Three sabers clashed violently, Malgus's lone weapon held diagonally as he halted both Talariel's blades. Talariel stood a solid seven foot flat in height, thanks to his rigorous lifestyle had a mainly decent amount of muscle. And with the force to enhance his already intimidating stature, was capable of snapping a full grown man's neck with a single hand in a second. Malgus on the other hand, stood seven foot two, despite being in his seventies nearing his eighties, was one of the most physically abled beings around, competing with tall Ariel in muscle structure, was not something tall Ariel could easily plow through. Tall Ariel sneered, teeth grinding together as he pushed his two blades against Malgus's own. Malgus held both the hilt of his weapon with both hands, pushing back against tall Ariel slowly as his mask made an audible groaning sound. White flashed against their faces, the yellow molten pools of their eyes staring into the other with contempt. Malgus leaned forward, bringing moving his arms in front to his center as he began to heave Talariel's blades to the right side. Talariel's eyes widened at the show of sheer strength, clenching his teeth as his arms burned, attempting to stop Malgus from moving his weapons to the side, knowing that if he pulled one of his blades away then Malgus would follow through and cleave him in half instantly. With a roar, Malgus slammed his head into Talariel's face. The pure blood stumbled back as blood burst from his broken nose, was then bent over as Malgus twisted and slammed a steel-capped boot into the pure blood's stomach, sending the Sith sprawling across the soil. Malgus reversed lightsaber in his grip and raised it, ready to plunge the weapon through Talariel's head. Swiping down, Malgus's eyes dashed taut he sighed faster than most could see, the man altering the course of his weapon behind himself as he successfully blocked a strike towards his back. Asina's purple unstable weapon danced off as the hulking Sith's weapon, the woman twirling her double-bladed weapon in a circular blur, raising the weapon overhead whilst she spun the weapon and down to her side to attempt a reverse stab at Malgus's stomach. Malgus, having blocked and sidestep every attack from the combo, met the woman's blade and brought them into a deadlock by pushing his weapon down and to the side forcing Asina's blade to follow, using his free left hand to uppercut the woman under the chin. Asina's head snapped up, ears ringing before pain flared over her entire being. Malgus, unleashing a barrage of lightning at the Empress, raised her into the air with the force before flinging the twitching woman away and into a solid tree. With a crack, the woman hit the tree, digging into the bark before Malgus let her go. With the Empress out of commission for the moment, Malgus turned back to Tall Ariel who had brought himself back to his feet. I see you've decided to go with your favored style the older Sith sneered as Tall Ariel held only one of his lightsabers in his hand. Tall Ariel yelled out in response, a deep sinister bellow that made the trees around them sway. Malgus regarded the man with an amused stare, the scar gash over his left brow contorting in his humor. How intimidating Malgus mused before stepping forward and moving to engage the Empire's wrath once more. Both Sith, using their right arms brought their weapons around in a left moving arc at the same angle, their lightsabers meeting in the middle in a violent flash of energy. Both weapons bounced off each other as they danced the same dance, both swiveling their weapons around and meeting into he middle from the opposite side. Tall Ariel smirked as he leant back and broke the saber lock by disengaging letting Malgus's weapon pass by harmlessly whilst Tall Ariel stabbed forward towards Malgus's stomach. Malgus, in an effort to lower the damage he would take, pivoted himself to the right lightly, letting his opponent's weapon sear into the left of his abdomen, leaving a shallow gash as he barely avoided the skewering attack. In response, whilst still pivoting, Malgus completed a full circle whilst raising his elbow, slamming Tall Ariel in the face with the back of his steel in case joint. Ridges of bone were shattered and fell of Tall Ariel's face as the Sith bellow in rage. Creating distance, Tall Ariel leapt back and threw his lightsaber at his opponent, landing next to Asina as the woman regained her senses. Malgus simply stepped to the side as the weapon passed by, watching it circle around back to its wielder. You should just take her and flee, there is no way you could win this engagement and escape before he arrives. In fact Malgus stood to the side as Tall Ariel became even further guarded Nox entering the clearing from behind where Malgus stood. Where's Arkan Tall Ariel hissed as he looked around the clearing for any sign of the ex-emperor.
He's out dealing with the rest of your men. Knox waved his hand dismissively as he observed both Tall Ariel and Asina. As much as I'd like to take you down a peg or two, I'd suggest, as Malgus said, you leave. Asina groaned, placing her palms to the ground before pushing up and making her way to her feet. Ah, you've decided to join us again. Knox stared down at the Empress with a disapproving look, though they wouldn't be able to tell due to the helm of Kalig hiding his features. Both the Empress and the Empire's Wrath reignited their purple and red blades respectively, ready to engage both Malgus and Nox in battle at the same time. This battle is as futile as it is stupid, surrender and I will ensure you won't be punished too harshly. Nox crossed his arms behind his back whilst Malgus stood beside him, glaring at the two opponents. Your overconfidence has always and will always be your greatest weakness, even if you kill all our comrades, we will stop you here and now Asina lowered herself to the ground, lightsaber behind her as she prepared to make a dash at Knox. Knox himself brought his hands down to his side, clenching his fists in preparation. Not alone you won't a voice overhead made Tall Ariel look up as a shuttle entered the clearing. Just in time Asina smirked as five people jumped down from the shuttle. The hero of Typhon landed in a silent crouch whilst a Jedi battle master and two council members landed behind him. Cypher 9 dropped down to the ground next to them and promptly dashed into the foliage. The champion of the hunt flying into the area before hovering above the tree leaned to glare down at his enemies. Increasing the amount of idiots doesn't change what they are, idiots, you will all die as easily as the next. Nox sneered as Malgus reactivated his broken lightsaber, a red-hued haze being released from his body as he began to channel the dark side. You can't hope to defeat us Malgus clasped his left hand in front of himself for effect before an explosion from the Imperial Republic base shook the ground below, the shockwave pushing the trees harshly, some tearing from their roots and flying over the tree lean. And now, you're alone, and Arkan is making his way here Nox became shrouded in a mist of purple that swirled around him violently. The hero proceeded to run forward with a bellowing charge, lightsaber in hand as his robotic arm gleamed in the sunlight. Nox, seeing the hero charge, took half a step forward as he raised his right arm, vibrant crimson light tearing from his fingertips in a wailing screech. The clearing was obscured by the torrential barrage of lightning, blinding white light shining through the trees as Cypher 9 was forced to hide behind a tree from the heat that washed through the forest. The present, eight months since Poison Moon, 24 BBY, IO Cath, SIVA Testing Lab SIVA stared down at the woman currently restrained to the surgery table below. Carol lay on her stomach, unable to move as SIVA had once more removed pieces of her spine. She looked at SIVA out of the corner of her eye, the whites in her eyes had long since become bloodshot, the veins in her skin had ruptured several times over, and her bottom jaw was currently missing her tongue simply dangling from within her neck after the droid had forcefully pulled her bottom jaw from her head after she had tried to bite her tongue off. Beginning surgery Siva announced to a floating camera drone, the machine circling around and analyzing Carol's entire nude body. Eight mechanical arms lowered from the ceiling, each one serving a different purpose as they were manipulated by Siva. She could feel two needles plunge into her back, skewering through the plates in her spine as fluid was injected. Another set of hands removed the skin and muscle on her back, she was painfully aware of the removal as her bones became bare to the world, muscle snapped and tore as they were cut by scalpels by another set of mechanical limbs. Siva meanwhile began to cut and separate the bones in her back, pulling them up and out of the woman's body and placing them onto a sterile tray to the side. Carol meanwhile offered no resistance, simply letting it happen, death would not come to her even as her lungs failed and her heart beat irregularly, her brain function stopped and restarted at the droid's whims. And she was powerless to stop it, a simple doll for the horrid machine to contort and break as it pleased. Siva finally began to remove the spinal plates and vertebrae from the woman's back, cutting the discs in half, making sure to leave the spinal cord intact. Part 1 Success Siva announced as the camera drone now pointed straight down to observe the surgery. Beginning Part 2 The droid raised her left hand to the side as she used magnetic manipulation to pull a nearby trolling to her side. What looked like crude metallic bone structure lay atop trays, suspended within containers atop these trays with their lids opened. 
Two thin long wires were given to the droid courtesy of a nurse droid, Siva putting the first of the two wires alongside the right side of the spinal cord, the second being places on the left at the same time. A slight pulse of electricity activated the wire's purpose as they spring to action, encasing the spinal column instantaneously in a protective metallic covering so no damage to come to it. The droid reached for the first container, 24 discs that would serve as the woman's new vertebrae began to levitate from the container thanks to Siva. The droid began to grab each piece, splitting them in half, placing the two halves on each side of the spinal column, the two halves piecing themselves back together naturally, showing no signs of ever having been separated. The droid had started from the cervical vertebrae, putting the new spine together piece by piece before ending with with the final lumbar vertebrae. Siva stood back to allow the camera droid to observe the new glistening black spine now integrated into the woman's body. Beginning part 3 Siva announced as she pulled forward the second half of the already partially altered rib cage. The ribs were integrated one by one seamlessly, melded to the front portion of the rib cage without issue, the now fully metal rib cage fused together, melding with the spinal column and locking into place. The next thing to be replaced were the shoulder blades, the new replacements fusing with the top of the spinal and rib cage. The nano droid swarm currently housed within Carol began to hastily construct new muscle tendons, converting stores of remaining fat into useful materials. Siva watched with satisfaction, standing back with the camera droid as they watched Carol begin to shake. The first muscle constructed by the nanodroids was the multifidus and rotators, stabilizing the new spinal structure before being reinforced by a series of stimulants that worked to strengthen the muscle. Stemming out from the spine, Siva watched as the nanodroids constructed the external intercostal muscle groups, the spoas major the erector spiny along with the serratus posterior interior and the gluteal muscles all at once. Several tubes linked to the torso of Carol rapidly transferred artificial fats and proteins from canisters under the surgical table, keeping Carol from becoming malnourished due to the rapid reconstruction of her body. A thin layer of film began to excrete and form over the woman's back layer up and layer forming one after another as the new skin was quickly completed. Surgery success Siva concluded as Carol began to take her own breaths without external assistance, her skin returning to its previous color as her back rose and lowered now for the final touches. Siva's right pointer finger extended into a thin needle whilst the droid came forward. Carol watched the droid near, the droid's hand lowering into her head, feeling the needle break through the skin next to her ear and pierce her skull. She could hear and feel a small pop that sounded within her right ear, that was the last thing she felt, the last thing she heard as her vision went black, everything went dark and silence prevailed. She knew no more as she felt nothing. A sigh escaped her as she floated in the void. It's finally, over a small trail of tears ran down her face before she began to disintegrate within the void. She gave no whimpers or cries as she passed, the end had finally arrived, and she would accept it a small smile playing on her features before she disappeared completely. Sivar retracted her fingers from Carol's head, an afterthought unlocked the restraints currently holding the woman in place, allowing the thing on the table to slowly rise, complete and unmarked as her breasts bounced slightly as she rose. The woman's dilated brown eyes shrunk back to their normal sizes as the bursted veins within her eyes healed, revealing the whites within. The thing on the table seemed to examine its hands, roaring her hands to and from her before she lowered them and gripped the sides of the table. The thing rotated itself as it swung its legs over the side of the flat surface, lowering her newly enforced limbs to the ground before cold registered in her head as the bases of her feet touched the cold tiles. The thing on the table rose, standing tall for half a second before collapsing under her own weight, her palms impacted the cold ground, the tiles cracking and warping under the base of its palms. Blood leaked from the base of her right hand thanks to a small cut from the broken tile below. It clenched its teeth as white paste flooded the cut, pooling together before solidifying into a perfectly healed hand. My master. May I present to you, the most sophisticated amalgamation of organic and artificial intelligence. Tell me child, what is your name Siva knelt down to the thing attempting to stand, helping the cyborg up from the ground with a gentle touch. Designation, 
C490L, Carol, Unit Number Zero, First of My Kind, I thank you kind mother, and I thank you, your majesty the thing rose to its feet, standing tall and proud as the camera drone came forward and examined her form slowly as it circled around. And of the original personality a deep baritone voice sounded from the camera drone, turning to point at Siva who came forward to answer the question. Suppressed as it merges, the two personality matrixes will soon become the one, working in tandem to reach peak efficiency, it will learn at a level unprecedented for a machine and organic that isn't you or myself. It will grow resilient enough to survive orbital entry without external assistance. Strong enough to arm wrestle a rancor, within a few months, there will be little a regular organic could do to halt let alone stop her Siva told the drone before the drone's front lit up, a ray of light shining before a hollow appeared in front of the droid. The hollow of Nox stood with its arms crossed behind its back, garbed in what appeared to be a simple robe held tight to his features. C490L stood tall as the drone continued to circle her at the same pace as the hollow did, analyzing her every feature as if able to see through her layers of flesh. Coming around to finish a full circle, the hollow of Nox stopped to stand by Siva's left side, turning his neck to look the droid head on. Teacher her, monitor her progress and when the time is right and your tests are done, send her to me. I would like to test me herself Nox's hollow looked over the new machine once more with an appraising eye I must congratulate you, you have done a phenomenal job with your work, I am impressed. Your kind words being me great satisfaction my master, I will endeavor to please you further in the future Siva vehemently replied, her tone several tones higher, pleased with his words. I have no doubt that you will continue to impress, I look forward to seeing you next work of art. Now forgive me but I must depart Nox finished as Siva knelt, the C490L doing the same as the larger droid. As do I my master, I will converse with you shortly Siva continued to kneel as the hologram shut off, the camera drone rising and departing the area soon after. Rising, Siva looked down to her smaller creation below with an analytic gaze come, there is much for you to learn. Yes kind mother Carol took a few shaky steps quickly learning to distribute her weight as the towering machine went further into the lab, soon after walking long confident steps in pursuit of the one who remade her. Caldani Spires Knox's fingers drummed across the surface of his ornate table, the room dim and dark, the only light being produced by the hanging orange crystals. Coruscant as always progressed onwards despite it being well into the night. Even in the dark ones could see the dark of his eyes, seemingly absorbing the very light in the air as stars twinkled within such twin wells of darkness. His eyes were taunt in a squint, frown marred his face as his tear troughs became pronounced. He didn't look towards the doorway as it opened, Valen walking through with a neutral expression. It amused him, he could admit, thanks to their bond she could always tell what kind of emotion was running through him at any given moment, just as he could her. What's wrong love Valen knelt down next to his seat, worry easily seen of her features. Slowly his face twitched, eyes making their way to look at Valen's own. Something, is about to happen as if guided by an unseen entity, Knox brought his hand forward onto the table, different Republic frequencies appearing and just as before, he absent-mindedly opened one such frequency. What is going to happen Valen asked as some opera began to play. This Knox raised a lone finger as the opera singer fizzled and sputtered, breaking apart as the signal was hijacked. The person to take over the opera singer's previous spot was the easily remembered Count Dooku, eyes squinted and white hair slicked back. The Count of Sereno had an air of authority to him as he peered meaningfully at anybody watching. Hello oppressed people of a once free galaxy, I am Count Dooku of Sereno, I served once as a Jedi Knight and is a member of the Jedi High Council Dooku began as he cast his signature look of superiority. Knox brought his right elbow onto the armrest of his seat as he leant his chin on the back of his hand. I dedicated my life to peace and justice, undertaking countless missions and risking my life many times over. I have protected people and communities, and brought countless criminals, pirates, terrorists, tyrants, and corrupt individuals to justice. And yet as a Jedi I was serving the most corrupt, most destructive institution in the entire galaxy Dooku continued on unimpeded, 
a small chuckle rising from Knox as the Sith observed Dooku's hollow with unblinking eyes. Valen rose from her spot to stand behind Knox's chair, leaning down as she rested her head on the high back of the seat, wanting to watch the hollow with her lover. The Galactic Republic, and its Senate, have become abominations. The Senate is mired in corruption and decadency. Senators routinely betray the people they're meant to represent, whoring themselves to the highest bidder. They allow you, their own people, to suffer lawlessness, abuse and exploitation, stagnation, prejudice and injustice. They lounge in luxury on Coruscant, while you toil and languish the Senate watched OK as Palpatine hid his smirk masterfully, eyes peering at the towering figure of Dooku that stood tall and high in the Senate chamber. The Republic is in deep in debt, which they expect you, the working people, to pay off for them. They create layer upon layer upon layer of bureaucracy, which is enormously expensive, stifles your voice, which makes ever the simple aspects of governing frustrating and ineffective. They abolished their military, causing the rim worlds to fall into chaos and the hyper lanes to become overrun with pirates. And to add insult to injury, they ridicule and punish systems that try militarize and self-defense Padme looked on in her senate pod, silent and unmoving as she watched Dooku's transmission, Kenya put a reassuring hand on the woman's shoulder, sending a worried glance to her friend. The Republic also stifles our economy, it imposes a myriad of taxes as do its devote governments and planetary governments. These taxes do not pay for our safety, as the military has been abolished. No. These taxes pay for the Senate's lavish lifestyle, the Republic burdensome bureaucracy, and the whims of the highest bidders. The Republic has such contempt for you, the Count even be bothered to vote on the recent financial reform bill. Worse still, the maverick Senator who drafted the bill, Senator Jeremiah Grayshade, was assassinated by the powers that be. Killed in cold blood, for daring to actually represent the interests of the citizenry. Well. I dare the powers that be to come after me. I do not fear you, I will fight you, I will overthrow you, and I will destroy you Dooku's words of power grasped at each and every individual who cast their attention to the hollow playing over the galaxy. The Jedi enforce the will of the Republic upon you. Their rhetoric about compassion and peace is self-righteous lies. They stand by and do nothing as the Republic tramples on you, but are quick to cut you down if you defend yourselves. Those in the Outer Rim know this all too well. Suffer an attack by pirates, enslavement by criminals, and the Jedi do nothing. But declare your intention to leave the Republic and govern yourselves the Jedi are at your doorstep at the blink of an eye, ready to take you down. Instead of using their power to liberate people from the Republic they use their power to keep the people subjugated. Instead of devoting themselves to justice and good, they devote themselves to the Republic. It's for these reasons I have resigned from the Jedi Order his words came as a shock to the greater galaxy, to hear such a man had left the Order after such time shook many. From this day forward, I devote myself to creating a new government and a new order of the Force. The new government I will create will correct the Republic's failures. It will be led by a head of state, a council of advisors and a parliament. Instead of thousands of sectors with thousands of senators, we will have only a few sectors with a few senators. These senators will serve four-year terms, and will be elected by the planetary and system governments of their sectors the Jedi High Council sat within their chamber, sat atop their seats, Yoda himself looked to have aged years, his ears drooping atop his head as a sad frown sat on his face. Our new government will not have sector governments, thus eliminating an entire layer of bureaucracy, taxes, laws and regulations. Our government will not impose its will on education, which will be left to the free systems of the galaxy. Our new government will not involve itself in welfare of healthcare, allowing these systems to manage these tasks as they see fit. Under our new government, all tariffs and trade barriers will be eliminated. Citizens will be able to trade and do business with each other without restriction individual peoples across the galaxy looked unsure at each other, shrugging and murmuring as they huddled around projectors. The new government will possess a large military. The military will be centralized, with planetary and system militaries being absorbed within it. The enforcement law will also be centralized. 
The role of the government is to maintain order and the rule for law. Our new government will devote itself to that responsibility, without treading into roles that are not its by right. Knox could feel the turmoil beginning to rise within the Senate, a small smile playing on the edge of his lips as he drew the raw emotion from the Senate into himself. We will patrol the hyper lanes, keeping them free of pirates. We will bring order to the outer rim, and root out lawlessness. We will rebuild the economy, by restoring control of economic matters to the people, instead of a corrupt inept government the Senate remained silent as senators sat, their eyes glued to the hologram. I will build a new force using order, to replace the complacent Jedi Order. This new order will serve the people, not corrupt politicians. It will utilize its power on service to the good, uninhibited by a self-righteous, tyrannical code Obi-Wan and Anakin watched the hollow with troubled looks, looking to each other in unease. This will be the beginning of great strife and turmoil. After all the Republic and Jedi will not surrender power willingly. We the people will have to take them down by force. A new day has begun. Today ends the mark of silence and consent, and the beginning of revolution. We will seize power back from ruling class the count continued onwards despite the technicians working hard to remove the hijacking. No longer will we be spat on by the people who are meant to represent our interests. No longer will our voices be silenced, our grievances ignored. They didn't hear our pleas, now they will hear our judgment. People of the galaxy, join me in this quest. We will fight, and we will be free. May the Force be with us all and with his final words spoken, the hollow abruptly shut off, silence rose across the galaxy. Knox stared at the now bare table with a look of uninterest for several moments. Valen looked conflicted as his shoulders began to shake, the man hunching forward as she thought of reaching forward to check on him. Her worries were alleviated as his head shot up, a deep, full-bellied laugh rose from him as his voice peeled through the apartment. Tears brewed in the sides of his eyes and streamed down his face as he cackled. Love Valen's head turned to the side in curiosity as Knox rose a hand and wiped the streams of tears from his face. Knox regarded her with a side glance as his laughter began to settle. Leaning over to her, he rose the side of his head as he gave her a face-splitting smile of pure insanity. Let chaos, rain closing his eyes, Knox became still as he opened himself up to the currents of the Force, using the sudden influx of turmoil to feed Appen and empower himself. Three days later, Knox ascended the ramp of the X-70B with a purposeful gait, Valen was already within the bridge of the ship, preparing for their immediate departure. Are you sure you have to go so soon? Kenya asked as she watched Knox pause at the top of the ramp. Turning back to the girl, Knox looked down at his adoptive daughter with knotted brows and a small frown marring his features. It is for the best my dear, tensions are high, everybody is weary, and upcoming events call me elsewhere, I'm entrusting you to act in my best interests while I am away, keep a close eye on your acquaintances and an even closer eye on your friends. And remember, honeyed words taste of poison Knox told the woman who appeared to be downtrodden at his words. I understand father, I'll do my best to continue on your work while you are away, I'll make you proud. Kenya looked at him once more, an almost puppy-like look coming over her features. Chuckling with a small puff of air, Knox descended back down the ramp before wrapping the woman in a tight embrace. I know dear, you need not worry about disappointing me, you've done more than enough to make me proud, all I ask is you do your best that is enough," Knox whispered to his daughter as the girl responded in turn by hugging him around the waist. The ship hummed as Valen prepared the ship for flight. Double checking systems despite the onboard AI showing the ship's current state. Her ears perked up as the footsteps of her lover registered within her range of hearing. She glanced over her shoulder for a small moment, her eyes tracking the male specimen she was infatuated with as the entity took his spot in the central chair. She finished preparing the ship for flight as she leant back into her own seat, leaning onto the armrest as she fluttered her eyebrows at the man currently stroking his chin. As if he could feel her gaze, Knox's keen eyes slowly peeled over to lock with her own. Something I can help you with sweetheart Knox asked as Valen playfully lent her cheek onto the back of her hand, running one of her black nails down her supple lips. Oh. 
I was just wondering where we were going Valen shifted slightly as she drew her free hand under her bust, making them more pronounced. Knox chuckled, he could feel her boredom, having felt her growing its when he had been giving Kenya her tasks, but, he had to admit she did a phenomenal job at managing her mounting boredom compared to when she ruled Zakul. Leaning back, adjusting the seat as he yawned, Knox raised his right hand, activating the hollow console which began to show a multitude of planets. Well we have quite a few things to do, we have a hunt to commit on Kessel, Kerda, and Sessa. We have to establish contact with whatever life remains on Rakata Prime. And then we have to check out some interesting rumors on Corellia, that is to name a few though Knox listed each task they had to go through one after another as Valen listened with rapt attention. Is that all ha huh? Valen mused as she scratched at one of the tattoos on her left arm. Hmm, now that I think about it, they don't have to be done in any particular order, why don't you choose which one we go to first? Knox asked as Valen perked up, a hopeful gleam in her eyes. Really Valen asked to which Knox nodded, the woman jumping up from her chair with a pleased clap of her hands, coming around the chairs to sit herself down in Knox's open lap. Will Valen purred as she shimmied herself in his lap, a playful smile on her lips as she analyzed the different planets visible on the hollow I've heard some good things about Kessel. I'm sure you have, Kessel it is Knox chuckled in her ears before grabbing a hold of the flight stick, forcing the ship to leave the platform below connected to his apartment. Valen stopped paying attention to the orientation of the craft they were in, diverting her attention to sliding her hands under the belt of her lover's robes, snaking her nimble fingers under his belt and into his undergarments. She took extreme pleasure as she watched his right eye twitch slightly as she ran her index finger over his toned stomach, she licked her lips with her tongue resting atop the left side of her bottom lip, pushing her hand farther down as her sulfuric eyes watched Knox's face for his reaction. Knox maneuvered the sleek ship through Coruscant's atmosphere and into the vacuum of space. You're really trying to get under my skin aren't you? Knox announced after engaging the hyperdrive towards the Akadis maelstrom. I may be Valen innocently played off her actions, decidedly ignoring her hands currently housed within his undergarments. That's so. Knox answered by suddenly grabbing Valen and pulling her flush against him, a gasp escaping the woman at the sudden movement I guess I'll just have to pay you back for your little game. His voice was low as it rumbled in her ears, sending a pleasant tingle down her back as she felt his cursed hands expertly maneuver around her clothing. HMN I do like the sound of that, Valen purred, a joyous giggle rising from her as Knox stood from his chair, carrying the woman in his arms as he marched from the bridge towards their shared room. Alert me of our imminent arrival Knox's voice echoed throughout the ship, registered by the AI who replied in the affirmative, Knox ignored the answer as the door to his quarters opened, tossing the brunette in his arms onto the bed. She landed on her back with a small giggle before making her way onto her elbows, her legs parting as she shook her hair from her face. She sent her lover a sultry smile as she wagged her left index finger at the man, motioning him to her as her eyes squinted in a predatory glint. Come here my big gorgeous dragon Valen's voice was like fine silk up and Knox, the man simply coming into the soft fabric of the bed below, leaning forward before she closed the gap between them, their lips smashing together as the two became locked in carnal embrace. The droid at the onboard bar minded its business as it chatted with the onboard AI, both listening to the moans and screams of pleasure that began to tear though the ship, the ship AI let out a small sigh oh the joys of the flesh. Locked overhead in battle was the silencer fleet against the Republic and Imperial forces, what little remained of the Eternal fleet was also present, the ships repaired from Zildrog's destruction of the fleet had arrived minutes prior quickly aiding the silencer fleet as the Republic Empire coalition waged war. Alderaan burnt as stray fire from dreadnoughts impacted cities, skyscrapers fell from their foundations, killing many underneath. The Eternal flagship, the Eternity was in a stalemate against three Harrower-class dreadnoughts and four Republic Valor-class dreadnoughts. On either side of the Eternity was a cotter of Eternal fleet warships assisting the behemoth of a capital ship. Armies of Skytrooper units deployed from their warships to lay waste to all opposition. A single burst from one of the silencers annihilated six Republic cruisers, sending shrapnel hurtling to the surface of the planet. 
dropping out if hyperspace were more and more republic and imperial forces, the leaders of the coalition having diverted all resources to snuffing out the eternal empire here and now. Meanwhile, across the continent was Nox and Malgus, battling not only the hero of Tython but Empress Asina, and having joined them was the newly formed Jedi Council and the entirety of the Dark Council. Hatred manifest burst off Nox in rippling surges of electricity, bouncing from his fingers and forked snakes to strike against Lethris and Saitli Shan herself. Malgus was locked in saber combat with both Tal Ariel and the replacements of Nost Dural and Tol Braga. The replacement of Nost Dural was a rat attacky male named Sol, whilst the replacement for Tol Braga was a twilight female named Cassandra. Arkan's yellow blade slashed out to bat against Darth Saren's red blade, a bolt of supercharged yellow lightning surging out and impacting the replacement for Varan. Saitli swung her double-bladed lightsaber overhead as she resolved herself to stopping the monster Nox was becoming. Her blade cut a vicious curve through the air, it would have removed his head had he not leant back, the blade sailing in front of his brow, he became aware of Kira Carson's blade about to pierce his spinal column, his motion blurred with a quick burst of force speed, he twisted out of the blade's path and slashed against the apprentice's stomach, a mean trench of smoldering flesh gouging across her stomach leaving a scorching scar before he mule kicked her in the chin, sending her sprawling across the ground in agony as the resident Jedi healer moved to heal the girl. He felt the billowing rage rippling from Lethris as the male moved to cleave Nox's head from his body, at that same moment, Asina's purple-bladed weapon moved to sever his legs from his body at the knees. Knowing leaping to either side was useless, the same as going back and forward. Nox did the only thing that would ensure he remained unharmed for sure. With a twist, Nox's feet left the ground as he corkscrewed through the air horizontally, both blades sailed above and below his body, the Eternal Emperor landing on his feet before he shoved his hands away from his center of being. A force push rose from his being, tossing his four opponents away from him, Saitli was sent crashing into the trunk of a tree whilst Asina and Lethris were sent sailing head over heel into the tree lean. Kira, already injured screamed in pain as a thick tree branch embedded itself into her left arm, the Jedi healer panicking and picking the girl up and attempting to move her away from the battle. Nox slowly lowered his arms to the side as he surveyed the battle, Malgus was still locked in a stalemate with Tall Ariel, Sol and Cassandra. Meanwhile Arkan had gotten the upper hand in his battle against Saren and Varan's replacement his blade descending in furious blows that shook the ground below and with a final furious blow, his blade knocked the hilt of Varan's replacement from his hands and sliced into the torso of the man. The victim gave no noises as his body fell in two, Arkin giving no fanfare as he went back to wailing Appen Saren. Nox turned his attention back to Saitli, the brown-haired woman rising to her feet with her lightsaber in hand. His countenance pinned Saitli, a glare from under the soulless cold steel depicted his attitude. A snarl ripped from his maw as the temperature dropped around the battlefield. So this is how it is Saitli Hanox sneered as the soil beneath his feet began to decay, a field of death quickly spreading from his feet and over the clearing the trees around them withered, their leaves falling from their branches only to fall to the ground in husks of ash, bark decayed and fell from their holds, cracking and splintering as the bases of the tress died. Grass around him lost color and shriveled into nothingness, sound became muted around him as light seemed to be a little dimmer. The field of effects spread far and wide from the point of origin, everyone within beginning to feel sick, an instinctual fear running through their beings as a cold chill rose from their spines. The blue blades of Satali's weapon erupted from the hilt, her haze hard as she wore her combat armor, limping back into the clearing behind her was Asina, the Empress having several abrasions and cuts and grazes. This is how it must be. Sadly glanced to Asina as the Empress ignited her own double-bladed weapon I held hope that you would learn, but you declared yourself Emperor, you're treading a path that must be halted, we will do what we must. You can't comprehend it can you, you're so set in your beliefs and ways that you can't accept the possibility someone of my origin could have the best intentions, you can't accept it, it goes against everything you know and understand, I thought that little dry spell of yours when you went into seclusion helped you, but I see I was wrong. You're right, you will do what you must, 
and I will do what I must to ensure my child may live in a galaxy without fear." Nox's lightsaber sailed into his grip from his belt, igniting in a crimson red blade that reflected off the black soulless lenses of his ancestor's countenance. I will not let your naivety ruin my plans. Lowering his blade, the red tip of the weapon scorched the dead soil at his feet, the blade pointed straight down as he leaned forward slightly in preparation to attack. Lightning coated his entire left arm, dancing across his fingers up until it arced from his elbow and into the air, burning ozone in the process. There was no signal, no agreed app and opening, one second he was there, the next his entire figure blurred before whistling booms of air announced his movement. Just like himself, Asuna and Sadly disappeared in after images, their blades meeting in the middle with a colossal thunderclap that rattled the ground around them. They appeared as solid objects for that one moment, Nox's lightsaber held forward as it halted both double-bladed weapons of his opponents. Slowly his head looked from left to right before a growl rose from him, heaving forward as his enhanced strength began to push both formidable opponents. His feet became entrenched in the ground as he pushed off, Asuna and Sadali's feet leaving trails of dirt as Nox began to push them back adjusting his weapon's orientation in the process as he attempted to push their weapons back into their faces. Sadali in return, stepped back, breaking the lock as she spun her weapon around, attempting to catch Nox off guard with the other end of her weapon as it cut through the air towards his abdomen. Quicker than she could see, his weapon hand flipped, the red of his blade appearing as a sheet of red before the blade settled against her own. Asuna took this as her chance, vanishing from the spot as she sped around Nox and made for a decapitating strike to the back of his head. She failed to notice however, his offhand lowered to his side whilst his open palm faced backwards towards her. Pain overcame her rational senses as a crackling boom of lightning assaulted her ears, catching her square in the stomach, scorching her armor as it drove her to her knees in agony. As the lightning coursed through her body, she could feel it sapping her strength, tearing her connection to the force asunder, it stopped a moment later, however it left her heaving, sweat pouring down her face as her skin burned and muscle ached. Nox reverted his attention back to Sadly, blades connecting in a flurry of strikes as he defended himself from the Jedi Grand Master's assault. He leapt to the side as she made a mad dash in his direction, lightsaber a whirlwind as she spun the blade in her grip, white and blue mist-like vapor poured from her as she drew heavily up in the force, her lightsaber became a blur of blue, leaving trails of light as she sped up. She turned to face Nox once more, using her oneness with the Force to even the odds as she burst forward, spinning her lightsaber overhead as she spun before she made a stabbing motion for Nox's chest. So this is your resolve Nox spoke neutrally as he ducked under a decapitating sweep from the Grand Master you really call for my death this day hey? What I want is irrelevant, it is my duty to the Republic to put a stop to you Sadly winced as she spoke. So that's their ultimatum hey, I see. Very well then Nox clenched his lightning-covered left fist as he prepared himself. I'm sorry her voice came out as barley a whisper as she closed her eyes momentarily, the haze rising over her growing in intensity as a tangible storm began to swirl around the mature woman, Asina made distance between the Grand Master and Nox, leaping to engage tall Ariel as she trusted sadly with ending Nox. That's new, maybe her seclusion wasn't as wasted as I thought. Ravan had been doing more than I thought he did, teaching his descendant, clever. Not, yet Nox replied as he weathered the storm taking over the area, Arkan and Malgus were shielding themselves alongside their opponents. The woman's pupils glowed with white light as she gave a half-hearted glare to Nox, lowering her center of mass with her offhand in front of herself and her lightsaber hand out behind her, ready to surge forward with her lightsaber. You're not the only one gifted with knowledge Sadly Nox thought as he in turn drew up in the force, flooding every cell in his body as if the floodgates had been opened. Several things happened as Sadly took a step forward, a sniper bolt burst through the foliage of blinding speeds from a hidden Cypher 9, rockets descended up in Nox from above courtesy of the hunter, Lethris appeared on the opposite side of the tree lean ready to re-engage, both lightsabers in hand and ignited. The Jedi leapt from the underbrush leapt behind Nox with his blades in front of himself ready to skewer Nox. He chuckled to himself, directly to his left was the blaster bolt from Nine, to his right, 
a barrage of rockets and immediately behind him was Lethris ready to end him, and to his front, the collimation of her family line's power, sadly Shan resolute in her beliefs. In turn, as everything was about to impact him. Knox chuckled, the force responding to his call as the technique he wished to use was ready. Everything around him slowed to a crawl, the blaster bolt about to cleave its way into his ribs froze centimeters to his left side. The rockets to his remain stationary whilst both Lethris and Sadly were stuck, frozen in place as Knox boosted his own perception of time to the nth degree. He moved, and as he did so the sound of howling winds tore into his eardrums as he movements created a vacuum, oxygen had yet to fill in where he had previously, he raised his right foot high into the air muscles tensing before he slammed his boot into the ground with all the force he could muster. Turning to the bolt sent at him courtesy of Cypher 9, he made use of the energy absorption abilities of Tudominus in his open palm, Knox slammed his hand into the bolt of plasma, absorbing the bolt slowly as it swirled into the micro whirlwind of energy in his palm, eaten away into nothing as its energies were added to himself. He rounded to face Lethris the hero of Tython, plunging his red blade's lightsaber into the man's right pectoral and through the other side of the man's back. He let go of the lightsaber as he finally turned to face Sadly, walking up to the woman through the frozen wisps of her cyclone. I'm sorry Sadly, but as I said, I won't simply let you ruin the future, not because of some misguided idea of the Senate, you lost this battle long before you even decided to engage he gazed directly into her blue eyes as he slowly raised his arms directly towards the sky grabbing hold of a Valor-class cruiser with the force before making a dragging motion downwards. With a resolved sigh, Nox walked away from the gathered Jedi, first stopping in front of Asina, he raised his right gauntlet to the woman's face, pushing his middle and pointer fingers into the woman's temple before dragging said digits down her face, his fingers left trails of carved flesh as he moved, moving over her eyebrows, ignoring her eyes as his fingers' fingers reconnected with her cheeks, he continued the carving downwards before finishing on the bottom of her chin. Blood had yet to pour out onto her face, but one could see the open vessels on her face, the red life blood all too ready to pour out when time would inevitably return to its natural state. You will bear the scars of your decisions for the rest of your days. He wasn't yet finished however as he rose his hands to either side of his body before bringing his hands together as hard as he could onto the woman's ears. He then moved to Darth Saren and Arcan, picking up a thick branch from the ground before leveling it between the Sith pure blood's eyes, he reared his arm back before plunging the stick forward and through her cranium, not stopping until the stick jutted clear through the back of her head. Such a shame you were so short-sighted Nox shook his head before making his way to tall Ariel and Malgus, Sol and Cassandra appeared to be about to deliver a decisive blow to the hulking Sith Lord as tall Ariel held him in place. He walked up beside Tsoul and Cassandra, right index finger puncturing directly into Tsoul's neck, moving to Cassandra, he stood behind the woman before reaching forward, grabbing the front of her jaw with his right hand and the back of her head with the left. Closing his eyes, Knox reverted his perception of time back to its original state, everything beginning to speed up, and with a heave, snapped the Rattataki Jetty's neck with a thunderclap as her head reversed. Chaos ensued. Saitley's eyes widened, one second Knox was eye front of her, the next thing she knew her eardrums popped as a spray of dirt, pebble and strome assaulted her, grazing her skin as the ground underfoot cratered. As her eyes remained closed, screams registered in ears, she cracked open her left eye to take in the situation. What she saw made her panic, the cyclone of energy around her dissipating as Lethris looked at her with a troubled stutter and garbled words. Sticking out of his chest was the hilt of Nox's blade that immediately deactivated itself, leaving a clean hole through the man's chest that one could see all the way through. As he collapsed a scream of pain tore her attention from the Jedi Master as Asina collapsed to her knees in a spray of blood and gore, her hands covered her face as her hands became caked in blood, blood leaked from both she ears as she screamed to the high heavens. A series of thuds were heard on the other side of the shrubs, Sol and Saren collapsing to the ground at once, one still alive as he held his spurting neck whilst Saren was simply deceased soon impact, the stick in her head snapping off as she slammed face first into the ground. The final sound that registered in her ears was a thunderclap, 
her eyes turning to where she recognized the form of Nox to be as Cassandra's head was now reversed, blood spraying from her neck as she collapsed to her knees, the vomit of blood coating Nox as he now cut a far more intimidating figure than ever before. Tall Ariel seemed to have frozen, just as Malgus looked wide-eyed with panic, Arkan interestingly enough appeared not to be surprised, as if he had experienced such a thing in the past. Slowly Nox turned to face her, his entire front now coated in blood as it dropped from his countenance, the black lenses of his mask glowed vibrant purple as he faced her. Absent-mindedly, Saitly registered the continued screams of Asina, the Empress now having collapsed onto her back as she wailed. You should have remained in exile not ten seconds later, the ground quaked across the land, a Valor-class dreadnought falling from the sky as it carved its way through a mountain and into a city. He turned to Arkan and Malgus, nodding over his shoulder as they got the message. Turning to the pure-blood tall Ariel, whose fight seemed to have fled him, he looked at the Sith apathetically you have lost, the Jedi Council and Dark Council have been halved in their numbers, collect your Empress and leave. Tall Ariel seemed to make an educated move, leaping to Asina, gently cradling the woman into his arms before speeding from the battlefield and into the underbrush in the direction of Cypher 9. And you Saitly, I expected more from you, to think that you would bend to the Senate even when you knew they were in the wrong, pathetic. It's a good thing Theron is with me I'd hate for him to turn into someone as spineless as you. Oh I'd hurry and get medical attention for Lethris here, he doesn't have much time as it is Nox called his lightsaber to grasp the galaxy as a whole will benefit from my rule, I know you see this as much as I, you're just too much of a shut in coward to stick up for yourself, now take you failure of a hero and get out of my sight, before I cleave your head from your body and send it to your Jedi Order. He watched the Jedi Grand Master leave, taking Lethris in she arms as she fled the battle, allowing Nox to sag slightly as fatigue of using force speed to such a degree in tandem of using the force to augment his own perception of time so her had full control of such blistering speeds, was taxing, but he hit it well, walking to a waiting eternal shuttle a few hundred paces away. The three present boarded the shuttle without any words passing between them, rising into the atmosphere as a silencer atomized another portion of the Republic Navy. Pull back! We're heading back to the cool space Knox ordered as the gathered fleet immediately began to leave, the Republic and Imperial Coalition continuing to fire up in the faster ships to no avail. The shuttle they were on landed in one of the Eternity's hangars as both left the atmosphere of Alderaan, as soon as the shuttle setting down, the Eternity jumped into hyperspace. I take it you have decided you are indeed with us Malgus Knox turned his attention to the traitorous Sith who stood with his arms crossed in front of his chest. I am, it would be, unfavorable for me to find myself at odds with you Malgus replied as Nox nodded at the Sith's words the shuttle bay doors opening, allowing for the three do them to drop from the shuttle and into the hangar. Lana and Theron stood waiting for them, anon to pleased look on the heavily pregnant Lana's face as she tapped her foot impatiently. Theron looked worried as Lana came forward, her eyes scanning over Nox for any damages, he wasn't sure what she could see but the frown that made its way to her face brought a small smile to his face. Are we to retaliate? Lana asked as Nox came forward, shaking his head in the process. There is no need just yet, both the Empire and the Republic have been dealt a critical blow in these last weeks, this will allow us to prepare, for now me make for Io Kath, I have a bar center to break in. Nox chuckled to himself as Lana closed her eyes took a deep breath before nodding her head. If they attempt something like that on you again I'll take the silencer fleet and level cost city myself Lana retorted, her anger at the situation bleeding eye to her words and Nox came up to her and wrapped an arm around her shoulders. I am sure you would, but now, you need rest, come along Nox urged the hormonal woman along with a gently push. Commander, my mother, is she Theron began as Nox stopped and looked towards the former cis agent. She is fine, scared, sad, but fine, she was the only one to walk away without any injuries Knox reassured the man who slumped in relief. Thank you, Commander Theron smiled, Knox nodding in response before continuing onwards with Lana. Arkan, Malgus and Theron stayed behind as the two entered the elevator and ascended to a higher floor within the flagship. Come Malgus, 
we have several topics to go over before you can truly begin your duties. A crown urged the Sith trader to follow. Leaving Theron alone to his thoughts he sagged, relief continuing to flood him at knowing his mother lived on. The present, Kessel. Approaching the planet from the swirling maelstrom of storm clouds behind, asteroid bounced around behind the curtains of black, lightning flashing, illuminating vast distances with its blue-hued arcs. The planet below was colored brown as clouds washed over the world, its atmosphere was tinted a slight shade of green and brown, no doubt the toxins in the atmosphere were to blame. Rotating the orientation of the X-70B, Knox became level with the portion of the horizon he was aiming towards. Craters of asteroids littered the continents of the planet, deep gouges delving deep into the surface of the world. But he didn't pay attention to any of these, his black star-flecked eyes peering at the planet through the force itself. A haze of black shifted from within the world, rising in columns, through the atmosphere to coalesce into the atmosphere, soaking the stone of the surface in its dark energies. It wasn't a force nexus, that was easily evident, it was more akin to the bleeding life force of a being that refused to truly die, despite being cut up into pieces, the being's will to live was so great that his life force still oozed from his corpse, fueling him in his undeath. The ship hurtled through the atmosphere, sediment bouncing off the hull of the ship harmlessly as the lord on board aimed at the greatest focal point for the bleeding life energies. Vents of gas rose high from the same cracks as the life energies in the cracks of the planet's surface. He activated the landing gear of the ship as he slowed and began to lower it to the ship's surface. A hiss from the landing gear, signifying the ship's safe landing, the entity lowered his hands from the control stick, a sigh escaping him as he slumped into the fabric of his seat. This place is weird Valen announced her presence with a sway of her hips, sauntering into the bridge with a small smirk on her face, a flaring pain in her abdomen forcing her to stop her sauntering and resort to small steps as she approached. Stretching in his seat, a yawn escaped Knox as he slowly rose from his seat, turning to the woman as the ancient entity wore a simple black gown, this allowed Valen a rather nice view in her opinion as she ogled his pectorals and abdomen. It should feel odd, considering it's in a sense alive, or was Knox mused as he walked past Valen, existing the bridge and heading towards the cargo hold. Oh. Valen began to contemplate Knox's odd piece of information as she followed him towards the cargo hold, a wind current rising throughout the ship's inside as the ramp was lowered. As the entity she loved moved to activate the Scorpio proxy, Valen leant against the entryway of the ship, staring down the ramp towards the planet's surface, she sniffed at the air before gagging slightly, the toxins at the planet's air disgusted the woman, plugging her nose as she animatedly waved the disgusting smelling air away from herself. Scorpio Knox's voice diverted Valen's attention back to the man as the proxy body of Scorpio turned on, the original body halfway across the galaxy splitting its consciousness between another of its proxies. Your Majesty Scorpio respectfully bowed her head as the man smirked slightly. Good to have you here Knox stood back as the droid stepped out of the crate it was stored in. The location of this unit is odd, where are we? Scorpio asked as Knox turned and motioned for her to follow, the man wearing a simple robe descending the ramp with the droid obediently following close behind. We are currently on Kessel, the mining world within the Akadis maelstrom. Knox looked at the barren wasteland around the ship with a contemplative look. I assume there is a good reason for you to be on such a deplorable world. Scorpio's clipped tone amused the entity. Oh yes. I do, I have unfinished business to attend to you see. Knox didn't elaborate further as he stared intently at one of the vents, a few hundred meters in diameter. Scorpio watched Knox with interest as the man seemed to space out absent-mindedly, staring at the vent intently for several seconds before the droid cleared her throat. Is there something you wish me to do whilst you attend to your business? Scorpio diverted Knox's attention, the man blinking once or twice before his thought process continued. Ah yes, I need you to do several things before I return, I want you to find and determine the makeup of Kessel's spice that the locals mine the amount the mine and exactly how they do so. Find a strong undiscovered source of coaxium so we may mine it covertly away from prying eyes. I also want you to make contact with the resident species energy spiders, 
either find them and begin peaceful relations, a deal with them so they may provide us with what we wish or a large amount of their webs so we may extract glitter stim, other than that, you may do as you wish Nox informed the droid as he turned towards the ship, ascending the ramp until he came face to face with Valen. I must split from you momentarily, you may do as you wish in the meantime, stay on the ship or mingle with the locals, I will find you when I have done what I need. Valen looked crestfallen, Nox seeing this raised his hand to cup her chin, leaning down to capture her lips in his own. The woman greedily accepted his attention, her hands rising as she wrapped her arms around his neck. The two continued this for a few moments before they separate a small frown marring the woman's face as Nox stepped away, already feeling as if the distance he made was too far from her, the warmth of his body leaving her as she felt a sense of cold wash over her. Nox shrugged off his robe and tossed it to the side, leaving him wearing a pair of black knee-length pants, he began to walk to the ramp once more before stopping and looking over his left shoulder. When I say you can do anything. I mean anything, this world is sparsely monitored, but there is a large prison under the Republic's jurisdiction, security is reportedly a joke and most inhabitants are. Well nobody would miss them Knox informed the woman, feeling her mood raise significantly before he continued onwards down the ramp. I will depart immediately to perform your tasks, is there a time frame you need this completed by Scorpio asked as Knox passed by her on his way to the nearest vent, falling in tow as the man's hair billowed in the air current picked up. I may be gone for some days, say a week before you must return to the ship, also if there is a security breach of any kind. I expect you to subdue any issues that may arise Knox stopped in front of the crack in the surface. As you wish Scorpio stepped back as her exoskeleton broke apart, hundreds of thousands of microscopic nanodroids beginning to ascend into the atmosphere in a black cloud of metal, heading northwards towards the nearest colony. Knox could feel Valen watching him, in turn sending comforting waves of energy towards the woman who soaked in what he sent her way. Looking down into the hole that dove deep down into the surface, Knox activated his force sight as the obscuring cloud of rising toxins became see-through. The entity stepped over into the vent, simply dropping down into the darkness as the heat from the vent passed by the man harmlessly. He landed on an outcrop of rock, the stone cracking as he landed on its flimsy surface. Quickly he into its edge, looking towards another outcrop hundreds of meters below, once more dropping over the ledge and towards his second target. He continued this process several times, dropping kilometers at a time in some leaps as passing well below the deepest depths mined by locals as he was surrounded by darkness, no light reached where he was, the sediment of the vents now so heavy it was akin to wading through waist-deep sand. Landing on one last outcrop, the entity could see that the vent opened up into a colloidal cavern below, no doubt the empty magma chamber of a long-dead volcano. But deep down below that, Knox could see another opening, dropping down into the surface with an unimpeded drop that descended down until it opened up exactly where he wished to be. With that thought, Knox stepped over the ledge, ending up into a free fall maneuvering himself as he aimed for the opening vent of the magma chamber. A sick smile opened up on the man's face as he dropped into the darkness, a cackle rising from him as he narrowed himself, flattening his hands against his side before diving into the vent. Disappearing from the sight is an energy slider that lived within the chamber, the only thing signifying the man's presence was the shifting trail of sediment that showed clearly where he had passed. Elsewhere on Kessel, Cassandra Settlement. Wearing a simple set of grey armor, having foregone her regular clothing, Valen walked through the settlement with analytical eyes. Her face looked relaxed and inviting, her stance appeared open and unprepared whilst her usual molten eyes were sky blue. Her almost mythical beauty drew the attention of many around her, both important individuals and their property looked her way as her brown hair was braided and ran down the front of her chest until the end of the braid settled over the armor covering her fight breast. On her right hip was an MK2 blaster pistol made within the armories of Zakul specifically for her to use in undercover missions, and hidden under the backpack hanging onto her shoulders was her lightsaber in case she needed it. She puckered her lips slightly as she walked passing by a Republic officer as the man cast a look in her direction as she passed. Looking to some of the more shady individuals within the walkway, she approached one of the men, 
a zabrak male of brown color and a small ring of horns on his head. Excuse me Valen sauntered up to the man obviously in command of the crew of aliens around him. The zabrak looked to her as she approached, eyes passing over her fair skin as he looked her up and down. Despite all the visible vulnerabilities the woman showed, his base survival instincts screamed at him, the micro hairs on his body standing on end under her gaze, he shivered lightly at the dead pale look of her eyes. To simply walk through such a cesspool as Kessel, you either had to be crazy or formidable, perhaps even both, and he was betting she was a mix of both. What can I do for you, ma'am he nervously asked, watching as her eyes pinched slightly before a disarming smile came to her face. I'm looking for some, organic wares, perhaps you can point me in the right direction her fingers snaked out and danced across his chest armor, much to the Zabrak's hidden alarm as well as he wasn't sure if she realized of not, but he could feel the armor bend and warped under her touch, leaving small grooves in its surface as her fingers raked across its steel surface. Gulping, knowing exactly what she wished, the Zabrak looked towards the branching street to the right. You'll want to take a right down there ma'am, halfway down that street you'll see a Rodian named Seed, he's the one you want to talk to the Zabrak told the intimidating woman. Her hand fell to her side as she squinted up at the stocky Zabruk, a tisk escaping her lips before she simply went in the direction he left in. Slumping as she left, his second in command came up to him with a raised eyebrow. What was that about the man asked as the Zabruk turned to watch the woman disappear into the crowds. Gather our things and our guys, we're leaving, now the man ordered before storming off to his ship located on the outskirts of the town. The mines. The black metallic cloud of metal slammed into the ground 500 meters from the nearest individual, the metal cratering the ground before the metal shroud coalesced together as they came together to form Scorpio's form. Stalking out of the falling debris cloud, the droid observed the mine up ahead with her photoreceptors. Cloaking herself the droid began to shimmer and shift, disappearing into thin air as she waltzed towards the mine. Stopping in front of the entrance, the droid scaled the overlooking tower with a sentry guard looking out towards the distance with his blaster in his grip. Silently, with the grace of a cat, the droid maneuvered herself, flipping over the railing in an unnatural show of agility, the balls of her metallic heels connecting with the floor of the wall's walkway. Remaining crouched down, she observed the less than ideal situation going on behind the Republic's back. Slaves moved crates of spice from within the opening of the mine making sure they were sealed shut so they didn't react to the sunlight, stored and stacked under a tarp kept up by four mounted poles. Using her agility, the droid leaned forward, form shimmering slightly before she pounced, sprinting at inhuman speeds into the mine, weaving and passing by the unprepared slaves that wouldn't have cared regardless. Swallowed by the mouth of the cave, Scorpio leapt, rotating in the air before her limbs dug into the roof of the tunnel, she immediately began scurrying across the roof deeper into the cave, passing overhead of the unsuspecting slaves silently akin to a shadow. Following the largest trail of slaves, Scorpio soon appeared in an open cavern, it spanned an impressive distance as towers were erected to assist in the mining operations, tubes fed from the surface provided both limited amounts of oxygen and supplies to continue unimpeded. In the center of the cavern was a towering crystalline tower of lime color, her scanners depicted the tower descended hundreds if not thousands of meters deeper down into the planet. Vents of superheated air occasionally burst from around, sometimes killing a slave that was unfortunate enough to be caught in the offshoot. Covertly, the droid approached an exposed vein of spice jutting from the wall, nearby slaves beginning to place equipment around the vein to begin mining. Producing a small tube from within her constantly shifting metallic body, Scorpio's five fingers split in half into ten as they dug into the surface of the high reactive mineral, she managed to remove a sliver of the mineral, removing the cap off of the tube before sliding it into and resealing the tube. Placing the tube back within her chassis, the droid slunk back deeper out of the potential prying eyes of the guards and slaves. Standing to full height, the droid analyzed the offshoring tunnels from the central chamber, deciding to continue on with the next part of her given mission, the droid chose a less populated tunnel to delve into, sprinting full speed towards the dark tunnel that dove deeper, and with a Herculean leap,
cleared the traffic of slaves and landed in front of its unlit mouth, entering without a care in the world as she began her search. With Knox slamming into the button of the chute with the force of a comet, the area around Knox shook and shuddered, crystalline structures falling from the roof only to be obliterated by the own collision with the ground, breaking away like glass as the structures splintered and broke. Rising from his crouch completely undamaged, Knox's eyes flashed in all directions rapidly as he took in all around him. A single statue sat against the northern wall of the cavern, half destroyed by the whims of time, from its open stone mouth, an eternal scream visible on its sculpted features. Lime green glowing ooze dropping from the left side of the statue's mouth, dropping down from the statue to pool in a moat of the same liquid, obviously having been building for hundreds if not thousands of years. The rest of the statue looked little better, having only one of its two arms remaining, extended to its side with its hand facing what would have been upwards had to statue not fallen. Its fingers were long with two extra digits than it should have had and tipped with claws, at the center of the statue's chest was what was depicted to be a red gem held in place by a chain hooked around the statue's neck. Approaching the statue, Knox stood just beyond the surface of the obviously volatile pool of liquid. So that's what you appeared as in their dreams hey, beast Knox mused out loud as he looked directly at the unseeing eyes of the statue. Feeling around the cavern, he could feel that this was the location for the highest concentration of the planet's seeming life force, like a flowing ocean it attempted to sit on his shoulders and push him down, crying for his servitude to whatever it once was. He resisted however, standing tall as he breathed in the toxic air. His unmarred skin beginning to sizzle and shift, the hidden runes he had grafted onto his skin long ago flashed a bright indigo color. It was as if someone had pulled the plug out of a bathtub, the black, viscous atmosphere around him began to twist, slowly rotating around his standing body before picking up speed. Sound began to pick up, blasting, cracking winds tore throughout the cavern, another much like the sound of flowing water sounded from around him. It didn't take long for a whirlpool formed around Knox, the energy around him being violently sucked into his body at a rate far faster than it was produced. Whilst this occurred around him, Knox knelt onto his knees, crossing his legs, placing his hands onto his knees, Knox breathed out a long breath, consciously bridging and fortifying the connection he had to the cosmic force. Snapping forward, Knox blasted his consciousness from his body straight into the waiting clutches of chaos. Chaos. The shifting orange tint of the eternal sands of chaos blew heavily into his face. The swirling black, red, white, and blue energies that made up his form swirled around him and broke off into rising wisps of energy that bled into and disappeared into the atmosphere. Open immediately before him, the familiar descending path obscured by unnatural darkness, the kneeling statues the same as they had ever been, the whispers rising from within the crack of chaos didn't deter Knox in the slightest, simply making him smirk. Walking forward, Knox entered the crack in chaos, arms crossed behind his back, head held high, the entity marched into the dark. The consistent heartbeat of his adversary shook the tunnel he walked, the mural on either sides of the wall remained the same a gusts of wind attempted to shoot him back out of the black tunnel. Familiar lime snaking wisps of energy twisted and turned from deeper down in chaos. Knox ran the fingers of his left hand through the snaking wisps, watching as it shifted and parted around his fingers. Once more, Knox soon stood at the end of the corridor, looking down into the ethereal swirling vibrant green whirlpool that worked as the doorway to the realm below. Instead of dropping down, Knox stepped forward finding purchase on what appeared to be nothing but platform of energy he absent-mindedly created through the energies of the force around him. He walked down the invisible steps one at a time before he stood on the precipice of the doorway. Staring down into the gaping maw of shadow, Knox sighed, dropping into the doorway whilst holding his breath. Realm of Typhogem, Lower Levels of Chaos Starless Void lay open before him endless in size as its lone resident almost immediately recognized his presence. Its glowing red eyes found him as its towering size turned to face him, still larger than the planets he used to smash in his battles, Typhogem's rage rose to hide it hadn't felt in eons. Hello Shade, it's been some time Nox's mocking tone carried throughout the void. 
His answer was the terrible, world-breaking scream of hate that escaped from the tentacled maw of Typho Gem. The shockwave washed over Nox, causing his form to waver slightly but was altogether harmless. Nox's gaze caught the sight of Typho Gem's right arm, or lack thereof. Everything from the elbow down was missing, a skeletal arm had begun to manifest where the arm used to be, but was thin, had no muscle and looked as if a relatively strong wind could tear it from its larger body. That's not looking too good, not the same as it once was hey. Well, unfortunately for you. I'm here for the rest Nox's black eyes squinted as his featureless form shook and shivered. Typho Gem in turn began with the opening attack, his left hand spurred into action with a blast of planet-rending lightning. The bolts of hatred cleared the unfathomable distance between the two in moments. Nox's form blurred as he was about to be hit his humanoid form contorting and flying through the air at blistering speeds, the lightning arcs slowing to a crawl as he flew beside their superheated arcs. With each bolt being larger than he himself was, Nox sped between each colloidal arc. It appeared Typho Gem was not as inept as Nox thought as its eyes tracked his movements, and in a show of speed the belied its size, created distance between itself and the entity that had taken its arm. A small grunt escaped Nox as Typho Gem was once more at the same previous distance he was previously, the lightning now behind Nox continuing onwards unimpeded before fizzling out in the far distance. The intelligent red orbs of Typho analyzed Nox intently. It stilled momentarily before the force answered its call. Finally, we battle Nox smiled as countless warping holes of swirling darkness appeared, tentacle tendrils of dark green ooze burst from the gates, barbed claws on the end of each tentacle, lightning arced between each tentacle as they came from all directions, speeding towards Nox. Nox watched each tendril spur towards him, hundreds of thousands of each individual appendage wanting nothing more than to bury in his flesh, pulling him apart until nothing remained. He spied no hole he could pass through that was covered in some way, the impenetrable wall of death coming closer with each given second. His smile quickly developed into a frown on his humanoid featureless face. He wasn't a cross however, simply pleased with Typho Gem's apparent acknowledgement of the danger he posed. It was this thought that passed through his head as something within him shifted, as if the locks of a vault were disengaged with the vault door being flung open wide. Typho Gem watched with burning eyes, the endless mass of portals encircling his enemy lunged their attacks, attempting to skewer the being before him. The appendages neared the being at the center. But Typho Gem wasn't fooled, he could perceive the shift, the resounding shockwaves billowing from Nox's form, energy-constructed body growing unstable. Typho Gem could see everything occurring as if it was right before his eyes, below the man's eyes, four slits bled into existence in trails of black. In horizontal rows, the six eyes exploded open, violet eyes of glowing power. It was this same moment that Nox's body exploded. A white dome of energy erupting from his body, the tentacles disintegrated up and touching the dome, reduced to nothingness as the dome washed over each one. Do you know how liberating it is to cast off the binding flesh that restrains my power? To manifest myself at my truest? No. I guess you wouldn't Nox's new form towered over the previous humanoid shape he had after all you've never had to pretend to be weak to wear the face of a smiling man that has the best intentions, to mingle with the lower life forms just to remain hidden between them, no, you would never understand. Six arms sprouted from his shoulder blades, three on each side of his body, these arms were similar to a human's in overall shape and the amount of joints they had, his hands however were a different story, seven fingers on each hand, ending with sharp claws capable of tearing flesh from anything. His legs were tense with muscle that coiled, ready to spring into action. Produced and jutting out of his spine, an innumerable amount of unnaturally elongated arms hung from his back, they dwarfed his body in sheer size, taunt and tight as the pale flesh cling to each one. One could see the bones underneath, the muscle clinging tight to each appendage. All along the length of each arm were joints at regular intervals, allow universal movement in any direction, and at the end of each arm were the same severn fingered hands that accompanied his regular arms. Gumless lips with serrated teeth ground together as the form of Nox straightened out, 
black hair clung to the top of his head trailing behind his head, his six eyes staring at Typho Gem. Staring at his arms, Nox clenched the hand of his first right hand into a fist before returning his gaze to Typho Gem. It's incomplete, but enough Typho Gem apparently wasn't too keen on seeing what this, new form of Nox was capable of, calling the full power he had to bear as reality warped to his whims. Orbs of crimson energy blasted from Typho Gem's chest where the Gem of Fury was one housed. Spreading out behind him, the thousands of arms straightened behind him like a halo. Some flew forward, elongating as they grew further in length, meeting the first of Typho Gem's orbs head on, one by one the hands clasped the face of the orb. They pushed the first orb out of Nox's way as he began to fly forward, growing more accustomed to using his different arms. He careened out of the way of the second and third orb, his arms trailing behind him like a coat trail, following his movements. Despite being over a hundred meters in overall height, Typho Gem was still insurmountably larger than he was, he still housed a world-breaking amount of power, and despite Nox dodging out of the way of the two orbs, Typho Gem still had innumerable ways of attacking. This was Typho Gem's realm, and despite being a shade, could continue to learn and refine his ability. So when a ring of asteroids appeared around Typho Gem, Nox's eyes widened for only a moment before narrowing. A flick of the celestial beast's remaining hand chased the ring of asteroids to begin flying in Nox's direction, it didn't matter if they impacted each other, turning each one to dust as the debris would continue on its course. Continuing to fly towards his target that slowly grew in size as the distance closed, two of his first six hands began shrouded in a red haze. His hands coming close together, white light appearing within his fists. He met the asteroids head-on as his two red encased hands were flung in front of him, twin beams of bright, white and crimson burned from his palms, feeding from two small vortexes in his palm. The superheated jets collided with the asteroids, searing through their surfaces, splitting them in half or outright causing them to explode under the power they were subjected to. A line of explosions obscured both opponents from each other, the shockwave passing over both harmlessly. Preparing himself for the inevitable collision he would have with his opponent a lance of energy appeared in Typho Gem's left hand, his reality bending abilities coming into play as six miniature stars were formed up above his head, their gravity causing them to elongate as they pulled on each other, they began to twist in comfort before circling around each other in a ring of superheated plasma. As the explosive cloud finally evaporated, it appeared Typho Gem's opponent hadn't been idle either. In two of his six immediate arms were elongated blades of black energy, longer than his body was but no doubt dangerous as they cut through the very fabric of shadow that surrounded him. In the other four arms appeared to be four white balls the size of his palms. As if he were using his right arm, Typho Gem's nub wavered, the halo of stars overhead shifting before spinning at Nox. That's, new Nox thought, puckering his imaginary lips before flying to meet the charge head on. Using both dark shears in his hands, Nox spun with the first in his right hand, the blade elongating as he sliced, the shadow of the dark shear, normally susceptible to light, completely ignored the light projected from the incoming halo. The writhing shadows that made up the blade came in contact with the halo, a screeching noise announced their collision, the shadow blade bent and warped but remained strong as the halo and dark shear battled for dominance. It appeared Typho Gem wasn't content with letting Nox overpower his ring of stars, the beast flying to the opposite side of Nox, using his lance to strike out at Nox. Three of Nox's eyes remained pinned on Typho Gem, tracking his movements, Nox raised his other dark shear and forced it to connect with Typho's lance of red light. Despite being many times smaller than Typho Gem, Nox's strength did not fail him as he managed to divert Typho Gem's lance away from himself. With a snap, Nox's eyes widened as his dark shear began to crack, the light of the spinning halo slowly beginning to eat at the shadow blade. The danger Nox was in became worse as Typho Gem made a jabbing motion with his lance capable of splitting moons due to its size. ERM, no I don't think I'll be taking either of these head on from what Nox had seen, the warfare Typho Gem was most used to was with other celestials and entities, while such beings were indeed powerful, they never had to evolve, to truly learn, nothing stuck, thus when they battled, 
their patterns were more often than not predictable. This was one such moment, when survival of the other was not guaranteed, Knox was willing and able to do just about anything be needed, and with a mind as ultimately twisted as he was, there was nothing he wouldn't resort to. Thus, when he all but evaporated from in between Typhogem and the halo of stars, he obviously hadn't been expecting such a thing as his own attack collided with his shade form, his wail of pain tearing at the dimension around him as it at his stomach. Kessel Valen attempted to regain her balance as the entirety of Kessel shook, whole minds exploded as their produce became unstable. Countless lives were lost in the ensuing explosions that tore the ground and threw the sediment and rock into the atmosphere. Volcanoes exploded across the planet, ejecting mass amount of toxins and gases into the skies. The prison on world threatened to be swallowed up by the shifting of the continent around them but ultimately held. Another earthquake tore through the town of Cassandra, its inhabitants kneeling low in the ground with their hands raised overhead to stop anything from hitting them, people cowered in their homes, slavers hid as their slaves gathered around them. People attempted to get to their ships only to be knocked out of the sky due to the flying clouds of debris. Chaos Lances of light and blades of shadow shook Typhogem's void, flashes of energy announced the explosions as supernovae exploded around the two combatants. Their blades connected as the smaller knocks sped around Typhogem, blitzing the towering giant, flying at the beast's back in an attempt to slice off his wings, said wings beat at their owner's command, the resounding wave of energy tossing Nox away and into the distance. As the distance between them increased, two more miniature nova appeared at the center of eight of Nox's many arms before being blasted towards Typhogem. The beast, knowing just how damaging those attacks were, hurled his lance at the nova, the spinning blade impacted both at the same time, a flash of white announcing the beast's safety as the exploding dome expanded from the center point. Another lance sparked into existence in Typhogem's hand. The cephalopod being looked around as his opponent appeared to disappear from his immediate senses. The powerful force being's red orb snapped from side to side as it turned and twisted. You know, you house formidable power, I admit you may currently have a greater connection than I. But you lack a few vital components needed to win this duel. Imagination. Tenacity. The sheer need to win. You know as well as I that as long as you can imagine it, the force can do it. But you lack that component. And that is why, no matter what you do. I win Nox's voice rung around the titanic being, it looked around, in all directions for the one it battled. Far off in the infinite void it called home, it saw a spark of white, a small dot on the horizon. He had less than a second to prepare as the jet of plasma was then tearing at his body, searing into his abdomen before the white light of the beam burst from his back and continued onwards unimpeded. Did you know? Appearing in front of his head was none other than Knox, the tiny figure having a snug smile on his face as he cast a glance to the continuing jet of plasma that refused to dissipate. On instinct Typhogem made to create distance between the suddenly appeared entity, his error known immediately after as the searing pain of the beam of plasma cut through his stomach, his entire left portion threatened to separate from his bottom, barely kept together by the right half of his stomach as energy bled from the gaping wound. The current most destructive thing known to organics is the releasing beam of energy from a supermassive black hole, known as a quasar. There is nothing that can survive it. I once had a baster diced version of a quasar sent at me from my lover, had I not been so tied to the cosmic force. I wouldn't be here right now. That gave me an idea. I know exactly how a quasar is formed, so why not make a real one? Albeit it is far smaller, weaker than had I been able to form a proper one with sufficient energy. But instead I used the latent energies around me to form the basic requirements to form one. I'm afraid had I had time to make a fully formed and self-sustaining one. You would have died almost instantly Nox mocked. Typhogem, sensing the danger and foreseeing what came next, immediately turned tail and attempted to flee back into the void. You're free to go and lick your wounds, but not without me getting a little something for my efforts with a twist of his hand, the black hole currently releasing the quasar jet, began to twist and rotate. 
Typho Gem was halfway through dematerializing himself into the void when a pain unlike any other seared itself into his mind, he could feel the separation of his right wing from his body alongside the corresponding leg, the white quasar beam severing them from his larger body with next to no resistance. He didn't even have time to scream as the process of evaporating completed, fleeing off into the endless dark as he left a wing and leg to the entity who had no doubt once more claimed victory. Nox could feel the coalesced power of his new form begin to waver, Asai escaped him as he forcibly reverted back to his more humanoid shape of swirling red and blue energies. His control of the created quasar ceased, carefully watching the beam sustain itself for a while longer before Logan it began to waver and shift, growing unstable at its source as the black hole began to swallow itself. He ignored what remained of his final attack swallowing itself in favor of dragging the two now useless appendages of his enemy towards him through use of the force. With either one slowing to a stop within arm's reach of either side of his body. Reaching out, Nox clasped each appendage with his hands as the black viscous muscle that made up Typhogem's limbs were cold to the touch. Ethereal runes exactly the same as the ones on his real body flashed into existence on his immaterial form. The limbs began to contort and twist as they lost their forms, the energy that made this form swirling into Nox's palms, the process felt like hours but eventually he had absorbed the two celestial body parts, he could feel the energies that made up the limbs threatening to tear out of his form in an escape but he ruthlessly squashed the power down and began to process of fully converting and adding them to his base power. Whilst doing so he could feel his adversary's attention on him throughout the void. A mouth beginning to materialize on his ethereal body, he opened it in a smirk as white light shone within. I have taken all I need from you. But do not feel as if I won't come back and complete the process, it may not be today, tomorrow, or ten decades down the line as I have far more pressing matters to deal with, like a little Sith playing his games throughout the galaxy. But when my more important matters are complete, I will return, and I will devour you, so sleep demon. Sleep in your eternal nightmare, know that I will come and take what remains of you at any moment. And no, when I return, you will be all but powerless to stop me Nox's mad laugher reverberated throughout the void as he felt the demon's restlessness with one last high-pitched cackle, his form unraveled as he flung his consciousness back to his awaiting humanoid shell. Kessel. His hand shot up, ripples of force energy rising from around him to halt the process of the falling cavern around him. He reversed the process as the stalactite slowly ascended back into the previous position. The ocean of energy that flowed within previously long since gone and absorbed by Nox, having been the physical manifestation of Typhogem's energies remaining in the physical realm. Corbin, Kessel, the final is. Sessa Nox mused as he felt his control of his power was once more shot to heck. He would have to regain his previous masterful control once more due to the sudden boost in his base power, this why he hadn't let go of the cavern, maintaining it absent-mindedly would afford him the beginnings of his control exercises. His other hand reached out and twisted, taking great care as he bent the fabric of space in his palm. Leveling his palm out, three balls of a black metal sat atop his palm, their density so high that light bent around their surfaces much like a black hole would. With keeping the cavern around him, Nox split his attention to focus on all three balls in his palm, slowly they began to levitate in his palm, all three following a small circle as Nox scowled at the small metallic balls nearly crushing them as he adjusted just how much power he was putting into holding them suspended in the air above his palm. Luckily I have a week before returning Nox mused as he began to enter a meditative state to enhance the effect of regiment he was subjecting himself to. It would be a full seven days before he would open his eyes again. In the back of Nox's lab, the Zaquilan Emperor paced in front of a large apparatus, the apparatus itself fed oxygen, nutrients, and other substances into a single canister in its center. Around the canister was a 30 centimeter space around the canister that served as a sterile vacuum that separated the canister from the outside world. The canister itself was clear except for two silver metallic caps on either end. Inside the canister was clear if not slightly yellow in coloring. It was what was in the center of the canister that drew Nox's attention however. No bigger than the tip of his thumb, a single life form was being constructed within, 
microscopic wires fed into the life form to safely help its growth as the wires administered everything it needed to grow. A Shanox announced out loud as he paced around the apparatus. Yes my child the AI of the mother machine appeared at his side, staring at the incubation tube in front of them both. Are they ready Nox asked, the ancient AI nodding her rickety head, her hands raising as the instruments around the room moved to pick up three separate canisters from their storage containers in the right hand corner of the room. A mechanical arm lowered from the ceiling of the vacuum chamber, sanitized and safe. The cap of the canister was removed by a second arm as the metallic limb lowered into the vat of liquid. Begin germline engineering process Knox ordered, on either side of him appeared four large screens, two showing real-time live feeds from within the canister, the other showing an analysis of the process about to commence. Begin installation of T. Medrias pure blood DNA sample a shat did exactly as ordered. One of the canisters brought from cold storage was inserted into the apparatus. The liquid within the canister promptly moved along a series of tubing that isolated the cells from the liquid. Eventually the cells were introduced to the developing embryo through the mechanical limb, the mechanical limb directly altering the artificial life form as it did so. Knox moved his attention from the canister to look to his right, watching one of the screens before him as he watched the process of the introduction of the foreign DNA structure. A small satisfied smile came to his face as he watched the modified cell duplicate, those two duplicating twice over and before long, hundreds of the newly developed artificial cells continued to develop. Implementation is a success as Sha announced, Knox nodding in reply it appears to have sufficiently integrated with the already introduced artificial cellular structures. Prepare for the implementation of the transgenes, I don't want any defects Knox ordered squinting as the second stage began. Ashanox drew the A.I's attention as he stared at the growing life form within. My child the hologram of the AI approached, uncertainty clear on its features. I'm sending a series of instructions to you as we speak via neural interface. They are to be followed to the letter. Afterwards I want you to take our creation here, along with yourself, and I want you to be relocated onto a repurposed warship and sent to the deep core. You are to grow our creation until it is ready to awaken. I have sent a diagram of the exact specifications you are to mold it into, throughout this process you are to keep our creation unconscious throughout its entire growth until it reaches the age of 19. Upon reaching the lifespan of 19, you will have it put into cryo storage. Afterwards you will become inactive until I come to collect both of you. Do you understand Knox ordered the machine that slowly absorbed his words? My lord, whilst I am following your orders, am I permitted to conduct my own experiments as Sha asked, searching Nox's face as the being she considered her child considered her request. You may, however these subjects are to be kept away from your primary objective, and by no means are there to be any recreations of what we have done, understood Nox ordered, the AI nodded to his words, kneeling down before flickering away as the machine focused solely on its directive. Turning to leave the most secure section of the lab, Knox paused at the entryway before his words echoed around the chamber once more. Send me a list of what you require before your departure, they will be implemented into your vessel Knox finished, knowing the AI heard him, the entity walked through to the second part of the lab, two Bakta tanks of one very nearly recovered Myra Lucan Bar Senther, and her completely healed but unconscious Nadia Grell. Walking up to the Bakta tank, Knox reached up, bridging a connection to the unconscious woman's mind, closing his eyes as he dragged himself into his cortex of memory along with the Merolukan's cortex of memory. Cortex of memory. I don't think I'll ever get used to seeing him like this the melodic voice of the Merolukan spoke. Blind as she was, she could still perceive the kneeling trio of beings that represented Tenebris bound and brain-dead spirit. But it is no less than what he deserves Knox slowly opened his eyes, leaning back onto the throne that represented his dominion over his mind. I, see your point Letha sighed, turning away from the entity to stare out at the internal world before her. Stepping up from his throne, Knox walked forward at a slow and sedate pace, his footfalls silent as he came forward. Coming to a stop next to the Myra Lucan, the Zaquilan Emperor looked up in the unseeing woman's face. 
the scars she would forever bear both physically and spiritually were carved into her skin like twisted gauges. Under her right eye was a gash in her skin that carved across to the side of her lip. The growth of her hair was still sparse and left the damage to her head visible to anyone around her. Whilst her skull was no longer an angry red in color, it still appeared to be unhealthy pale, healed unevenly and blistered across the entirety of her skull. Here Knox drew the depressed Barsenthar's attention, pulling an ornate white and gold cloth from thin air. The importance of the cloth was not missed to the woman however, shakily she reached up and cupped the fabric in the emperor's hand. In his hand was the ornate cloth that covered her eyes up and her kind's practices. Pulling the cloth up to her head, the woman gently tied the sash around her head, taking comfort of the feeling it gave her as its silk touch licked against her scarred skin. Knox smiled slight, watching small tear tracks roll down from under the white cloth, the tracks of tears falling from under her chin and pooling on the stone underfoot. Come, let me take you to a more lively place Knox placed a gentle palm on the woman's shoulder, the terrain around them shifting as he manipulated his inner realm around them. The duo appeared within a lively forest eerily similar to that one would find on Typhon. Even the feel of the force within the vast forest was soothing, harmony, life, allowing the Myra Lucan to feel as if she were once more on home. Many wouldn't believe you could feel anything like this Letha spoke, gently plodding herself down against one of the towering trees, leaning back into its bark as the calls of native avians echoed throughout the tree lean but to be able to create something like this within yourself. Simply for my sake, you're a lot more complicated than what people believe, aren't you? A brunic. Sighing, Knox ran a hand through the black locks of hair atop his head, coming forward and placing himself down beside the woman. They weren't wrong with what they taught us you know. Knox spoke, allowing a glowing bug to land on his extended right pointer finger. Huletha asked, Knox allowing the bug to climb down from his finger before circling his palm. One's perspective plays an integral part in how their future is shaped. I am a master of the dark side, its manifestation, I am power incarnate, yet it wasn't enough. Knox began, watching the bug before it stopped, proceeding to fly away back into the underbrush. I have ignored the limit imposed app in myself, and passed it. And I am growing, yet everyone around me perceives what I am doing is wrong, yet who is to say what I am doing is wrong? I am unifying the galaxy, stamping out slavery, giving hope to the hopeless, feeding the hungry, mothers no longer have to kneel over their deceased child because they were worked to death, a father no longer has to rake his fingers bare of flesh and muscle down to the bone so his family can survive another night, I am single-handedly making our galaxy a greater place. Yet because I possess the power to bring ruin to the galaxy, I am in the wrong for trying to do what is right for the many rather than keep the high-class elite app in their pedestals, I want to raise the overall standard of living for all, yet because of my views and my way of doing it, which is working I might add. I am a monster, and I must be stopped Knox sneered as his face soured, the Myra Lucan feeling the passion that bubbled up from within the man's soul. And don't bother saying something like I haven't done anything remotely good, you saw with your own eyes the state Balmora and Terry's was in before I took power, and now that I am in power, they're thriving, cities have been rebuilt, children run and cheer in the streets while parents no longer have to keep them sheltered and instead can recline and relax. Yet because I don't come from the Senate or the Republic and follow differing religious views, I am an enemy of the Jedi. And because I do not crush the Republic for the naive views and give the remains of the galaxy to Asina, I am an enemy of the Empire. I stand one at the head of the most influential power in the galaxy, trying to fix the wrongs that both the Republic and Empire actively strive to make worse. And I'm the bad guy. Do you see what I'm getting at here? The Force is not an ally, slave, or transaction. The Force is a paradox it empowers and imprisons, it destroys, and unites. It binds the galaxy together and tears it apart. It has a will, but needs a commander. That was his lesson, and I, am its commander. Current time. She could feel the gaze of the honor guard as they watched her walk past, well aware that they did not trust her alone with their lord. 
Her eyes danced across the meter in a half-wide moat of water that sat on either sides of the eternal throne walkway and around the circular base ahead that housed the throne itself. Slowly she ascended the stairs to the throne, eyes tracing over Knox wearing his royal white armor, in turn, she could feel his eyes gazing over her, despite her lover having no pupils thus couldn't know exactly where he was looking, but she could feel where he was staring, the raising of the hairs on her neck, the instinctual terror were all telltale signs that one was currently under his intimidating gaze. I have some interesting news from the Senate Valen purred as she slunk herself over the man's lap, placing her knees on either side of his hips whilst she brought his head to her bosom. Oh, tell me, just what whispers have you been privy to Knox asked, his voice once more returning to its natural state. An assassination attempt on the Senate. 21 senators are now deceased Valen told her lover as the man's chest rose as he chuckled. Yes, an assassination attempt on Little Sheev, orchestrated by Grand Omega, and foiled by Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin Skywalker. You'd be interested to know that the Emergency Powers Act for Palpatine has gone through, because those pathetic spineless cowards in the Senate fear losing too much influence and they expect him to fix it, fools they're all but waiting for the Military Creation Act to be finished. Meanwhile Duco has made a council for his confederacy and I believe they are making plans for their armies. It's funny. How two can manipulate the events of the galaxy as a whole, yet still remain unaware of the eyes that watch their every move Knox replied to the woman who pouted slightly and palmed his chest with her right hand. That's cheating. How am I supposed to compete with you when it comes to information gathering?" Valen playfully complained as she flattened herself, molding her body against her lover's as she pressed her assets into his armor. Well why don't you try competing with Kenya or Scorpio, I have no doubt you'd be able to more than compete with them." Valen laughed at his words, her eyes tracking her right index finger as the black-tipped digit snaked across the dragon's head of his chest plate. What would be the fun in that, there's no challenge in any of that. Why not go for the top dog? Valen purred, her hand raising to the side of Nox's neck as she rose to peck him on the lips. I see your point, you certainly have your work cut out for you then. Nox smirked after Valen pulled her head back, her eyes squinting in a challenging gaze. You just watch me, I'll be better at it than you in no time. Valen playfully retorted, a huff escaping the woman before she laid her head on his shoulder, a small hum soon rising from her throat as she fell into a state of comfort. Seeing that she wasn't going to budge any time soon, Knox closed his eyes, a deep breath raising his chest before he blew said breath out, furthering himself within the cosmic force as he looked to the larger galaxy to feel, to search and learn. Almost instantly his face twisted, contorting as a troubled expression rose over him. Guard my body was all Knox ordered of Valen and everyone within, the man quickly ejecting himself from his mortal shell. He rose from the throne a specter, unseen to any who didn't have a strong connection to the cosmic force, his body made of the swirling red black, blue and white of the force. I'll return shortly his voice sounded echoed, hundreds of voices molding together into a single mouth. He disintegrated into a cloud of purple, swirling together into itself like a black hole before disappearing entirely. With the Jedi. Not exactly Belazura Dara commented as she stuffed her thermal cape into her survival pack. I've seen worse Ferris said I hope. Though for all intents and purposes, the subtle creep of static electricity down his spine, whispers they all refused to acknowledge, the sickeningly sweet call that both called to and pushed them away unnerved them all. Ferris may have meant it as a joke, but Anakin took it as a challenge, took it as Ferris trying to show off and so he felt incentive to win the challenge only he perceived. We all have Anakin pointed out, half snubbing the other apprentice. I don't think so true mumbled I say we've finally made it to the worst the galaxy has to offer he said happily, winding one flexible arm around his back to fasten the strap of his survival pack. As a Teven, True could bend his arms backwards or at off angles to do whatever he wished, it was one of the many things that mad who's such an accomplished fighter. I don't think you'll be finding any Turata strips here the blonde Dara teased true I have a feeling we'll be eating food capsules, wouldn't trust the food anyone gave us here. I never get the good planets true whined, his face contorting comically as he expressed his feelings. We've come a long way from the galactic games, 
that's for certain Ferris mumbled remember how nervous we were on our early missions. Sure true replied I still am he looked out Adreshdi, the humor draining from his face especially here. What about you, Ferris Anakin asked as he bent down to tighten a strap he didn't need to tighten nervous or is that not allowed for a Jedi Knight? I'm not a Jedi Knight yet Ferris replied, decidedly ignoring the face Anakin made with his back turned away. But you're closer than any of us Anakin straightened to his full height does that make you any more nervous, or less, I mean, let's face it. The council's eyes are on you. The other Padawan frowned, though he picked up on Anakin's taunt he tried not to reply I'm not thinking on that, I'm thinking of the mission. We're all thinking of the mission Anakin Dara tried to intervene. Of course, we all want to capture Omega True said, eyes warning Anakin to back off. But Ferris wanted to be the one to do it, I'll bet Anakin said, the sudden backing of Ferris annoying him slightly once you start impressing the council, you have to keep doing it. It doesn't matter who does it Ferris replied just that it gets done. Spoken like a true Jedi Knight Anakin said, smirking slightly. At this, Ferris flushed red what are you trying to say Anakin? Anakin. Dara began warningly, however she was turned away from the augment, the coloring of her face draining slightly as she stared directly into the eyes of a see-through figure. The woman, garbed in white stood directly behind them, dried tear tracks covered her cheeks as mascara looked blotched and messy. In her chest was a gaping hole, see-through to both sides. The woman was staring directly at Anakin with a sad gaze, and as if she felt Dara's own gaze, her eyes slowly fluttered to Dara's. Blue. Dara stammered, the woman, despite being dead, had the most entrancing blue eyes the girl had ever seen, deep pools of deep ocean blue that drew her in, gave her a sense of comfort so unlike the rest of the world they were on that Dara couldn't help but bask in its wake. The woman stepped clear through Anakin, three quick strides and she appeared directly in front of Dara, her gaze pinning the girl. Slowly the beautiful figure went to one knee, her brown hair fluttering in the non-existent winds of the city. You can see me a melodic voice spoke from within the woman's supple lips, calming, soothing in its feel. Yes. The blonde girl replied, almost in a trance-like state as the other Padawans completely ignored the usual joking girl. That's a serious charge and an untrue one Ferris spoke in the background, almost distant as Dara focused on the sad eyes of the woman in front of her. You've been close to death, haven't you? The woman accused, gentle fingers rising and cupping the blonde girl's cheek, the apparition looked up in her as her lips quivered, tears threatening to spill as feelings she hadn't quite dealt with yet rose up, threatening to spill over and into the real world. She was dragged to the real world as a hand landed on her shoulder, the concerned gaze of True looking soon her with knotted brows. Are you okay he asked, red flushing the girl's features as both Ferris and Anakin too looked at her. I'm fine. Why Dara asked, finally taking notice of the concerned look of the masters who had joined them how long was I standing there? You've been staring into space for like five minutes now Anakin answered as the girl sucked Ina. Breath, eyes flashing to where the apparition stood but no longer residing. Dara, if you're feel unwell you can stay on the ship if you wish her master Sora asked, coming forward, the female master put her hands on Dara's shoulders and made her look to her face. N, no I'm fine. I'll come Dara stammered out as she wiped the moisture from her face. If you're sure Sora looked like she wished to press the matter. I am Dara finished, once more catching the flowing hair of the apparition in the corner of her eyes but continued to look forward at her master rather than entertain whatever she had gained the attention of. Nox watched the group of Jedi depart from their ship and down into the city I'd Dreshdi. The form he had taken on a whim coming in handy whilst the brown hair of the apparition he appeared as blue around him feminine head. His kind gaze became neutral, eyes bleeding from vibrant blue to black. An inky swirl materialized at his side as energy bled from deep within him. Stepping out from the coalescing whirlwind of dark was the black-colored ghost of Aloysius Kallag, red glowing eyes peering from his countenance as he too watched the troop of Jedi walk away. Hide all evidence of our presence here, I'll remain at their sides, 
but I'd rather not take the chances of them running into an outpost of ours or one of our agents Knox ordered with his own voice, a stark contrast from the feminine voice that came from the supple lips of his. It will be done flesh of my flesh Aloysius promptly vanished into thin air, traveling hundred of miles in second towards the eternal empire stronghold on world. Obi-Wan looked up with unsure eyes, eyes dancing up and across the decrepit building the troop of Jedi found themselves in front of. What is it Master Anakin came up beside his master, his curious gaze staring up into his eyes. Teluron Thacker is a prosperous businessman Obi-Wan began why would he frequent such a place? You think it's a trap Anakin asked. I'm no sensing anything. But... Obi-Wan shook his head, raising his hand to his head and holding the bridge of his nose. The issue was the planet they were on dark malevolent waves continuously washed over the planet, buffeting everything it washed over in hatred, fear and anger. It was akin to swimming through a sea of evil, actively messing with their senses in almost every way. It could be a case of not wanting to be see with us Siri came up beside the duo pointing out her opinion one of us should go in first to check it out. I'll go Anakin and Ferris spoke at the same time, locking gazes with each other at the same time after their words left their mouths. I'll go the words rose from Regal. Striding forward to and walking through the rusted door without worry. No doubt the man's height and stature would cause any to be weary of crossing the man. The group waited for several moments, each second nagging at them worse than the last. And Dara, for every moment they waited, found it harder and harder to keep her gaze away from the flowing white apparition that followed them, her tear-stained face looking up in them with a saddened gaze that did nothing to dissuade the young girl of her nervousness. Before long the man's head peeked out through the rusted door, a smile on his face he's here, all clear. The group released a collective breath staggering through the doors almost impatiently. Apparently the uneven and rusted looks of the building scared away unwanted guests, easily seen as only one person sat within outside of the bartender himself. Holding a hand around a mug whilst his eyes darted uneasily around the room, seemingly waiting for the building to suddenly collapse around them. Teluron was a tall humanoid with pale skin, soft-looking skin similar to someone whom would spend a great deal of time inside. He gave a stiff nod to the new arrivals, drawing his red cape closer to himself at the same moment. Thank you for seeing us Obi-Wan opened the conversation with his greeting. The Jedi helped my home world of Ion Teluron replied I vowed to help whenever I could. How'd you find yourself in a place like this, Korriban I mean Siri asked, looking around with an unimpressed gaze. Luck I guess the man questioned groaned I ticked my boss off such a little thing but she was feisty. So I didn't check references and a deal went bad, what's a few million credits? Next thing you know, I get handed an open assignment to this crap hole the man shuddered as a chilling breeze washed over everyone present haven't slept a full night since. Obi-Wan took the whole story in, motioning to the bartender to bring in a round of drinks, thinking that within such a place it would be better to place an order didn't mean any of them would be drinking what they would be handed though. Silence reigned as they decided to wait for their drinks. And before long the bartender slammed their drinks onto the bench, the grog sloshing and splashing over their brims to pool at the base of the mugs. I wouldn't drink that crappy if I was you Teluron regarded the drinks with a distasteful side on sneer. Appreciated Siri sniffed the drink and quickly redrew herself from the sulfuric smelling drink what can you tell us about the two we're pursuing? Nothing much except they're here Teluron began a male and female were spotted, matching their exact descriptions. I checked up on every hotel and hovel but they didn't check in, nor did they register within anything that can pass for half a business. Doubt they'd use their real names Obi-Wan pointed out did you give descriptions? Well, I said a woman and man traveling together Teluron offhandedly replied as he stared at his mug. Isn't there some sort of database for arrivals and departures Obi-Wan asked. Nobody really gives enough of a freak to keep track Teluron replied in a clipped manner. Have you checked if there are any businesses here that cover for Omega's enterprises Obi-Wan asked. Honestly, nah Teluron replied but I'm not going to go out and step on too many people's toes, you don't ask too many questions on Corriban. Why Siri leant forward, raised eyebrow. He tried to hide it, 
but everybody noticed the uneasy look that passed throughout the man. That's the unanimous rule, everyone just knows it, something happens here you keep your mouth shut, the way it's always been. Obi-Wan and Siri passed a glossé towards each other, both realizing that Teluron wasn't going to be very helpful in their search. Something was wrong with the man, either fearful of the city or something else, but it was keeping his mouth shut. I should warn you though, you know the Commerce Guild has its own army, well they have a division here Thacker informed the group they say it's out of necessity, to protect their business. But they have their droids everywhere. If Omega and Zan have any contacts in the Commerce Guild, they most likely have eyes everywhere. That was probably the most useful piece of information they had received yet, Obi-Wan however wasn't keen on leaving yet, he needed more information before being satisfied enough to leave. Zan Arbor has expensive tastes he leant forward she probably not too thrilled to be here, doesn't seem to be much luxury in Dreshdi. It's a steaming pile of crappy Teluron agreed wholeheartedly. But they're still business executives, used to having the best of everything Obi-Wan said there must be something for them, if you're looking for, special items, there must be somewhere to go. There's a uh, well loose kind of black market here Thacker replied run by thieves of course, supplies are low, no stored and it's hard to find essentials like blankets and thermal capes even though this crap freezes your bones in the middle of the night. They rob what they can whenever they have the chance, no hotel room is safe, they even rob ships several times a week if they get the chance, heck not even the commerce guild is safe. So how do we get there Obi-Wan questioned. It's on the outskirts, near the plaza ruins. Though that is if you can tell the ruins from regular buildings here, everything's in the same state Teluron answered quickly I'll give you the coordinates, you want something go at dusk. Look for Oben. She's the best of a bad lot, she won't cheat ya and she knows everything that's going on. I even bought a few things from her myself. But watch out the the Commerce Guild, they're real jumpy and looking to lay the thieves low at the earliest chance. The Jedi each began to rise. One more thing Master Jedi Obi-Wan looked back at the man whom appeared to have more information. The Commerce Guild, Oben, and everyone else here have come to a sort of unsaid agreement. But if, something, anything happens, don't trust your eyes or ears. Slowly Obi-Wan lowered himself back down to the bar side, Siri and the other master sending each other uneasy looks. Why would we do that? I won't say too much, but keep your wits about you, watch your back, and don't tread on any more toes than you have to. There's strange happenings here as of late. The man seemed to freeze as another cold breeze washed in through the room, and in own fell swoop. The man drank the rest of his drink and swiftly departed the building with no further words, almost fleeing as soon as his foreboding words fled his mouth, fleeing like a bat out of heck like he would be mauled for simply passing the words. What do you think that meant? Siri asked, looking to where the man had all but sprinted from the building. Dunno, let's get to the market. Obi-Wan shrugged and moved to leave moments later, the rest of the Jedi following after him with questions rising within. Corbin's dusk lasted for hours, beginning mid-afternoon, the pale sun slowly descending over the horizon. But one wouldn't normally be able to tell, as the forever-present orang-tinted clouds hung over the sky like a veil, the little sunlight that filtered through, the darkening of the sky was the only telltale sign, the shadows elongated and came to life, reaching across the streets in an attempt to ensnare anyone that walked within. Apparently the locals had attempted to stop these clutching shadows, uneven lights installed along the roads, but this still left several long distances of deep, twisting darkness that twitched and moved though there was nothing within. Every time one of the Jedi entered the shadows, they couldn't help the subtle crawl and shiver that came up the bases of their spines. Dara, in her perpetual cold feeling, had actively moved closer to the following spirit, the ever-present creeping warmth that billowed form the white figure warmed her body, the cold chills abetted and fled her, not even the dark shadows wished to near the apparition, as the shadows sneered and fled her presence, thus Dara kept as near as she could in the darkening day of Corriban, even though the other appeared not to notice nor comment about the woman's presence, so she believed she was the only one able to see the woman, 
perhaps something to do with her connection with death as the spirit had asked. I have a suggestion Master Anakin announced as they all stood at the entrance to the market this Oben might feel threatened if she's approached by one person, more specifically a younger person. Obi-Wan seemed to hink it over for a few moments that's not a bad idea. We can't surround her, we'll definitely spook her Siri offered why don't you and Ferris go. You can say your brothers, say you've been stranded here, yes that sounds good Obi-Wan added on to Siri's words, the two seemingly agreeing. Anakin's brow twitched, the last thing he could possibly ever call the oath Ferris was his brother, a total snob yes, brother, never. But regardless, the two swallowed their misgivings for each other and entered the plaza, pillars rising high to hold up some sort of roof, behind these rows of pillars was a building, plenty places to hide which no doubt was one of the many reasons it was chosen for the illegal activities that went on within. Whatever you don't, don't reveal that you're Jedi. That's information that they can and will sell to anyone that looks interested, and we know Omega is expecting us but we don't want him to know we're already here Obi-Wan called out before the two Padawans vanished into the plaza. Silence reigned between the Anakin and Ferris duo, the tension between the two hadn't lessened in the slightest, in fact the sole reason Anakin had wanted to enter the plaza alone was to get a foot up on the search, to do better than Ferris, but knew, the masters were oh so wise that they had to send in another to babysit, and it had to be oh so perfect Ferris. The two walked in silence, they could see people skittering around in the darkness, dealing their stolen goods to whoever was fortunate or unfortunate enough to accept the deals. And as if luck was on their side, a young woman approached, wearing a tight-fitting grey tunic and leggings, her head had a grey cap that covered the sides and back of her head and snugly over her ears. She carried an enormous satchel on her back without strain. Looking for something friends she asked in a friendly manner. You open Anakin replied the woman's eyes dancing over them quickly after. Who's asking? Thacker sent us, said you have things for sale. I've got it or I can get it, what's you need? The woman seemed on edge but open to trade. Blankets and hand warmers Anakin proposed. She promptly dumped the satchel on the ground, reaching in and pulling out two hand warmers. As she did so two blasters became visible to the two Padawan's credits first. In reply Anakin held out his hands, the agreed amount of credits within to which she quickly snatched form his hand, tossing the two warmers at the soon after got no blankets today, but I've got a lead on some thermal capes, you can meet me here at the same time tomorrow and I'll have them. What's the price Ferris raised his voice, and the answer caused him to raise his eyebrows. I said they're plush, to quality. I'll have some other high-end things too she was quick to defend herself even if you don't want them, someone else will. You have a lot of customers Ferris asked, his gaze filtering over the empty place with an unimpressed look. Yep, I've got the whole spaceport as customers my friend Oben shrugged her satchel back into place on her shoulders. It was clear that she was about to take off, no doubt disappear into the night forevermore. Anakin spoke up. Our parents marooned us here. They said they'd be back, but it's been a few weeks but we. I don't care about your backstory, just your creds. We heard that a couple had passed by the spaceport recently Anakin continued on unimpeded a male and female, maybe. Oh Ben's eyes proceeded to harden I don't discuss my customers. But I use. Ever. Anakin knew right then and there he had reached a dead end. So you only find things and not people Ferris tried a different angle seems like there's not much difference to me. You need the skills, contacts, and discretion. The woman stopped in her tracks. What do you mean? It seems to me, for a price, you'd be willing to find just about anything Ferris pressed her with his hardened gaze. The woman hesitated, scanning over them with an appraising gaze, as if wondering how much they could pay. But she was unable to give an answer however, as an explosion tossed the tree from the feet and across a few meters before they were deposited on the ground in uneven heaps. Slowly sitting up, the thief looked around before her eyes widened at what she saw. Commerce Guild droids she grabbed them by their arms run. She promptly took off back to the blaster fire that no doubt prepared to snuff out her meager life, and so Anakin dashed after her, 
lightsaber igniting in hand as he burst into action. Time slowed, he could see the bolts of plasma about to strike her back steaming towards her from phalanx of the spider droids. He dashed and leapt, expertly deflected the blaster fire in any direction other than their intended targets. He twisted mid-air and landed up in a pillar before he leapt again, next landing next to Oben as he deflected more blaster fire. Who the heck are you Oben yelled out, ducking low as she managed to survive the onslaught for another second. Ferris dashed forward, covering their retreat, Anakin hustling Oben into a shelter in the dark as the three of them tried to calm their breathing. In doing so Oben looked towards their lightsabers where'd you get one of those? Peeking out, Ferris quickly returned they have tracking units, we gotta get out of here. We don't know which way Anakin turned to Oben. The woman let out a quick, frustrated breath okay okay seeing as you saved my life, I'll save yours, come on. She immediately proceeded to sneak through the shadows of the ruins, guiding them through twisting passageways and climbing through blasted out holes. Both Ferris and Anakin knew the rest of the Jedi group were following, their telltale signatures remaining strong. Despite the fading sounds of blaster fire, Anakin knew the army hadn't given up he could feel their presence too, heading through the city and towards the outskirts of the spaceport now. Orben led Anakin in and out into a series of narrow and winding streets, the streets narrowed into a single lane. The small hovels and buildings were spaced farther and farther apart the more they walked until they walked alone within a rocky landscape. The lane had long since dwindled into a stone and dirt path that wound across the land. Anakin mused they were most likely climbing the plateau that cradled the spaceport and Dreshti itself. Before long they scrambled over the last obstacle of boulders and saw their target. Anakin looked down in wonder at the ancient structure before them, drilled deep into the side of the mountainside in front of them that made almost two-thirds of the structure impenetrable. The entrance had long since crumbled to dust and charred pillars, toppled columns, and crumbling stone. A familiar, Stomach-churning sensation rose over Anakin, tremors of the dark side emanated from the ruins, shaking, whispering in the deepest recesses of his mind. He knew what this building was, one of the many ancient Sith monasteries located on the world and more than likely still haunted by its long-time deceased tenants. Is that where we're going? Ferris asked. Creepy isn't it, don't let it bother you though Oben soothed. Nobody lives here, everyone's afraid to come here except for me, we won't be followed, that's for sure. What was it Ferris asked, though Anakin himself was aware of this building's purpose, he knew dang well that Ferris was also aware. Just some old monastery, they blasted out the side of the mountain to make it, will you two hurry up it's going to get cold soon Oben started down the path to the monastery with hasty steps, winding through the treacherous terrain before them. Something once more rose within Anakin, Something he wasn't familiar with, a rarely felt but recognizable fear, deep warning telling him to steer clear of the building they were approaching. But something far deeper, more sinister beckoned the boy forward, he didn't know but it clawed at him, drew him nearer eagerly, and he all but kept his chin high as it quivered, and walked into the maw of the awaiting beast. Kalig watched the trio walk to the ancient monastery, beady red eyes peering at them unblinkingly from within the dark soulless eye sockets of his mask. His head slowly twisted to follow them as they walked the beaten path, and with an explosion of malevolent energies that erupted into a wave of blackness that dwarfed the dark energies of Korriban itself. Not even a second later, Aloysius appeared within the monastery, he glanced towards the direction of the other person already within. A rising screech tore from his mask, echoing through the narrow shadowed passages, passing through stone and across stale air. Answering his call, like ink, black splotches of dark life force piled together from the floors, walls, and ceiling. The long-deceased spirits quite literally crawling from the stone as they answered in their own twisted screeches. Their molten eyes stared at Aloysius, dragging themselves forward from the ground like zombies. The powerful spirit stared at them apathetically, his imposing presence demanding their servitude. The first if the newly appeared dead knelt before him, tongue waggling in its see-through jaw, eyes wild as it had yet to regain itself. The others followed suit, kneeling before him, and slowly but surely, the spirits became more aware, 
intelligence slowly bleeding into their unblinking eyes as Aloysius awaited the completion of their gathering. Lord! The first one to kneel asked, tongue twisting and winding, slinking out the side of his mouth as he spoke. I am Aloysius Kallig, herald to the true ruler of these lands, he demands those that trespass here in our catacombs do not come across any of our great secrets. They are unworthy and free of the taint that binds us here. They are not to come to harm, as he wishes to oversee their travels himself. Now. Go. Do his bidding his words spurred the phantoms into action, the spirits scattering at his command, phasing through doors and walls, ascending and descending as they did exactly as ordered. Hoarding their secrets and treasures, burying them deep into long-forgotten and untouched tunnels. Aloysius soon phased into a large chamber deep within the monastery, a tunnel dug beneath the ground that moved under the surface of the planet and to the great Sith temple at the Valley of the Dark Lords, no doubt an escape tunnel for a cowardly ruler. That will not do the first of the phantoms appeared at his side, carrying a jewel and tablet it had died with and no doubt held a great deal of sentimental value to the spirit, and held its teachings. Go. Take your things to the dark council chambers within the great temple and hide them there and return after, his majesty will collect them and make sure they are only uncovered by those that deserve your teachings the great general ordered. The listening spirits immediately speeding down the dark tunnel like dark wisps that blasted through any debris that blocked their path. Aloysius turned his back to the constant stream of spirits that came to and from the tunnel, staring up through the monastery towards the unwelcomed guests, the presence deeper within and the trio currently entering. He also made sure to keep track of the group of Jedi nearing the cliff away from the monastery with the presence of his descendant floating around them. Hmm those droids appear to be follow their tracks. Dara and True easily slipped through the crevice that served as the entrance to the monastery. Siri, Sora, and Obi-Wan followed. But due to the slim size of the crevice, it became more difficult to pass through the larger you were. Obi-Wan had the most trouble shimmying by, chest and back raking across the cold surface of the walls, rocks digging in and tearing at his robes. And when it came to Regal, the man wasn't able to go through the crevice outright due to his large stature. It would simply be an impossibility for the man to fit in the small crack. Go on ahead, I'll find another way in the man reasoned, head scanning the side of the ruin from left to right. I'll how with you master true made to go back through the entrance to not leave his beloved master alone. No, I'll catch up Regal affirmed before promptly disappearing towards an outcrop he had spotted. Seeing the winding darkness ahead, Obi-Wan wasn't first into the slinking shadows. He could feel the dread of the building, mounting up in his shoulders as a chilling weight that tried to force him to succumb to its influence. The only light that came into the passage was thin trails of light that looked akin to bony fingers dropping from the ceiling and walls. Footsteps echoed throughout, Obi-Wan wasn't entirely sure whether they were Anakin and Ferris or someone or something else's. Voices whispered in his ears, rising from deep within the shadows he swore were moving, but he kept his wits to himself, what really unsettled him however was when he turned a corner. The setting had suddenly shifted as he moved, a figure lay kneeling on the ground, begging and pleasing in a high-end furnished room, standing over the Sith student was his instructor, sick satisfaction shone clear on the instructor's face as a blinding flash of lightning struck the student. And as soon as the vision started, it faded back into uneven stone blocks into he floor, a skeleton half buried by a fallen walkway and thousand of years of dust caked up in the surface of the stone. The figures from the vision were long since gone, dead Obi-Wan suspected, yet the malevolent feel for the vision remained, reinforced by the rising shadows, whispers crying out towards the group that walked within. Obi-Wan could tell he wasn't the only one to see the vision, as Siri Tachi looked downright shaken, True shivered as he rubbed himself for comfort. But oddly enough, Dara seemed unfazed, either because it seemed she was focusing almost completely on something else, or she wasn't shivering at all. Obi-Wan was almost jealous, to be so resilient in such a twisted evil place. No, he was glad for the girl. Deeper down the hallway, Oben climbed over a collapsed pillar blocking the way motioning for Ferris and Anakin to follow her as they struggled to climb the unforgiving stone. They stopped outside of what looked like a small chamber, 
from its design and architecture it was most likely an enclosure, possibly a meeting room. Oben was evidently living here, Anakin mused, a storage place and a hideout. Bins lined the walls of the room, filled to the bin with assortments of scarp and valuable resources, stolen most likely Anakin thought. In the far corner of the room was a lone bedroll, cleanly kept, a canteen lay by its side obviously for if the woman got thirsty in her sleep. Next to those two items was a pile of boxes put together to form a crude table, a lamp lay on its surface. Oben leant over and lit the lamp, bathing the room in iridescent light, it seldom helped the feeling of the trio however as the shadows barely crept back, snaking and reaching for the lamp in an effort to snuff out the only source of light in the night. Turning to face Anakin and Ferris, Orben held her hands on her hips and a squint on her features. So who the heck are you really Oben accused, deciding to rest against the uneven wall? We already told you Anakin reaffirmed his introduction we're stranded. I think you're a Jedi Oben began never seen one of your kind, but I've heard of ya Oben looked over Anakin and Ferris again as the two didn't speak fine Jedi credits are as good as anyone else's I guess. If you wait here a while, the army will stop hunting and you can leave, but you're safe here until then, they won't enter this place. Do you live here alone? Ferris asked, changing the topic of conversation easily. Leaning towards the light, Oben basked in the little warmth of the lamp, and in that moment, they saw a moment of utter loneliness, agony flash in the woman's features, but as soon as it came it passed, her gaze hardening I live in many places, but yes. I'm alone here. But. I don't think I'm really. Sometimes I get spooked, I hear things, but I chalk it up to this place being so old, but I can't help but wander. Maybe we should look around for you Ferris asked make sure it's safe for you. I don't need your help oh Ben gently pet her blasters I got all the help I need right here, so now tell me. Are you really looking for a man and a woman, and don't tell me they're your parents? Yes. We're looking for a couple, Ferris confirmed, Anakin looked uncomfortable at the thought of answering the thief's questions. Do you think you can help us, Anakin asked, not wanting to give too much information to the woman. Crossing her arms, a playful smirk came to Oben's face if you're Jedi, you can make it worth my while right, I hear Jedi have a cast fortune. Who says that Ferris looked offended at the prospect of the Jedi hoarding credits? Hey it's just what they say or Ben held her arms up in a non-aggressive gesture. Well it's not true Anakin retorted but yes, we can make it worth your while, but it depends, do you know something? She opened he enough to answer when Anakin and Ferris perked up, an explosion rocked and shook through the catacombs, shaking the ceiling and knocking Anakin and Ferris to the ground. Behind the entrance to the chamber, the group of Jedi ducked for cover as slabs dropped form the roof attempting to snuff their lives out. Suddenly, the unmistakable clank of metallic footsteps echoed throughout the catacombs, growing in intensity as spider droids appeared, ready and in attack position. It appeared Orben had underestimated the effort the Commerce Guild was putting into snuffing out her operation, because their army had indeed entered the monastery and was hunting her down. Leaping to her feet the woman looked panicked they're coming through the main chamber, there's only one other way out follow me. Obi-Wan watched and waited until Oben walked to the wall and slammed her heel into its surface, a hidden passage flinging open that she hurriedly ushered herself through. Leaning down to Dara and True, he urged the two into the small chamber as Anakin and Ferris moved through the newly opened passage. You two, stay with Anakin and Ferris no matter what happens. We'll take care of the spider droids Obi-Wan gave them a gentle shove the two Padawans looking upset but accepting his orders as they slowly made their way through the hole in the wall. Turning back, Obi-Wan, Siri and Sora looked to each other, their hands flying to the hilts of their blades before they leapt into action, flying from the small chamber and out towards the main chamber, ready to engage the gathered army. Creeping through the hidden passages, Anakin made sure he never once lost sight of Oben, he knew the woman was keeping something from them, he just knew. She was the key to their whole search, he could feel it in his very bones, so he steeled himself for staying on her tail no matter what she did. Unfortunately for him, it seemed Ferris had the exact same hunch, 
because he could feel Ferris directly on his own tail just as he was following Oben, Ferris was following him. He could practically feel Ferris' breath on his neck. He tried to ignore this as Oben pushed forward, he took note that they were adjacent to the Great Hall. And despite the thick slabs of stone hiding them from the droids, he could hear the blaster fire clearly, the fast pinging of their barrels as they unloaded volleys of the ammo. Oben ignored all this, choosing to quicken her pace in a frantic effort to get as far away as possible. Where are we going Ferris whispered, barely loud enough for all three of them to hear. Just follow me Oben bit back in hurry. Taking a sudden turn, the passage opened up into a collapsed opening, stepping and jumping over stones and slabs until she entered the new chamber open for them. There was a whole system of secret passages through here. Guess the big monks didn't trust the others Oben thought out loud. Anakin agreed with her thinking, as much as he knew about the Sith, it was well known they had little to no trust for each other. As they kept moving, moisture began to pool along the walls, leaking and dropping down the uneven surfaces, Anakin guessed they were most likely within the mountainside now. As they kept going, Anakin quickly realized he had forgotten exactly which path they had tracked to get to this point, thinking he may have to make use of some kind of tracker to get back out. What I am about to show you isn't visible from above Oben relayed over her shoulder, pressing herself into a rusted door before pushing it open with all the force she could muster. Anakin followed her through the door before stopping cold in awe, before them was a large ship, definitely old by its state, clunky in build. Afterburner tanks were mounted to the back of the ship and were gargantuan in size. This was probably before sunlight travel was perfected Anakin came closer to the ship, his mind going crazy as he wanted nothing more than to pull apart the old vessel and see how it worked, the old technology could be so different from today's technology, the secrets it could hold. It's a service bay Anakin announced, looking towards the rusted and decaying parts surrounding the ship, tools still lay within toolboxes, half sticking out from the rusted openings we must be in a hangar. You got it Oben took his attention look. Anakin did so and couldn't help the widening of his eyes, the hangar was titanic in size, going on bar beyond the veil of shadows with pillars that rose high into the roof to hold up the ceiling. Wrecks of various ships lay decommissioned throughout the hangar, awaiting the repairs they would never receive, the smell for rust rose and assaulted their noses, the air was full and thick, full of memories they weren't privy to. Its huge ferris looked around you could dispatch an army from here. Yet, yeah, a lot of ships for monks Oben stated, ignorance of the true significance showing clear as day. The Sith were much more than monks Anakin told her as he snooped the large ship in front of him. So I've heard, the big bad original evil right Oben gestured to the hangar well they're all gone and dead now. All you know except for the two still running around and maybe more. Anakin thought to himself bitterly. So where's the exit? Ferris asked, sensing Anakin's quickly souring mood. The landing platform is completely blocked off, no way out through there, probably blasted to pieces by artillery long ago. But you can get out through some of the hangar bays. It's a bit of a climb down the mountain, but I say it's better than the army on our tails. Anakin stopped after hearing her reply, a rising presence he was long familiar with his stomach twisted and shifted against his will as the hair on the ends of his arms stood on end. He could feel the dark side of the force flooding the hangar like an invisible ocean above their heads. Anakin Ferris whispered. I know came his quick reply. Let's go, quietly they backed up, stepping back into the service bay, the shadow calming Anakin slightly as he felt his rapidly beating heart lower ever slow slightly. Oben seemed confused as she watched them with a raised eyebrow what is it? Something worse than the army Anakin whispered and it's coming this way. Two rows of droids greeted the Jedi in the main chamber, dwarf spider droids mixed with honing spider droids. Tracing lasers lanced from lenses atop the honing droids heads, scanning their surroundings as they searched for their intended targets. Standing behind the droids was an army of militarized locals dressed in plastoid armor. The whole assortment was more sophisticated than what was surely needed on such a world, making Obi-Wan's suspicion of the Commerce Guild Operation skyrocket. Blaster fire from the droids came quickly and accurately, 
the flash of Obi-Wan's and Ceres' blades answered the flying bolts of plasma, redirecting bolts away from themselves and into their surroundings. The two moves forward, their years spent together, fighting and learning together honed their ability to meld their fighting styles together. They too advanced, Ceres' maneuverability coming to it as she danced around blaster fire. Obi-Wan was the strategist of the two, setting her up for a chance to which she expertly capitalized on. He moved, she danced around and struck. They moved like phantoms, blurs of speed as their after images flew through the main chamber, cleaving through the army of spider droids without fault. Their ferocity took care of the first two lines of droids in moments, the two landing together back to back with their blades up and ready just as the third line stepped up for battle. Sora was known for her fighting prowess, as a combat instructor within the Jedi Temple, Obi-Wan took the chance to observe her technique, the fluidity of her movements. Each swipe of her lightsaber was true and calculated as she severed the head off a droid, a blaster in half or deflected an incoming bolt. With one savage strike, rendered five droids defunct with a single swipe, their heads dropped to the ground as she simply stared forward, smoke rising from the droids' decapitated bodies. Seeing the Jedi deal with the droids spurred the gathered militia into action, seeing that they weren't dealing with simple thieves, they mounted their weapons and opened fire on their Jedi, streams of blaster bolts filled the main chamber and hailed down Appen the Jedi. It was then that the third line of droids advanced, using the chance to mount an offensive whilst the Jedi were saving themselves. Obi-Wan began to sweat, whilst he could not see the chance of them being defeated, being struck by a plasma bolt was not something he wanted to deal with especially since they were hunting a rather resourceful target. It was this moment that the third party made its move, the Jedi, the gathered militia and the army of spider droids froze as a palpable pressure settled on their shoulders. The shadows of one of the connecting passages elongated to an impossible degree, countless arms crawling from the only darkness, dragging themselves from the darkness like nightmares given form. Their screams drew the attention of the droids as the registered the noises. Obi-Wan Siri and Sora shivered as the humanoid shapes stood tall, hunched over as ruby red eyes looked at everything within the chamber. The chill of the room intensified as clanking footsteps came from the other side of the chamber, stepping from the shadows was something Obi-Wan wasn't sure was dead or alive. Made out of pure coiling darkness that shrouded it from view, its red molten eyes scanned over the Jedi and everyone else present slowly. Seeing the apparent leader, the droids opened fire up in the figure, giving the answer to Obi-Wan's question in the negative as blaster fire simply passed through the spirit and hit the stone behind it. This was apparently the wrong move for the droids, as the spirit seemingly took offense to this as it raised his hand in a bald fist. They watched as the spider droids began to claw at the stone, digging into the storm as they whined and cried their forms beginning to dent and crumble, the steel of their bodies screaming, crumbling, and warping, and before long the entire droid army was a mangled mess of steel, dropping onto the ground into the scrap. The gathered Jedi each felt the collective fear they each held rise as the dead turned their attention to the masters. The militia froze see their blaster fire long since ceased as they paled several tones. They held their lightsabers forward, this seemed to apparently offend these dead figures as they shifted their stature lowering as they prepared to sweep and snuff out the lives of the organics present. They were halted however by the same one who crushed the droid army, a lone hand raising in a halting gesture that completely froze the prepared army. The creature drew their attention as its shoulders grew stiff, chest pumping out, head raising before blasting forward. What came out of its mouth was a scream that shook the temple, rocks dropped from the roof as the bestial yell shook their souls. Fear swelled up from within, crushing them as an instinctive terror froze them. When it ended, the intended warning was imposed. Yet we read you loud and clear Obi-Wan announced, motioning the Jedi with him to go back into the catacombs away from the spirits. Regal maneuvered himself in the shadows, steering clear of the spirits watching him as he followed his fellow Jedi. Khaled watched the Jedi leave, head slowly turning towards the army that had come to snuff out the thieves, and one by one, the militia thrust their blasters to the ground, turned tail and fled back into the sands of Corriban. 
A flick of his wrist caused the spirits to surge back throughout the catacombs of the temple towards the hidden passage under the monastery, once more flying under the continent towards the Korriban Academy where mounting shadows were arriving. All the while Kalig remained, staring down towards the hangar with squinted eyes, thus he proceeded to take a step in following the trail left by his ancestor, continuing in following his orders of protecting their secrets from the intruding Jedi figures. They heard the marching drums of the droids' footsteps, the clattering of the footsteps of the army apparently nearing drew panic from Ferris and Anakin. Stay here Ferris ushered Oben into the shadows of the service bay and hide. He ran back over to Anakin as the two looked around, the army they were searching for remained hidden for several moments before the reflective glint of their armor reflecting the little light that shone in. The two spotted maybe thirty to forty droids approaching as sweat looked on the bases of their necks. Wait Ferris squinted those aren't ordinary battle droids. They have reinforced armor Anakin swallowed hard and the control center is lower, you can't cut off their heads. There is too many of them Ferris began looking around the hangar we have to retreat. We can take em Anakin sneered, grabbing the hilt of his lightsaber before Ferris settled his hand on Anakin's shoulder. Anakin, there's no time to play hero. The two of us can't do it by ourselves Ferris tried to coerce Anakin's current thinking. That's your trouble Ferris Anakin shrugged off the boy's hand you're always looking at the odds. Ferris huffed as Anakin stepped forward through the shadows, of course the hothead went on to attack the army of approaching droids head on. And as such, both Anakin and Ferris knew that Ferris wouldn't leave him. We should attack them from above Ferris pointed out they won't be expecting that. How? Follow me Anakin gathered the force eye to his legs before leaping high onto a gigantic statue, landing on his knee gently. Clawing into the stone, he began to ascend higher. Looking over his shoulder, he could see Ferris was doing the same on another statue not so far off. And finally they were high above the floor, but even so the ceiling still towered high above them, stretching to disappear into a veil of darkness that was reminiscent of a starless sky. Balancing on the shoulders of the statue, Anakin looked down as the ranks of droids passed down below. Wait for the first wave then drop Anakin said then we can use our liquid cable launchers, the statues can cover and... I get it Ferris quieted the explanation as he tried to focus. They waited for several moments as the droids drew closer and closer, but it was as if luck was against them, as two shadows blasted into the hangar gaining the immediate attention of the droids. Ferris and Anakin sucked in a breath as they realized Dara and True had arrived and became the sole attention of the droids. They think we're down there Ferris blanched in horror. Both Jedi Padawans leapt from the statues into the air, they bounced from the cold stone of the statue and swung over the first line, their lightsaber sawing through the droids they cut through. Due to their quick thinking and unexpected angle, the droids were ill-prepared for the descending Jedi, taking out dozens in moments before the Jedi came to a landing. Seeing Anakin and Ferris, Dara, and True sprung into action, engaging the droids form their direction as they cut through the nearest of the ranks. Anakin steeled himself as he became drenched in his focus of battle, he lost focus for anything else even as he knew the chances of victory were slim. It he knew, that if he were to prove himself a true Jedi, such things were what he would have to do on a regular basis. He force pushed a droid, carrying it over and into another, crushing them together against each other's robust forms. He drew up in the force further, it was always something he and his sister could lord over everyone around them, their connection rivaled the greatest of the great, so when he drew it to himself, his senses sharpened, his actions became faster and strength greater. He continued to cut down any before him, the droids turned to scrap heaps within moments as he plowed through the lot. Even as he focused on the battle, he kept note of all the other Padawans around him, in battle all his misgivings with Ferris evaporated, in battle, they were simply Jedi, brothers at arms defending each other. But even as well as the Jedi were doing, something has to go wrong, such was the nature of Korriban as True's lightsaber flickered unevenly. Dara seeing his predicament, she moved to defend him even as the boy was struck by a blaster bolt. Anakin would have moved to do the same had he not spotted a flickering shadow out of the corner of his eye, a fleeing figure, ominous and flowing running away in the opposite direction. And making a moment's decision, 
he charged after his target. Watching Anakin rush away after some unseen enemy, Dara began to panic, standing over a fallen True, blade flashing in wild arcs as she, Ferris and True were soon surrounded by droids. Panic began to settle within her as her breaths became ragged, he movements became sluggish and she began to tire. The same could be said about Ferris as the night candidate slowed considerably. But their saving grace came in the form of the glistening white lady that had followed them, Dara's eyes widened at her arrival as like a gracious deity, spread her arms to the side as earth radiated from her body. Energy flooded the Jedi, the movements becoming foreign to them as they began to blur and speed with speeds they had not the ability to achieve. Dara flipped and contorted mid-air as her lightsaber left trails in the air, terrible wakes that severed the bodies of the silver droids around them like a terrible warrior had taken her body. The same could be said for Ferris as he was rejuvenated, his actions becoming a blur as he sped up further and further, a force push from him tearing through several of the droids, turning them to scrap instantaneously. Simultaneously, the two lost compete control as a ripple rose formed them, domes of energy erupted from them, blasting the rest of the surrounding droids to the ground or outright obliterating them on their surroundings. The gracious spirit lowered her hands, the brimming energy fled their bodies in the waking silence, the two Padawans beginning to huff and puff as weariness came over them. Dara collapsed to the ground, she couldn't help the utterly grateful gaze she sent at the woman who had helped them. Ferris neared, more than weary as he easily recognized he had nothing to do with what he had just done. What was that Ferris whispered, kneeling down and seeing to the unconscious true? The lady in white was all Dara said, Ferris didn't say anything else as he could still feel a remnant of the absolute power that had washed over him in their time of need. Who, or what is the lady in white? By the time the masters had arrived, Obi-Wan had rushed after Anakin and returned shortly after, dissatisfied with the apparent failure to capture the man. You all right Obi-Wan asked as he knelt down to True. Just a few bruises, Ferris fixed me up the boy smiled up to Obi-Wan as he flexed his body to show he was fine. I saw someone fleeing the side of the hangar, Obi-Wan is sure it was a Sith Anakin tried to explain the reason for abandoning the group. Well we're on Korriban after all Dara's tone was clipped as she sat not too far off from the others, to Anakin her tone differed from when they last spoke, as if she resented him for running from them. Our mission is to find and secure Grand Omega, you had things under control so I went after him Anakin stayed resolute in his stance. So you were sure we had things under control Ferris growled, wiping his hand on his tunic. That's what I said. True was wounded. I couldn't help him. Dara stood over him and battled against waves of droids alone. And we had things under control Ferris glared hard at Anakin. Well obviously I made the right call Anakin looked around at the scattered scrap of the deceased droids. And of course you were only thinking of the mission Ferris insinuated. Of course Anakin replied in a short tone, squinting at the other Padawan. But deep down he knew. The main reason he had chased after the Sith was to one-up Ferris, to win their bet, and admittedly, his thoughts of his friends were lost on him in the moment. Chancing a look to True, his friend looked pained and unhappy with his explanation, he hoped True would eventually understand why he did what he did, after all they were best friends right. The masters chose that moment to approach, appraising the droid scrap as they knelt down and picked up one of the pieces. These are the super battle droids we've been hearing about Sora announced a complete violation of Republic regulations. Wincing, Obi-Wan neared we're lucky to be standing, this could have ended so much worse. I think our next step is to trace the steps if the Sith, he most likely used the exit you used to get inside, Regal. That's why he blocked it I assume Regal supported. Or the landing pad is still operational Siri offered her opinion. It's buried Anakin shook his head. Maybe it just looks buried Siri replied. Let's ask Oben Anakin said she can at least show it to us. Standing he walked back to the bay Ferris had left her, and froze up and seeing her absence. She was hiding beside the cruiser, where could she have gone Sora said. I don't think she'd return to the monastery Ferris said she's terrified of the commerce guild. 
she must have snuck behind us when we were helping True and Ferris. Siri began to look around the chamber at where she could have gone. Most likely heading for the other exit, I think she might have gone in the same direction as the Sith, Ferris announced. This caused the Jedi to look at each other, the group promptly departed without further words, hurried footsteps moved them across the hangar, checking each service bay as they made doubly sure that Oben hadn't hid in any of these separate chambers. Finally they found the collapsed hall the Sith had escaped through, immediately using their lightsabers to clear a path, until they had a large enough hole to crawl through, and one by one they each passed through into the last bay that was hidden away. And inside this bay was a much newer ship, ramped down and obviously ready for immediate use. Did you see this when you came in Obi-Wan asked Regal, the man shaking his head. Must've came in after I left. As the Jedi came closer, they spotted a body on the ship's ramp, undoubtedly dead as her hair sprawled around her, itching what little she had been able to get, which just happened to be one of the thermal capes Anakin and Ferris had requested, and without a doubt. She was dead. With the Jedi currently tracking the Sith and Omega on world, Nox evaporated from his following of Dara and the others, shifting across Korriban to the Sith Academy Dark Council chambers. He came together like gathering ash atop his old throne, leaning back into the ancient cracked stone of his council seat, Nox rested his chin on the back of his right hand. Black eyes peering at the spirits ready to sweat themselves to his servitude. Kalig ascended the steps to stand at his side, his skull countenance peering at the spirits with disinterest. Approach one at a time Kalig's words echoed throughout the chamber, the temperature dropping considerably the more than darkness gathered. As the first of the newly gathered spirits approached and knelt, Nox listened to the words it spoke. Mind wandering as he mused over how long it would take for the Jedi to find Omega and the Sith in the Valley of Dark Lords not far away. Valley of the Dark Lords, hours later. The group of Jedi peered at the ruins around them, huddled together as they walked away from a group of recently dispatched Tukata. We'll have to search every tomb Sora announced. Oh, good Dara dryly commented. Anakin refused to look at either Ferris and True, having caught Ferris fixing True's malfunctioning weapon. It hurt him to think that True would go to Ferris for help, rather than asking Anakin considering he had already been working on the power cell. But if Ferris was doing it then there was no need to tell them what was wrong with it because obviously the perfect Padawan would already know. Your hurt Obi-Wan said as he looked over Anakin. It's nothing Anakin replied shortly, still very much annoyed. Anakin, this is only the beginning of the battle Obi-Wan stopped their progress let me take care of it. Quickly, almost embarrassed Anakin raised his arm, Obi-Wan quickly applying back ta to the wound on his arm, and as soon as it was applied, the burning sensation began to lessen. As they continued their walk, the group began to feel more and more uneasy as the valley around them began to contort, shadows twisted and grew, darkness roiled and awakened, brought from their slumber by their mere presence, trespassing on land that didn't belong to them. They are waking, Regal said. They know we're here, Siri agreed. Let's try the first tomb, Obi-Wan said. Anakin wanted to say something, somehow, some way, he knew that the individual they were searching for wasn't within. He hated the feeling rising within, a feeling of uncertainty, he hated it. He wanted to be sure, to know exactly what was happening, that was power. Stay together, Sora said. They entered the tomb, it was absolutely massive, two stone obelisks stood guard on either side, teeth bared at whoever was near claws ready rend the flesh of everyone about to enter. Anakin noted them to be Tukata. Walking forward, Obi-Wan pushed against the entrance to the building, the stone groaning and screaming under the pressure. It took longer than one would have thought but before long they were all walking inside, keeping close together, lightsabers at the ready, using them to light their path. The tombs ran deep and far into the dark stone depicting life-sized carved stone figures showing long dead Sith Lords. And with each step, the whispers grew deeper, growing in strength in their attempts to draw in all listening. Within the ears of all present, whispers promises that would never be full-filed, trying to pry them from the group in an attempt to gain power of everyone present. As they walked, the dark S grew in intensity, 
the light of their lightsabers passing on only for a few meters before being swallowed by the void. Suddenly a skeletal hand grabbed a hold of Sora, rising out of the dark corner in an attempt to main the Jedi, a snap hiss of a lightsaber split the skeleton in half. All at once, everything exploded into action, blaster fire exploded from all directions, energy nets attempted to bind everyone in place. Leaping into action, every moved forward, Obi-Wan proceeds Sora and Dara whilst True and Regal moved forward to deflect the blaster fire. Anakin, Ferris, and Siri did their best to disable the energy energy net binding them. As the energy net broke, a fireball erupted. From the rear of the tomb, swallowing everything in its path in an attempt to burn them all to a crisp. We have to get out of here. Obi-Wan shouted. Sora hauled Dara from the confines of the net, the group flying towards the door, and as soon as they reached its surface, trepidation overtooled them as they realized it was shut, with them trapped inside. With nowhere to go but up, they could feel the heat of the fireball as it neared, the group leapt up and high into the air as the fireball smashed into where they previously occupied. As they hung from the stone above, their situation became a whole lot more manageable when the fireball busted through the sealed door, allowing them freedom from the corridor they were confined within. Deeper within, the fire all stopped and exploded as it lost momentum, eating at stone, annihilating everything it came across for a good 10 meters in diameter. Quickly departing the tomb, the still smoldering crater of where the fireball landed was easily avoided, fire still burning of where it previously exploded. Are you all right? Sora asked. Dara nodded, still shaken by the sudden ordeal but more than willing to continue onwards. The group came to the unanimous decision, following that event, they couldn't well search all tombs and expect to make it out in one piece. Obi-Wan stood forward, he stretched his senses out on a whim, he could feel him, Omega deep within the ruins and tombs, knowing which direction he was in thanks to the unique bond they had between each other, not that Omega knew of this bond, Obi-Wan suspected. He turned. There. He pointed down the row. Xan Arbor and Omega are in there. They've gone to meet the Sith. And of course how they missed it was beyond them, for halfway up the valley was a littered trail of bloodied Tukata. Anakin couldn't help but agree, he too could feel that was the right direction, the Sith was out there, calling to him from that direction, he was near, he was waiting, and he was watching. They entered the tomb before them, it was far darker than the last, smelling of death and decay. Everything was ing apart from age, worn to the point it could crumble at a moment's notice. Buried within, stacked atop each other and within the walls were hundreds of bodies piled on top of each other. Once more rising their lightsabers as a source of light, their weapons made the murals on the walls visible to the group, drawn in red, the deeds of the great lords were shown before them, interestingly enough apart from the massacres, the worldwide bombings, others appears to be scratched out, and recently they might add within the last decade of two if the age of the scratches was anything to go by. Like something was trying to remove evidence of its existence. Sitting up beside him, causing Anakin to jump, one of the bodies wore the face of his mother. Annie, she called. Annie. Mother. It pained Anakin to see her in such a sorrowful state, the last he had heard she was living a comfortable life with a new husband, Kenya had said so, she wouldn't lie. Would she? Anakin. Obi-Wan's voice was sharp. It's a vision. Nothing more. Anakin shook his head, the risen body where his mother was now laid back down looking like a simple corpse. He grew red with embarrassment, the other looking at him with what looked like pity. Even Ferris, and that was something he hated more than all else, pity, from Ferris, no, this was unacceptable. It wasn't just him that experienced the visions however, everyone was experiencing something different, everyone was being shown something that either scared or terrified them. Once more Dara showed her fortitude, seemingly unaffected by the whole ordeal as she simply continued on. Many shadows once more rose to meet them, reaching out, screaming, clawing and biting, but no harm came, they continued through the swimming sea of darkness, they walked through the passage of hate, the whispers and taunts. The murals continued on, 
depicting creatures of Mawai different shapes and sizes, images of death and destruction followed in their wake. One of them sprung to life and flew at the group, screeching and trying to claw at them, True leapt to the floor but as the avian was up in them, it exploded into dust. He he True found his way to his feet, clutching at his lightsaber. Anakin glared at the weapon, the weapon whose right to modify had been stolen by Ferris, and no doubt the other Padawan no doubt fixed it perfect just like he did everything else. Obi-Wan held up a hand. Stop! Energy trap! Squinting, Anakin could see nothing but the dark except the light of his master's blade. I don't see anything, Ferris said. Look away, then look back. Use the force, Siri instructed. Doing as told, Anakin looked away, the turned back, and sliced the absolute fainted glimmer of purple one could possibly see, it shimmered and disappeared, how easy would it have been to run into it? I see it, Dara said. There will be more, Obi-Wan warned. The Padawans must be very careful. You most likely won't be able to escape alone. Stay close to your masters. Stepping around the trap the group made their way past deeper into the next chamber. The chuckle split the fetid air. I would expect no less of you, Obi-Wan. The voice mocked then, laughing at any misfortune they may have had on their way here. Granta Omega. Obi-Wan stopped dead in his tracks as Grant Omega stepped out from the shadows just meters ahead of where they were. He tapped a finger on his utility belt. Did you really think you could avoid a few traps and catch me? Get back here you fool, Zan Arbor hissed as she appeared, unhappy look easily seen on her face, appearing behind him out of the darkness. Why must you always talk to him wearing her blue silk robe that clung to her figure, she looked like a snob with her blonde hair braided into coiling robes that hung around her head. Well because I'm enjoying myself of course Omega said, his face contorted into a sickening smile on his face, he apparently felt right at home where he was I have. Let's see one, two, four, eight Jedi, all sent to capture little old me. Are you serious, are you forgetting I'm here, too Zan Arbor snapped through gritted teeth typical. I was a Jedi enemy before you were born, Granta. My father was their enemy before me, Omega said. Xanatos, a traitorous Jedi that had turned and tried to kill Quiggan Jin, it wasn't something they were proud of. But apparently the man's son had inherited his utter arrogance, cruelty, and the same boiling hated that need to spill the blood of any Jedi around him, whether he was office sensitive or not. The blonde waved her hand go ahead, I'm going on without you, whether we meet this Sith or not, I'm going on. I can't wait to be off this, disgusting planet. Anyway, we've wasted enough time, he's waiting. All we need to do is get there and meet him and you're here humoring these Jedi, let's go and get everything we've ever wanted you fool. But it appeared his hubris had once again gotten the better of him as he didn't move, simply shoved her off of him and arrogantly stared down the Jedi. I can do this, with or without his help Omega sneered. Oh uh, hello, in case of whether or not you've forgotten, you're no Sith, you don't even have a connection to the Force Zan hissed. I've outpaced Kenobi every step of the outsmartest and outgunned Omega continued on his hate-filled rant I don't even know any secrets of the Sith. But when I get my hands on them, nobody is ever going to be able to stand up to me. And what better place to end Kenobi, that the very halls that call for his death. Obi-Wan's eyes hardened, lightsaber held at the ready, the man held no words for Omega. He wasn't angry, it appeared he was simply ready to do what was needed. Nothing was going to save the criminal before them Anakin realized, not unless Obi-Wan let him live. Eh I see, you don't want to speak to me. You're ruining my fun Obi-Wan Omega held his brow and gave a dramatic sigh as if he were on a play. His other hand reached into his coat and produced a blaster, a kid 21 to be precise. It's annoying, that you Jedi managed to find me here. But it's a fitting end, our final encounter. With the Sith nearby, I'm invincible here. You can do nothing, but die like dogs at my hands. You, all of you. Your end has arrived. Come, or are you too afraid? 
his finger pressed into the trigger, but that's all he achieved as Obi-Wan exploded into action, sprinting forward with his lightsaber pointed forward in a classic maneuver. The bolts from Omega's blast came fast and hard, Obi-Wan blocking and redirecting each bolt away as he continued on towards his intended target. A sick smile came to Omega's face as a smell slowly cooled up from behind and up from the floor. The hundreds of dead buried within suddenly rolling to life as they sprung from their resting places, screaming and roaring. Zombies. No doubt raised by the Sith to protect Omega, but something was off about them, as if they were actively resisting being activated, as with some of the zombies did not rise, shook slightly but did nothing else, like the Sith wasn't able to rein them in. They should have been answering the call of the Sith within the tomb, but it appears the activated zombies weren't attacking because he ordered it, but because something else other than the hidden Sith had down so. The evidence for this came when one of the zombies tried to take a bite out of Omega, causing the man to panic and blast a hole in its skull. Recovering from the confusion of the zombies attacking everyone within, Anakin moved to assist Obi-Wan, coming to his side as they cut through the horrible smelling dead. These undead were simply in their way, nothing more. Answering to an unseen force that cared not for the machinations of the current Sith, these dead wanted them all out, and if they didn't leave then the zombies no doubt would attempt to add them to the count of the dead. Working with his master, Anakin, and Obi-Wan cut through the continuing to grow horde of zombies, cutting a path towards Omega who was not only firing up in them but also the zombies that were leaping at him. Together they would capture the lunatic, and the reward would be theirs. Zan had long since disappeared into the shadows as soon as the first zombie turned on them. But she didn't matter in the slightest, it would be simple to find her if need be again. It was then that the culprit of the zombies turning on Omega appeared at the entrance to the tunnel, shrouded in shadow, feet clanking against the ground, the spirit from earlier had reappeared. Causing the Jedi Masters to draw their breaths short at its sinister eyes, every other feature on its face hidden. It simply stood there and watched as they battled, but its presence was enough to cause everyone to shudder, and when visions rose from looking at it for too long, shrieking Sith shadows leapt from the walls only to evaporate into ash, an illusion, but they were no doubt effective as they wore at the resolve of everyone present. Why aren't you obeying Omega yelled to the spirit, the being turning to him with its molten eyes, unblinking and unanswering before turning its attention back to the fight with the Jedi. The spirit's very presence drove the power of the dark side to new heights as the dark side interfered with their senses, sapping the source of light from the... and to save each other they reached it in an attempt to anchor themselves to reality, calling up and whatever they could to help aid them. Ferris looked to Dara, the girl knowing what he was asking. Please help us Sora heard her words, many questions rising from within his mind. And like a great heat had descended up in the zombies, they physically recoiled as blinding white light filled the tunnel, and stepping from within, was the lady in white. The imposing spirit seemed shaken as much as the zombies, for its screech was a terrible thing. But the flowing brown hair of the spirit flowed with its movements, it sprung forward, cutting a straight line through the zombies before it impacted the spirit, both dispelling into the force immediately after. With the presence of the Sith spirit gone for now, the zombies returned to their previous assault, the amazement of the Jedi fading and returning to battling the group of Sith zombies. Anakin began to lose focus, as he was the main focus of the hidden Sith, visions of being betrayed by his master, cut down in this very tomb, being abandoned for Ferris or cast out of the Jedi Order. Anakin. Obi-Wan's voice was close. Keep your focus. Anakin shook his head once more, yes he needed to focus, the dark side preys on your insecurity, so all he needed to do was focus, and he wouldn't be affected by it any further. True leapt high, cutting two zombies in half, redirecting stray blaster bolts from Omega away from himself, but the moment soon turned to horror as he landed, and the blade of his lightsaber flickered and spluttered, it threatened to lose power at a moment's notice. And to make things worse, Tri was located at the very middle of the horde of zombies. Obi-Wan was long gone, having taken after Omega on the far side of the corridor, he was too far to help right now. Anakin looked both left, then right, he had a moment to make a decision. 
The only thing stopping him from assisting in the capture of Omega was friendship. His friendship to True, the chance that he wouldn't be okay. He'll be okay Anakin sprinted after his master. Ferris called to True catching the boy's attention as he hurled his lightsaber through the air. The boy smiled gratefully as he too tossed his own sputtering weapon at his friend, catching the working blade and swinging in a wide arc, cutting through the zombies about to crumble up in him. Ferris caught the half-powered lightsaber, resolving himself to make do with the weapon as he aimed it at a zombie. Suddenly, Omega appeared again, having snuck past Obi-Wan and back to the fight, Zan at his side. Anakin's eyes narrowed, this whole thing was a trap, they never planned to fight them, they were about to run out through the front door. And at the entrance of the tomb, another stood, this time the real Sith, the one they were hunting, sick yellow teeth smile like a snake ready to pounce. His face was hidden, what Anakin wouldn't do to see the idiot's face. Zan ran to the Sith as they were about to make their escape, Anakin turning his attention back to the fight of the Jedi, Ferris was watching True's back, but none of the masters noticed, only he and Dara, that the blade was once more short-circuiting. He stood still, watching Dara leap through the air to save him, completely selfless in the endeavor even as Omega smiled at seeing her leap, his target clear. And like a serpent strike, fired. The bolts sailed and nailed the girl in the chest, three in quick succession. But she had done what she had wanted, come between Ferris and Omega and cutting through a pouncing zombie even as her body collapsed face first on the ground. Everything froze, the zombies rounded Alan the dying girl in confusion, Sora roared in anguish, and in a burst of power, carved a bloody path through the distracted and immobile zombies. The three targets took this chance, they ran through the entrance and into the darkness, disappearing into the shadows. True howled in anguish, Ferris collapsed to his knees in front due Dara, cradling her from the ground even though the zombies surrounded them. Siri leapt, decapitating the zombies between herself and the group of Padawans, landing and swinging her blade in an arc to finally sniff out the lives of the final gathered dead. Omega was still nearby apparently, as Ferris took a blaster bolt to the shoulder form the shadows of the entrance, deep down and nearly around the corner, they were escaping. Anakin remained frozen still as Dara's head turned towards him, eyes pleading, begging for him to come to her, her cheek lay against the dirt, eyes slowly growing cloudy, she seemed to be struggling to accept the inevitable, but it was just that. The inevitable. He saw all this, and still he didn't move. Obi-Wan appeared once again, having apparently been in a scuffle with more than a few zombies deeper within the tomb. Heedless of the situation he continued to the direction the Sith and Omega were escaping through. Anakin closed his eyes, shedding a silent tear before bursting after his master. Slowly she felt her body grow still, eyes closing against her will a sad whimper escaped her, she was cradled in her master's arms as tears ran down both their cheeks. Almost pathetically, one harsh cry escaped her before she went still in her master's arm, her eyes finally went shut and refused to open. No amount of shouting or crying from the others could wake her from her eternal slumber. And because of the decisions of many around her, the actions and ignorance. Her life had been snuffed without a fair chance. Her eyes opened to a star-filled sky, soft grass pet her arms and legs, her hair lay sprawled around her hair as she resolved herself to simply rest in the afterlife in comfort. Well I wouldn't exactly call this the afterlife. More smile across roads Dara's head snapped to the side as she caught a familiar figure. Sat atop a small perfectly shaped rock was the same silhouette that had followed her for the better part of the last day. Sitting up, crossing her legs, Dara stared at the woman with a pouring expression. You say this is a crossroads, what for? Dara asked as the woman's eyes trailed over her before looking at something behind her. A choice the voice became disassembled as the woman faded making Dara look to where she had been staring. Apparently the plain of grass she was on was a part of a small island teeming with life, floating in the void as a small stream of water flowed through the island and drifted off into mist within a waterfall that dropped into the void. Across from the island was another island, the other covered with ash and sand, dead trees lined the decaying field as bones jut from under the surface. The sand twisted and rose 
flowing off the side to meet the water from the island off life in the middle. Both sources colliding with a stone path that kept the two islands separate. Surrounding the two islands were colloidal statues hidden behind giant stone ropes. Floating around the islands like ancient monoliths. Standing at the center of the path was a humanoid shape made of shifting colors, staring up into the sky as if it was waiting for something. Correctly assuming it was waiting for her, she came to her feet and made her way to the edge of the island. A small amount of wonder filling her as she stepped off and onto seemingly invisible ground below. Hello little one the shifting figure turned to her as she made it onto the floating stone path. W, where are we Dara asked, staring up into the black eyes that stared down at her. As of two days ago, you died protecting your friend. In his self-imposed guilt, Ferris Olin has resigned from the Jedi Order. Anakin Skywalker continued on the path before him. And True, True feels the most guilt of all for it was his lightsaber that shorted. But that is not why you are here, you see I need help the being slowly lowered himself to her height, giving her a full view of the multitude of stars within his endless sockets. M, my help. W, what do you need my help with Dara asked, unsure of where she was as nothing gave her a straight answer, scared of what this being wanted with her. You see child. Asif has taken control of the Senate. And within a few short years, will begin a galaxy-wide war with his apprentice, who currently leads the Confederacy of Independent Systems the being explained. You mean Count Duca Dara asked, the shock of the situation shaking her. Yes, this Sith. His goal is to rule the galaxy. And one of the biggest obstacles between him and his rule is the Jedi, so he plans to destroy them the thing explained to her, his words spoke of nothing but absolute truths that rocked her very soul. You. You plan to stop him she wanted to cry out when the being shook his head, reaching forward and gently holding onto both her shoulders. The Sith is a problem. But what will rise from the Jedi Order to oppose him will be a great deal more noble and far greater than the current Jedi Order. But that doesn't mean I won't help anybody, I plan to save as many people as possible he continued to tell the girl of what was to come, the truth of the upcoming events causing tears to flow down her face. Then why don't we just end the problem before it grows too big?" Dara asked in pure desperation. The Bing comfortingly rubbed her arms, flooding her with soothing energy at the same time. Because in time, dangers far greater than this Sith will come. And without the Sith preparing the galaxy, they will all die and perish. Nobody will survive. Not the Sith, not the Jedi, the galaxy will burn. And then the ones who did such a thing will burn when even greater dangers drop atop them. You see child. For the survival of the galaxy, this Sith must prepare everyone. That is why I can't do anything until the time is right. B but what could be more dangerous than a Sith? Dara grew terrified, for her entire life she was told that the biggest enemy of the Jedi was a Sith, for something more dangerous to exist, it terrified her. Armies of beings without the Force, they crave nothing but death and destruction, they will turn Coruscant into heck if given the chance. And apart from them, there are demons and evil gods see malicious and twisted, locked away or too far away to endanger the galaxy. But they are breaking free as we speak, they are the ultimate danger, everything dies if they win, even the Force itself. Dara froze, the mere thought of something able to endanger the Force itself instilled an instinctual terror within her but it also steeled her, in life she protected the galaxy, and in death she was being offered the chance to do something to continue to help. What do I have to do he could have been lying, but the possibility of what would occur of him not lying would be the worst possible thing she could ever think of. Behind her a gleaming white hole opened on the stone path. There are others in this quest with me, they are in a similar situation that you are in. But through that doorway, you will come across a vessel of light, you will be bound to it, you will grow with it. You will protect it, it is vital for not only the survival of the current Jedi Order, but many important events in the future. And through this vessel, you will be given the chance to guide and protect your friends from this vessel the being grabbed a hold of her stomach, withdrawing his hand as a trail of bluish light coiled around him palm. It then cast the tether of light through the doorway, 
almost immediately after Dara could feel a connection to something on the other side, an insurmountable amount of light, warmth, and comfort rose from across the gate. Go now child, watch over and protect the fate of the galaxy the being stood tall as she nodded, trusting in the being as she turned away from him, eyes catching the tether that connected to whatever was on the other side of the gate, she did however completely miss the same tether coming from her back and directly connecting herself to the being, not that she noticed she was connected to it however as she stood over the boundary of the gate. Knox watched her depart, a small smirk playing on his features as the dead girl did his bidding in a misguided sense of justice that he had implanted within her. Looking around, Knox sniffed at the islands before contorting and shifting out of the fabricated reality towards his body currently still sat atop the eternal throne. Knox stood within the rehabilitation building with his arms crossed, a small frown marring his face as he looked forward. The building he was in was built solely for the inhabitants that struggled to walk in front of him. Droids hovered to and from the room they were in, coming to the occupants Knox was watching, injecting fluids directly into the back brace of the Myra Lucan before him. She hunched slightly as she stood bare, not caring in the slightest that she was entirely nude, running up and down the base of her spine, connected directly to each vertebrae and nervous structure, was a segmented spinal covering of metallic coloring, blue lights shone on each segment as she moved. The droid behind her injected a veil of clear liquid between the plates in her back. Without anything else to do, the droid withdrew its syringe and left the room. Letha stumbled half a step forward, the regrown hair drooping beside her head, uncombed and uneven. Sweat tracked down her forehead and ran down her chin. Come on now Letha, that's enough for now Knox grabbed Letha through the force, making her levitate. She glanced at him through ragged breaths with closed eyelids as he used his other hand to pull a repulsor chair towards the two of them. He maneuvered her through the air and gently deposited the Myra Lucan onto the soft fabric of the chair. Using the force once more to pull a white-colored blanket from a rack in the corner of the room. Gently, as a parent would, placed the blanket around Letha, tucking it over her shoulders and tucking under her legs. A sign rose from her as she looked saddened by her situation. Muscle atrophy, degradation of muscle structure due to lack of physical exertion. He was routinely using myostem to regrow and reinforce the muscle structure she had lost during her suspension in Bakta. Lana then entered the room, Letha perking, her regrowing sense in the force allowing her to at least sense the approaching blonde. Ah here you are, doing well I hope Lana neared the bulge in her stomach very much noticeable, wearing a brace to ensure both her safety and the almost ready-to-be-born child the two would soon have. Letha held out her hand to Lana, opening and closing her hand, beckoning for her to hold her hand. The blonde obliged and snaked her beautifully manicured fingers into Letha's own. Letha perked slightly, the kind and loving smile coming to her face lit up the room as she looked directly towards Lana's stomach her unblinking eyes staring towards the child within. He's strong, I can feel him reaching out towards you both Letha whispered, sure enough, the life within instinctively knew of its parents' signatures, always remaining calm as long as they were nearby, whenever they were apart, he would grow restless and start to squirm, causing a great deal of pain to Lana, which in turn would cause Knox to come running. And the little one most likely instinctively knew to do this to keep them together too, as whenever Knox would be within a certain radius, all pain Lana received would calm, the baby stilling and basking in their combined presence. I know Knox smiled proudly as Letha used her other hand to take one of his free ones. I'm happy for you too. Letha trailed off slightly, wishful thinking over taking her current thought process. Maybe in another life, she could have had someone, maybe even Knox himself. But for now, she was simply happy to back in the love offered to her by Lana and Knox. Despite there being no sexual attraction between them, it was more familial in nature, and she cherished it. She knew that she and any other Jedi had to be careful with their emotions. But she didn't see her connection with Knox and Lana as a negative, if anything it gave them all someone to rely on in such trying times. They were all a big family. Knox the high ruling emperor of that galaxy, saving everyone, raising the standard of living for all. Lana, his wife, the woman who would stick by his side through the apocalypse itself. 
and their soon-to-come child, the upcoming Prince of Zakul, the entire empire's populace were excited, celebrations were being planned, the guards were going mental in assigning a personal militia to protect their prince in his early years. And then there was her, the adopted aunt, someone with no family, broken in the eyes of many but brought into the waiting arms of those willing to help her. She was shown and given the love of real family, unconditional love by Knox and Lana. Even her apprentice Nadia Grell was given the opportunity, the girl had cautiously accepted, and was currently off-world training with the Knights of Zakul to expand her understanding. Give it a month, I'll say you'll be back to running around worrying about everyone again Knox quipped as the trio made their way from the rehabilitation center towards the landing platform where their ship awaited them. Someone has to, Aletha playfully quipped in turn, Knox rolling his eyes in response. Bleeding heart Knox chuckled causing Letha to stick her tongue out at him and cross her arms before making a huffing noise and jutting her chin in the air away from him. What followed was a round of laughter echoing around them as they passed a unit of knights designated to escort them. Stepping onto the shuttle, Knox assisted Lana onto the shuttle gently, then helping Letha onto the shuttle. Where to your majesty the pilot asked over comms. To the spire, we have things to go over Knox replied the pilot confirming in the affirmative, the knights hopping into two more shuttles to serve as the escort. Immediately after the trio of ship took off the the fleet warships spire in the distance. The present 22 BBY. Staring out to the void of space from his throne like Vakarayan did thousands of years ago. Nox's abyssal eyes stared unblinking he stood frozen, like a monolith of white and black. For the first time in days, his brow twitched and his mouth opened, Valen perked up from the throne as he was snapped towards him. Scorpio. A voice consisting of thousands, layered up in each other, combating against each other spoke as it grated out of his vocal cords. My lord Scorpio's voice sounded from the throne at his side. Engage cloaking measures on all fleet vessels. I want eyes on everything everywhere. Recall the first fleet back to Zakul, I plan to make personal use of it myself and I want all hyperlane points monitored and secured, interdiction fields will be engaged and any vessel that so much as has a percent of a chance of entering our systems will be captured and eliminated. The only traffic I want from Zakul from now on is to be our battle cruisers, nothing comes to us without my express permission Knox's original voice sounded from his mouth as the thousands of others mounting from his voice box settled. Seconds later, a swirling wormhole appeared in front of the eternal throne spire, a giant construct thousands of meters in diameter to form a hypergate ring large enough for any vessel on the fleet to travel through tens of not hundreds at a time. What came through, its engines roaring with enough intensity to rattle all glass within a thousand meters. Slowly but surely the subjugation soared through the hypergate. Fifteen times longer than the eternal fleet warships that flew by its side as an escort fleet. The absolute behemoth of a vessel with enough power to single-handedly battle a legion of Harrower-class dreadnoughts with ease, if not destroy them all in a single blast of its quasar cannon. The ship served its purpose of being the greatest vessel in the Eternal Fleet, giving the fleet a new height of splendor as it came through the Hypergate, the tiny warships coming through with the ship. A warhorn echoed from the capital ship, signifying its arrival. Soon the rest of the first legion that accompanied the massive ship, each one capable of activating and making use of a hypergate themselves. Coming to a stop in front of the throne, the behemoth flagship of the Eternal Fleet dwarfed the building to the point it was minuscule next to it. One by one, more fleet vessels appeared in the system, fleets dropped out of hyperspace at the Emperor's call. Three thousand years worth of constructed war vessels blanketed the stars, glistening against the backdrop behind them. Of course, with the shipyard of Iokath being one of if not the largest in the galaxy, its ability to churn out ships was unrivaled by anything other than the Star Forge when Iokath manufacturing was pushed to full power. So currently in the system, despite nearly blocking the sight of anything other than warship, hundreds, thousands of battle cruisers. This was only a fraction of the fleet's might the rest were being diverted to Iokath space or amassing at hyper lane points to outright block all incoming traffic to Iokath. What is it love Valen rose from her comfortable seat, 
allowing Nox to turn away from the window and place himself atop his towering throne. The time for chaos is up in the galaxy. I'd rather not take the chances of them prematurely discovering us. Thus our space is on lockdown until the pieces are settled and the board is set, the same will go for the ascendancy. Now. We must leave for Coruscant, these events are too important for me to simply observe from half a galaxy away Nox typed away onto the inbuilt pad on the throne, linking the first fleet and the subjugation directly to his neural implants. He felt the link between himself and the X-70 activate as he powered the ship and began pre-flight procedures. I'll get my stuff Valen proceeded march from the throne room, past the scores of honor guards. He sat back for a few moments, staring into the mid-distance for a few moments before leaning forward once more to open a hollow channel. Father. The voice of Kenya sounded as the woman hastily answered the call hair done in an ornate braid around her head thanks to the stylists that did her hair. I have a mission for you of utmost importance. One week later, Coruscant. Three Nebu starfighters flew towards Coruscant, the ship they were escorting a glistening silver. Their engines roared as the cones of the thrusters propelled them through space towards the galactic capital. The person they were to escort was the Senator Padme Amidala, coming to vote on the vital piece of legislation that would enable an army to be erected by the Galactic Republic to assist the small numbers of Jedi across the galaxy in their effort to maintain peace. Peace was hard to maintain in the last years for these valiant heroes, as thousands of systems declared their intentions on leaving the Republic to join the C.I.S. It was a harrowing ordeal, as the Republic fracturing. So she was coming herself, her voice as of late, was one of reason, someone who told nothing but truths, of kindness of hope. She placed her faith in others, and in turn they did the same. A third fighter trailed behind the Nebo shuttle, the ships rotating in orientation to be level with the part of Coruscant they wished to land. Senator, we are approaching Coruscant one of the many individuals on the ship reported to a woman wearing fine white clothing, her hair done up high beside her head in elegant fashions only Nebo could achieve. Very good the young lady replied as she began to make her way throughout the ship to the boarding ramp. The ship streaked lower through the skies of an early morning Coruscant, clouds hanging low as the wings of the ship carved their way through the harmless white fluff. The escort fighters slowed down to maintain pace with the ship as it began to slow, nearing the designated landing pad. The four thrusters of the ship howled, a systematic hum growing in intensity as the ship's landing gear began to dispatch. The first ships to land were the fighters, landing on pads connected to the larger central landing platform. They landed without issue as the main vessel rotated in the air, its landing gear gently stroking the steel below before coming to a comfortable rest. The cockpits of the three fighters opened in unison, one male and two female climbing from their ships, down the yellow hull of their fighters and onto ladders connected to their ships, gently landing on the ground without issue. A blue and white astromech droid lowered from its hold in one of the fighters, it happy bleeps amusing the female pilot it accompanied. She sauntered her way over to the male pilot who had just stepped down from the ladder to his own ship, the man reaching up and pulling his helmet from his face with a joyous smile on his face. We made it he animatedly said, looking towards the much smaller woman at his side as she arrived, his eyepiece staring at her I guess I was wrong, there was no danger at all as if to mock him, as the senator walked down the ramp to the glistening silver ship, an explosion ripped through the vessel, frying everyone on board as they went up in screams of pain and agony. The senator herself flew forward and impacted the ground as fire licked at her fine clothing, her charred flesh on her back sizzling. The three fighter pilots were thrown of their feet, one careening off of the side of the hovering platform only just managing to lock her hand on the ledge of the platform before she would have fallen to certain death. The right wing of the silver cruiser dropped from the ship, impacting the ground as flames ate away at its plating, the other wing was tossed away from the hull of the ship it was connected to and dropped into the clouds below, disappearing into the abyss. Sitting up, the smallest female of the pilots clambered to her feet, seeing the destruction before her, running towards the body of the senator in white. She gripped the sides of her helmet, all but tearing it off and tossing it away as she dropped to her knees next to the woman in white. Kneeling down, 
the rounded supple but gorgeous features of Padmi Amidala looked down at the woman in white, tears streaming down her cheeks as she rolled the woman onto her side. Cord Padmi stuttered out, holding the woman close as her eyes opened slightly to stare at the senator she was impersonating. Milady, I'm so sorry Cord muttered out, her eyelashes singed from her face as blood leaked down her nose and mouth I've failed you senator. No, you haven't Padmi cried back as the woman slumped, finally dying in the arms of the woman she swore to protect. At the edge of the platform, the third pilot propelled herself back onto the edge with little issue, her own helmet long since gone as she glared around with eyes of yellow fury. She spared no glance towards the deceased as she belined her way to Padme, grabbing the shocked woman by the shoulders and hauling her to her feet. Typho. Go alert security. Kenya all but ordered, the brown-skinned male sprinting towards this fighter to do just that. Requesting immediate pickup, priority asset in danger Kenya whispered into the pad on her left hand. Incoming a male voice responded as she pushed a frozen Padme towards the far edge of the platform. I shouldn't have come tears leaked unabated down Padme's cheeks as she stared forward into the mid-distance. No, she did her job, now it's time to do ours Kenya replied, grabbing Padme by the shoulders as a security shuttle roared through the early morning fog. The shuttle hastily settled down onto the landing pad across from the burning cruiser, the Nabu guard leaping from the open bay doors and rushing to surround and escort Padme away from danger. Kenya watched Padme be ushered into the shuttle, being spirited away into the grey veil of mist. The remaining security and Typho began to shift through the wreckage in an effort to find anything that may have survived the explosion. Kenya watched them work locks of hair flying around her head as four other ship and emergency crews arrived. But Kenya ignored all of these, turning away from the burning scrap, her eyes scanning over the skyscrapers around her in search of the answers she was seeking. She continued to squint, eyes flashing as twin molten fires that glowed through her clipped eyelids. Raising her left hand to her mouth, the wrist-mounted computer system flared to life as the screen projected a hollow display of the figure that answered her call. Father. Kaldani Spires. Stay with her until tomorrow when she will return to active duty in the Senate, then you will return here to me, and I will give you your new orders. Knox spoke towards the hollow of Kenya, the woman holding her robes closer together to resist the cold that whipped her hair around her head in the hollow. It will be done, Father. The woman's hollow began to flicker and vanish, the blue light shining from the hollow evaporating from the room bathing the room in orange light courtesy of the orange crystal hanging from the ceiling. Knox leant back into his rotating chair, fingers playing at the tip of his chin as he thought over how to proceed through upcoming events. He didn't cast a glance towards the door to his office even as it hissed open, Valen waltzing through and placing herself down onto one of the long couches within, a huff leaving the woman as she had just returned from organizing the on-world nights of Zakul. Something on your mind, Valen ran her hand over her face, one of her sulfuric eyes peering at Knox from under her hand as she leant her head back onto the arm of the couch. No hurdle to big, but I believe Kanya's presence around Amidala will be detrimental to some of my plans if she is nearby in the coming weeks. No. I need her attention, elsewhere. Stepping off of the Lurgo agitator built from the beyond old blueprints of the vehicle stored within the databanks of the company minus Lurgo. Pulling out a pair of macro binoculars, Kanye raised the binoculars to her eyes, staring down at the landing pad that the assassination attempt was enacted. Emergency crews were currently cleaning up the wreckage, craft hauling the remaining shell and wings of the vessel away. Across Coruscant and the galaxy, news on the death of Padme were being spread across the Holonet, after all they had no idea she had after all survived and Kenya had no desire to correct them until the culprit was apprehended. The perfect vantage point lowering the macro binoculars back down to her side, Kenya turned away from the platform far away, looking around the ledge she was on with a critical eye yes, full view of the pad, enough space to set up equipment, almost zero surveillance, perfect. Moving her right hand to her left wrist, the display of the gauntlet mounted computer system lit up, her fingers danced across its flat surface, a long resonating from the gauntlet as she achieved what she wanted. As she waited for what she ordered from Kaldani Spires, 
she closed her eyes, face scrunching up, twitching slightly as she attempted to center herself in the force. With a following deep breath, drawing in as her lungs filled, followed by a frustrated breath out. She repeated the process a few more times before opening her eyes. She turned her head slightly as her eyes were once more twin eclipses of orange yellow and red fighting against each other for dominance in her iris. Slowly but surely, her eyes began to pick up a glittering and flowing mist of brown color, shimmering in and out of existence around her, concentrated at the edge of the ledge and a small area leading off of the edge and down into the shifting fog below. A droning buzz filled her ears as she watched the trail of her suspected opponent, eyes scanning as she traced it until it went around a building and out of sight. Turning to look to her side, a probe droid buzzed around, awaiting its orders as its many eyes and sensors scanned around the area. I want to know everything that happened here Kenya demanded of the probe, its beeps and droning whistles signifying its acceptance, immediately beginning to lower itself to the ground calling for several other units to come and assist in its analysis of the environment. Stepping away from the droid as it went to work, Kenya hoisted herself atop of the lector agitator, leaning back and tilting to the side as she maneuvered the speeder over the edge of the platform. Slowly, Kenya guided the speeder to descend down the side of the building following along the trail she was following, taking care to keep her focus as she used the force to track the aura trail left by her target. A sly grin made its way to her face as she urged the speeder to move faster, disappearing into the fog as she went on the hunt. The next day, the Senate chambers. Hurriedly walking through the Senate hallways, Captain Typho accompanied Padme alongside her handmaidens and Nabuian guards. She hasn't returned yet milady Typho whispered in hushed tones, Padme biting her lip in response as her eyes flashed momentarily in worry. I wouldn't worry, she's capable. I have no doubt she'll return shortly Typho, seeing the woman who he guarded in almost visible distress. Taking a calming breath, the entourage stopped in front of the door to their designated repulsor pod, the senate chambers just through the ornate door in front of them. We'll make do Padme side, holding her head high before stepping towards the door, causing the door to lift and grant them access to the pod to which they all huddled inside of without gaining the attention of any of the other senators present. Her death is a great, and tragic loss for us all Palpatin looked crushed, eyebrows low on his pale face, eyes glistening as tears threatened to spill whilst he stood at the center of the room, his speech entrancing everyone within the room save for Padme herself we will mourn her loss, a great champion of the free peoples, a woman who would give her life to peace. She will be mourned, missed, and cried over. As a colleague, a listening ear, and as a friend. With Pal Patton finishing his words, Senator Orn Free TAA came forward with his repulsor pod, his aides standing by his side as he opened his fat lips, his four leku sitting snug against his shoulders and back. With these events, I think it be in everyone's best interests if we are too. Suddenly Padme's pod lurched forward, the woman standing high and mighty as the others in the pod stumbled slightly under the sudden acceleration. The attempt of my life, a clear attempt to silence my words of protest Padme's opening words silenced the senators, shock and surprise running through the impossibly tall building's chamber as camera drones rapidly approached and circled the senator. This assassination attempt. Padme's face contorted as righteous rage ran through her veins momentarily cost the lives of my aide, several if my security guards, in a ruthless and senseless attempt on my life. There is little to no doubt that I was the target but more importantly, the security measure before you was the target. This security measure, of which I have been in vocal and clear opposition of since its initial drafting, but I will not die, I will not be silenced. And if my life is endangered for speaking against its creation then senators, you must realize that something is affront here. With the cameras off of his face, Sheep's face contorted in utter and complete rage for a single second, missed by all around him. Masterfully, he calmed himself down as his eyes settled on the surviving woman. With this wonderful news, Senator, of your survival, I agree and urge to defer the vote unto a later date. Pal Patton smiled kindly before a third senator voiced his opinion, pointing his finger accusingly at Pal Patton. Pal Patton has never been behind the Military Creation Act, 
and was ready and happy to stall when the elder of the opposition turned up dead. Senator Kandabrian Bulat and hissed would he have done so if it was the pro-military senator who was killed, and when she shows up alive, he postpones the vote anyway. I for one, seriously doubt whether he wished for the vote to be put forward today at all. Regardless of whether your accusations hold credence or not Senator, far too much has occurred today for everyone to accurately and safely put forward their vote. No, we will vote in another session of Congress. Senate is adjourned Mass Amata stood up, dismissing the entirety of the congregation as he all but shrugged off Kanda Bryan's accusations. Padme appeared to not be finished however as she forcibly gained the attention of those present once more wake up, senators, you must wake up. If you offer the separatists violence, then only violence can be shown in response. Many will lose their lives, and all will lose their freedoms. I pray that you will not let fear push you into disaster and ruin. Vote down this security measure which is nothing less than a declaration of war. Does anyone want that? I don't think that is what anybody really wants, so I hope, that when it comes time to vote, that you all, that we all, make the right decision. Hanging her head, Padme urged the repulsor pod to return to its original place, leaving the Senate chambers with her entourage in tow. Stepping back into the Senate hallways, Padme stopped and stared at the blue armored figure awaiting her and her group. Chancellor Palpatine wishes to meet you within his chambers milady the Senate guard announced, holding his weapon flat against his arm as he informed the senator. I will be there in a moment Padme bid the guard her words, Typho watching the guard turn point and walk away back to his duties. I don't know how much longer I can prevent the vote from going through my friends Palpatine sat behind his desk, looking solemnly at the Jedi Council sitting across from him. Amusement trickling over him as they remained ignorant of the Sith and dark side memorabilia littered around his office more and more systems join the separatists as we speak. If these systems do break away Mace Windu began before being cut off by Palpatine. I will not let this republic which has stood for a thousand years be split in two Palpatine replied in a clipped tone the negotiations, will not fail. If they do, you must realize there aren't enough Jedi to protect the republic Windu leant forward his elbows to his knees as his robes hung loosely around his frame were keepers of the peace, not soldiers. Master Yoda Palpatine turned his attention exclusively to his completely unaware arch-nemesis Do you really think it will come to war? HNN and the dark side clouds everything, impossible to see, the future is Yoda shook his head as he made an attempt to connect with the Force, his ears dipping at the murky veil of darkness that stood between him and what he wished to achieve. Anything they may have said was cut short as the hollow of a Rodian appeared on Palpatine's desk. The loyalist comedy has arrived your grace. Good Palpatine smiled. Senator Padme is with them. Send them in Palpatine rose from his swiveling and rising as the doors to his office opened. We will discuss this matter later Palpatine spoke to the Jedi. Master Yoda rising from his chair and making his way to the approaching senators whilst Winder rubbed his chin in thought. Senator Amidala, your tragedy on the landing platform, terrible Yoda topped, propping his hands atop his cane, a smile making its way to his face seeing you alive, brings warm feelings to my heart. Do you have any idea who was behind this attack Padme asked, worry in her brown orbs, winder rising from his chair to meet the woman. Our intelligence reports point to disgruntled spice miners on the moons of Nabo Mace relayed what they knew to the senator a frown coming to the woman's face. I think that Count Duca was behind this Padme replied, the master of the order shaking his head with a small smile at the woman's naivety. He is a political idealist, not a murderous Kadi Mundi replied, trying to soothe the obviously worried senator. You know milady, Duca was once a Jedi, he couldn't assassinate anyone, it's not in his nature Mace added. Padme looking unconvinced entirely in the argument the masters made. But for certain senator, in grave danger, you are Yoda intervened, pointing a finger at the woman. Palpatine, who had since been staring out of his window towards the cityscape of Coruscant turned to the group Master Jedi, if I may. May I suggest that the senator be placed under the protection of your graces. Bail Organa came forward with an uneven and distrusting stare you really think that is a wise decision under these stressful times. 
Padme looked aghast, the suggestion annoying her in no small part. Chancellor if I may I do not believe the situation. The situation is that serious. Oh but I do Senator. I realize all too well that additional security might be disruptive for you. But perhaps it would be easier if it was someone you were familiar with. An old friend, like Master Kenobi Palpatine smiled kindly, urgency easily seen by all present in her eyes as his eyebrows twisted upwards. That's possible. He's just returned from a border dispute on Antia and Windu agreed, seeing the positives of Palpatine's suggestion. Coming forward, nearer Padme, Palpatine looked meek. Do it for me, milady. the thought of losing you, is unbearable. Reluctantly, Padme seemed to finally come around and nod her head. I will have Obi-Wan report to you immediately. Thank you Master Windu Palpatine walked around to his chair gently sitting back down as the Jedi made their way from the room. The spires. Father Kanya knelt behind the man that raised her, Knox stood on the balcony once more, staring out towards the Senate and Senate apartments, face passive and unmoving as his black eyes gazed into the mid-distance you wished to see me. Yes. Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi have been tasked with guarding Senator Amidala his voice once more layered twisted in a thousand tones as it raked against Kanya's ears however I have another task for you. Two Chis have left Xilla and are currently within Republic and Separatist space. I want you to hunt them, learn everything about them, find out if they have inadvertently alerted either sides to our existence, and act accordingly Knox turned to Kanya, eyes peering downwards as he kept his head at the same position. It will be done father Kanya kept her head low the lone braid of hair that normally ran down her back now looped on the floor as she wore her black robes I will not disappoint you. I know Knox turned back to staring out at the horizon, taking this as her dismissal, Kenya rose and turned to leave and Kenya. Turning back to her father, a small smile came to his face as he turned back to her, reaching out to his desk as a small pyramid flew from its surface and into his grasp. You have done exceedingly well thus far, I am proud of you. I hope you know that. Here, for your efforts the glowing red pyramid in his hand levitated and hovered towards Kenya. The woman sniffed slightly as her lips quivered, tears brimming on the sides of her eyes. She reached out with her palm facing upwards, the hollow crown landing in her palm, her fingers lacing around it and clutching its smooth surface. Thank you Kenya finished, no more words being said between the two as the apprentice left to do her master and father's bidding. Soon enough Kenya had left the apartment towards her personal hangar up in her lector agitator. Splayed out on the couch she was on previously, Valen dropped what remained of the purple jogon fruit she had consumed onto a small petri dish to be cleaned later. Are we playing our hand to force them together Valen asked, wiping her hand on the fabric of the couch she sat on. There's no real need to influence them any further. My influences on both Anakin and Padme have already done what is needed. Anakin's need for love and attention will almost outright remove his inhibition even with Obi-Wan present and Padme's desire to find a man that fits her parameters are perfect Knox replied, turning from the balcony in satisfaction, making his way back to his chair with a small sly smirk. And if it doesn't go as planned, I mean. I know you're fully aware of her feelings towards you, hidden as best as she can or not Valen asked, sitting up from her chair with a stretch and yawn. Then I will do what I must to ensure things go as planned. But, you are right. I am indeed aware of her feelings and desires, in fact I have capitalized upon them in the past to further my plans, and will do so again if need be he replied, calling Appen Jagon from the bowl that they sat in. Rising from the couch, Valen puckered her lips, making her way across the room and around the desk. She grabbed Nox's chair turning him to face her before planting herself down onto his lap, wrapping her arms around his neck. The small smirk remained on Knox's face as the woman who held his affections forced his head between her bosom. If she thinks she can lay a finger on my property I'm going to deglove the bench. Valen's words caused a bark of laughter to rise from the man as he himself wrapped his arms around the woman and drew her closer, the woman sucking in a breath as she was pressed hard against his body. Is someone a little worried I'm about to catch feelings for one of my resources? His right hand snaked up her stomach line, 
tracing over her stomach and between her breasts, a flick of his finger unlatching the clip around her neck as her clothing immediately loosened afterwards. I uh, maybe just a little Valen purred as the shoulders of her robe slid from their place, exposing her chest to Knox. A half-mocking smirk came to Knox's face as he stared up to the nervous woman well, why don't I prove to you how little you have to worry? Padme's apartment. Staring out at the smog of the city, Padme argued with Captain Typho, wearing a purple robe with light blue highlights, the woman's hair was done up behind her head like a tower. I have to disagree Senator, this course of action Typho stepped half a step forward, worry on his face. This plan will work, I will not cower and wait for these assassins, I have faith in your abilities and the Jedi's abilities to protect me. I'll be safe Padme argued as she turned her head slightly, watching the half-wit Jar Jar walk around the corner towards the elevator door. Hearing the slow of the elevator, Padme glanced to her guard captain I suppose we should see the opinions of our Jedi protectors no. Following closely behind the approaching Jar Jar, the auburn-haired Obi-Wan Kenobi approached with a robe and tan undergarments. On the other side of Jar Jar was a teen wearing a black robe, a confident smirk on his face as his Padawan braid hung down to the right side of his neck. Looky looky whose ISA found Jar Jar waved, motioning towards Anakin and Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan came forward from around Jar Jar's side, bowing slightly as he smiled kindly it's a pleasure to see you again milady, and in good health at that. Looking over the man who greeted her, Padme's lips coiled at their sides as she resisted a smile, instead she lowered her head to return the greeting. It has been far too long Master Kenobi, I'm glad our paths have crossed again. But I'm sorry, I must warn you I think your presence here is entirely unneeded and unnecessary. I'm sure the Jedi Council have their reasons Obi-Wan replied, not wanting to argue rather simply soothing the woman. Padme turned her attention from Obi-Wan and faced the teen who made no moves in stopping his open ogling. Annie, goodness, you sure have grown she almost immediately recognized the teen, mouth opening slightly as she smiled wider, and in turn the boy stood forward, smirk on his face. Anakin simply stared at the woman trying to formulate a sentence, and in trying to come off as smooth he opened his mouth. So have you, grown more beautiful I mean, and much shorter, for a senator I mean his eye twitched slightly, screaming at himself internally at the blunder and fool he no doubt made of himself. Pointedly ignoring the disapproving look Obi-Wan sent him from his side. Taking it all in a stride, Padme laughed and shook her head Annie, you'll always be that little boy I met on Tatooine. Looking down, Anakin attempted to snuff his embarrassment. Obi-Wan and Typho looking amused at his failed attempt at wooing the senator. Sparing his apprentice, Obi-Wan came forward to take charge of the situation our presence will be invisible. I promise you milady. Nonetheless I am grateful for you being here. The situation is more dangerous than the senator is willing to admit, having you here is a great help Typho replied, settling the atmosphere of the room as the conversation took a turn for the serious. I don't need more security, I want answers, I need to know who is trying to kill me and why instead of doing that the Jedi are here, instead of doing anything definitive Padme hissed slightly, annoyed at the prospect of needing such potent protection. Obi-Wan frowned slightly, seeing her point but he and his apprentice were here for her protection we're here to protect you Senator, not start an investigation. Anakin on the other hand appeared to have a different view we will find who is trying to kill you Padme, I promise you that we will do so at the best of our ability. He knew almost immediately he had overstepped his bounds, given the dirty look from Obi-Wan, Anakin bit his lip as he focused solely on Padme. We are not to exceed our mandate, my young Padawan Obi-Wan urged in an attempt to get Anakin on his line of thinking. I mean in the interest of protecting her, Master Anakin replied, turning to his master with a raised eyebrow in an effort to cover his blunder. We are not going through this again Anakin. You will follow my lead Obi-Wan cut off Anakin's argument. However it seemed Anakin wasn't down however. Why? Obi-Wan came up short, turning back to his apprentice with an almost shocked look. What? Why else you do think we're here, assigned to protect her of not find her killer? Protection is a job for her security, 
not Jedi Anakin rebuked as Obi-Wan had to physically withhold a sigh. We will do as the Council has instructed, you will earn your place and follow young one. Obi-Wan turned back to Padme as it looked as if the woman was about to input her two cents. Perhaps with your presence, the identity of the killer will be revealed. Now if you'll excuse me, I must retire. Padme rose and left the room alongside Dorm, leaving those present to themselves as she made her way to her bedroom. Everyone gives Amidala a slight bow as she and Dorm leave the room. I must return to my station, I must express once more, I'm glad to have you here, I have an officer on every floor, if anything happens or you need anything, please consult one. Typho made his exit through the elevator they had used to arrive. Frustrated. Anakin listened to Jar Jar in the creatures speaking at them of his happiness that they were there. Jar Jar. Jar Jar. She didn't even recognize me. There hasn't been a day gone by that I haven't thought of her, and she's completely forgotten about me. Anakin looked towards Padme's bedroom, a forlorn look on his face. Anakin you are focusing on the negatives again. Be mindful of your thoughts. She was glad to see us. Now let's go over security, I don't want to miss anything Obi-Wan distracted his apprentice from simply staring at the bedroom. Yes master. The Jedi Temple. Yoda and Mace walk side by side through a long hallway, passing by large bronze windowsills that oversaw the cityscape of Coruscant. Why couldn't we see this attack on the senator Mace asked, seeking Yoda's input into the troubling situation they found themselves in. The disturbance in the force, Masking the future it is Yoda replied, his came tapping against the ground whenever he brought himself forward. I believe the prophecy is coming true, the dark side is growing ever stronger the black human male looked down at the tiny green figure at his side. Only those walking the path of the dark side can sense the possibilities of the future. For us to see as of late, walk this dark must we would have to, no Yoda replied, ears peeling slightly as his eyes tracked to meet Mace's own. It's been ten years since we have heard of anything related to the Sith, do you believe they could be behind this? Mace asked, voicing his own suspicion. A certainty that is, out there, they are Yoda confirmed. Do you think Skywalker will be able to bring balance to the Force? Mace inquired, wanting to know the Grand Master's thoughts. Only if he chooses to follow his destiny. That night, tossing and turning in her sleep, Padme lay on her bed, silk sheets slinging to her form as she dug her head into her pillow. Artu stood in the corner of the dimly lit room. The light peeling through the blinds of the room, illuminating it for the droid to observe for any dangers. Outside of her room, stood in the hallway was Anakin himself, standing in a trance-like state as he meditated. His brow twitched as his hand moved to his lightsaber, cautious of potential danger as her heard the door to the apartment slide open. A small smile returned to his face after a moment as he felt the familiar aura of her master near, returning his saber to his belt within moments. Typho has more than enough men downstairs, I think it's safe to say they won't be trying that way. What about up here, any activity Obi-Wan asked, looking to his apprentice with an inquisitive look. Silent as the grave. But I don't like just waiting around here for something to happen Anakin replied casting another look to the room with squinted eyes. Obi-Wan nodded in agreement, it didn't sit well with him either, he reached into his robes to pull out a small palm-sized scanner, one screen displaying Arta whilst the other didn't show anything at all. What's going on with the camera? Obi-Wan asked, turning to Anakin whom looked sheepish. She covered the camera, apparently she didn't like me watching her. Anakin shrugged the question with his simple answer. What the heck is she thinking? Obi-Wan began to pace, unsure in her actions and wanting to berate both the Senator and Anakin. It's okay, she's programmed R2 to alert everyone if there is any danger Anakin assured his master. I'm not worried about an intruder. There are many more ways to kill a Senator than simply breaking in Obi-Wan chastised as he crossed his arms and stared at the room. I get it. But we also want to catch this assassin, don't we? Anakin asked half accusing in his question. You're using her as bait Obi-Wan came to his conclusion, looking at his apprentice in disapproval. Her it was her idea, I didn't like it as much as you don't. But no harm will come to her, 
I can sense everything going on in that room Anakin stated confidently, smirking slightly as he tilted his head upwards slightly. It's too risky, and your senses aren't that attuned as of yet my young apprentice Obi-Wan quipped in turn, Anakin looking back with a raised eyebrow and conflicted gaze. And yours or Anakin tried not to snap as Obi-Wan chuckled. Possibly. A shadow passed over the blinds, a probe droid passing slowly by as it hummed whilst flying. An arm came forward out of the droid's body as it came closer to the window, the tip of one of its digits ignited as it slowly cut a hole in the glass silently. A small hollow thump sounding as the cut piece of glass was pried from the window. Hearing the noise, Arto came alive, beeping and bleeping as his dome rotated. The probe droid froze as Arto scanned over the room, and after a few moments of not seeing anything, Arto shut himself down once more into standby. Seeing Arto go still, the droid continued, a small cylinder being produced from the droid and pushed it into the circular hole. From the cylinder, two small centipede-like bugs clawed their way out, dropping from the edge of the cylinder and slamming into the ground curled up to protect themselves from the impact. You look tired Obi-Wan observed as he looked over Anakin's features. I don't really sleep well anymore Anakin looked sad as he spoke, pacing around in front of Obi-Wan. Because Obi-Wan wagged his eyebrows in questioning. My mum, she. I've been having dreams, something's wrong and I haven't heard anything about her since Kenya told me she got remarried. I don't know what to think or do Anakin stopped in front of a golden table, hands sliding over its surface as he sought wisdom from his master. Dreams pass in time Anakin. Don't put too much thought on them Obi-Wan tried unsuccessfully to off his knowledge to his apprentice. Honestly I'd much rather dream of anything else. Like Padme. Dang even simply being around her, it's... Anakin didn't finish as he basked in the aura resonating from the woman in the other room despite the disapproving look he received from his master. Anakin, be mindful of your thoughts. You've made a commitment to the order a commitment I should say that is not easily broken. And don't forget, she's a politician, they're not to be trusted Obi-Wan warned Anakin, the apprentice soon beginning to look irritated. She's not like the other's master Anakin rebuked, heat coming to his face as he felt the need to defend the woman he was crushing on. It's been my experience that senators are only focused on their own interests and are more than willing to dispense with democracy to get what they want Obi-Wan replied carefully looking over Anakin as he tried to push his point. Master, not another lecture. It's too early for talking about politics, and you're generalizing. The Chancellor doesn't appear to be corrupt Anakin kept defending. Pal Patton's a politician, I've seen him to be very good at following the passions and prejudices of the senators Obi-Wan replied, looking unsure and careful of Anakin's current line of thinking. Well I think he's a good man, my insti. Anakin snapped his attention to the direction of the room. I feel it too Obi-Wan and Anakin broke into a dead sprint, grabbing their lightsabers as they leapt into action. Arto screamed in a series of whistles and high-pitched squeals, prods flying from his chassis as electricity sparked whilst the centipede-like bugs hung menacingly over Padme's face, about to sting the poor woman as their tongues flicked in and out. Bursting into the room, Anakin rounded the corner before leaping, lightsaber igniting in a hiss as he cleared the distance, lightsaber flying around in two swipes that severed the bugs in two motions. The bugs sizzled as they dropped dead, Anakin standing over Padme in her beat as the woman sat up confused and panicked. A hum alerted Obi-Wan, the man twirling to to face the window, catching the gaze of the probe droid before sprinting and leaping to catch it. He broke through the window hands clamping onto the sides of the black robot as it rapidly flew away from the apartment in an attempt to escape. The droid nearly drops at the added weight of Obi-Wan, swinging from side to side before it caught itself and continued to fly away with the Jedi hanging onto its speak build for dear life, the traffic and buildings far below mere specks from their height. Anakin watched with panicked eyes as Obi-Wan and the droid became mere specks from his view, disappearing around a building before he shook his head and turned to Padme. The woman's hair clung to her head, her bedhead making her look as if she was struck by lightning as she adjusted her nightgown to make sure her loose gown didn't leave her cleavage for all to see. 
Stay here Anakin told the woman before he sprinted back through the room's doorway, flying through rushing security and Captain Typho as they entered. Obi-Wan held on tight as the droid brought them closer and closer to oncoming night traffic, constantly sending electrical shocks through itself in an effort to dislodge the Jedi. He nearly fell as one of his hands lost their grip, causing his loose arm to flail before his fingers found purchase on a wire, snagging the wire from the droid before it shut down and made them both drop through the sky like bricks. He began to panic, pulling the droid towards himself, the error he had made evident as the droid sparked, and with a bit of luck, pushed the wire back to where it belonged, the droid coming back to life and immediately flying once more. They ascended and descended over their travels, weaved between traffic as the droid continued to try to shake him. It bucked against walls, moving into the plasma cones of some speeders attempting to burn the Jedi. His tenacity proved greater than the droids as he hefted his legs, wrapping them around the chassis of the droid despite being upside down, hugging the droid close. Looking ahead, the droid appeared to be moving towards a beatup lime green speeder hidden in an alcove. Seeing a crouched figure, Obi-Wan squinted as his eyes adjusted, his eyes widened as he spotted them taking aim in his direction with a long-necked rifle. Oh! Obi-Wan quipped as a beam leapt from the rifle, impacting the droid not a second later as it exploded in his grip, letting him simply fall down towards his inevitable doom thousands of meters below. Obi-Wan simply looked ahead as he felt the wind prick at his skin, staring passively as he sighed. He shook his head as a warped hum came closer and closer a high-pitched whistle beginning to annoy him as a shape of yellow came up below him. With the speeder maintaining a similar speed to him, Obi-Wan reached forward, fumbling at the back of the unoccupied seat as he swung his legs around and placed himself into the soft padded seating of the high-performance speeder. What took you so long? Obi-Wan asked as he pointed in the direction of the light-colored speeder currently making a hasty escape through coruscant night traffic. Oh you know, I couldn't find a speeder I really liked, with an open cockpit and speed capabilities, and then there was the color Anakin listed off the various many reasons why he took so long as he wound through the air in the pursuit of the assassin, a small silver glint visible in both their eyes as a blaster pistol was pointed at them from the open window of the assailant's speeder. If you spend as much time working on your saber skills as you do on your with, you'd rival Master Yoda as a swordsman my young apprentice Obi-Wan joked as he held onto the side of the speeder for dear life. I thought I already did Anakin wondered out loud as he held onto the control stick with both hands. Only in your mind my very young apprentice. Boy, careful easy Obi-Wan held on tighter as Anakin weaved through traffic once more leaping across lanes and between buildings and through the scaffolding of a newly constructed building even as blaster fire continued to originate from the one firing up in them. Oh come on master, at least act like you're having fun Anakin smirked oh sorry, I forgot you don't like flying. Oh I don't mind flying. But what you're doing qualifies as suicide Obi-Wan instinctively ducked as they narrowly avoided another vehicle. As they fly through more traffic, diverting their path into a tram tunnel. Neither they nor the assassin noticed the pursuit of two separate parties. A golden metallic figure leaping and flying through the air at breakneck speeds thanks to its jetpack, rifle in its grip as its red lenses followed the two and a third. The third it was watching was a human wearing a jetpack, silver twin pistols clipped to his legs as he flew after the assassin. Coming to a screaming stop, the golden-colored droid watched the two speeders leave the tram tunnel and once more enter oncoming traffic. The traffic diverted and swerved as the lime speeder continued in a straight line headless of the vehicles it was about to impact. Declaration, Zam Wessel, and Django Fett in sight HK-51 alerted his master, Knox watching from his apartment through a lens connected to HK's chassis. Be ready to take the shot, and be ready to follow Fett Knox ordered through the comms. As you wish HK replied, his custom rifle beginning to release a hum as it began to build up charge. HK watched all three at once as he stood atop of his skyscraper vantage point, watching Anakin come close to and move ahead of Zam Wessel, however as HK observed the teen saw the report of his way as Zam now had a more stable line of fire and rained down fire up in the yellow speeder. Noting they were once more becoming small blips, HK dropped from his vantage his jetpack roaring to life as he surged forward in pursuit. 
as he closed the distance between himself and the winding speeders by remaining on a straight path via following a calculated path, HK watched the two speeders skin over rooftop, narrowly passing under a landing skiff narrowly and spotting as a flag seemed to get caught in the scoop of Anakin's speeder. He, and this Knox through attached cam, watched as they passed through a refinery, blaster fire from Zam igniting twin pylons that caused an outburst of lightning to strike Anakin and Obi-Wan. HK once more landed atop a signal tower near the entrance to a tunnel, watching the two speeders come closer and closer, the hum of his rifle rising exponentially as a continuous wave of reverberate energy rose from all sides of the barrel of the rifle. Zam hastily entered the tunnel, but Anakin seemed to have other plans as he rose up and to the right, taking another path as HK followed after Zam with tracking routines, making use of all nearby surveillance systems to keep track of the bounty hunter. He passed by several casually flying speeders scaring the drivers as they swerved slightly before catching themselves, the well-lit tunnel passing by. Zam seemed to have relaxed in her confidence, HK watching as the speeder slowed considerably and merged with traffic to pass as another regular citizen. Obi-Wan HK remained low and close to passing building to remain hidden, even as Anakin seemed to find Zam as he slammed into the speeder from high up above where the yellow speeder he previously used was far up in the sky. The boy ignited his lightsaber in an attempt to strike Zam whilst the yellow speeder now being controlled by Obi-Wan had once more caught up with Zam. Blaster fire erupted from the lime speeder, knocking the lightsaber from Anakin's hand, sending it careening through the air before it was caught by Obi-Wan far behind. HK landed on top of a final vantage point, this time a series of power line interlacing between two small apartment complexes. Raising his now vibrating rifle, HK raised the scope to his eyes as he knelt, arcs of electricity dancing along the barrel of the weapon. Target locked HK alerted Knox, awaiting the order to take the shot as Anakin and Zam continued to struggle, a small bout of fire erupting from the cockpit as the hunter accidentally shot her controls. Fire Knox ordered, HK's finger pulling the trigger not even a fraction of a second later as a small rod encased in white light burst from the barrel faster than Mach 7. It took barely a single second for the projectile to reach its intended target, puncturing the back of Sam's speeder and through the other side with next to no resistance. However the desired damaged and target had been done, all but obliterating the essential operating systems of the speeder that remained on autopilot until they were destroyed. HK rose to full height the barrel of his blaster smoking considerably as he watched the speeder drop through the sky and towards a series of nightlife below. Target hit confirmed HK alerted Knox despite the man already being away. Follow after them, observe what takes place and then return to following the senator Knox ordered. It will be done HK replied as Knox cut the link and went to do his own business. Flying at leisurely pace, HK gently landed on the platform to which the nightlife was taking place, having long since deconstructed his custom rifle and inserted the pieces into his one chassis to hide it. HK scanned the aliens making their rounds before ducking into an alleyway, liquid synth skin spewing over his form as his height adjusted, taking the form of a blue skinned twi'lek wearing a dull grey set of robes. He stepped out of the alley and followed the trail of carnage, gently pushing by bustling peoples as he followed the trail. By the time he found his targets, it appeared Anakin had seen fit to remove the woman of her hand, the two Jedi putting the hunter on the ground in an effort to interrogate her. Tuning his hearing, HK behind to listen in. Do you know who it was you were trying to kill Obi-Wan asked, kneeling in front of the woman. The senator from Nabo Zam replied, sending hateful glances up at Anakin whilst nervously looking around. Who hired you Obi-Wan asked, leaning closer even as the alien glared harder at him it was just a job. Anakin seemed to be getting tired of her evasiveness, twitching slightly as his grip tightened tell us. She's gonna die soon anyway, I can guarantee whoever they send next won't mess up like I did Zam hissed as the burnt limb flared in pain. It looks like this wound's going to need. Treatment Obi-Wan tried to compromise with the obviously irate woman. Who hired you, tell us, tell us now Anakin finally snapped as the woman's eyes snapped to him, a hateful sneer mounting on her face but nonetheless gave in. It was a bounty hunter called. HK picked up a new noise just before Zam gasped, 
the woman seizing and beginning to shake, following the trail of fire, HK spied Jango Fett crouched down with his hand extended. Obi-Wan and Anakin too turn to see Jango Fett just as the man's rocket pack roars to life before he ascends and escapes into the night. The woman went still in Anakin's arms, Obi-Wan reaching forward and pulling something from the woman's chest. Toxic Dart Anakin stood beside Jar Jar, standing guard to the entrance to Padme's bedroom whilst she and Dorm packed her luggage. Before long Padme marched from her room with Dorm in tow, staring straight forward to Jar Jar. Representative Binks, I am confident in my decision to count on you Padme stopped in front of the Gungan wearing very baggy clothing. Yusa Bechen Mesa Bottoms Jar Jar answered in his regular decorum. Eh Jar Jar what did we speak of Padme gave a pointed look to Jar Jar. As a representative to his species, it was expected of Jar Jar by many to speak of in a dignified manner as it often rubbed people the wrong way when he would speak as his ditzy self. So with the help of Kenya and Padme, they had been teaching him a more proper and educated manner of speaking. Oh yes, pardon I, Senator. I mean, I am honored to accept this heavy burden. I take on this responsibility with deep humility tinged with an overwhelming pride, it is not every day that I am called upon to. Cutting Jar Jar off, Padme rose to the tips of her toes and gently planted a kiss on the Gungan's cheek turning the Gungan red and causing a heated almost hateful glare to come onto Anakin's face, pointed solely on the Gungan. That'll do Jar Jar, you're a good friend. Now I don't wish to hold you up. I'm sure you have a great deal to do Padme dismissed the Gungan. Of course, M Lady Jar Jar bowed and turned, turning from the woman as a smile came to his face, evidently Senator Padme was in a very foul mood. I don't like this absurd idea of hiding Padme hissed as she passed by Anakin to continue packing. Don't worry, now that the council has declared the order of an investigation, it won't take long to find the bounty hunter Anakin smiled, eyes roaming level the irate senator's body whilst she wasn't looking. I haven't working for years to stop this dang able military creation act, only to not be here when the culmination of my actions comes to bear Padme growled out frustrated to her very core. Sagely of not arrogantly, Anakin continued to smirk as he made his way around the bed sometimes we have to let go of our pride and do what is requested of us. Padme paused her movements, her eye twitching slightly as she turned to face Anakin pride. Annie, you're young, inexperienced and definitely don't have a very firm grip of politics, I suggest you reserve your opinions for some other time with someone who wants to listen to them. Sorry. I was only trying to. Anakin tried to say before Padme cut him off. Annie no. Padme cut him off. Anakin looked sad if not depressed at the nickname please don't call me that. Call you what Padme turned back to Anakin in a huff. Annie. I've always called you that, it's your name isn't it Padme rebuked, crossing her arms under her bust. It's Anakin. When you say Annie. It's like I'm still a little boy, and I'm not, so please call me by my name Anakin looked at the woman who he crushed hard on with pleading eyes. Anakin I'm sorry. I get your point, besides it's impossible to deny you've. Padme openly looked up and down Anakin slowly, that you've grown up. Well, it's impressive, but from what I've seen, he definitely has a long way to go if he's even going to come close to his father's, physique Padme blushed slightly turning her head as Anakin looked away embarrassed. Well, Master Obi-Wan manages not to see it Anakin bitterly replied as he looked out the window. Well, mentors have a way of seeing more of our faults than we would like. It's how we grow is it not Padme replied, grabbing another bundle of clothing before shoving them into another suitcase. Don't get me wrong. Obi-Wan is a great mentor. As wise as Master Yoda and as powerful as Master Windu. I am truly thankful to be his apprentice. Only, although I'm a Padawan learner, in some ways, a lot of ways. I'm ahead of him. I'm ready for the trials. I know I am he knows it too. He believes I'm too unpredictable. Other Jedi my age have gone through the trials and made it. I know I started my training late but he won't let me move on Anakin rounded, standing next Tia. 
black face with his back towards the window, staring intently at Padmi as she once more had another bundle of clothes. That must be frustrating Padmi bent down and gently pushed and refitted her packed clothing. It's worse, he's overly critical. He never listens, he just doesn't understand it's not. Fair Anakin snapped, pacing across the room until he was on the same side of the bed as Padmi's bag. Padmi remained with her back turned, trying to stop the shaking in her shoulders as she held in a giggle I'm sorry. You sounded exactly like that little boy I once knew, when he didn't get his way. Anakin however was almost completely unamused as his eye twitched I'm not whining. I didn't say it to hurt you, it's okay Padmi smiled kindly as she placed a hand on the teen's shoulder, dorm watching from the back of the room. I know Anakin slumped slightly as he put his head in his hands. Anakin. Anakin looked up to Padme, both holding each other's gazes for several seconds before her lips parted don't try to grow up too fast. Anakin stood back up and smiled down at her I am grown up. You said it yourself. Please don't look at me like that Padme shifted as the teen began to look at her more intensely. Why not? Because I can see what you're thinking Padme took half a step back as Anakin's lips curled in amusement. Are you force sensitive Anakin sked in jest as Dorn watched the exchange with mild concern. No it makes me feel uncomfortable Padme rebuked before shoving her way past Anakin and moving to finish her pack. Sorry, M Lady. Karuskin civilian spaceport. Stepping off of a civilian bus, dressed in meager peasant outfits, Dorm. Obi-Wan and Typha waiting with their luggage as the two laughed together as Anakin joked to the woman. Milady, I bid you safe travels and stay Typho bowed lightly as Padme returned the gesture. Thank you Captain, take care of Dorm, the threat's on you too now Padme looked towards Dorm, a small trail of tears running down the woman's face as she was dressed as Padme. He'll be safe with me her lips quivered as she spoke, Padme bringing the woman into a hug as she held her head gently. You'll be fine Padme hushed before pulling back. It's not me I'm worried about milady, it's you. What if they realize our plot dorm whimpered, Padme shook her head, gesturing towards Anakin. Then I have faith that my Jedi protector will prove to me how grown up he is no Padme reassured dorm as the three shared a smile. Nobody present noticed the observing red lenses of HK as the droid watched them from the other side of the spaceport masquerading as a protocol droid with his chassis alteration. Slowly he made his way forward as Padme and Dorm shared one last hug, Anakin moving to pick up Padme's luggage whilst Arto began to follow after them a few paces behind. Once more listening in, HK heard the Master and Apprentice bid each other farewell with the words May the Force be with you. Making their way onto the huge freighter that would be transporting them to Naboo, Padme couldn't help the small frown that came to her face. Suddenly, I'm afraid. It's okay I'm kinda scared too. This is my first assignment on my own Anakin shared with the woman who began to look even more unsure at that tidbit of information. However she shook off her unease soon after at another one of Anakin's jokes. There's nothing to worry about, we have Arta with us. I do hope he doesn't try anything foolish HK heard as he walked right past Obi-Wan and Typho in small calculated steps. I'd be more concerned about her doing something, than him was the last thing HK heard of the exchange between the two as he just made it aboard the freighter before its doors were closed, the droid mingling between the tenants as it made its way to a dark part of the ship to once more change shape to be near its targets. My master, we are outbound for Nabo HK reported as his chassis shifted, another layer of synth skin covering him before he was made to look like a short tan skinned well endowed human female. Very good, very good. Keep me updated. The storage hold of the freighter was teeming with life, cramped closer together than anybody would have liked, emigrants and other beings tried to find comfort whilst carrying their belongings. Nudging his way past several people, the white and blue astromech made its way to a food line, a droid serving low-grade and distasteful mush into bowls for the patrons on board. Keep moving. Keep moving the droid yelled at a rather argumentative Rodian. Coming up to the vendor, Arto made his way forward, using his claw arms to manipulate the utensils, spurting the low-grade mush into the bowls. 
Artu then grabbed hold of several slices or chunks of what could have possibly passed for bread. Hey! No droids the serving droid yelled out as it reached forward and made to grab whatever Artu had taken, and much to its consternation Artu deftly dodged out of the way. Cheekily the droid grabbed a few slices of meat before making an escape, whirling round and moving towards where Padme and Anakin were located. Passing by a group of patrons, Artu failed to notice the glowing red eyes of a certain protocol droid whose head slowly turned to follow the droid. Laying atop a bench, Anakin's face twisted and contorted in his sleep, sweat ran down his face as he shifted no. Mom. No. Almost immediately Anakin's eyes snapped open, sitting up rapidly as he brushed off Padme's hand whom had reached out to wipe the sweat from his brow. His hand rose as he held the bridge of his nose, noticing the stare Padme was looking at him with, he turned to face the inquisitive woman's face. What Anakin asked as he rotated, planting his feet onto the cold ground, Artu arriving with their meals as the droid placed the bowls down onto a circular barrel sat between them. You were having a nightmare Padme pointed out, Anakin not answering just yet as he stared at her from the corner of his eyes. Seeing Anakin wasn't going to simply talk about it without any help, Padme offered one of the bowls to Anakin are you hungry? Thanks Anakin turned the slush over with a fork, watching it slosh around in the bowl. We uh, we went into light speed a while ago Padme informed Anakin, Artu returning to their sides once more with two cups of liquid they weren't sure they wanted to drink. Anakin remained silent before his eyes caught Padme's own for a few seconds. I'm looking forward to seeing Nebu again. I've thought about it every day since I saw it last. It's the most beautiful place I've ever seen the intensity of Anakin's statement unnerved Padme slightly. You were just a little boy then. It may not be as you remember it time changes your perception Padme told Anakin, hoping for him not to be disappointed when they'd inevitably land at the Nebu spaceport. I think time has given me much more mature feelings to enhance my perception Anakin rebuffed, smirking slightly as he stared unabashed at Padme. It must be difficult having sworn your life to the Jedi, not being able to visit the places you like, or do the things you like. Padme listed off, drifting off at the end of her sentence as she realized how lonely such a life must be. Or be with the people I love. Anakin finished, catching Padme off guard as she looked at him with a raised eyebrow. Are you allowed to love, I? Thought that was forbidden for a... Jedi Padme took a bite of her food as she leant in to hear what Anakin had to say. Attachment is forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Compassion which I would define as unconditional love, is central to a Jedi's life, so you might say we're encouraged to love Anakin smiled softly, eyes occasionally flickering to see the woman's reaction. You have changed so much Padme admitted, once more taking Anakin in as a whole. You haven't changed a bit. You're exactly the way I remember you in my dreams. I doubt if Nabo has changed much either Anakin started, the reverence in his voice taking her off guard once more. It hasn't. Padme began, but it appear Anakin was on a roll as he cut her off. I can't wait to breathe the sweet breeze that comes off the rolling hills. Whenever I try to visualize the Force, those hills are what I see Anakin look to Padme as he finished his sentence, she looked completely unsure on how to take what he said, or the undercurrent that he had accidentally portrayed. I love Nabo Anakin stammered out as his face went red trying to divert the embarrassment of his outburst. Thankfully, taking control of the situation for both their sakes, Padme diverted the topic of conversation. Were you dreaming about you mother earlier, weren't you? Padme asked, seeing the forlorn look on the teen's face, she winced internally. Yes. I left Tatooine so long ago, my memory of her is fading. I only have glimpses of her whenever I try to remember her. Kenya helps but it's not the same as actually being in her presence. And I don't want to lose it. Recently I've been seeing her in my dreams, vivid dreams, scary dreams. I worry about her. Padme watched as Anakin began to clamp up, not wanting to talk much further as he simply started poking at his food with his utensils. Jedi Temple Coruscant, Obi-Wan Kenobi. 
Obi-Wan shielded his eyes slightly as light from high above shone down from the lofty ceilings. Walking at a sedate pace, Obi-Wan passed by several apprentices and Padawans, making his way across the floor of the great hallway to the analysis room. It's getting late Obi-Wan mused as he watched the sun slowly lower of the horizon. Entering the analysis room, Obi-Wan walked past several glass cubicles where people were going to work on their own investigations. Coming to an open empty cubicle, Obi-Wan sat before the console as the droid within a sealed room on the opposite side of the cubicle came to life, a tray spitting out from the console for Obi-Wan to place the dart he held. Place the subject for analysis on the sensor tray please the droid labeled as PK-4 requested. Placing the dart down onto the tray, he watched as the tray retracted into the console, the droid on the other side activating the console as a screen lit up for Obi-Wan as the droid went to work. It's a toxic dart. I need to know where it came from and who made it Obi-Wan informed the droid as it picked up the dart before it and began to analyze it. One moment, please the droid turned away and made its way to a workstation reserved solely for itself, Obi-Wan watched the console as diagrams appeared on screen, scrolling rapidly as the droid tried searching for a match. Second passed by with no progress the list reaching its end before going blank, the droid humming and turning back hovering back towards the console and Obi-Wan. As you can see on your screen, subject weapon does not exist in any known culture. Markings cannot be identified. Probability self-made by a warrior not associated with any known society the droid listed off its hypothesis, placing the dart onto the tray for Obi-Wan to take. Pardon could you try again please Obi-Wan asked, consternation clear on his face. Master Jedi, our records are very thorough. They cover 8% of the galaxy. If I can't tell you where it came from, nobody can the droid replied matter-of-factly. Obi-Wan sighed, taking the dart from the tray that ejected once more from the console before him, sliding it into the pouch on his side before standing. Thanks for your assistance you may not be able to figure this out but I think I know someone who might Obi-Wan turned from the console and swiftly made his way from the analysis rooms, heading out of the temple and towards the city life of Coruscant. Hours passed as Obi-Wan made his way through the thick crowds of Coruscant, walking down a street in Coco Town. Old warehouses, beat up speeder and occasional freighters passing by. The man eventually stood before a kind of alien diner, patrons saying in and out of the doors happily. On one of the steamed up windows were the clear cut words of Dex's diner in Orbesh. Heading inside, Obi Wan saw two beings serving customers, one a blonde girl wearing a blue short dress. The other being a red and silver droid that rolled along on a single wheel. Leaning down over one of the tables, the blonde began to wipe one of the empty booths with a concentrated look. Looking around, at many booths Obi Wan looked at several individuals eating happily. Can I help ya? The girl asked, her name being Hermione Bogwe. I'm looking for Dexter, Obi Wan replied, missing the narrowing of the girl's eyes as she began defensive. What do you want him for? Hermione asked, shifting slightly as she looked to the droid who had was looking in their direction. Relax, he's not in trouble. It's a personal endeavor, I need his help with, Obi Wan told the girl. She still seemed somewhat suspicious but turned away and made her way towards the open serving hatch behind the counter. Dex, someone's here to see you honey she turned her away from the one she was speaking to to lower her voice Jedi by the looks of him. Almost immediately afterwards, a head poked out from the hatch looking around excitedly, the alien smiled widely. Obi-Wan the four-armed alien announced excitedly. Hey Dex Obi-Wan smiled and accepted. Take a seat, I'll be right with you Sex told Obi-Wan before poking his head back through the hatch. Walking towards the same booth Hermione has cleaned, the Jedi Master took a seat as the blonde waitress approached. Do you want a cup of RDs the girl offered to which Obi-Wan took with a kind smile. Thank you Obi-Wan watched the girl nod and depart immediately after, his attention turning from her to the opening kitchen door as a large bald, sweaty old alien walked through with a beaming smile. Hey old buddy Dexter quickly made his way forward. Hey Dex Obi-Wan too couldn't help the warmth that rose up within him. Stuffing himself into the opposite side of the booth, 
the alien studied Obi-Wan as Hermione settled two mug of steaming arties between them. So Obi-Wan my old friend, what can I do for you? Dex took the mug in one of his forearms and took a quick sip of his drink. You can start by telling me what this is. Obi-Wan reached into his robes and produced the dart between the two of them, watching as Dex's smile faltered slightly as he put down his mug with widened eyes. Well, what do you know? The man picked up the dart, taking to be careful not to nick his fingers on its sharp edges while he peered at it. I ain't seen one of these since I was prospecting on Subterrell beyond the outer rim. Do you know where it came from? Obi-Wan asked as he cupped his drink with his hands. Dex grinned before placing the dart onto the table between them. This baby belongs to them cloners, what you got here is a Kamino Kyber dart. Kamino Kyber dart. I wonder why it didn't show up in any analysis archive Obi-Wan ran his fingers through his beard in thought and suspicion. It's these funny little cuts on the side give it away. Those analysis droids you've got over there only focus on symbols, you know. I should think you Jedi would have more respect for the difference between knowledge and wisdom Dex pointed out, pointing at the dart throughout his words as Obi-Wan did indeed see what he was pointing to. Well, Dex, if droids could think, we wouldn't be here, would we? Obi-Wan laughed slightly with the alien as they mused in agreement Kamino, doesn't sound familiar. Is it part of the Republic? No, it's beyond the outer rim. I'd say about 12 parsecs outside the Rishi Maze, toward the south. It should be easy to find, even for those droids in your archive to find. Those Kaminoans keep to themselves. They're cloners, dang ed good ones, two Dex shook his head and explained to the Jedi Master. Picking up the dart, Obi-Wan stared at the dart intently as he turned it over in his hands. Cloners, are they friendly? Obi-Wan asked eyes straying from the dart to Dex. It depends Dex pointed out. On what? Dex Obi-Wan asked, curious at the alien's sudden shift in demeanor. On how good your manners are, and how big your pocketbook is. Dex grinned as he sat back, Obi-Wan nodding along slightly. Naboo spaceport, days later. The freighter landed with a shutter in the giant spaceport of Theed, emigrants from within the ship began to stream from within. Along with everyone departing, Anakin, Padme and Arta made their way of the ship with their luggage in hand as they made their way into the main plaza. Neither humans nor droid noticed the tracker placed within both bags of luggage in case one was lost, the own standing in the shadows of the freighter with a concentrated look. Stepping out from the shuttle bus, the trio came up to the front of the palace courtyards. The great courtyard itself stretching far and wide with the rose-colored sum of the palace on the far opposite side courtyard. If I grew up here. I don't think I'd ever leave Anakin mumbled wistfully. I doubt that Padme laughed in reply. No, really. When I started my training, I was homesick and lonely. This city and my mum and the occasional visits from Kenya were the only pleasant things I had to think about. The problem was, the more I thought about my mum, the worse I felt. But I would feel better when I thought of this place, the way it shimmers in the sunlight. The way the air always smells of flowers. Anakin thought, getting sad at the end of his words with a look from Padme. And the soft sound of the distant waterfalls. The first time I saw the capital, I was very young. I'd never seen a waterfall before. I though they were so beautiful. I never dreamt one day I'd live in the palace Padme finished, Anakin looked to her shock at the thought she too had thought the same. Well, tell me, did you dream of power and politics when you were a little girl? Anakin asked, curious about her younger life. Padme laughed out loud, stopping herself after several seconds before shaking her head. No that was the last thing I thought of. My dream was to help in the refugee relief movement. I never thought of running for elected office. But the more history I studied, the more I realized how much good politicians could do. So when I was eight, I joined the apprentice legislators, then later on became a senatorial advisor, with such a passion that, before I knew it, I was elected queen. Partly because I scored so high on my education certificate, but for the most part it was my conviction that reform was possible. I wasn't the youngest queen ever elected, 
but now that I think back on it, I'm not sure I was old enough. I'm not sure I was ready. The two walked through the white halls of the courtyard, ascending a pair of steps as they continued to walk. The people you served thought you did a good job. I heard they tried to amend the constitution so you could stay in office Anakin pointed out to Padme, a sour look coming over the woman's face at his side. Popular rule is not democracy, Annie. It gives the people what they want, not what they need, I don't know many worlds where both are the same thing. And, truthfully, I was relieved when my two terms were up. So were my parents. They worried about me during the blockade and couldn't wait for it all to be over. Actually, I was hoping to have a family by now. My sisters have the most amazing, wonderful kids, but when the Queen asked me to serve as Senator, I couldn't refuse her Padme told Anakin of her story, the boy not looking away from her as she was his sole focus. I agree, I think the Republic needs you. I'm glad you chose to serve. I feel things are going to happen in our generation that will change the galaxy in profound ways Anakin smiled in a rare moment of wisdom he held. I think so too Padme agreed wholeheartedly as they entered the palace soon after, a comfortable silence coming over the duo. Palace Throne Room, Nebu. Seated in her throne, Queen Jamilia sat comfortably as she smiled at Padme, CO Bubble at her side along with a series of advisors. Four handmaidens stood close by with guards standing at the doors. Taking Padme's hand, the queen looked relieved we've been worried about you, I'm glad you're safe Padme. Thank you, your highness. I only wish I could serve you better by staying on Coruscant for the vote Padme admitted sadly. Given the circumstances senator, you know it was the only decision her highness could have made CO explained the senator reluctantly accepting the man's words. How many systems have joined this Count Dooku and the separatists the Queen asked as Padme slowly took her hand from the Queen's hands. About 200. And more are leaving the Republic every day. If the Senate votes to create an army, I'm sure it's going to push us into a civil war Padme informed the aghast council. It's unthinkable, there hasn't been a full-scale war since the formation of the Republic. CO looked shocked at the notion of war. Do you see any way? through negotiations, to bring the separatists back to the Republic the Queen asked, hidden urgency on her face which was seen by Padme herself. Not if they feel threatened. The separatists don't have an army, but if they feel provoked, they will move to defend themselves. I'm sure of that. And with no time or money to build an army, my guess is they will turn to the Commerce Guilds of the Trade Federation for help Padme replayed to the Queen a thought process she had once asked of Knox to see if he could shed light on the potential actions the Confederacy could potentially take. The armies of the commerce, why has nothing been done in the Senate to restrain them the Queen hissed in a momentary display of hostility to a third party. I'm afraid that, despite the Chancellor's best efforts, there are still many bureaucrats, judges and even senators on the payrolls of the guilds Padme slumped at the headache the Commerce Guild were to her. It's outrageous after all of those hearings, and the four trials in the Supreme Court, Newt Gunray is still the Viceroy of the Trade Federation. Do those money mongers control everything CO hissed at the corruption running through the Senate? Remember, Counselor, the courts were able to reduce the Federation's armies. That's a move in the right direction the Queen said, coming to the defense of the Senate as a whole. There are rumors, your Highness that the Federation Army was not reduced as they were ordered Padme informed the Queen as the woman turned to look with her with an unsure gaze. The Jedi have not been allowed to investigate. It would be to be too dangerous for the economy, we were told Anakin offered his own words. We must keep our faith in the Republic. The day we stop believing democracy can work is the day we lose it the Queen reaffirmed her words, Padme wincing slightly. Let's pray that day never comes Padme nodded along with the Queen. In the meantime, we must consider your own safety the Queen changed the topic of the conversation with ease. With a signal from CO, all the advisors and attendants gave a bow before leaving the room. What is your suggestion Master Jedi CO Bibble asked as Anakin stood forward to answer. Anakin's not a Jedi yet counselor. He's still a Padawan learner, I was thinking. Padme cut in as Anakin looked annoyed. Hey, 
hold on a minute Anakin cut in only for Padme to silence him and continue. Excuse me. I was thinking I would stay in the lake country. There are some places up there that are very isolated Padme suggested of the council. Excuse me. I am in charge of security here, M. Lady Anakin knew he had messed up at the annoyed glare Padme sent him. C.O. Bubble and the Queen exchanging a look with each other at that moment. Annie, my life is at risk, and this is my home. I know it very well, that is why we're here. I think it would be wise for you to take advantage of my knowledge in this instance Padme worked hard to withhold the scorn in her voice. Sorry, M. Lady Anakin stepped back looking embarrassed for himself and Padme at his outburst. She is right. The lake country is the most remote part of Nebu. Not many people and a clear view of the surrounding terrain CEO looked amused at Anakin while supporting Padme in her stance. Perfect. It's settled then the queen stood up while Anakin sent a glare at Padme at the perceived slight at his intelligence and her being right. Padme, I had an audience with your father yesterday. I told him what was happening. He hopes you will visit your mother before you leave, your family's very worried about you Padme looked worried at the queen's words, choosing to follow her advice as they all exited down the main staircase. The Jedi Temple Standing the great library of the Jedi Temple, Obi-Wan stared passively at the bronze bust of Count Dooku. Seated around the room, five Jedi were seated around studying archived material. Computers stretched on forever, light panels glistening and tinkling with untold amounts of data held within. Did you call for assistance a frail elderly looking human Jedi woman came up beside the fellow Jedi Master, her name being Jocasta Nu. Yes, yes. I did Obi-Wan replied in a distracted state while staring at the angular features of the bronze bust. He has a powerful face, doesn't he? Jocasta announced affectionately he was the most brilliant Jedi I have had the privilege of knowing. I never understood why he quit. Only twenty Jedi ever left the Order Obi-Wan relayed a sadness with his voice, laced between his words which the older woman picked up on. The just twenty, and Count Dooku was the most recent and the most painful. No one likes to talk about it. His leaving was a great loss to the Order Jocasta explained to Obi-Wan. What happened Obi-Wan asked Jocasta. Well, one might say, he was always a bit out of step with the decisions of the Council, much like your old master, Kikon Jin Jocasta replied. Really Obi-Wan asked, his mouth opened slightly in surprise. Oh, yes. They were alike in many ways very individual thinkers, idealists. Jocasta grew distracted for a few moments as she looked sadly at the bust he was always striving to become a more powerful Jedi. He wanted to be the best. With a lightsaber, in the old style of fencing, he had no match. His knowledge of the Force was, unique. In the end, I think he left because he lost faith in the Republic. He believed that politics were corrupt and he felt the Jedi betrayed themselves by serving the politicians. He always had very high expectations of government. He disappeared for nine or ten years, then he just showed up recently as the head of the separatist movement. Interesting. I'm still not sure I understand Obi-Wan thumbed his beard as he tried to decipher what Jocasta had revealed to him. Well, I'm sure you didn't call me over here for a history lesson. Are you having a problem? Master Kenobi Jocasta hastily changed these topic of conversation and turned to the young man. Yes, I'm trying to find a planet system called Kamino. It doesn't seem to show upon any of the archive charts Obi-Wan and Jocasta made their way to one of the open computer stalls, the man starting it up to explain. Kamino, it's not a system I'm familiar with. Let me see. Jocasta leant down over Obi-Wan's shoulder to peer at the screen Are you sure you have the right CO ordinates? According to my information, it should be in this quadrant somewhere, just south of the Rishi maze Obi-Wan explained tapping away at the computer. No CO ordinates, it sounds like the kind of directions you'd get from a street tout, some old miner or furbig trader frowning the old woman took control of he computer away from Obi-Wan for a moment and typed away. All three actually Obi-Wan admitted sheepishly. Are you sure it exists Jocasta asked skeptically. 
Absolutely Obi-Wan replied, his tone resolute. Let me do a gravitational scan Jocasta offered, starting the process as Obi-Wan and the old woman watched nervously as the scan of the Rishi maze was completed. There are some inconsistencies here. Maybe the planet you are looking for was destroyed Jocasta stated sadly at the thought of a lost planet. Wouldn't that be on record Obi-Wan asked the old woman, his eyebrow raised. It ought to be. Unless it was very recent shaking her head slightly, she turned to Obi-Wan sadly I hate to say it, but it looks like the system you are searching for doesn't exist. That's impossible, perhaps the archives are incomplete Obi-Wan shook his head at the notion of what was suggested. The archives are comprehensive and totally secure, my young Jedi. One thing you may be absolutely sure of if an item does not appear in our records, it does not exist Jocasta explained before turning away and making her way to another Jedi motioning her for her attention. Feed residential area, Nabu. Passing gossiping old woman and men, the trio of humans and droid walked through he streets of Feed, carrying their luggage in hand. Children ran by, laughing joyously as they played together. Anakin had changed back into his brown Jedi robes. While Padme had changed into a simple beautiful dress that did the job of driving Anakin crazy. Stopping as they turned into a side street, Padme's face lit up with a wide smile. There's my house Padme stepped forward, hastily noticing Anakin's nervousness as the young man stood back. What, don't tell me you're shy Padme quipped as she turned to the boy. No, but I... He was cut off by the excited shouts of two little girls, bursting from the courtyard of a building and flinging themselves at Padme. Aunt Padme, Aunt Padme they yelled in unison as Padme wrapped her arms around them and gave a big hug. Ryo. Puja Padme cooed as she scooped them both up I'm so happy to see you. She turned to face a massively nervous Anakin with a small smirk on the side of her lips. This is Anakin and this is Ryo. she motioned to the girl on her right, and on the left this is Puja. Shyly the three exchanged their greetings before the girls spotted the shining white and blue dome of the astromech accompanying them Artu. The girls wrestled themselves from Padme's grasp to hug the droid, the droid whistling and beeping as he was set up and by the children. Deciding to let the children stay a play with Artu, Anakin and Padme chuckled and made their way into the house. Padme's parents' house. Standing around the dining room, Padme and Anakin watched as Sola came into the room carrying a large bowl of food. They're eating over at Jeff Naren's later mom. They just had a snack, they'll be fine Sola spoke over her shoulder to her mother in another room. Putting down the bowl of food onto the table, she smiled kindly at Anakin and Padme when Rui entered from the opposite doorway. Anakin, this is my sister, Sola Padme motioned to Sola as she continued to smile. Hello Anakin Sola produced a set of plates and began to set the table. Hello Anakin offered, unsure of how to continue so he left it at that. Soon Sola sat down, her mother Jabal coming in seconds later with a steaming bowl making hushing noises as she rushed towards the table. You're just in time for dinner. I hope you're hungry Anakin Jabal spoke in a small voice, eyes lidded slightly as a smile played on her lips. I am a little Anakin replied. Oh mum he's being polite. We're starving Padme cut in, adjusting her seat so she would be closer to the table while she stared hungrily at the home cooked meal. You came to the right place at the right time. Sit down, son Rui grinned at Anakin as Jabal started passing around the food at the table. Honey, it's so good to see you safe. We were so worried Jabal started. Ignoring the dirty look Padme gave her whilst Rui smiled slightly at the pending conversation. Dear. Rui began as Jabal slumped at his voice. I know, I know, but I had to say it. Now it's done Jabal smiled sadly as Sola passed the bowl off food to her father. Well, this is exciting. Do you know, Anakin, you're the first boyfriend my sister's ever brought home Sola coyly stated as Anakin became beet red in his face. Sola he isn't my boyfriend. He's a Jedi assigned by the Senate to protect me Padme bit out in order to hush her sister's japes. A bodyguard. Oh, Padme, they didn't tell us it was that serious Jabal began to look panicked as her heart raced. It's not, 
Mom, I promise. Anyway, Anakin's a friend. I've known him for years. Remember that little boy who was with the Jedi during the blockade crisis she sent Jabal a look even as everybody nodded well this is him, he just, grew up. Honey, when are you going to settle down? Haven't you had enough of that life? I certainly have Jabal pressed. Her argument as Padme's face soured. Mom, I'm not in any danger Padme replied, not wanting the topic to continue any further. Is she Rui asked as he turned to Anakin. Yes. I'm afraid she is Anakin finally replied. But not much Padme weakly cut in as she sent Anakin a pinning glare. Afternoon, the garden. Sometimes I wish I'd traveled more, but I must say, I'm happy here Rui commented as he walked through the garden with his daughter's Jedi protector. Padme tells me you teach at the university Anakin spoke. Yes, and before that. I was a builder. I also worked for the refugee relief movement, when I was very young. Meanwhile with Padme, Sola, and Jabal. Clearing the table, Sola turned to Padme with a lidded gaze why haven't you told us about him? What's there to talk about, he's just a boy Padme replied in a clipped manner, her annoyance clear. A boy, have you seen the way he looks at you Sola continued on despite her sister's annoyance. Sola? Stop it Padme's tone was final, but as it is with any sibling, they fonty nude anyway. It's obvious he has feelings for you. Are you saying, little baby sister, that you haven't noticed Sola stacked all the plates on top of each other? I'm not your baby sister, Sola. Anakin and I are friends, our relationship is strictly professional Padme bit, balancing both empty bowls of food together as she turned to her mother mom would you tell her to stop it? Well, maybe you haven't noticed the way he looks at you. I think you're afraid to Sola laughed at Padme's increasingly an out attitude. Cut it out Padme turned on her sister with a hard glare. Sola's just concerned, we all are Jabal preferred her own words. Oh, mom, you're impossible. What I'm doing is important Padme stated, trying to get her mother to understand. You've done your service. Padme. It's time you had a life of your own. You're missing so much Jabal went quite after speaking her final words, her eyes downcast with sadness as she thought off her daughter's steadfastness and refusal to do anything for herself. Back with Anakin and Rui. Now tell me, son. How serious is this thing? How much danger is my daughter really in the father asked as he turned and cacked Anakin, the young man sighing as he prepared to answer. There have been two attempts on her life. Chances are there'll be more. My master is tracking down the assassins. I'm sure he'll find out who they are. This situation, won't last long Anakin tried to calm the nervous man with his words of confidence on his master behalf. I don't want anything to happen to her Rui said in a display of vulnerability that made Anakin win CE. I don't either. An hour later, Padme's room. Don't worry. This won't take long Padme said to Anakin as the team leant against the door frame, Padme herself packing things into her luggage. I just want to get there before dark Anakin soothingly replied as Padme continued packing. Stepping from the door frame, he looked around the room. You still live at home. I move around so much, I've never had a place of my own. Official residences have no warmth. I feel good here. I feel at home Padme replied to Anakin's questions. Picking up a framed hologram, Anakin to end it over in his hands in silence is this you. In the hologram was Padme at seven or eight surrounded by a horde of forty of fifty little green humanoid creatures, she appeared to be holding one in her arms as she smiled hugely in the hologram. That was when I went with the relief group to Shadabai Baran. Their sun was imploding, and the planet was dying. I was helping to relocate the children. See that little one I'm holding? His name was Nakitula, which means sweet here. He was so full of life. All those kids were. I did everything I could to save him, but he died, they all did. They were never able to adapt, to live off their native planet Padme explained before placing the hologram back into its place, memories of a small creature in his arms when Kigon was still alive 
he absent-mindedly reached into his pockets, his hands wrapping around a small handful of crystals he hadn't parted with in years. Getu Anakin thought sadly for a moment before his eyes caught another hologram. Slowly reaching out for the hollow with his left hand, he picked it up, showing Padme at the age of eleven. Wearing official robes and standing between two robed legislators. Her expression severe and serious. My first day as an apprentice legislator. Notice the difference Padme pulled a face, Anakin grinned before she turned back and continued packing, Anakin placing the second hollow, the young man seeing the stark difference between the two pictures of Padme. Halfway across the city, staring out towards the Nabari resides, HK watched Anakin and Padme depart the residence, connecting a hollow channel to his master. Greetings my lord, report. They are on the move. Jedi Temple, training veranda. Walking through the main hallway towards the nearest training area, Obi-Wan looked forward at the arched doorway ahead. Coming out to the veranda, Obi-Wan spotted twenty or so four-year-olds training with the oldest member of the Jedi Order, Master Yoda. Helmets covered their eyes as they tried to strike training droids with miniature lightsabers, the droids hissing and changing orientation to avoid them. Don't think, feel, be as one with the Force. Help you, it will Yoda watched with a sense of pride as his students tried to do as asked, seeing the approaching figure of Obi-Wan, he tapped his cane on the ground younglings, enough. A visitor we have. Welcome him. Taking off their helmets, the children turned off their lightsaber with small smiles on their faces. Master Obi-Wan Kenobi, meet the mighty bear clan today motioned to the clan as the man bowed children welcome, Master Obi-Wan. I am sorry to disturb you, Master Obi-Wan stated his regret as the alien chuckled and shook his head. What help to you, can I be Yoda asked. I'm looking for a planet described to me by an old friend. I trust him. But the system doesn't show up on the archive maps Obi-Wan explained as Yoda processed and thought over the words. An interesting puzzle. Gather round the map reader, younglings. Master Obi-Wan has lost a planet. Find it, we will try. Yoda slowly made his way to a nearby map reader, the children gathered around it as Obi-Wan took out a little glass ball and placed it onto a small bowl sitting atop a shaft. The window shades closed, darkening the room as the reader lit up. Projecting a star map hologram throughout the room. The children laughed and tried to reach up to grab the light. This is where it ought to be, but it isn't. Gravity is pulling all the stars in this area inward to this spot. There should be a star here, but there isn't Obi-Wan pointed to a single point on the map. Most interesting. Gravity's silhouette remains, but the star and all its planets have disappeared. How can this be Yoda turned to the children, each looking unsure before a child named Jack put his hand up, and with Yoda's nod he spoke. Because someone erased it from the archive memory Jack offered as Obi-Wan immediately looked troubled as the other children chimed in that's right yes, that's what happened, someone erased it. If the planet blew up, the gravity would go away another child named May continued on the explanation. Truly wonderful, the mind of a child is. Uncluttered. To the center of the pull of gravity go, and find your planet you will Yoda smiled as Obi-Wan stared but nodded seeing the wisdom offered by the children. But Master Yoda who could have erased information from the archives? That's impossible, isn't it Obi-Wan asked as Yoda frowned. Much harder to answer, that question is. Napo Lake Retreat, Landing Platform, Late Afternoon. A water speeder, driven by Paddy Aku, the caretaker, schemed across the lake towards the island retreat, Padme and Anakin sat comfortably as they watched the lodge become larger as they came closer. It took a few more minutes, but before long they were stopping atop the terrace, Anakin helping Padme from the speeder. They quickly departed the terrace, walking up a series of stairs onto a terrace overlooking a massive garden. Behind them, Paddy oversaw two serving girls as they made to move the bags of luggage WTH diligence. Stopping at the balustrade, Anakin looked to Padme as she looked out over the garden and the shimmering lake and the rising mountains beyond. When I was in level 3, we used to come here for school retreat. 
See that island? We used to swim there every day. I love the water Padme explained as she reminisced. I do too. I guess it comes from growing up on a desert planet Anakin replied, Padme becoming very aware that Anakin was staring directly at her. We used to lie on the sand and let the sun dry us, and try to guess the names of the birds singing Padme continued. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Not like here. Here everything's soft, and smooth. Anakin touched Padme's arm gently, his finger tracing her arm as Padme became nervous as she became quite aware of how Anakin thought of her. There was a very old man who lived on the island. He used to make glass out of sand and vases and necklaces out of the glass. They were magical. Everything here is magical. You could look into the glass and see the water. The way it ripples and moves. It looks so real, but it wasn't Padme stared back at Anakin as his eyes passed over her features. Sometimes, when you believe something to be real, it becomes real. Real enough, anyway. Slowly he raised his hand to her chin, stroking it softly as he felt the smoothness of her skin. I used to think if you looked too deeply into glass, you would lose yourself, Padme offered weakly. I think it's true. Leaning down, Anakin kissed Padme to which the girl eagerly accepted, the two sharing in the heated moment. Eyes shooting open, Padme pulled herself back in regret I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. When I'm around you, my mind is no longer my own Anakin offered weakly as Padme shook her head. It's the situation, the stress. She replied. Jedi Temple Landing Platform With his starfighter ready to take off, Obi-Wan walked beside Mace winded towards its open canopy. Be wary, this disturbance in the Force is growing stronger Mace spoke in a grave tone. I am concerned for my Padawan. He is not ready to be on his own Obi-Wan made insecurities known. The Council is confident in this decision, Obi-Wan Mace replied smoothly and confidently he has exceptional skills. The Council is confident in its decision, Obi-Wan. If the prophecy is true, he will be the one to bring balance to the Force. But he still has much to learn. And his abilities have made him, well, arrogant. I realize now what you and Master Yoda knew from the beginning, the boy was too old to start the training A&D. Obi-Wan hesitated slightly, which Mace easily caught onto. There's something else Mace pressed Obi-Wan with his eye. Master, he should not have been given this assignment. I'm afraid Anakin won't be able to protect the Senator Obi-Wan replied slowly. Why? He has a, an emotional connection with her. It's been there since he was boy. Now he's confused, distracted Obi-Wan Anno and, Mace looked unsure at the sudden occurrence but offered his wisdom nonetheless. Obi-Wan, you must have faith that he will take the right path Mace replied, but wasn't sure him safe as Obi-Wan climbed into the cockpit of the starfighter. Has Master Yoda gained any insight into whether or not this war will come about Obi-Wan asked as he paused and looked up at the brown-skinned man. Probing the dark side is a dangerous process. He could be in seclusion for days. May the force be with you Mace spoke, watching as Obi-Wan clipped Eno the fighter, the canopy closing before the ship rose and blasted into the atmosphere. Naval Lake Retreat Lounge The two sat down at a large table, smiling at the maids as dessert was placed between them. The sun touching the mountain peaks through the open balcony as the lake glowed in rose-tinted light. Staring down at the fruit offered to the two of the, Padme picked up a fork and made to spear the fruit. She twisted as the fruit seemingly moved on its own AMD dodged her stab, only to do the same after she tried again. Slowly she frowned and raised her head to look at Anakin who was focusing on her plate. You did that Padme accused as Anakin snap head up in wide-eyed innocence. What? She scowls at the fruit and back at Anakin as he moved his hand slightly, the fruit rising slightly to hover in front of her. That, now stop it Padme laughed along with Anakin, reaching out to grab it, but it looped around her hand to avoid her Anakin. Moving his hand, Anakin smirks as it lands in his outstretched fingers I'm not really supposed to do that, for fun, I mean. If Master Obi-Wan were here, 
he'd be very grumpy. Seemingly pleased with himself he cut into he fruit, reducing it to slices, before raising one of these slices into the air and sending it back to Padme. Slowly she raised her fork and pierced the fruit, taking it to her mouth before taking a bit. AMD in the corner, in the force, Knox watched all this with an apathetic gaze. Hours later, twilight. With a fire blazing in an open hearth, Anakin watched Padme stare into the open flames with distant eyes. Unbeknownst to her, Knox stood directly behind the woman, hand held above her head as he focused on his task. Slowly she raises her head to him as she notices Eddie's presence. May I tell you something Anakin began with a brief pause. I don't know Padme replied as she turned her face back to the fire. Then how can I tell you Anakin asked of the woman who didn't turn back to face him. Maybe you should use your Jedi intuition Padme snarked in reply. It doesn't work around you. My mind is always a muddle. I can only think of you Anakin started as Padme sighed. Anakin, don't. Padme tried to stop him but it appeared the boy was dead set on revealing his heart. From the moment I met you, all those years ago, a day hasn't gone by when I haven't thought of you. And now that I'm close to you again, I'm in agony. The closer I get to you, the worse it gets. The thought of not being with you misks my stomach turn over, my mouth goes dry. I feel dizzy. I can't breathe. I'm haunted by the kiss you should never have given me. My heart is beating, hoping that kiss will not become a scar. You are in my very soul, tormenting me. What can I do, I will do anything you ask. Silence. The logs flame in the hearth Anakin basically bled to the woman as she simply watched him if you are suffering as much as I am, tell me. I can't. We can't. It's just not possible Padme shook her head and once more tried to turn away. Anything's possible. Padme, please listen. You listen. We live in a real world. Come back to it. You're studying to become a Jedi Knight. I'm a senator. If you follow your thoughts through to conclusion, they will take us to a place we cannot go, regardless of the way we feel about each other Padme desperately tried to reason with Anakin, but the teen apparently only caught the end of her words. Then you do feel something there's an extraordinary connection between us. You can't deny that Anakin cut her off, his desperation clear as day as he almost grov velayed. Annie, it doesn't make any difference. Jedi aren't allowed to marry. You swore an oath, remember. You'd be expelled from the Order. I will not let you give up your responsibilities, your future, for me. I was destined to be a Jedi. I don't think I could be anything else. But you are asking me to be rational. That is something I know I cannot do. I wish I could wish my feelings away but I can't Anakin retorted as he tried to reason with her, just make her understand. I am not going to give in to this. I'm not going to throw my life away. I have more important things to do than fall in love Padme bit, finally turning away at what she perceived was the end of their argument. After several seconds of silence, Anakin opened his mouth again. It wouldn't have to be that way, we could keep it a secret Anakin reasoned to her as she whirled to face him. Then we'd be living a lie, one we couldn't keep even if we wanted to. M.T. sister saw it. So did my mother. I couldn't do that. Could you, Anakin? Could you live like that Padme asked, Anakin slumping and seeing defeat as his eyes lidded. No, you're right. It would destroy us. Kamino. Coming out of hyperspace. Obi-Wan stared at the perpetual storm-covered planet as his ship dislodged from the hyperspace ring that connected to his fighter. Flying forward, the man approached the planet, entering the atmosphere and flying towards a glistening silver city stood above the ocean. Heading towards a circular platform held aloft by stilts as waved crashed against the ultra-modern city. His landing was signified by the hiss of his landing gear and a beeping from the starship's systems. A sigh escaped the man raising his hands and pulling his robe's hood over his head. With his head now covered, he opened the fighter's canopy, the sound of heavy rain intensifying as the man rose from his seated position and climbed out of the ship. 
Stay with the ship Obi-Wan ordered his droid as he stepped down onto the metal platform and towards a see-through door connected to the platform. Entering the door as it slid open, drop plates of rain splattering on the floor. Welcome to Tipica City, Master Jedi, I am Tongwi Obi-Wan wiped the water from his face as he noticed the large taunt alien that had approached him. Everything is ready. The Prime Minister expects you Tongwi motioned to the right as Obi-Wan looked confused. I'm expected. Of course, he is anxious to see you. After all these years, we were beginning to think you weren't coming. Now please, this way came the reply, Obi-Wan hiding his surprise and following the alien down the corridor. They walked mostly in silence as Obi-Wan looked at the architecture before they came to a stop in front of a closed door. With her H.E. door sliding open, the two entered, Obi-Wan spotting another alien as it rose from behind its desk seemingly made of pure light. May I present Lamasu, Prime Minister of Kamino, and this is Master Jedi. Obi-Wan Kenobi Obi-Wan bowed to the Prime Minister. Please. Lamasu motioned towards a chair to which Obi-Wan obliged and made his way to the chair, sitting across from Lamasu as the Prime Minister sat down slowly. I trust you are going to enjoy your stay. We are most happy you have arrived at the best part of the season Lamasu nodded along as he spoke. You make me feel most welcome Obi-Wan replied as the Prime Minister seemed satisfied with his words. And now to business. You will be delighted to hear we are on schedule. 200,000 units are ready, with another million well on the way Lamasu explained as Obi-Wan was caught further off guard. That is, good news. Please tell your master Sido Dias that we have every confidence his order will be met on time and in full. He is well, I hope. I'm sorry Master Obi-Wan was unsure if he heard correctly. Jedi Master Sifo Dias. He's still a leading member of the Jedi Council, is he not Lamasu answered. Oh, yes. Sido Dias. Rising from his seat, Lamasu motioned to the door. Expecting Obi-Wan to follow behind you must be anxious to inspect the units for yourself. That's why I'm here. Nabo Mountain Meadow. Walking through long-length grass plains sprinkled with beautiful flowers. In the distance, a herd of shocks grazing through the grass innocently. The shimmering expanse of the lake in the distance captivated Padme and Anakin as they sat in the grass conversing with each other in a coy mood. Padme herself sat picking at the flowers that surrounded her. Oh I don't know. Padme shook her head with a small smile. Sure you do, you just don't want to tell me Anakin replied smirking at the woman as she shifted slightly. Are you going to use one of your Jedi mind tricks on me Padme poked at him with her jape. They only work on the weak minded. You are anything but weak minded Anakin is his compliment with his answer which she easily picked up. All right, his name was Palo. I was twelve. We were both in the legislative youth program. He was a few years older than I, very cute, dark curly hair, dreamy eyes Padme played wistfully as she looked at Anakin's face from the corner of her eyes. All right, I get the picture, what happened to him Anakin asked as Padme chuckled at his sour look. I went on to become a queen. He went on to become an artist Padme easily answered as Anakin nodded. Maybe he was the smart one Anakin replied in a bitter tone. You really don't like politicians, do you Padme asked with a raised eyebrow. I like two or three, but I'm not really sure about one of them smirking slightly out of the corner of his lips, he sighed glanced her I don't think the system works. How would you have it work Padme asked, genuinely curious at his outlook. We need a system where the politicians sit down and discuss the problems, agree what's in the best interests of all the people, and then do it Anakin explained, Padme seeing the obvious correlation between what they currently had and what he wanted. That is exactly what we do. The trouble is that people don't always agree. In fact, they hardly ever dox Padme answered to Anakin's thoughts. Then they should be made to Anakin stated honestly. By who, who's going to make them the woman he crushed on asked. I don't know. Someone Padme raised an eyebrow. You she accused. Of course not me the teen snarked. But someone Padme shrugged. 
someone wise Anakin squinted as he stared off at the lake. That sounds an awful lot like a dictatorship to me Padme bitterly replied, trying to imagine the galaxy under such a state. She stared at Anakin as she watched a small grin come to his features. Well, if it works. Anakin answered, face dead straight without a smile as he stared at her with intensity. You're making fun of me Padme giggled. Oh no, I'd be much too frightened to tease a senator Anakin sarcastically replied. You're so bad she laughed, picking up a fruit and tossing it at the side of his head. Still holding the smug grin on his face, Padme threw two more which he caught without any issue. You're always so serious. Always carrying the weight of the universe on your shoulders. Starting to juggle the fruit, Anakin smiled and laughed, jumping to catch and add more fruit to his thrown fruits, he continued this until he had caught too many, losing control before ducking. Being the recipient of the fruits falling atop his head with a splatter. He bit his lip to hold his laugh before Padme's bark of laughter forced his lips to loosen before they devolved into giggles together. They spent hours on the grass plain overlooking the lake, before Anakin got an idea into his head. Now he stood in front of a shock waving his arms as he yelled at it. Watching Anakin run around in circles as the shock chased him, Padme simply laughed as she held her stomach. As the shock was up in him, Anakin leapt into the air, landing onto the shock facing backwards. He laughed as it crossed past Padme, bucking wildly. Leaping from left and right. He lasted for a few moments before he was kicked off, tossed through the air and trampled over him as he landed on the ground, fleeing from its aggressor to rejoin its herd. Seeing Anakin laying still face down in the ground, Padme's face swiftly fell, shooting to her feet as she rose and rushed to his side, barking out his name in worry. Slamming down beside him, she turned Anakin over, mock fury taking over her as she caught his look of amusement. She slapped him on the chest several times as she cussed him out. Grabbing her slapping hands Anakin laughed as he dragged her down atop of him, the two swiftly revolving into a struggle in the grass, simply enjoying themselves before they came to a stop at a bottom of the hill, the two split up and lay on their backs beside each other. Seeing the same shock from earlier approaching, this time slot calmer than earlier, he sat up and approached the shock slowly. The beast seemed to eye him critically, it seemingly allowed him to approach. Slowly placing his palm to the beast's head, Anakin laughed joyously as he turned back to an inquisitive Padme. Holding out his hand to her. Milady Anakin smirked as she gently took his hand, taking by surprise as he suddenly pulled her forward and hoisted her up onto the shock, leaping up after he did so to land in front of her on the shock's shoulder blades. With a hip and a spur, the shock stumbled into movement as Anakin anchored himself to it, Padme wrapping her arms around him and planting her head into his back for comfort. Slowly, together, they made their way across the grass plains towards the retreat. Tipica City, Parade Ground, Kamino. Standing beside Lama Su and Tanwi on an overlooking balcony. Obi-Wan looked at the amassing army of white soldiers below. Thousands of figures marched in unison, covered by white helmets with T-shaped visors. Several hundred being run through drilling formations. Magnificent! Aren't they Lama Su stated as he watched his creations with pride. Obi-Wan had nothing to say, simply nodding his head as he stared unblinkingly at the armies. Come! I have much to show you Tong we instructed as he turned to lead Obi-Wan. Walking by a large eating area, Obi-Wan listened to Lama Su with Tong we following closely behind. He looked at what seemed to be a horde of identical twenty-something-year-old males, hundreds of them sitting together, all dressed in black whilst they ate together, conversing as they normally would. We modified their genetic structure to make them less independent than the original host. As a result they are totally obedient, taking any order without question Tong we told Obi-Wan as the human ran a finger through his beard. Who was the original host Obi-Wan asked in masked suspicion and curiosity. A hunter called Jango Fett, we felt a Jedi would be the perfect choice, but Sido Dias hand picked Jango Fett himself Lama Su answered the question. Where is this bounty hunter now Obi-Wan questioned as he looked up to the aliens. Oh we keep him here. After a few hundred thousand clones, 
the genetic pattern starts to fade, so we take a fresh supply. He lives here, but he's free to come and go as he pleases Lama Su was happy to keep answering the Jetty's questions, seeing no issue in doing so as they continued on to the next section of the tour. Barracks Walking through a corridor of transparent tubes, the trio watched the clones climbing into sleeping tubes for rest, falling asleep soon after as his siblings did the same. Apart from his pay, which is considerable, Fett demanded only one thing, an unaltered clone for himself. Curious isn't it Lama Su explained, his own bafflement at the request the bounty hunter hand made. Unaltered Obi-Wan asked, eyebrow raised. Pure genetic replication. No tampering with the structure to make it more docile, and no growth acceleration. The alien explained. I would like to meet this Django Fett. I would be most happy to arrange it, for you Tong we replied, bowing and leaving back through the way they had come in through as Obi-Wan continued with Lama Su. Clone Center Classroom Walking past through several classroom, filled with young boys all identical to each other as they simultaneously went through learning programs. You mentioned growth acceleration. Obi-Wan mentioned back to the previous conversation. Oh yes, it's essential. Otherwise, a mature clone would take a lifetime to grow. Now, we can do it in half the time. Those items you saw on the parade ground were started ten years ago, when Cedo Dias first placed the order, and they're already mature. Obi-Wan nodded along as he turned his gaze to the boys. And these Obi-Wan nodded to the nearest child. About five years ago if I remember correctly. Hatchery. Walking through the same corridor, Obi-Wan looked towards several towering racks of glass spheres, filled with fluid and embryos suspended within. They're immensely superior to droids, capable of independent thought and action Lama So continued on. Very impressive Obi-Wan replied, thinking on how to pose his question without alerting the, the Prime Minister of his confusion. I'd hoped you would be pleased the alien replied seemingly pleased with himself. Gazing at the nearest embryo rack, Obi-Wan came to the first question tell me, Prime Minister, when my master Sido Dias first contacted you, did he say the order was for, himself, or, himself? Of course not. This army is for the Republic. The Republic Obi-Wan question astonished by the answer. We are also very much against this Count Dooku and his secessionist movement. We are proud to be of help to the Republic. Tipica City Apartments I have arranged for you to meet Django Fett in the morning. Sleep well Tong we left Obi-Wan to his room as the master graciously accepted, allowing the alien to leave. Hearing the door close behind him, Obi-Wan pulled out his comlink. R4, R4. Obi-Wan spoke into the machine in his hand. Hearing the droid on the other side answer, Obi-Wan breathed a sigh of relief. R4, relay this. Scramble code 5. To Coruscant, care of the old folks home. Jedi Temple, Master Yoda and Windu. Sitting in a closed room, Yoda and Windu watched the hologram shimmer in and out, the single week as it struggled to hold itself together. Forgive me masters but I was under the impression Master Sifo Dias died before this by some months Obi-Wan apologized as the Masters looked to each other. No. Whoever placed that order was not a Jedi, I can assure you may squinted at the puzzle before him. I have a strong feeling that this bounty hunter is the assassin we're looking for Obi-Wan reaffirmed his suspicions as the Masters nodded. Who he is working for, discover that, you must Yoda demanded as the Master over Hollow nodded. I will, Master, and I will also find out more about this clone army. May the Force. The hollow cut off immediately after, having lost signal. A clone army. Ordered by someone in the Senate perhaps. Someone's out to start a war Mace offered his own wisdom as Yoda played with his ears, a hard look on his face. Inform the Chancellor of this, we must Yoda started to rise as Mace asked a question that troubled him. Who do you think this imposter of Cedo Dias, could be Yoda stared at Windu intensely before shaking his head. Nabu, night. The lodge was silent, the lake rippled slightly as fish swam happily, 
the tranquil waters reflecting the light of the moons. Laying in his bed, Anakin shifted restlessly, sweat poured down his neck and forehead. Turning violently, he cried out. No. No. Mom. No. Don't. Immediately after his eyes snapped open, the teen falling back onto his sheets simply stating up at the roof. Hours had passed, he now stood on the balcony with his arms behind his back, his eyes closed as he controlled his breathing. Padme came up to the door frame, staring at him seemingly meditating before turning to leave in silence. Don't go Anakin grumbled out, his eyes still closed. I don't want to disturb you Padme came back, slowly approaching as the teen took a deep breath. Your presence is soothing Anakin replied, a brief pause overcoming any further conversation. You had a nightmare again last night Padme pointed out, now standing by his side as Anakin's face scrunched up. Jedi don't have nightmares Anakin deflected as Padme looked at him unamused. I heard you Padme revealed to which Anakin opened his eyes and looked at her. I saw my mother. I saw her as clearly as I see you now. She's suffering, Padme. She is in pain, they're killing her Anakin looked completely distraught, catching Padme off guard at the intensity of his words I know I'm disobeying my mandate to protect you, Senator. I know I will be punished and possibly thrown out of the Jedi Order, but I must go. I have to help her, I'm sorry, Padme. I don't have a choice. Annie, I told you I wouldn't let you give up your future for me. I'll go with you. That way you can continue to protect me, and you won't be disobeying your mandate Padme replied, the relief flowing from Anakin almost palpable. What about Master Obi-Wan Anakin asked. Smiling and grabbing Anakin's hand, she dragged him back into the lodge, lidded eyes peering back at him I guess we won't tell him, will we? Once more, hours had passed, with their luggage packed, they moved via speeder across the lakes, they made their way into a floating platform in another section of the lake. Boarding the Nabooian ship, they soon depart on board the ship, en route to Tatooine as Anakin's nerves are at him slowly. Kamino Standing before the door to Jango Fett's apartment, Tanwi stood with Obi-Wan as he waved his hand, a muted bell ringing on the other side. Whilst waiting, Obi-Wan looked around, noting the door locking mechanism. The door suddenly opened whilst a ten-year-old boy stood on the other side, sizing them up with his gaze, identical to the boys from the cloning facility. Boba, is your father here? Tanwi asked as he looked down at the unaltered clone. After a small past, Boba nodded, squinting at both before him. May we see him? Tongwe asked, Boba Fett pausing for a few seconds. Sure Boba answered, slowly stepping to the side, allowing for Tongwe to enter with Obi-Wan. Looking around the room with an inquisitive gaze, Obi-Wan heard Boba call for his father from behind him. Stepping out from his bedroom, wearing a jumpsuit. Jango Fett was unshaven and mean-looking with scars and old wounds. A few odd tattoos on his body as he stared at Obi-Wan with suspicion. Welcome back, Jango. Was your trip productive Tongwe asked out of courtesy. Fairly Jango refused to elaborate further. Sizing each other up, Obi-Wan and Jango stood across from each other as Boba Fett studied them both with a small frown. This is Jedi Master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's come to check on our progress Tong we introduced as Jango's features remained neutral. That right Jango fixed Obi-Wan with a cold glare. Your clones are very impressive. You must be very proud Obi-Wan tried a friendly approach with the man, once more Jango was seemingly unaffected. I'm just a simple man, trying to make my way in the universe, Master Jedi Jango answered. Aren't we all Obi-Wan began to circle the room looking around eyes snapping to the open door of the bedroom where he catches sight of a couple of pieces of silver armor. Seeing Obi-Wan's gaze, Jango stepped in front of Obi-Wan's eyesight, cutting the man off. Ever made your way as far into the interior as Coruscant Obi-Wan looked into Jango's eyes searching. Once or twice. Recently Obi-Wan asked, perhaps a bit too forceful as Jango looked at him carefully. Possibly. Jango answered cryptically. 
then you must know Master Sido Dias Obi Wan quickly changed the topic, choosing an alternative approach. Boba, close the door. Jango ordered as his metaphorical son did as asked, smiling thinly at Obi Wan in the process. Master Hu Jango played dumb as Obi Wan remained steadfast. Sido Dias, isn't he the Jedi who hired you for this job? Obi Wan continued as Jango shook his head. Never heard of him. I was requited by a man called Tyrannus on one of the moons of Bogdan Jango told Obi-Wan as the master took the new information with a raised eyebrow. No. I thought. Obi-Wan began, before being cut off by Tongwi who seemingly had the answer. Sido Dias told us to expect him. And he showed up just when your Jedi master said he would. We have kept the Jedi's involvement a secret until your arrival, just as your master requested. Curious. Obi-Wan replied, suspicion now at an all-time high. Do you like your army? Jango attempted to divert the master's attention. It seems to me it's your army, being that they are all clones of you. Obi-Wan answered with a side glance. They'll do their job well, I'll guarantee that. Jango grinned, pride ringing from him. I look forward to seeing them in action. Thank you for your time Jango Obi-Wan turned to fully face Jango. Always a pleasure to meet a Jedi Jango bid the master farewell, watching Tongwi and Obi-Wan leave, the small smile on Jango's face dropped as he glared hard at the door, obviously in deep thought. What is it, Dad? Boba asked as Jango slowly turned to face him. Pack your things, we're leaving. Opening his eyes, Knox allowed his eyes to adjust as he blinked away the blurriness in his eyes from shining lights of Coruscant. Rising from his kneeling position, Knox popped his shoulder blades, the entity made his way to his desk before opening up comms integrated into the desk. HK, status report Knox ordered, the hollow of the droid coming into existence almost immediately after. My master, it appears Senator Padme and Skywalker have arrived on Tatooine. I am maintaining an acceptable distance and will continue following HK replied as Knox thought over what his droid said. Very good, alert me should anything drastic happen Knox cut the hollow off as he heard Valen enter the room. Anything interesting happening Valen asked with the coy smile she usually held when around Knox. Opening himself up to the cosmic force, Knox twitched slightly as he surged, something, a feeling placing itself into his stomach an instinct he had come well accustomed to. Eyes flying open, Knox's brow twitched lightly as it curled upwards in deep thought, making Valen stop what she was doing as she felt his curiosity through their bond. Is something wrong dear Valen asked as she watched Knox rise and claim his black robe from his seat. Just a feeling dear Knox squinted, eyes darting back and forth. A gnawing sensation running through his head like a buzz and as if it was a shadow prowling on the darkest recesses of his mind, he couldn't pinpoint it. It persisted, but was not foreboding like an imminent warning of danger, more akin to a slight whisper of happenings that he should be privy to but was unable to access at this moment. Gnashing his teeth together in frustration as he simply couldn't think of what was nagging at him, Knox shifted his head and stared at his desk in frustration, waiting for the hollow call he knew was coming. Much as he knew, Less than a second later a chime rung across the surface of his desk, answered moments later as Knox reached out and tapped at the desk, the hollow of Scorpio appearing moments later. Your Majesty Scorpio inclined her head in greetings. Scorpio, what can I do for you? Knox asked, sitting back in his chair with a sigh. I have been able to establish a meeting with the Zigerian royal party at your request. They are eagerly awaiting your arrival Scorpio announced as Knox smiled. Thank you Scorpio, I appreciate your efforts, I'll head there at once. Please alert me should anything else occur Knox bid Scorpio well before ending the call before taking his time to rise from his chair. I'm really not looking forward to dealing with those beasts Valen hissed as she swiveled her legs off of the couch and made to rise why must we do this? I'd like to establish a beneficial relationship with their ruling party, through business dealings and whatnot. Knox replied as he left the room with Valen in tow, both turning left as they made their way to their quarters. But why, we get enough chattels from the huts and vessels and whatnot HK raids, so I doubt it's for them Valen pushed, causing Knox to chuckle as they entered the room, 
the emperor moving to the stand that held his royal outfit. Nathama Knox replied much to Valen's confusion Zigeria and Nathama are far closer than I would like, especially with having next to no presence on Zigeria itself. I may have a fleet surrounding Nathama at all times however it's better to be safe than sorry. Oh. I see Valen grasped his reasoning quite easily, especially since Knox's fortress and one of his most valuable vaults are on Nathama, yes, better to be safe than sorry. When do we leave? Immediately. With Kenya. The Fury Interceptor roared through space as she approached her target in separatist space. Molten eyes peered at the swirling blue vortex in front of the viewport before the ship dropped out of hyperspace in a low boom. This is their last recorded location Mistress A2VR8 unit alerted Kenya as she spotted separatist ships flying to and from the planet in specific spots. The planet of La Mered lay before her. Sitting into the pilot's chair, she urged the ship forward, engaging cloaking measures in order to best avoid being detected before she could find her targets. Seeing the glimmering hollow of Knox appear on the center console, she paid attention to him as he made to speak. Progress was all Knox stated as the girl went to reply. We've managed to follow their tracks to Lama Red, I don't know why they're here but I will endeavor to find out Kenya replied as the ship discreetly entered the atmosphere of the planet. What of the target's identities Knox asked, his voice clear and hard. Severance Ton, a female Chiss recently left the Chiss Academy along with her lover Van Daler. It appears they were picked by Sidious and brought to Republic Space to serve in the Confederacy, I'm sending through everything I know right now. Kenya sent a nod to her 2V unit whom immediately did as she had said what do you wish for me to do when I find them master? Lady Kreth, your orders are as follows, find out what they're up to. Capture them, eliminate them if need be, you know what to do Knox ordered. Yes my master Kenya answered before Knox's hollow cut off moments later. Following sensor readings, Kenya chose to forego going to Byron's landing and instead flew low across the lands at blistering speeds towards the Oro mining station. Rather than landing at the mining station, rather chose to land in the wilderness away from any prying eyes. Maneuvering the ship until it slowed and began to rotate, lowering through the canopy of the trees, the landing gear protruded from the bottom of the ship and touched down with the ground, a hiss echoing through the ship as it came to a rest. Contemplating her next move for several moments, Kenya slowly rose and made her way to the cargo hold. Opening one of the containers, Kenya pulled out a set of armor called the Exiled Padawan's armor dyed white and gold. Quickly she dressed herself and put her old clothing on top of a nearby crate for later use. Sliding the helmet on she allowed the armor to power itself on before making her way to a large case next to the entrance to the cargo hold. Flicking the locks of the case, Kenya raised the lid to reveal a set of eight different lightsabers kept side by side on soft molded fabric that fit the lightsaber hilts perfectly. Let's see, red will do. Kenya selected the third lightsaber from the left, clipping it to her thigh. Closing the case and clipping it shut, Kenya opened another case next to a rack of rifles, filled with experimental shielding technology which she picked up and integrated into her chosen armor. A glistening orange dome surrounded her for a few seconds before fading away signifying its activation as it drew power from the battery in the back of her armor. Will there be anything else Mistress 2V asked from the entrance to the storage room. Not at this moment, thank you 2V. Make sure nobody comes near the ship Kenya Rose, the eye sockets of the helmet blackening to hide her features as she exited the storage room and embarked on her espionage mission. Leaving the ship, Kenya looked over the lush rainforest around her, squinting to find anything that could be a potential danger. Activating her wrist-mounted computer, her Lurgo agitator hovered down the ramp of the Fury Interceptor coming to a rest before the white-clad woman. Raising her wrist to her head, a 3D display of the local surroundings was displayed. Whilst staring at the map, four probe droids came down the ramp, hovering to surround their master as they waited for orders. Lowering her wrist computer, she turned to the probe droids gathered your primary target is a female Chiss, mid-twenties, force-sensitive, believed to be trained in lightsaber combat so a good identifier would be a lightsaber on her person. If you find her, alert me of her location, secondary targets, 
any Confederacy operations and bases. You have your mission, now go. With their orders the four probe droids hovered higher into the air before blasting away in four separate directions, soon disappearing over the trilene as small dots. Climbing over the seat of the agitator, Kenya turned the agitator with its controls, aiming away from the nearby mountain before urging the speeder forward, the onboard systems and sensors automatically forcing the speeder twist around any dangerous obstacles. Everything became a blur as the roar of the thrusters became more intense the faster she went. The high-pitched squeal of the thrusters growing louder and louder as she rapidly approached the capital city known as Barton's Landing. Quickly arriving at the coastline, Kenya spotted the decommissioned LH-3010 capital freighter that had been turned into a city some five decades earlier. Seeing several piers connected the outer rings of the freighter's hull, she decided that was a suitable location to land. And so, she abandoned passing over the coastline in favor of flying across the ocean, over high cresting waves and shoal of leaping fish. Setting a location for the agitator to idly wait for her to call for it, Kenya, nearing the pier, leapt from the seat of the vehicle, foot touching the right side thruster before she propelled herself at the rusting construct connecting to the city. The agitator continued on without its driver, disappearing over a tall wave as it ascended above the highest point the waves could reach, turning and making its way back to the shore where Is would wait for her to call for it. Meanwhile Kenya landed on the edge of the pier in a low crouch, a Monday Kala stated at her, having been working on his dingy fishing vessel froze in awe of her superhero landing. Rising from her position, Kenya squared her shoulders and approached the staring alien. Coaching into her fist, the Monday Kala unfroze as it noted she wished to speak to it. Excuse me sir, do you know where I may go for a stiff drink? Kenya asked, her voice altered by the ornate mask she wore. Assuming she was some kind of tourist, the Monday Kala gave his answer. Miss Miller's saloon has acceptable liquor if you are looking to partake, the fisherman answered after a few seconds. Appreciated, this conversation never happened. Kenya handed a handful of credits to the Monday Kala who happily accepted and immediately went to doing his work, pretending he hadn't met her as Kenya herself walked down the pier in silence. Passing through the city, Kenya easily noticed the clear disparity between the alien and human populations on the receiving ends of a whole slew of untrusting if not hostile glares. Assuming the aliens of the city weren't going to be open to talking to her, she kept a wide berth from them as she made her way towards the core of the old freighter that served as the higher-end districts of the city. Swoop gangs passed by, skiffs delivered their produce and cloud cars were used by officers as they looked over the general populace. The further she went, the better off individuals seemed to be, buildings became better maintained and everyone seemed generally happier. And eventually, after getting directions from several reluctant individuals, Kenya came to stand in front of Miss Miller's saloon. Walking up to the front door of the establishment, Kenya entered the building in swift strides. Walking inside, Kenya spotted a large male Shagrayan, standing as a sort of muscle for the business owner as he stared around the room with a sort of permanent glare. Wielding a club, a cobalt knife and a slug thrower, the Shagrayan cut an imposing figure at 225 centimeters tall. Ignoring the stare of the Shagrayan, Kenya noted the scantily clad courtesans or waitresses of many species serving drinks on a platter or walking into back rooms for private dances with patrons. Walking to the bar, Kenya sat herself down and stared at the available drinks. What can I get for ya? the bartender asked, a Falayan with green skin approached her hair pulled back and kept in place with a golden clip. She wore a form-fitting white and golden dress that hugged her curves like a glove. Have any mug and tea, I've been wanting to try it for a while. That and some answers to some questions Kenya disengaged the faceplate of her helmet and gently placed it onto the counter. The only one in the room able to see her face being the Falayan bartender. Coming right up, but the drink doesn't come free neither does information the Falayan began to make the drink, pulling out the required spiced syrup and adding it to the beverage. I've got it all covered Kenya replied as she reached into a satchel located on her hip, pulling out a handful of credits that she deposited onto the bench. Quickly finishing making the beverage, 
the Phalaen brought the brown-colored drink back to Kenya and gently placed the frothy drink onto the cold surface in front of the customer quickly taking the credits offered and placing them out of sight. The female Phalaen then leant onto her elbows onto the bench and smiled at Kenya well, ask away, you might not like my answers thought. We'll see Kenya took a sip from her drink squinting slightly before placing the drink back onto the counter now what I was expecting, but not, unwelcome. Now, on to my questions. Ask away the Phalaen smiled kindly as Kenya looked to her. Seen any, odd happenings lately? Never before seen species in the city, attacks at random, all the likes the woman asked as she spied the Phalaen. Well, I guess you're new around here then. Every now and then we get some people, disappear, we've been trying to put together a group to unearth the source behind them. The Phalaen hissed slightly I've had more than one of my girls go missing because of it. I see, what about anybody that seemed, off, you know, unwilling to talk or divulge anything about themselves, probably disappeared into the wilderness of heading some official business Kenya asked as the Phalaen shifted slightly. I might have seen someone or people, can't really put my finger on it though the Phalaen placed her right index finger on the side of her chin, eliciting a sigh from Kenya as she procured more credits and placed them on the counter oh yes a couple, they rented one of my rooms for two nights, never seen them before or any of their kind. At the end of their stay a group entered, special forces of something and took them away, my guess they went north to the mines, sign you know, the group to collect them were from Oro Mining Corp. Sitting and pondering the information for a few minutes, Kenya took her time to finish her tea before handing the cup back to the Phalaen that is indeed some very useful information for me, one more question. Does this Oro Mining Corp have any nearby business or outposts? Just a few mining stations around the continent, the nearest is to the north the Phalaen smiled as she took the cup. I see, thank you for your help Kenya reached for the gold and white faceplate of her helmet sticking it to her face as the magnetic locks to the rest of the helmet activated and fastened it into place. No problem dear, have a good stay, and if you need a place to stay or a drink, or, anything else, don't hesitate to ask. The Phalaen bid her farewell as Kenya rose and made her way back through the entrance to the establishment. As Kenya left, the Phalaen made to wipe down the bench as one of the city's more influential individuals sat down causing the woman to look up what can I do for you. Mila, I and the rest of the council are very interested to know who that was, I'm sure you have the answers we want, the core Iver asked. I don't have any idea of who they are, all they wanted was a drink and information Mila replied. Then what? Exactly, did they want to know Mila sighed at the question, knowing it wasn't a matter of denying, knowing very well the seriousness on the man's face. With Kenya. Looking through the eye slots in her mask as she raised her head Kenya spied the gathering clouds, the darkening of the skies as thunder rumbled. A droplet of rain landed on the eye slot of her mask, hitting the lens before it was joined by several others. How convenient Kenya hissed in frustration before lowering her head and making an immediate right. Oro mining facility had Kenya thought as heavy rains began to fall from the skies, small trails of water running by her feet. 2V Kenya spoke into the computer system of her gauntlet, bridging a connection to the droid on her fury interceptor. Yes madam what may I do for you the synthetic voice of her droid spoke through the systems in her gauntlet. I want you to find me any information you can get your hands on about Oro Mining Corp, and the locations of any facilities they may have nearby Kenya requested of the droid. Of course my master, I will do so at once the droid responded one moment. Very good. Thank you 2V Kenya replied as she cut off the call, waiting for the information she requested to be sent through to her. The air became thick with the moisture of the area around her, heavy winds picking up as rising waves crashed against the city's boundaries. Stopping at a junction in the street, Kenya turned her head left and then right as she spotted bustling citizens doing their own thing regardless of the rain. Shrugging as she waited for everything to be compiled, Kenya turned left down the street, heading towards what appeared to be a sort of market. Passing by a few stalls, she noted the variety of things that were on display. From foods to weapons and ship parts, exotic animals and illegal, 
things. Several stall workers called out to passerbys, some even trying to gain Kanya's own attention to sell their goods. Kanya however ignored them however as she picked up a notification buzzing her gauntlet but remaining silent. Pulling herself from some objects that caught her fancy, Kanya made her way from the market and into a nearby alleyway of which a heavy flow of water was escaping due to an incline within. Two separate notifications were displayed, one from 2V and one from three of her four probe droids. Selecting the file from 2V and audio file was accompanied by a slew of files, selecting the audio file, she selected it to play through the systems in her helmet. As she listened to the audio rendition of the written files, Kenya selected the second file of which a 3D map display that was centered on the city she was now in was shown, few other blips pulsing to show the locations of these platforms. Squinting, Kenya crouched low before leaping up and out of the alleyway and onto the roof, calling her Lurgo agitator in the process. Twisting the agitator to the west Kenya urged the speeder forward and began her search. With Knox and Valen, Zygeria. The X-70B hyperspace, Knox sitting in the pilot's seat of the vessel as he looked at the continents and oceans of the planet, white clouds crossing the planet from the east that swept west slowly. Eu Valen squinted, hissing in distaste as she glared at the planet with her arms crossed, laying back into the co-pilot's seat, once more garbed in her grey and gold robes what an ugly shade of blue, and green, it's like everything on this world wants to pee me off. I guess I'll just have to, talk to some of the produce. Chuckling at Valen's grievances and grumbles, Knox pushed the controls forwards as the X-70 hurtled through space towards the slavers. It took moments for the high-tech ship to clear the distance soon blasting through the atmosphere as they maneuvered the vessel towards the capital city and royal palace. Hearing a ringing chime from the communications port to his side, the hollow of a cat-like man came into being a gruff growl escaping the man as he spoke. Unknown vessel, you are approaching the Ziggurayan royal palace, state your business or be shot down the man growled, sneering as Knox made no attempt to alter his course. My name is Tall Ariel, I have a meeting scheduled with the ruling family Knox answered as the cover he had asked Scorpio to use, using the name of the Empire's Wrath rather than his own as cover in case something went wrong and he had to kill the royal family or drop a portion of their moon on them, anyway he digressed. I see, one moment the beast moved to no doubt verify as Knox urged the X-70 to dip underneath the clouds that traveled at a sedate pace. Silence prevailed in the bridge as the capital city grew closer and closer, the towering edifice of the royal palace standing over the entire city amused Knox. They waited a few more moments before the beast man returned. Obviously not happy and definitely reluctant the royal family is excited for your arrival, they will send an entourage to meet with you in Hangar 3 to bring you to them, thank you for your patronage. Knox almost laughed at the displeasure clearly shown on the Zygarian's features as the hollow cut out, one of the hangars on the royal palace lighting up as if to guide them. Here we go Knox uttered as he began to slow the ship, changing its course as he turned to enter the hangar. Don't remind me Valen squinted out of the bridge's canopy, staring out towards the stone that made up the inside of the hangar. Eight individuals hurriedly came together as the ship rotated a 180 and faced the hangar and transit had come through in case a quick escape was needed. The ramp to the ship lowered soon after, hydraulics hissing as it came to a gentle rest on the ground. The assortment of slaves looked up at the white-armored black-haired man, he wore a white and gold mask that has his features as blue-white light shone through the eye sockets, and the grey-outfitted woman walking behind his right side by a few paces wore a similar mask, entirely black and bare of any features. Lining up beside each other, the group of six women and two men bowed at the hip, their scantily clad outfits failing utterly to hide their private's greetings, we are here at your service and pleasure for the duration of your stay. Please call up and any of us should you need anything. Knox studied every one present that would be at his service however long he would be on world. Eyes staring one by one as his face remained neutral. Seemingly satisfied with his workers, Knox cleared his throat which one of you will be escorting me to the royal family. One of the men stepped forward, a Togruta male of around 40 years that would be my service seer, I have been tasked as your escort for the duration of your stay. Very good, the rest of you, 
I expect you to be in our chambers upon our return, now, let us be off. Knox commanded as the women and the one other male bowed and swiftly left in a line, the Tagruta motioning with his hands the direction they would be headed. The walk was quiet as the Tagruta walked a few paces ahead of them, Knox's eyes darting over everything around him, the slightest noise ringing in his ears, the slightest movement or shift of light drawing in attention. Valen remained his shadow as she ever was, sticking to his heels as she constantly glanced over his shoulder in preparation should anything happen. Tell me Nox's deep voice startled the Tagruta, the man's head swiveling to turn to him with thinly veiled fear how long have you been working here? I. The man seemingly didn't expect the sudden question, refusing to meet Nox's eyes as they walked I, I've been working here for eight years my lord. Turning his head back away from the Tagruta and facing forward, Knox nodded, satisfied with the answer. The trio walked through a doorway that led to a winding balcony of the royal palace, hovering pits of various plants stood on either side of the frame, ornate rugs were placed onto the ground as the Tagruta guided them towards a sort of pergola with three individuals sitting peacefully. Knox looked at the feline figure as Valen's neutral gaze turned into a glare. Servants made their way in and out of the palace, bringing foods and drinks to the monarch of Zygeria. Wearing a golden crown atop her head, the feline stared out towards the city. She was garbed in a blue skin tight outfit with gold accessories. Blue birds flew around her as they ate from her hands. Feeling around the woman, Knox could practically feel the malicious hatred from the woman's slaves as they served her their desire to kill her was almost palpable yet they kept their hands and their interests quiet. Your Majesty, I have brought your guests as you have requested the Tagruta knelt to the ground as soon as they arrived in the pergola. The green-yellow eyes of the feline quickly turned to face then as a small smile came to her face. Very good, leave us the queen departed as the feline turned her attention to the masked features of the people that had arrived. You bring us more refreshments the queen ordered of a red-skinned twi'lek that hurriedly rushed off to do as requested please, take a seat. Thank you for agreeing to this meeting your highness Knox came forward, voice muffled due to his mask, the being sitting down onto one of the comfortable cushions situated at the center of the pergola. Raising an eyebrow, the Ziggurian queen glanced at Valen whom had yet to take a seat, instead, had simply walked behind Knox and remained standing and silent. You'll have to forgive my companion here, she takes her duties very seriously and seldom has time for pleasantries. Knox retook the queen's attention as he soothed Valen through the force. I see very well. I'll allow it. Mirage Sintel turned her eyes to studying the ornate mask that covered the white-garbed man's face. It is not every day that I have the company of an individual that has enough money to buy a system, yet I know nothing about, I am told your name is Tall Ariel. What my name is? is of no consequence, only the business I offer and the profit you will gain." Knox placed his hands on his knees and lowered his head slightly as the Twi'lek from earlier approached with a platter, two following behind with a tray of drinks each. A false name then, as I guessed Mirage squinted, trying to gain any idea of whom this individual in front of her was and what is this so-called profit you offer me, I see nothing before me. The group of slaves placed the platter of food onto the table between them the drinks placed on either side of the platter as Knox went silent until the slaves bowed and departed. You have some very obedient stock, Knox resumed, changing topic as Mirage began to eat from the platter are all of them so obedient. Some we bring in can be challenging. But after they've been processed, they're a lot more, agreeable and obedient. That is, reassuring Knox answered, head turning to the side as he faced each slave placed around the balcony. A full minute of silence passed between the trio as Mirage humored Knox's apparent studying of her servants. Turning his attention back to the feline, Knox looked at the red-haired queen what kinds are you selling exactly? I sell everything, physically able for construction or heavy works, warriors, intellectuals, or other works. If you need a job done, any job. I have the workers Mirage explained as Knox placed his pointer finger and thumb on either side of his mask in thought. What about the range of species Knox asked, crunching numbers in his head in thought. I sell everything from humans to diathem and everything in between Mirage explained, curious as to what exactly this so-called tall aerial would request. 
Very good, yes very good, I would make a decision in time, but for now. I would like to personally oversee exactly what I am going to potentially purchase as I have a rather large request and would like nothing but to notch products Knox explained, making Mirage squint but see his point. Before I agree to your request, I would like to know exactly what the parameters of your request would be should you find our products satisfactory Mirage asked, drumming her fingers across the table beside her. She wants to know the margin of profit she would potentially gain should she accept Knox chuckled to himself, such a shrewd woman. I cannot give you a firm number, but I can estimate that the amount would range from let's say, a couple of thousand to a couple tens of thousands of heavy work orientated individuals. Perhaps a thousand intellectual individuals. But what I can foresee to be the most needed by my underlings would be in-house workers, a couple thousand butlers, chefs, maids and perhaps, a great deal of, exotic working individuals, pleasure workers. Sitting back, Mirage let the sheer scope of what could potentially be ordered of her people, the amount of funds needed to be acquired and stored for a request to be made on such magnitude. She nearly frothed from the mouth as she thought over the sheer amount of wealth that could land in her lap. Those numbers could satisfy an entire system if managed satisfactorily. I uh -huh. Mirage wiped her lip as she trembled in excitement for a moment I would be more than happy to escort you and personally show you the products you will be acquiring Mirage answered to Knox, she couldn't let anyone else handle this, if his words spoke true then her dreams of reinvigorating her great empire would well and truly be underway and perhaps, there would be potential future business. Mirage was further taken by surprise as the man reached for his mask, grabbing the faceplate as the white steel hissed as it disengaged. Her breath was taken from her almost as soon as the faceplate was lowered, glowing molten golden eyes stared into her own pools, the features of the perfect male human individual stared at her, strong jawline, well-proportioned nose structure. It was then she picked up the scent that rose from him, intoxicating, raw, primal. She watched as he reached forward and took one of the beverages before him, the clear wine glass raising to his lips as he knocked the drink back. Lowering the drink back to the table, the man raised the white mask back to his face, the hissing rising from its mask signifying it to be back in place. Knox slowly rose from the cushion as Mirage's eyes followed him. Forgive me your majesty, but it is getting late, and I and my companion have spent a great deal of time during our travels. Would you be so kind as to permit me and my companion your presence as we retire to the chambers you have arranged for us Knox stood to full height, offering his hand to the queen whose fingers gently took his hand. I would be more than happy to accompany you to your chambers to continue our talks, you are after all a valued guest and customer Mirage replied as she made her way to her feet. Turning to one of the awaiting slaves Mirage pinned him with a glare you, have a meal prepared for us immediately, our dinner will be had in their chambers as they are tired. Now. The Togruta swiftly made his exit, Mirage turning back to Knox and Valen, a small smile on her face as she motioned them to follow. I had the best arrangements we had available for you and your companion prepared, I hope they prove to be pleasant enough for you Mirage's message was clear as one of the guards swiftly turned and went through another tunnel to change their arrangements to the best they could possibly offer, a penthouse suite located near the top of the palace with a wind around balcony and a whole slew of slaves to cater to them at every moment, rather than the room they would have originally had should. They have been some mid-ranked customer. I very much appreciate your generosity your highness Knox could feel the animosity from Valen pointed solely up in the queen, a reassuring wave passing from him to which she soaked up eagerly. You have nothing to worry about dear Knox reassured Valen telepathically well aware she could hear his words as she calmed considerably, the adoration and possessiveness he felt in turn made him smile under his mask. Mirage proceeded to take them on a tour of the palace doing her best to distract them to the fact that she hadn't taken them directly to their room. An admirable job so far but nonetheless useless as Knox could feel everyone around him in the palace. A rather large amount of individuals moving to and from a room on the upper floors of the room, seemingly in a panic whilst the individuals that had been provided upon his arrival were ushered from somewhere closer to the base of the palace towards the top of the palace. Seemingly finished with their preparations, as Knox could feel a slow trickle of life force moving back to what they were doing earlier, 
returning to their regular duties in the palace, the same guard that had disappeared earlier returned and passed by Mirage to alert her they were ready. Almost immediately after, Mirage was hastily guiding them towards the upper portions of the palace, a small sway on her hips as she pointed out several expensive tapestries and ornate furniture, all the while her guards remained a few paces away, ever the silent shadows as their emotions remained clamped down, a merely trickle that Nox could feel prickling and rising from each individual around them. Making it to their designated room, Mirage instructed the guard to stay outside before ushering Valen and Nox into their temporary abode. Entering the room, Nox could see the room was immaculate in its state, having just been cleaned Nox mused. To the left of the room was a large and expensive bed within a connecting bedroom, the frame connecting the rooms opened wide as expensive curtains were tied together on each side of the frame. In the main room of which he stood, at its center was twin couches and an ottoman connected to the rightmost couch. At their center was an ornate and expensive designer table with a bowl of fruit on its center. On the opposite side of the room was a wide open doorway leading to a stretching balcony that oversaw the city. And throughout the four corners of the room, native exotic plants sat in tan-colored pots that were kept in pristine condition. Hanging from the ceilings of the room was a glowing yellow light with a cage surrounding them casting shadows around the room in unique patterns that changed orientation as they rotated around the light globes within. Making her way into the room Mirage planted herself down onto the ottoman, leaning back regally onto the soft fabric below as she looked towards the studying Nox are you coming, dinner will be served shortly. Nox watched as Valen slowly made her way into the room, eyes scanning over everything within, all the while Nox remained stationary even as Mirage raised her eyebrow at the actions. Over the minutes of silence, Valen's hand snapped forward at random breakneck speeds after studying random parts of both rooms. Eventually the woman moved to the center couches, eyes trailing over everything under her mask before she reached down and thumped around the table. Seemingly finding nothing, Valen paused as if unsatisfied, she peered in his direction, the unasked question as clear as day and her answer came from the slow rising of Nox's head as he stared at the overhanging lights. Following his gaze, Valen caught the hint as she raised her right arm, to Mirage's intense and immediate shock, a barrage of lightning tore from her fingers and slammed into the overhead lights, as the lightning slammed into the light, it branched out and covered the ceiling in a blanket wave of blue hatred manifest, washing over the roof as it cooked everything it washed over. And before long, the barrage of lightning stopped, the burning ozone striking Mirage as she tried to hide her immediate nervousness, the occasional cracking of residual energy leaping across Valen's left arm as she lowered it to her side. May I ask what that was about? Normally Mirage would have simply demanded an answer, either by herself or by her guards. But seeming how filthy rich they were and the, the show of power that seemed supernatural, a polite question would suffice, and hopefully she would receive an adequate answer. I don't like being listened to when I discuss private matters Knox answered, a complicated expression came of the Queen's face as she looked to the suddenly risen outstretched hand of the grey garbed woman, black notes dropping from her armoured fingers, listening devices clattering to the floor before being crushed under the woman's steel boots. Taking a few steps forward, Knox made his way to the centre of the room and placed himself down onto the couch opposite of Mirage. Valen taking her place at his side as she leaned back into the fabric of the couch, a light groan escaped the woman as she stretched her arms out and clenched her fingers together, acting very much like a stretching cat that amused Knox to no small end as his masked lover seemed to stop stretching. This is a very fetching apartment you have prepared for us, despite the installations of course Knox mused as he crossed his right leg over his left, crossing his arms as he let his tense muscles relax. I am glad it is to your liking Mirage fluttered her eyelashes in Nox's direction, making a point to ignore the snipe about the listening devices planted around the room, she was about to speak up when the entrance to the room opened, the slaves that had met him up an arrival marching in one at a time with steaming platters of food mounted and carried with learned efficiency are here it is, perfect timing. They watched the slaves each out their platers on the table at the center, the final slaves placing plates in front of the three individuals before stepping back and making to leave the room until they were called Appen. Eagerly Mirage surged forward and hastily dug into the food that was served. 
a subtle nod from Knox affording the permission Valen was looking for to partake. Mirage paused ever so slightly as the grey-garbed woman reached for her mask, pulling it from her face as the shadows receded, allowing Mirage an unobstructed look at her face. The swimming, shifting pools of golden magma in the woman's eyes reminded Mirage of her companion's eyes. The eyeliner around her eyes accentuated the glow of the woman's eyes adding to the exotic allure her supple lips and gently curved facial structure conveyed. The three jewels on the woman's head were clearly dearly expensive, glistening in the light that shone on them. But it was the look, the expression on the woman's face that momentarily froze Mirage, the look of barely contained animosity, chained down simply because it would displease the man beside her, the power she had shown seconds earlier a very prominent indicator, a lick of what she could potentially unleash. And if what Mirage suspected, the woman was a predator, a being that relished crushing her adversaries under tow and subjugating any that opposed her. If such a woman chose to follow, it wouldn't be someone weak, whether it was financial of physical power, it made Mirage all the more weary of the potential threat the man that had such a beast on a tight leash could potentially pose to her should she upset him. Making a point to ignore the unrelenting glare she was receiving from the grey-garbed woman whom decided to eat, the man at her side removing his high-tech white and gold mask and placing it on the table for he himself to move to eat. Now then, as we no longer have unwanted parties listening, we have much to discuss. Mirage Sintel the man's eyes glowed eerily as the queen paused momentarily, keenly aware of her isolation from her guards whom she had naively kept from entering the room. Very well. With Kenya, La Mered, ten hours later. Tearing across the sky, the rain pelted at the turbines of the Lurgo agitator as Kenya tore across the lands towards the northernmost mining facility. Trees passed by under the vehicle in a blur, up ahead. One of the many vacant mining facilities lay etched into a mountain. Being maintained by the automated systems within and their armies of droids that came with the facilities. Having already delved deep into the other tree facilities in the nearby region, and having found absolutely nothing pertaining to her query. Oddly enough, despite the probe droids marking all mining operations facilities as a potential location, this one alone reported any modicum of recent activity of any nature. So as the Lurgo agitator began to slow in speeds, lowering through the canopy of the trees as it began final approach. The relentless pelt of the rain slowed considerably as the leaves of the trees offered some protection from the dark clouds hanging in the skies. Pulling on the control sticks of the agitator, Kenya forced the speeder to come to a halt in a small clearing with several large rocks lining the tree lean. Stepping down from the agitator, Kanya's masked face looked towards the looming facility sticking out of the mountainside. The agitator immediately after stepping off, rose back into the air and hovered above the canopy, rotating in orientation before its engines roared, sending it soaring back the way she came. Marching into the treline, Kanya called her right hand lightsaber into her grip for immediate use if needed, ignoring the squelch of mud underfoot as thunder rattled the area, flashes of lightning forking across the horizon. Scanning through the dimly lit rainforest, Kenya squinted and paused, halting all movement entirely as she blasted her senses out towards the area around her. Almost immediately, life signs lit up like a Christmas tree as she felt anything around her. Eyes snapped from left to right in her closed eyelids as she focused up in a multitude of significantly more powerful life signatures, moving around the forest around her and into the facility through the entryways of the building. Closer to her however was a party of similarly feeling individuals hustling together and slowly combing through their home territory. Snapping her eyes open at the metallic thud of armored boots on an obstructing tree root. Launching herself to a nearby large tree branch, Kenya landed on its surface and immediately crouched down to avoid being sighted by four tan-colored droids holding blasters as the tried and nearly tripped over the unstable ground they were trudging across. Laying flat. Kenya saw the droids stop and look around in every direction. See anything the high tone of one of the droids asked as another shook its head. No, I don't see anything, think it was nothing the second droid offered as the first nodded. Roger, let's head back the clearly more competent of the group turned and left. Roger three consecutive replies came as the group of four left the clearing. She waited several seconds, 
simply flat against the thick branch out of sight as the rain pelted against her back. She waited for a full two minutes before rising back to her feet, maintaining her balance on the wood below before springing across to another thick enough to handle her weight. Within a few small leaps, Kenya had made a decent pace, leaping from branch to branch with practiced ease as she made her way to the entrance of the facility. With a dull thud, she landed on the final tree, before her lay the main doorway to the facility, droids rushing to and from as they ferried small sentient creatures in groups of six. Choosing to keep with stealth for the meantime, Kanya's eyes danced across the looming metal construct, looking for another way. Her answer came in the form of a grate sticking from one of the ledges, an air vent of sorts. Making sure none of the droids were looking upwards Kanya leapt high into the air, clearing the distance between herself and the ledge with no issue. Landing, the woman immediately went to work as her lightsaber sprung to life with a slap hiss. Angling the weapon, she stabbed the tip into the upper right-hand corner of the grate taking care to make as little noise as possible as she carved out her entryway. Fifteen seconds was all it took for Kenya to cut her way around the grate, her hand snapped forward to catch it so it didn't slam into the ground, she shut off her lightsaber and clipped it to her belt whilst using her other hand to bring the grate forward, gently placing it on the ground silently before repositioning herself quickly entering the grate with the grace of a feline and made her way into the building. Oro Mining Facility Ignoring the crammed sensation she was experiencing from crawling through the ducts within the facility, Kenya made sure to avoid making as little noise as possible, silently passing over marching droids within the halls below. Bickering from droids, odd mutterings from the humanoids the droids were overseeing rung throughout the ducts as she crawled taking a left at the junction towards an empty storage room. Kenya made her way to the end of the duct before gently cutting it from the wall, pulling the grate away before it call fall to the ground and slithering her way to the ground, gently placing the grate onto the ground. The storage room was dim, the lights turned off as equipment lay on shelves in four rows within the room. Activating the the night vision within her helmet, the woman looking to the entrance of the room on full alert, ready to spring into action in case anything entered. Stilling for a few seconds, Kenya let a breath out as nothing came through the door, slinking through the dark of the room to stand behind the closed door and listening intently to what was happening on the other side. Hearing nothing but silence permeate from the other side of the thick steel, Kenya stood flat against the wall beside the door to remain hidden as she opened it with a hiss. Standing flat against the wall with the door wide open, Kenya waited just in case anything was observing, silently reaching to her wrist-mounted console, tapping away at its surface as she activated systems entwined within her armor. A small hum began to resonate from her armor, a feeling of static electricity running across her body as the spine of her armor glowed a neon blue. With her preparations set, Kenya stepped out into the hallway, both the left and the right clear of any adversaries. Using the map displayed in her helmet, Kenya moved through the hallways, slinking through the cold steel halls like a shadow as she hunted. Overseer's room is, 200 meters away Kenya mused as she came to a junction in the hallways, pressing herself to one of the corners as she used a small camera mounted to her left finger, curling it around the corner as it fed a live feed through to the display in her mask. Nothing, good stepping around the corner. Kenya blurred a dull buzz resonating from around her as she used a burst of force speed to appear at the end of the hallway. Bouncing off the back wall, using it as a springboard, Kenya turned left at the corner and continued onwards without halting in her speed, sensors in her armor alerting her to any movement or signatures within her designated path. Rounding a second corner, Kenya saw the door to the overseer's room, a flick of her wrist and a minute use of the force as she continued made the door open as she neared. Adjusting herself, Kenya sidestepped through the still opening door as it slid open, mind working a mile a minute as she studied everything within as fast as she could mentally process. She could see the camera in the corner, having yet to adjust to her sudden appearance, the security monitors above a terminal already open and ready to use, four more monitors around the terminal and a total of twelve droids slowly turning in slowed motion to see what had entered the room. With the hum in her suit intensifying, Kenya knew she was about to be discovered, making use of her prepared countermeasure as lightning began to skip along her body, 
ozone burning as she could see arcs of lightning jump across her skin. Knowing she was moments away from being discovered, Kenya closed her fists and brought them together in front of her, keeping a 5 cm gap in her hands as the discharging power running along the surface of her armor began to be conducted through her knuckles. Lightning crossed between her hands, building in intensity as she felt her eardrums burst, the air around her hands distorting, visible to her eyes as the prototype tech discharged its designated power. Discharging outwards, Kenya felt the tech ingrained into her body short circuit and shut down, immeasurable pain rocked her body as her armor shut down, the lenses of her helmet returning to clear, a dome of distorting energy expanding over the room in slow motion as the EMP washed over the technology around her until it dissipated into simple static 50 meters from its origin. Her eyebrow twitched as the pain inhibitors remained on standby, the sizzling of her own flesh a non-expectant concern as the side effect of the discharge charred her armor. Slumping slightly, Kenya limped over to the decommissioned droids, her eyes peering at the camera to double-check it was shut down, satisfied, Kenya ignited her right hand lightsaber as she severed the heads from their bodies and sliced their chassis down the middle. Now standing over the console, Kenya waited for it to slowly reboot itself, one by one the displays lit back up, the woman leaning down to the main display as the console finally lit up. All right, where are you Kenya mumbled, taking her helmet off and placing it on the desk as she scrolled through the camera feeds one by one. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing one by one, each feed was checked off of the list despite the seemingly heavy presence of confederacy droids and evidence of whatever operation they were conducting in this facility clear as day. Flicking to the next feed Kanya's eyes dilated as a stinging sensation stung her neck, the display before her showing the room she was in, a feminine figure on the screen directly below her, and in her neck a syringe that had just finished injecting whatever was within. I hear you've been looking for me, the woman whispered in Kanya's ear as Kanya turned her head slightly, the red eyes of the chis she was searching for standing with a condescending smirk as the chis withdrew the syringe from her neck. Turning away, the chis looked to a group of droids that had arrived and walked to give her orders. Imprison her, I want to know who she is, and why she's here, Severance ordered as she disembarked, Kanya collapsing to the ground as everything went dark around her as she lost consciousness with Knox. I'm not questioning your intentions, but is it wise to risk the safety of your escort in such a way?" the sneering governor asked, standing beside Mirage as Knox leant against a stone railing overlooking the Colosseum grounds. I would not worry about the safety of my escort, I would fear for state of my merchandise when she is finished," Knox replied, voice synthesized through his white mask as he stared at the gathering of men and women below. Standing in a line were an assortment of slaves ready for testing, Valen walking in front of each and every one of them, staring at each one individually as she regarded them as if stains on the floor. Yu Valen pointed to a burly Twi'lek, motioning him forward with her finger whilst her eyes danced across the other, spying a Deviranian and doing the same and you, step forward. Both stepped forward, regarding each other with hard eyes and preparing to lay each other out at the soonest request. Fight me, one at a time, together, I don't care Valen smirked under her mask at the bewildered look on the Twi'lek's face, the Deviranian smirked soon after, cracking his knuckles and immediately rushing forward. What a fool Nox muttered under his mask as the Deviranian came within punching distance of Valen, throwing a haymaker at Valen with a wicked look on his face. Snapping her head to the right, Valen's left hand curled and rocketed upwards as the Deviranian sailed by with his missed punch. It was almost comical as Knox watched, Valen's armored fist impacting the red-skinned alien's lower jaw as it shattered, blood exploding outwards as her fist continued up through the bone and clear through the rest of the jaw, her fist came to a stop just below the nose, gurgling coming from the horned alien as he went limp, falling from the woman's hand into a heap on the ground. Useless, every single one of you useless Valen sneered as she shook her left hand to remove the blood caking her limb. Seeing that Twi'lek was making no moves to engage Valen launched at him after a small hop on the balls of her feet. To the spectators except for Knox, Valen simply appeared in front of the Twi'lek after a blur, hand flat, and arm outstretched to her side as she appeared behind the large alien, and much to the shock and horror of the rest of the group, his head rolled from his shoulder, 
blood spraying from his neckline as his head hit the ground and rolled to the side before coming to a rest on his leku. We have no use for hesitation Valen spat as she turned back to facing the ten remaining slaves it'd be more entertaining for me to simply take on all of you, so that's what you'll be doing now, all of you, come, know that regardless, you'll most likely perish this day. Every individual before her shook, aliens and humans of many different races exchanging glances as terror exploded within the group. I knew none of you were worth it Valen pounced at the nearest as none of them immediately made to attack. This was a waste of time, you're all a waste of time Valen growled as she punched clean through the center of the chest of a female rat attack ETCH, don't know why I asked to test yous out, just a waste. The ensemble of aliens soon degraded into a fear-endured craze, pushing each other out of the way as they scrambled to flee and escape their impending doom. Heavily dissatisfied, Valen slowly turned to face Nox's direction, the man knowing the question simply nodded for an answer. I've seen enough, finish it Nox spoke, spooking the jumpy mirage as Valen heard him, smirking as he turned away from the railing and walked away. What followed was the screams of the slaves to be tested as Valen slaughtered them in moments after disappearing, leaving after images in her trail and brutally executed her targets. Ignoring the screams, Nox walked away without care, scowling at the thought of the underwhelming performance of the subjects he had made to potentially purchase. Hearing rushed footsteps, Nox looked over his shoulder to see Mirage approaching with the governor in tow. I apologize for the lackluster performance of my merchandise, if you wish I can perform more thorough selections Mirage vomited out as Nox physically withheld himself from rolling his eyes. There is no need, I have, programs that will remove their weakness and make them somewhat usable, we will go with our original agreement Nox answered, Mirage recoiling as if struck by his words. Did you have fun Knox spoke, confusing the queen and the governor at his seemingly random words. Not as much as I wanted, but still, no Valen answered causing both the governor and Mirage to shrink in on themselves at the sudden arrival of the deadly woman behind them. Quickly coming to Knox's side, Valen stepped into pace with him. Have you been able to make contact Valen asked in curiosity, receiving a shake of Knox's head in turn as they continued to walk. Whatever is happening, I haven't been able to establish contact, I've left a message alerting her to the danger though, hopefully she receives it soon. Knox answered, the group exiting the Colosseum and stepping into the light of the city around them. And what if she doesn't get there in time Valen asked looking deeply at Knox as the man paused for a moment. Looking up towards the sky, Knox remained silent as he stared towards where he knew Kenya was. A lesson learned through pain is a lesson nonetheless Knox answered, seemingly satisfying Valen as Mirage mustered her courage and made to guide them once more. Wake up the first thing Kenya knew as she returned to consciousness was the jarring sensation of being struck by a shock prod, lightning coursing through her body as her captive stood in front of her. Her arms were bound by cuffs and pulled apart wide, just as her legs were in the same position as she looked to be stuck as in a star jump. You're awake? Good a rat attack he sneered as he withdrew a rod, electricity sparking from its end as he began to circle Kanya's bound form, tell me pretty human, what was the purpose for breaking into our facility the rat attack he asked as he came back to stand in front of Kanya as she looked around the dimly lit chamber. Answer me the rat attack he bellowed and struck Kanya with the end of the prod, electricity beginning to course through and spark across her body. And just as she was trained, Kanya clenched her teeth biting down and refusing to let any sounds loose other than a small grunt. The rat attacky gnashed his teeth together as the smell of burning flesh began to permeate the room, reluctantly taking the shock baton back as Kenya heaved in and out with uneven breaths. Looking down, Kenya saw the charred skin across her stomach, trying her best to focus and heal the wound as pain flared throughout her body. You're really going to make this difficult aren't you? The man returned staring at the scanty clad Kenya with appraising eyes. Pretty, we'll make use of that soon, but... It doesn't, look right, eh uh, yes the torturer mocked as he pulled out a metal whip with a barbed cord, rearing it around before snapping his hand forward, the whip snapping in the air and carving a slice into Kanya's side as she cried out in pain, 
cutting through the fabric of her scant clothing further as blood profusely leaked from the gash you don't have to worry about dying any time soon, you see, we have medical personnel monitoring your vitals at all moments and medics on. Stand by to resuscitate you should you be in threat of passing before I get my answers, but I don't think I'll have to worry. Her chin quivered as tears welled in the sides of her eyes, another yell of pain tore from her throat as a second lashing struck her exposed thigh leaving a deeper gash in her skin as muscle opened and exposed the inner ligaments of her leg. Six more lashings followed in quick succession as tears streamed down her face, the agony tearing through her as she felt her own blood leaking down her body. That's better the rat attacky approached and began to circle Kenya slowly, eyes scanning up and down with amusement clear on his face, he came to stand behind Kenya, coming closer to her as he leaned into her ear. You know I'm permitted to do whatever I dream necessary to get the answers I want, anything short of death is on the table he whispered, his offhand snaking under Kanya's fabric loose top to cup her left breast yes, you are a very fine specimen indeed. Squirming under his touch, Kanya bucked and turned trying to pull herself out of the grasp of the energy bindings that kept her in place. With her bucking, the man growled and came back around to Kanya's front before that though. I'll be doing my best to break you, don't disappoint me. Turning away from the bound woman, the rat attacky came to stand over a table of tools, knives, scalpels, low power blasters, saws and needles were each lay out in front of the eager man now what first, oh yes. Picking up a needle of green liquid, the man squirted a small amount of the concoction out from the syringe as he walked over to Kenya. This here my dear is an agent designed to slow your bleeding while simultaneously raising the capability of your senses, stay still. Immediately after finishing his words, the rat attacky stabbed the syringe into Kanya's exposed artery on her neck, quickly injecting the contents before she could throw him off. There we go, now we're all ready for the procedure the man walked away depositing the syringe back onto the table and looking towards the blaster set to its lowest power setting. Turning the blaster and pointing at Kanya's stomach, he fired a bolt straight into the same area he struck her with the shock baton, scorching the skin, charring its surface as it left a black mark where it struck. It's working, good he walked back across the dimly lit room, coming to a stop a foot in front of Kanya as he stared down at her legs and up at each of her arms. Let's start with your, left leg he raised the blaster and pointed it at the top of Kanya's left foot, the bolt of plasma rocketing out of the barrel and striking her in the legs as she screamed in agony remember, all you have to do is tell me why you were searching for Miss Tan. Eat, a dick Kanya hissed out in response before screaming as another bolt impacted the same spot eye on her foot. The skin exposing muscle clearly as a burnt ring surrounded the impact zone. You've certainly got a mouth on you but after we're done here, and I have you to myself, I'll have plenty of time to take care of that mouth of yours." Another bolt and scream echoed around the chamber as a layer of muscle on her foot exploded away, blood evaporating under the heat of the bolt as the fat on her foot exploded violently. It sucks to have to harm you, I'd much rather keep you in pristine condition, so why don't we end this? Tell me why you are here and I can keep you safe from the ones that want to hurt you." The rat attacky gently stroked her chin running a finger over the trail of tears as his face contorted to convey a semblance of regret please help me help you. Remaining silent the rat attacky sighed and fired another bolt into the same spot on Kanya's foot, watching with hidden satisfaction as the final vestiges of muscle burnt away and left blood smeared bone in its place. It doesn't have to be like this you know, this could all end if you simply told me why you're here the man reasoned as he took aim at Kanya's undamaged right foot. Gritting her teeth as she lost feeling in her left foot, unable to even curl her toes as her left eye twitched I'm not telling you, anything. I see, a shame a new bolt of energy struck the unmarried skin of her right foot, a new wave of pain coursing through her as she screamed and struggled in the energy bindings containing her then this is going to be a very long day for you. What followed would be a series of events that would forever change Kenya. Zygeria. Knox watched in satisfaction as over a thousand slaves were rounded up onto transports under the watchful eyes of their captors. I can foresee a very lucrative partnership between us the Queen smiled at Knox's side, watching as the ships began to ascend into the sky towards the exchange point. I agree your majesty, 
if your product proves as capable as they appear, then you can be sure to expect future business ventures with me." Knox answered as he turned from the railing at the end of the hangar and began to walk at a slow pace towards the waiting X-70B. Mirage followed at his side, knowing Valen was already on board the ship running pre-flight checks to pass the time. Will you be present for the next exchange? Mirage fluttered her eyelashes in Knox's direction as the masked man seemed to think for a few moments. I may potentially be present but I cannot make any guarantees, though should anything happen to the manifest or an offer is made for further business, I will be present. Knox responded as the duo stopped at the base of the sleek ship's ramp. I see Mirage frowned slightly, hoping to have gotten at least some hints on when they would be face to face to exchange pleasantries but it appeared they would have to wait I look forward to our next conversation then. As do I, now your majesty, please forgive me, but I must be off, I must arrange for the pickup of the merchandise from our agreed exchange point Knox gave a deep bow. Until next time dear Mirage puckered her lips and offered her hand to the man. Knox pausing momentarily before he shifted his mask slightly to the side and pressed his lips to the back of the woman's hand, causing a pleasant shiver to rise over Mirage's body before the man rose, his mask back in place, a subtle nod bio for he had turned away and was making his way into the bowels of his ship. Watching the ramp raise to a close, her hair whipped around her head as the thrusters roared to life, the ship beginning to rise from the ground before blasting away into the atmosphere. All the while the Ziggurian Queen watched with lust-filled eyes as she finally remembered where she had seen him before. Depositing his mask onto the covers of the bed, Knox stripped himself from his clothing, considering burning them in a furnace as he made his way to the shower. Activating the pressure jets, Knox allowed the water to stream over his body, steam beginning to rise as he stood under the warmth. Hello dear Knox didn't bother turning to face the person standing in the nude with her arms crossed under her chest coming to join me. She was all over you Valen hissed, jealousy felt cleary by Knox as it practically rolled onto him through the force. Don't remind me Knox made a dissatisfied face as he turned to face the woman whom had let her hair down come here. With lidded eyes, Valen did as was asked, stepping under the pressure jets of warm water well within reaching distance as Knox pulled her clothes and placed his hands on her hips. Dear, you are the only person in our empire that knows me, knows and understands my past. Nobody knows not even Kenya of my origins, yet you do. Knox pulled her flat against him, the woman's blazing molten eyes searching his own. You had access to my wellspring of memories from the time you were locked inside me. You seen them, I know you weren't just sitting around in there twiddling your thumbs. Do you really think some sleazy feline fluttering her lashes in my direction is going to be enough to drag my attention from you? I suppose not, Valen responded as she unashamedly let her hands wander over Knox's impressive physique and anatomy. With Kenya dangling, hanging in her energy bindings, Kenya stared into the mid-distance between her and the wall, her eyes glassy and empty. Her legs were stripped of skin and raw with pulsing muscle twitching as electricity coursed over her bare form. You've done well, annoyingly well in fact. The rat attacky re-entered the room, glaring at Kenya as he approached in fact, you've lasted so long that the boss has moved on to other ventures. Remaining silent, Kenya let the trail of tears freely pouring from her eyes to fall from her chin. Placing his tools down, the rat attacky came to stand directly in front of Kenya his hot breath wafting into her face and down her shivering chest. His gnarled fingers fingers tipped her chin as he lifted her chin to look up at him, her eyes not registering his present as he took sick satisfaction in leaning down and placing his lips to her own. Pulling back, licking her lips in the process, the torturer wiped his mouth to remove the saliva trail connecting the two. You were good, I'll give you that, you did good. The man turned his back and began making his way back to the table, Kanya's eyes flicking to him as her eyes became alight with twin suns of molten fury. I.D., G.D. What was that the man turned to face his captive as her eyes were illuminated in the dark, her breathing quickening exponentially as muscle all over her body exploded into action. I did Kanya twitched, the tormentor leaning close. What his only answer was a broken nose as Kanya leaned her head back before reading forward smashing her forehead into his nose as blood spurred to cover the lower portions of her face. You bench the man fell back onto the ground, 
hand clutching at his nose, checking his hand to see it covered in crimson blood. Hearing a low groaning, the man turned to face Kenya, eyes widening as her muscle bulged under her skin. Her face was contorted into a display of utter rage, her teeth grit as blood leaped from the sides of her lips to pool down the side of her chin. The energy bindings holding her began to fail as the device began to crumble in on itself whilst Kenya pulled herself forward. She cared not as the skin on her arms began to tear away, the muscle stretching and breaking as blood burst from the fissures appearing over her body due to the sheer strength that was needed to physically break out of her bindings. I did good. I did good. I did good. I did good. Flashback. The bunker around her burnt, beams of steel fell from the ceiling onto decapitated bodies whilst flames locked at the walls and support pillars. In front of her were two people, a kneeling pirate leader kneeling on the ground armless, the stubs on his arms cauterized as the fabric of his sleeves melted to his arms. Behind the pirate was the towering form of Knox, masked in the countenance of Kalig as he looked up in a twelve-year-old Kenya. Strength is not forgiving someone for the transgressions they committed against you, that is a lack of will and spine Knox spoke down at Kenya as he came to stand behind the quaking pirate. Strength is the ability to put your own misgivings to the side and doing what must be done the flames surrounding them were reflected in the lenses of Kalig's mask, Kenya looking up in her own reflection as her master stared down at her. I. I. Kenya shook as her borrowed lightsaber shook in her grip, Knox leaning down until his face was right before her own. How many families will this man be allowed to butcher because someone thought he was reformed? Knox's whispered words were oily, slithering into her ears as his presence coiled around her like a viper one forgives while the other continues. How many fathers must die to protect their children? How many mothers must kill themselves to give them time? Sisters taken and sold while boys are conditioned to continue the cycle. All because someone forgives. Tears freely bled down her face leaving reflective trails in as the heat assaulted her. Are you going to be the one that pretends to walk the high road, are you going to allow this, cycle to continue because you lack the will to save the masses from monsters that masquerade as men, are you going to be the reason a mother must weep over her dead child? Knox circled and placed his hands over Kanya's shoulders do what you need to do so no one walks the path cast up in you. Please, don't kill me the pirate leader whimpered as he attempted to shield himself his nubs raised over his head as he shied away. Are you weak? Are you as spineless as the fools who forgive the cool steel of Nox's armor stroked the girl's shoulders as she grasped the saber with both hands slowly raising it, a hiccup escaping the girl. I don't want to die. Kenya, be the change that the galaxy needs to purge the darkness that hides from sight. Nox continued as the yellow blade of Kanya's borrowed blade sprung from its fountain. Please. Please. No. Do I T. Ah ha 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 Kenya screamed and with a swipe of her blade, struck the right shoulder of the man, her blade continuing through as she severed the torso of the kneeling man in half, bisecting the man as he fell in two pieces. Shaking, the blade deactivated and fell from her grasp, clanking to the ground as Kenya wavered and dropped to the ground. Good my apprentice. Very good the towering monolith that was her father praised her as he dark shadow stretched and covered the girl, turning on her place on the ground to look up in him as she felt his satisfaction in waves. You did good. End flashback. The lights released sparks that illuminated the room, the energy bindings chamber littering the room as larger pieces lay wedged into the wall. I did good. The tool table was a wreck of simple metal shards, caved in and warped as its contents were strewn about. Straddling the Rattataki, Kenya raised her fist and brought it down up in the man's face. I did good her fist slammed into the man's nose, blood spurting and coating Kanya's stomach as cartilage was shattered and squashed. I did good the room shook as her voice quaked, the walls around the room warping in on themselves as she raised her other hand and brought it down up in the man's face. Another right hook from the raging woman shattered the man's jaw dislocating it as it hung loosely whilst a left hook obliterated the bones on the left side of the man's face. She kept on punching even as the man ceased moving, her hand beginning to burrow into the man's head, the skull long since shattered as bone fragments punctured the alien's brain. 
Even as blood and brain matter reputed from the orifices of the man's head, fragments on bone flowing within the life matter and pooling around the cratered head. I am good Kenya bellowed as she slammed her head into the saga bag that used to be the man's head, biting down on muscle ligaments as she rose back to full height, pulling out the tongue of her tormentor with her clenched teeth, flicking the soft sack of pink muscle to the side with a soft squelch. Breathing heavily, Kanya's blood and sweat filled hair clung to her nude form, her fist feeling like a thousand kilograms as she let them fall to her side. Sliding to the right side side, Kanya let herself lay on the ground, glaring at the headless corpse as she ran her left hand the brain matter and blood of the monster as she took in her handiwork. The world around her became a buzz, a ringing noise in her ears as she simply lay, ignoring all else as her hand was quickly dyed a deep crimson. The room shook as dust shook free from the ceiling, the sound of explosions lost on her as the flickering white light illuminated everything around her. Another explosion cracked the already warped ceiling, Kenya finally turning away from the corpse to face the room as the trickle of dust settled on her face. Before long, her wheezing breaths leveled out as her lungs slowly healed as she actively used the force to heal herself. Taking in a deep breath, the girl sat up on her elbows, staring down at her mangled legs as the red raw muscle and blood-stained bone. Almost all the flesh and muscle had been taken from the top of her feet, to the point she could count out each bone in both of her feet. The phantom pains of the blaster bolt still stung. That's not going to go away on its own Kenya mused in a deceptively calm tone, laying back down onto her back, bringing her gnarled and twisted fingers together into a praying-like gesture. Calm, reach inside whispers plead in her mind in the voice of her beloved father. Delving into a deep meditation, she remained away of the outside world as she attempted to attain harmony within herself, her breath leveling out, her heartbeat slowing as she felt a sense of warmth and belonging wash over her. Her emotions erupted as they became her sole focus, taking and clutching at her feeling of accomplishment and fulfillment for having done what was needed for the greater good. Righteousness followed soon after as the pain raking her body began to fade away without her notice. She took these emotions and embraced them, just as her master and the Order of Knights of Zakul had taught her. Feeling the life of everything around her within her meditative state, she mentally reached out and grasped at these life forms from the bacterial to rodents rummaging within the walls. And with an arch of her back, took from them the very life force that they needed to survive. Around her arching form, the light became a haze as the flickering of the overhead bulb intensified, a droning howl rising from nowhere in particular within the room as trails of energy constructed of life force flowed from all around, coming through the walls, roof and floor as flowing tendrils of purple and red energy that struck and settled into the skin of the woman that called for it to her body. With a howl, Kenya roared as the muscle in her lower body exploded to life, elongating, growing and stretching to coming her red stained legs, blood vessels sprung from her torso and wrapped around, binding the muscle and flowing within as blood began to flow through these mediums. Tendons formed and regrew to cover the muscle and blood vessels whilst a thin layer of clear tissue flowed like a liquid over the rebuilding legs, from her hips to the tops of her feet, her legs were reconstructed, now covered by clear skin which layers were being built up and over and over as new skin grew over the top, until at the end all that remained were two pristine legs, slightly pale to be sure due to their new construction but still smooth and pristine. Her eyes snapped over as she relaxed and lay back on the ground, unclasping her hand and letting her hands fall to the side. Flexing her toes in the open cold air around her, Kenya felt her toes slide against each other, the feeling once more returned to her legs as she stretched the muscle in her legs, spasming slightly as the pleasure of having working legs once more provided a sense of euphoria. As she lay on the ground basking in her silence, the door to the room blew off its hinges, scraping across the ground to collide with the far wall as smoke billowed in through the connecting hallway. Turning her head to look through the doorway, Kenya looked to see two crimson red lenses peering at her, the owner of said eyes stepping into the room whilst clutching a rotary cannon, rocket pods mounted to the thing's shoulders as a grenade belt was wrapped around its torso. 2V, you came for me Kenya wistfully mumbled as the droid calmly walked over to the laying woman reaching into its chest cavity to pull out a syringe of glowing green liquid that it plunged into Kanya's abdomen, 
injecting the fluid before simply tossing the spent syringe to the side. Of course princess. You exceeded the time you said you would need naturally I came looking the droid slung the Gatling gun over its shoulder and gently reached under Kanya's prone form. Thank you V Kanya whispered as she was lifted from the ground, one of the rocket pods attached to 2V turning to face the hallway as a rocket launched from the tube leaving a blazing trail of smoke as it wound around the corner to its track target. No, thank you, Princess rising with Kenya in hand, the droid turned to face the doorway as the rocket collided with its target down the hallway, a bright flash of orange followed by a wave of heat washing over them as Tuvi marched from the room and made his way through the trail of bodies littered through the hallways. In a daze Kenya looked around as she was carried in her droid's arms, she caught the blood splatters drenching the walls, still dripping as limbs hung from the ceilings, the bodies they belonged to wedged into the ceiling. Scorch marks blackened the walls and floors as the smell of iron and ash assaulted her nose. Hearing rushing footsteps, another rocket launched from two VS shoulder pods, flying forward to a group of droids that had congregated at the other end of the doorway. Oh no one of the droids stated as the rocket impacted the ground at the center of the ground with a whiz, exploding up an impact as it obliterated their bodies. Metal scrap swept the hallway with a clatter, blasters falling to the ground as Tuvi walked through the still burning ground, small flames licking at the base of his mechanical feet. Turning left at the junction, Tuvi entered an elevator, the elevator activating itself as it began to rise to the surface. A minute passed in comfortable silence before the elevator slowed to a halt, the droid and human marching into a new hallway with four doorways, the far end a wreck of twisted steel with shining white light shone through. However they didn't immediately leave the facility as Tuvi came to the first doorway, the door opening on its own as a large storage room was revealed. Repositioning Kenya, the droid allowed Kenya to her feet, gently propping the woman up as he motioned to a lockbox on one of the shelves. Princess, I believe that is where they have stored your equipment The droid returned to full height and turned to face the doorway, pulling his Gatling gun from his back and stepped into the hallway, rearing his weapon and unloading a constant stream of plasma on the basic machines marching through the opening. Kneeling down, Kenya unlocked the latches of the crate, peeling the lid off as her equipment lay wrapped in cloth within. Quickly redressing herself sliding the black skin tight suit to her body before equipping each individual piece of armor within. The final thing out on was her helmet which slid onto her head with no resistance, the lenses on the inside of the mask lighting up as system diagnostics were ran, automatically injecting several compounds into her back thanks to the inbuilt medical systems. Feeling the pain in her body numb, injected adrenaline brought her back to a state of stability as more healing compounds worked to heal the damage she herself hadn't been able to heal with the drain she had conducted earlier. Tightening her gauntlets in place, Kenya reached out, her hand above the case as she called her two lightsabers to her awaiting hand, the hilts flying into her hand immediately after. Clipping both weapons on either sides of her hips, Kenya turned to the battle unfolding in the hallway, making her way to the doorframe to see the situation. As the door slid open, Kenya ducked back away as a wall of plasma lit up everything around her, Tuvi standing alone in the hallway, blue shield constantly alight as it tried to protect the savior droid from the 20 to 30 droids guarding the entrance to the facility. Two more rockets launched from two VS shoulder pods, soaring down the hallway to collide with the two left and right columns of droids. Can't let him die now Kenya whispered as more droids arrived at the entrance, replacing the destroyed droids. Igniting both blades, twin yellow blades came to life in her grip, screaming to life as her third remained unlit, connected in house at the base of the spine of her armor. She leapt into the hallway, right lightsaber sweeping in a right diagonal arc, connecting with two bolts in the sweep that were redirected back some the hallway. Her left blade occupied the absent space in front of her as she wound her blade upwards to the right, with her blade reaching the apex of its arc up above her right shoulder, she pivoted her wrist and bent her arm so the blade was angled flat above her arm the point of the blade pointing behind her, redirecting another bolt that would have struck her head. Straightening her arm back out, Kenya flung her right hand saber down the hallway, a circular blur of yellow careening at her opponents as she went back to blocking the incoming bolts with her left blade. Choosing to use Sorsu, 
Kenya began redirecting any bolts that came in her direction, coming to stand directly beside Tuvi, both watching her second lightsaber reach the energy as the first line of eight was carved in half, exposing the second line as the yellow blade made its way back to its user, being met with Kanya's waiting right hand. Princess, by my calculations, there are about 40 opponents remaining in our vicinity Tuvi announced as his Gatling gun carved through six droid on the left side of the hallway ahead of them. All ahead of us right Kenya asked, looking to Tuvi as the droid nodded in the affirmative cover me. Once more static electricity permeated the air, the hairs on Kanya's body rising as the systems of her armor began to release a hum. Sprinting forward, Kenya remained low to the ground, both lightsabers extended in front of her as they became twin disks of yellow energy as her hands moved as a blur, leaving trails of light as it looked to be as if she herself were leaving after images. Bouncing around the hallway to dodge any bolts that rebound off of the surface around them, Kenya flipped off the left wall, her right foot touching the ground as she used her momentum to fly forward and slide into the ranks of enemy droid. We have you surrounded Jedi, hands up the stupid B-1 battle droids all leveled their blasters on Kenya as she remained crouched. 2V, shields up Kenya yelled out as she became obscured by blue and white light. Her companion did just that as he cranked his shielding to maximum output, just in time as another electromagnetic pulse erupted from Kanya's armor, scrambling everything around them as the wave of blue annihilated the battle droid's simple systems. 2V, being struck by the EMP and forced to shut down, however fared a great deal better than the simple droids as he was simply shut down and needed to be reactivated. One by one the droids toppled over and fell to the ground, useless husks of metal clanking to the ground as Kenya clutched her head, her implants spasming in her head as they slowly rebooted. Arg Kenya blinked rapidly to remove the spots in her eyes, slowly stumbling her way to the knocked out 2V. Reaching the deactivated droid, Kenya reached down and into the chassis of the droid, manually restarting the droid as it twitched at the sudden surge of power flowing through it. Did we win the droid optimistically asked as it slowly rose back to its full standing height, peering at the collapsed bodies of his fellow droids. I believe we did yes Kenya pat the droid on the shoulder, slowly limping her way to the entrance of the facility, the droid soon following after. Excellent. Fury Interceptor Stumbling on board the ship, the ramp closing behind the two, Kenya tore her helmet off and tossed it to the side of the cargo hold, walking to the lightsaber storage case that opened up in her arrival, allowing her to place the red lightsaber back into the case where it belonged. 2V, I'm going to need you to provide a synopsis on the capabilities of the prototype EMP system, analyze the recorded footage and send the findings to Scorpio and Skyva. Kenya unlocked the EMP prototype from her armor, allowing for the removal of the underplanting that housed the EMP systems, looking like a bulletproof vest used by enforcement, however on its back housed a flat ring-like beam of light that looked like an eclipse of white light, inbuilt in houses within a containment chamber in the shape of a flat halo. Winding around the front of the vest was a series of wires that fed around the armor, connecting to a large hexagonal plate on the front of the vest that served as both the hub and emitter. A display on the right side of the vest's chest showed three bars, one a constant green to show power remaining. One a slow blinking blue to show charge and emitter time and the final which was showing a countdown before it was ready to be used at full power. Will do, by the way, I believe you have a stored message in the communications hub. 2V informed Kenya as the woman began to undress into the nude. Thanks V, I'll check it out after I clean myself off. Kenya answered placing the EMP system into the droid's waiting arms as she moved to her quarters and shower. Entering her room, Kenya stepped into the waiting shower and wasted no time in activating the pressure jets, her jet black hair immediately clinging to her body as she kept her eyes closed under the intense pressure. Immediately she felt the stress of her day bleed from her body, allowing her to slump against the wall and just think of nothing. Leaning her back against the wall, Kenya leant her head back and ran her left hand through her black locks, breathing in a deep breath as the rising steam entered her lungs. Reaching with her right hand to a dispenser, cleaning gel was deposited into her hand which she proceeded to knees into her mucky hair, white foam coming into existence as she applied as much pressure as she wished, 
scrubbing the gel in as best as she could so she could clean her hair. Kneading the gel down the length of her meter length hair, Kanya leant over and began to wash the gel from her hair, the caked up blood and brain matter running down her hourglass figure in streams of red that were washed away as quickly as they appeared under the pressure jets. Reaching for more gel, Kanya washed the rest of her body, starting with her ample breasts as she scrubbed downwards, down her stomach and her legs. The whole process took half an hour as she took her time to relax under the warmth provided. And before long, Kanya stepped out from the shower, garbed in a white towel that she wrapped around her body whilst running a comb through her hair. Walking from her quarters, she stopped in dent of the communications terminal, activating the console to display the most recent message. Appearing in the hollow, Knox stood with his arms crossed staring at Kenya exactly where she stood despite it being a recorded message. Kenya, this message is of the utmost importance, there have been several disturbances through the force as of late, I have been gifted a glimpse of what is to come in the following days, the most prudent of which being on Tate Oin. It's Shmai, save her before it's too late. Kenya didn't allow the hollow to finish needing no more direction as she blurred into the cockpit of the vessel. Tate Oin, Lars Homestead now Kenya yelled out as she maneuvered the ship to face Tate Oin and activated the hyperdrive. Nathama, Knox's Palace, Vault 005. Knox stood with his arms crossed, the dim light of the sinister vault of which he stood obscured his features as nothing but his iridescent purple irises that sat in the blackened star-flecked eyes in his skull. Red light shone through the room courtesy of the object located at the center of the hexagonal-shaped vault. The only entrance to this specific vault was a door located on the southern face of the room, guarded by a multitude of zealots manning a hallway on the other side of the entrance, and four hulking boar claws that rested in their shells, awaiting an intruder. On the opposite side of the vault from the door, on the northern face, was a risen platform atop a set of stairs that raised a platform. Located on this platform was a sarcophagus which held what little remained of Tulak Horde's corpse. On a stand directly next to the sarcophagus was an obsidian mannequin which was used as a display to show off Tulak Horde's impressive armor, the armor dyed blood red from the obelisk in the center of the room. On the western face of the room was a series of shelves that released a ringing whistle, courtesy of the objects held up in the structure. The accumulated knowledge of Tulak Horde lay resting on these shelves. The holocrons the man had made in his time of life glowed in their prisms, kept in pristine condition by a service droid that kept everything as sanitized as possible. Tablets of scripture made under the ancient conqueror's eye were suspended from the ceiling in a halo formation, the stone writing facing the floor so one could study by simply looking up towards these titanic tablets. What really drew anyone that was looking into the room however was the restored artifact in the center of the room basking and releasing sinister light the red engine, the infernal machine hanging from the ceiling whilst its bottom half pyramid was held atop a pedestal at the base of the terrible creation. The dark side coiled around this obelisk, amplified by and feeding everything else held within the room as shadows passed through, almost alive as they snaked around the only other sentient occupant of the room. Under Knox's guidance, Valen levitated four feet above the ground, her legs crossed over each other as she held her knees with her hands. The flaps of her robes seemed to come to life on their own like a serpent, snaking through the air as the former empress took in the knowledge thrust up in her. Activating the machine, Knox reached out to the hanging portion of the machine, and for the briefest of moments, letting his iron-clad control of his emotions waver. Like a switch had been flicked, the room quaked under the barrage of rage, the sheer hatred manifest that darkened the room to the blackest of nights. The world, the force itself whined a pitiful whimper as Valen's breath became a physical distortion in the air as the temperature plummeted into the sub-degrees. Feast with the Emperor's demand made, the machine appeared to flash a vibrant orange with red mixed into it as it ate at the atmosphere around it. An aura began to bleed from the machine as it took the fuel offered to it, the sheer amount offered to it more than satisfactory to the object as its inner workings activated. Prepare yourself dear. What happens next may not be pleasant Knox warned as the machine began to him a high-pitched squeal. At the center of the machine, the space where the upper portion connected to the ceiling ended, and where the tip of the pyramid mountain to the ground sat, a ball of white light swirled into existence, 
fed into creation from the upper portion of the machine as a blanket of black vapor swirled around the upper portion like a cyclone. Culminating in a final high-pitched scream, Valen braced as everything flashed white, her ears ringing as even with her eyes closed, it was akin to staring at the sun with her eyes wide open. She felt as if her skin was being physically torn from her body, burnt off as it a nuclear shockwave was tearing her apart atom by atom. Blinded and feeling as if she was melting, the pain intensified as she felt fingers in her head, shifting around under her skull. Her teeth gnashed together, her eyes blazing with fury as blood trickled down from her sockets. And when it all became too much for the woman, she smiled, teeth flashing as she opened her maw and let loose a mad cackle of joy and pleasure. When the light died down, Valen was a panting mess, sweating profusely as she looked around in a daze. Walking over to Valen, Knox knelt down onto his right knee and gently moved a stray strand of hair out of her face. What was that Valen stammered out in a whisper, her lips quivering slightly as the pain of having every fiber of her being sifted through by whatever the machine had done to her. An imprint of recorded knowledge, forcefully implanted into your psyche, to unlock and draw up and through meditation once the ordeal is finished Knox explained as he led Valen to her feet I understand it is a trying process for those new to the experience. You don't say Valen accepted the help to her feet as she experienced a feeling of vertigo which caused her to stumble in her step slightly. With the machine no longer feeding off of Knox's bleeding hate, returned to a dormant state as the all-encompassing shadow of the dark once more coiled around the machine, waiting for the next instance its hunger would be sated. Let's get you out of here huh? Knox proceeded to pick the unprepared Valen up bridal style and marched through the entryway to Vault 005 let's let you rest for a bit. Making his way to the end of the hundred meters hallway with forty zealots in total standing in columns along its length, Knox came into an eight-point junction, at the center of the junction being an elevator that ascended to higher floors. The door to the elevator slid open on its own as Knox approached, ignoring the seven other hallways each with a vault of their own at their ends. Looking towards the control panel on the side of the wall, currently reading Secure Floor, Subterranean Level 42. Knox accessed the terminal with his neural implant, telepathically selecting the 13th surface level so he wouldn't have to release Valen as she rested in his arms. As the elevator rose, ascending with such speeds that despite the hundred meters of solid concrete between each level, they passed floors in seconds. But none of this was on Knox's mind however as wave of anger and hate, sorrow and fury washed over him, the echoes of a pulse that washed over the galaxy. Was that... Valen whispered as Knox nodded. Skywalker. It appears my warnings came too late. Knox frowned as he tuned into what was occurring halfway across the galaxy and one takes further steps into the beckoning darkness. For the one guided by hatred and fear, fears not the dark, but the consequences of failure. Tatooine nine hours later. Dropping out of hyperspace, the Fury Interceptor blitzed towards the surface of the Red Sand Planet. The ship rattled violently as they entered the atmosphere, akin to an asteroid as they plummeted to the surface. Steering the ship in the direction of the Jund land wastes, Kanya's lips quivered uncontrollably as they reached the surface and leveled out, kicking up a storm of sand and dust as the ship crossed the salt flats at blistering speeds. Lars Homestead Eating silently at the table, Beru and Lars ate with Clegg, the mood downcast as they took small spoons of their soup. Before Clegg could take another spoonful of his dinner, a yellow flash ignited over his shoulder as a blade became level with the side of his neck ready to decapitate him. He froze in complete terror as Beru and Owen took notice of the figure that seemingly appeared out of nowhere. The molten eyes of Kanya freezing Owen and Beru in place at the prospect of Clegg's potential end. K what are you doing Owen stammered in panic as Kanya's eyes beat down upon him her head straight but her eyes glaring down upon him. Where is she? Kenya whispered, her voice carrying across the table. Slowly lowering his spoon to the table, Clegg rotated his repulsor chair to face Kenya, staring up at the girl with a sorrow-ridden face. Where is my mother? Kenya demanded, Saber coming closer to Clegg's jugular, fully prepared to run the man through. She's a... Uh, come with me. I'm sure she'd like to hear from you Clegg looked straight at the ground as he hovered away from Kanya's saber and out of the dining room. 
Following the disabled man, Kenya ascended the stairs back to the surface level of the salt flats. Anakin was here, where is he? Kenya asked, the depressed man looking over his shoulder as they approached a particular part of the farm. He was here a couple of hours ago, he left for Geonosis, don't know much else, but... The man stopped at the base of a mound of sand, two different unmarked tombstones of different sizes were lined up beside each other. What is this Kenya bit as her lightsaber shook in her hand, her fear practically palpable in the air around them. The one on the left belongs to my dearest brother Edern, the middle one my parents. Clig sniffed as tears fell from his eyes and the one on the right, the best wife a moisture farmer could have ever had the privilege of marrying. Kenya stood stock still, processing the information, and when it did, the yellow blade of her weapon deactivated and fell from here grip to land onto of the sands at her foot. Nothing came to mind as she simply collapsed onto the ground in front of the tombstone, hunched over as her forehead pressed into the sand. A sob racked the woman as splotches of tears slid down to the sad, the sob soon giving way to openly crying as she moved and propped herself against the tombstone. When? Kenya asked through hyperventilating sobs, left hand raking the sand above the body below, sifting through her hand as she closed her eyes and leant her head back onto the solid concrete slab. Last night, midnight Clig answered hovering closer to the girl as he gently placed his hand on her shoulder. Last night, then I could have made it if I hadn't. Kenya felt like screaming, the full weight of her failures bearing down up in her shoulders. I'm sorry. Clig whispered as his thumb gently rubbed her shoulder. Was she happy before it happened? Kenya asked, allowing the man to try and soothe her as she didn't have the will to put up a brave front at that moment. I have her journal if you'd like to have a read, there's a room available to you as long as you want it. Clig offered his daughter-in-law to which she nodded slowly. I'll ah. Uh, I'll come down later, for now I just, want to spend some time with her. Kenya replied, Clig looking to her with pity. I'll prepare you a meal, join us when you're ready. Clig slowly began to make his way back to the pit which housed the Lars homestead. Thanks. The next day. You don't want to stay any longer Lars asked as Kenya looked towards the Fury Interceptor getting ready for flight. There are, things that I have to do Kenya answered as Beryl looked her arm around Lars's own. Well, just as father said. There's always a place here for you if you want it. Lars smiled kindly as Kenya turned her head to look at the farmer sadly. I appreciate it, thank you. Kenya lifted her lips in a pathetic attempt at a smile before it dropped, looking back to the interceptor before preparing to go. Before you go, Clig appeared from the dimly lit staircase of the stairway, coming up to the gathered group as he waved at his daughter in law, handing her a bound leather case sliding it into the girl's hand I think this would find more purpose in your hands. Looking down, Kenya gazed as the rough leather, terrible in quality as was the paper within, but it was still previous to the previous owner and now precious to Kenya herself. I don't. I. Kenya's gentle fingers slid over the journal, tears once again brimming in her eyes as she looked at Clig's sad eyes. Young lady, you take this journal and you keep it close. We all have a piece of her in our hearts, but it doesn't hurt to have a little something to remember her by. Clig clasped Kanya's hands and smiled kindly at her, plus. I have a sneaking suspicion that she wanted you to have it anyway. Clutching the journal to her bosom with her left hand, Kanya reached with her right hand and wrapped her arm around Clig. Thank you Clig, thank you. You're a good man. You know. I think being here may have been some of the best days of her life Kenya stood back to as she observed the Lars family. Don't be a stranger, you come by and have a meal with us sometime Clig smiled, Kenya turning halfway to face the starship as its thrusters began to activate. I'm sure I can spare some time to have a meal with my family Kenya then began her march to the awaiting ramp of her ship, the small smile on her face dissolving away into a malevolent scowl her lips twitching as she ascended the ramp and made her way through to the bridge. Princess Tuvi acknowledged her presence as the adoptive daughter of the Eternal Emperor guided the ship from the Lars homestead into the atmosphere of the Red Planet where to Milady. Lama Red, we have unfinished business to finish. Lana Red, the same day, Mila's saloon. 
The bar was awash in customers, joyously going through their day as her girls worked, dancing, and offering services and drinks. The green-skinned Felayen ran a cloth across a glass as she cleaned it, it had been a good day, sure to be an even better night as customers of all species flooded into the joint. Things however took a turn for the worst as a shiver ran down her spine, everyone within the building apparently experiencing the same feelings as the door to the establishment opened. A figure garbed in a simple back robe stared dispassionately at everyone in the establishment, head scanning from left to right. The bouncer Berlo turned to face the stranger, moving to remove the person from the establishment just as the person raised their hand in a grasping motion. All the patrons gasped as Berlo struggled and rose from H. The ground against his will, grasping at his neck as terror overcame the alien. Walking forward into the saloon, the black-garbed figure then strode into the building, hands still clasped together as Berlo followed the figure still hovering and chalking in the process while the hooded monster came towards the bar. As the thing walked, the patrons leant away from the person as far as they possibly could without drawing the thing's attention. Coming up to the bar, the person sat themselves down all the while Mila looked at the desperate pleading eyes of Berlu. What can I do for you Mila asked as the person used their free hand to grab the base of their hood, pulling back much to Mila's horror. You can start by telling me who you opened your mouth to wench Molten eyes glared at Mila as the Felayan began to openly panic Tell me now, or they all die It was a businessman named Sidi Stan Mila blurred as the intense eyes of the woman in front of her studied her Dropping her hand, the bouncer dropped to the ground, heaving desperately to draw in as much oxygen as possible Tell me, where is this Sidi Stan Kenya asked lightning dancing between her fingers as she drew closer to the Felayen. That night. Please. I'll tell you whatever you want, just let me live the core Iver named City Stan plead. Open your mouth, or I'm going to cut through the base of your neck. Kenya stared down at the quivering alien, the man reluctantly doing as ordered. Her face plastered as she knelt down, her fingers out of sight of the alien wrapping around a long hollow tube and quicker than the alien could react, she pulled the tube out and shoved it down the man's throat, all the way down to the base of the neck. Gagging and wrenching, hollow echoes sounded from the other end of the hollow's tube as the mon breathed and gagged, trying to get the tube out. I wouldn't move your head if I were you, the way it is, if you move too much, it might tear something, that and you'll be needing it soon Kenya rose patting the man on the back as she looked wound a series of chains and binds around his legs. Running her hand down the links of the chain, Kenya grabbed the end and hooked it to 200 kilogram weights. Now, let's get down there while it's low tide Kenya grabbed the core Iver and began to climb down the side of the pier until her feet connected with the mud ground meters below. Placing the man onto the mud ground, laying as still as he could eyes wearing as he plead through his facial features to her, the rapid breathing through the tube amusing her. With the weights and chain in her off hand, Kenya simply dropped them onto the mud, a gesture of her hand and quick use of the force making the weights be buried into the mud. Now, we have a few minutes before the tide comes in, so. I'm going to talk and you're going to listen Kenya leant against the support beams of the pier with her arms crossed. You see, I'm an orphan adopted by a man who I love and cherish as my father. I had a adoptive mother as well, a lovely woman on Tatooine known as Shmi Skywalker, I grew up beside her son Anakin. We loved each other, I as her daughter and her as my mother. Recently she remarried she was finally happy. But, apparently, she was taken hostage by a bunch of Tusken raiders. My father found out. And he sent me several messages and tried to communicate with me in order to get me to her to save her as fast as possible, since I'm 99% closer to Tatooine than Coruscant is, it would have taken me 6 hours at most to get there and save her Kenya uncrossed her arms and glared. At the silent core Iver but. I was indisposed, unconscious because of the trap you laid to protect your investment. And now. A day too late to help. She's dead and I could have saved her if I was able to receive those messages, but I couldn't. And the ultimate reason lies before me, anchored to the ground. Her eyes flickered from the core Iver to the approaching waters that quickly began to rise. Now, 
float and breathe, or die. I don't care Kanya leapt up onto the lone pier and proceeded to sit down, leaning back onto her elbows as she watched the ocean rise. Hours later. Sitting on the pier, Kanya watched the sun set, knees curled up in front of her chest as streams of tears rushed down her cheeks. Her hair flowed in the howling winds coming in from the ocean, the white armor she wore doing its best to keep her warm. A profound sadness came over her, no longer could she feel the connection to Shmai, a constant she had been able to use to comfort herself, but now, that connection, that comfort was gone, a whole, void of anything was missing, never to return. Her brow twitched at the sound of a hiss from a snorkel poking out of the high tide waters coughing rising from the tube protruding from the water as a wave washed over the top of the snorkel, filling the reliant creature's lungs with water which was promptly dispelled by another violent series of coughs. Angrily she turned to face the dark shadow under the surface of the water, the culprit behind the trap that had knocked her unconscious, alive and struggling to keep himself alive on the misconceived notion that she would allow him to live after what he had done. With her molten eyes lit, Kanya reached out with her left hand, motioning towards the overall area around the core ivor, Kanya focused. Her finely controlled hate spewed out from her, blistering heats rose from the ocean floor below, the waters beginning to boil as Kanya snarled, taking pleasure from the panic rising from the submerged individual. Being knocked around by the rough waters, the core ivor cried out through the snorkel, bubbles of oxygen rising around him as the water was slowly but surely increasing in heat. Intense pain flared around him as he was burned by the water, he tried to cry out, he tried to squirm his way free, but the weights connected to his feet wouldn't allow him to be freed. Thank you for the meal miss, I wasn't expecting an invite from my new neighbor for dinner, a shame my husband couldn't join us a female core Iver spoke a small smile on her features whilst her children happily ate their meals I'm sorry I'm afraid I've forgotten your name miss. Kreth, my name is Lady Kreth the glowing eyes of the human across from her brightened momentarily in her mirth. Lady Kreth, I'm sorry to be brash, but you wished to talk about some of my business did you not Alistair spoke, the female core Ivor looking expectantly at the human who toyed at her dark hair with squinted eyes. H.N. Kreth looked up before sighing oh yes. I understand you're working with the confederacy are you not? Your husband mentioned to me you share slot of work together. That's right yes. Alistair looked unsure, but it wasn't uncommon knowledge that they were working alongside the separatists we are very proud to stand by and help such a just cause. I'm sure Kreth turned her attention from Alistair to her two sons and daughter did you two enjoy your meals? Yes Miss Kreth. It was a lovely dish Sanda answered, a small smiles coming to Alistair. I'm glad you enjoyed it Kreth replied before turning back to Alistair now in light of your, impressive insight. I'm in need of some, information, and in turn, I'll part with some of my own. That depends on what you want and what you offer Alistair squinted at the woman across from her. Oh, I'm sure you're aware of Severance Tan's prior training. I want the location of this said academy. And in turn. I'll let you retrieve your husband Kreth stared at Alistair as the core Ivor froze, shaking slightly before rage flashed across her face. Why you shrewd sniveling no good Alistair rose from her chair as her voice rose. A twist of Kreth's hand was accompanied by the sounds of a sickening snap. Alistair whirling around to the screams of her children as he middle child lay still he would be face down in his food had his neck not be facing the wrong direction, snapped backwards at a 180 degree, eyes wide as he blinked and slowly died as blood dripped from his mouth. Answer the question or we go two for two Kreth said, Alistair turning to the demon that she ate with as the human seemed like the cat that ate the canary. After a full minutes of silence Kreth's amusement seemed to crash and die every second she waited. Not going to answer, all right Kreth raised her hand again, promptly twisting her fingers as Alistair, panicked, leapt at the demon, however she froze mid-air as her eldest child, her son released garbled noises behind her, her daughter freaking out and openly crying at this point, however the child remained in her seat, too scared to move as Kreth simply stared at Alistair. Answer, or you'll lose your favorite Kreth demanded as Alistair gulped. I... I don't know, B, but... 
I... I know they're on Geonosis right now, you can find out there Alistair was promptly dropped to the ground. I see, very good. Thank you for your time Kreth rose from her seat and began to leave the house. Wait, M, my husband, where is he Alistair begged as she groveled. Boiled fat reptile meat isn't exactly at the top of my list of favorite meals. But you can't waste a good kill can you? Kreth walked to the table and fished into one of the deceased boy's meals and pulled out what looked to be a molar. I hope you enjoyed your meal ma'am, good day. Alistair simply stared ahead as her child wailed several octaves louder behind her. 2v, prepare the ship for a trip to Geonosis we have a chis to find. Kenya spoke as she pulled out a trigger hopping onto her Lurgo agitator before swiftly departing the high-end building. Before reaching too far away, she pressed the trigger and smirked at the massive fireball that sprung into existence from the building she had just departed, turning her head away as she disappeared into the dark of the night. With Knox, atop his palace, Nathama. Standing stop the highest floor of his palace, standing stop a spire that rose high into the atmosphere. On the western and eastern faces were two towering tuning towers, rising higher into the skies, being used as a focus as the palace itself channeled the dark energies of the force. Around the titanic palace was a plateau of extravagant greenery and life, creatures running through the Rhine forests and enjoying their lives but wisely stayed away from the behemoth black doors that served as the entryway to the palace. Surrounding the plateau however was the giant rising mountains surrounding the plateau, this was expected however since the palace was located within a caldera of enormous proportions. The plateau, before reaching the mountains that surrounded the landscape on all sides, dropped off into a moat of churning lava that descended into the crust of the planet. Within this moat of magma was churning forms of fire wirms that were imported to the planet, finding their place happily as they loved their new stomping ground. Looking up, Knox looked to the dome of swirling winds that surrounded the caldera itself, a creation of Knox, a dome of Mach 4 winds that swirled perpetually, tearing apart anything and everything that entered its boundaries. This dome of torrential wind blocked off all potential traffic to and from the caldera, simply traveling to the volcanic crater on foot was an impossibility lest one be torn apart by the sediment and wind current itself. The only way to actually travel to the palace itself was through a system of artificial subterranean caverns that started near the sanitarium tens of kilometers away from the kilometer. Getting through these caverns would be a difficult task, due to the Vorklaw swarm that covered the grounds. Anti-aircraft emplacements installed into the ceiling to utterly annihilate anything that wasn't permitted to travel through the cavern system. Yes, Knox's palace, known only to the zealots and Scorpio herself was Knox's last bastion. A place to come back to should everything he worked for fall, if his empire ever turned on him, or an enemy destroyed his people. His palace would ensure not only his survival, but the survival of his knowledge and family. Within the subterranean floors of the palace was a colossal laboratory, commanded and used solely by a Shah at Knox's request. Several floors above this laboratory were dormant factories meant to produce anything from water, food and basic living supplies, even organics, to being able to produce an automated army of enormous proportions to defend the palace. The vaults below the lab were accessible only to the guards and whomever Knox chose, the accumulated knowledge his people, Tulak Horde, Aloysius Kalig, Mar, Freedom Nad, Naga Sado, and many other ancient Sith had dedicated vaults sealed away until their knowledge was to be collected upon or added to. Knox stared out at his creations of harmony and chaos, basking in the nexus of energy that was growing stronger with every moment thanks to the palace itself, and in turn gifting more power for Knox being able to absorb from the nexus in any moment. Connecting directly to the nexus, Knox drew in the energies, arching his head as he, in that moment, made use of his foresight and force sight. Swirling to him like a swirling vortex of black flame mixed with its opposite of shining white light, Knox remained utterly still as his eyes lost focus, making use of the same techniques Tenebri once did whilst he had Ravan imprisoned. Knox peered into the branches of the possible future. His face contorted to display several shifting emotions as rapid flashes appeared within his mind. From the unmaking of the universe to his own impending death, Knox saw every possible future within that moment. Others less likely than the rest, 
Knox focused on the major common factor within 99% of the branches. As quickly as it came, Knox ended his state of intense meditation, allowing the Nexus to return to their previous state. Knox glared straight out towards the large galaxy with glowing purple iris, seeing through stars towards what he foresaw to be the start of the galaxy's major events. It's time. For chaos. Standing up in the bridge of his luxurious ship. Arms crossed, Knox glared out through the viewport at the swirling vortex of blue streams of light. Wearing his Sith cultist armor with the court Asus weave skin suit underneath, over the top of his armor was a black cloak to obscure both himself and his armor, hidden underneath the cloak, clipped to his waist was his lightsaber, the flow of the exposed crystal releasing a crimson light under the hem of his robes. Valen, sitting in the co-pilot's seat, ran a comb through her wet hair as she wore a lone loose silk see-through nightgown. Turning his head from the viewport to stare at Valen herself, Knox smiled slightly as he watched her engrossed in her current actions. Seemingly noticing his staring, Valen slowly turned to look towards her lover, puckering her lips slightly as she held the comb underneath her breasts. See something you like, Valen purred as she leant forward in her chair. Yes, you tease Knox chuckled, seeing Valen's satisfaction at the hunger flashing in his eyes. Knew it, I'm simply irresistible, Valen replied fluttering her lashes as she ran her slender fingers down her chin. Che, close enough Knox leant down and captured her lips with his own. Their fun was cut short was a low-sounding boom echoed throughout the ship, signifying the arrival to Geonosis. Becoming serious, Valen's face flattened as she stared out through the bridge. So this is where is happens ha huh? Valen asked. Knox returning to his standing position as the ship automatically engaged its cloaking procedures. Yes, can you feel them, can you see it, the threads of fate are entwined together here, the ripples of time and space quake in anticipation Knox stared out, unblinkingly as the orange world of sand grew closer. It's exhilarating Valen answered to his question, Knox nodding in turn as the ship they were on entered the atmosphere of the planet, the arena clear as day as much as Knox could see the rippling power of the force users present. Knowing Kenya was too nearby, Shrouding herself from everyone present but himself, the X-70B made its way towards a plateau with a flat surface of orange-tinted stone. I suppose it's time to depart, Valen grunted, rising from her chair as she made her way to their shared quarters. That it is. The X-70 settled down atop the orange-tinted stone of Geonosis, waves of sand parting around the vessel as its landing gear touched down up in the surface of stone. The ramp to the ship lowered slowly with a hiss, hitting the ground with a small clang. Stepping down the ramp, wearing his robe with his Sith cultist armor hidden beneath, like a stalking behemoth of shadow, Nox stopped to stare at the orange planet with an apathetic gaze. At his side, sauntering down the ramp with a curled smirk, Valen came to a stop behind his right shoulder. Looking towards the Colosseum, Knox watched as clouds of Genosians swarmed towards the stone construct. Absent-mindedly, Knox took note of the separatist core ships buried into the surface of the planet, massive silos scattered around the sand flats that spanned kilometers. Stepping off of the ramp, Knox squinted and looked around. Engage cloaking measures and return to the stratosphere until called Appen. I wouldn't want anyone to happen Appen our ship by accident Knox ordered the onboard AI watching the ship lift off from the ground, its ramp closing as it did so whilst its form began to shimmer and disappear. The only proof of the ship's departure for them was the low boom of the thrusters propelling the ship high into the atmosphere and the sudden change in the air currents, Valen's hair whipping around from under her cloak as she and Knox began to walk to the edge of the stone plateau. Are you ready to watch the opening chapters of yet another war? Knox held out his open hand, slithering from within the black void of his sleeves. Of course Valen took hold of Knox's hand, prepared for the feeling of vertigo that came with Knox making use of fold space app in them. Geonosis Petronaki Arena Appearing within one of the tree-towering columns of stone that surrounded the Colosseum, Knox stared down below towards the stands and the arena floor below, making sure he didn't step out from the shadow of the window sill. They're bringing the prisoners out, Valen murdered watching as Obi-Wan Kenobi was brought into the arena on a drawn carriage, tugged along by a reptile with a Genosian solitaire. 
the gathered populace of Genosians that were scattered throughout the arena cheered as the man was chained to the first of the four pillars that stood at the center of the arena. Sniffing his nose slightly, Nox twitched as Valen caught wind of his odd behaviors, the man turning to face one of the darkened archways leading to the arena with an analytical eye. Dear. Valen inquired as Nox flatly stared at the archway, as if waiting for something to happen. I smell lust, passion, love. And it's coming from Skywalker, and Amidala Nox answered, watching the haze of emotion peel out of the archway with a small grin. Ovalon quickly turned to face where Nox was staring, just in time to catch Padme and Anakin pulling apart, but she didn't miss the passion not the emotion rippling off of the two as they stared into each other's eyes I think I'm going to be sick. I've seen you stare at some of your dinners with the same intensity as that Nox playfully remarked as Valen's brow twitched. Shut it Valen bit non-aggressively, turning to pout as Anakin and Padme were carted out to each of their own pillars, chained in a similar way to Obi-Wan. Count Dooku Nox observed the grey-haired man that stood beside Newt Gunray and the Archduke alongside the reported bounty hunter Jango Fett. The famed Makashi master Valen stared at the supposedly dangerous old man who looked far more spry for his age than one should. That's the one Nox confirmed as the Archduke spoke to the Genosians in the stands. I wanna test him Valen's hand twisted towards the hilt of her weapon. Another time perhaps, they're bringing out the executioners Nox remarked as three large gates were opened, three creatures being escorted towards their targets by their handlers. They've got a reek Nox pointed to a large triple horned bull like creatures that roared ferociously at its handlers. Don't we have one of those Valen pointed out towards the green insectoid that snapped and hissed as it was prodded on. Close but no, that's an acklay, we have a gladiopod Nox replied as Valen pursed her brow. What's the difference Valen asked in genuine curiously. Biome I suspect, I'm positive they had a common ancestor somewhere down the line. Just differences in environment led to the difference of appearance and capabilities Nox informed. Ah I see, and that's a Nexu Valen stared at the feline with a small smile, her interest peaked I want one. I'm sure I could order one or two of their cubs for you Nox answered, Valen smiling much like the cat that got the canary. It appears the fun is about begin Nox leant against the stone windowsill and stared down as the Acklay began its attack. Sweat pooled on Obi-Wan's brow as he ducked out of the way of the Acklay's attack, moving his chained arms in front of the beast's claw, silently rejoicing as the beast's claw shattered the chain, allowing his freedom as he ducked out of the way of another swipe. Leaping to the left, immediately followed by a bounce to the right, Obi-Wan avoided two death-guaranteeing stabs and leapt behind the pillar out of his attacker's reach in search of a way to remove his cuffs. Hearing a solid smash, he turned to his left to see the reek had smashed its head in an effort of pulverizing Anakin. Instead however, Anakin had leapt up and over the beast's head and landed on its back, and with a shake, the monster had torn Anakin's chain in half as the young man clung to the red and grey beast. Obi-Wan didn't have any more time to think however as a green pincer wrapped around the pillar and attempted to stab him through, the Jedi Master rolling out of the way as he heard Padme scream out in pain. That's probably going to get infected if it's not treated soon Nox remarked as he watched Padme scream and slash at the Nexo with her chains, forcing the feline to fall from the pillar and whimper about in pain. Feeling a burst of anger and hatred, Nox stared at Anakin, seeing the young man's heated expression as he stared at the Nexo and Padme. The sheer panic and compassion rolling off the boy enraptured Nox's attention as it was abundantly clear at what was causing it. One would think the supposed chosen one would have more stable emotions Valen squinted at Anakin as the boy came to Padme's rescue whilst controlling the reek. What the freak? Valen winced as Padme dropped down from the pillar and landed on the reek on her crotch how strong is her crotch? With the Acklay pulling back as it was attacked by one of the guarding Genosians, Anakin and Padme picked up Obi-Wan, the Jedi Master jumping up onto the reek behind the senator as he nodded towards his apprentice. Their reprieve ended soon after as the gates to the arena opened soon after, a legion of battle droids marching and rolling in under Dooku's command. Pulling the reek to a stop, Anakin, Padme and Obi-Wan looked nervously at the droidicas that came to a stop in front of them, their cannons mounted and at the ready for the order to kill their targets. Seemingly waiting to give the order, 
Count Duco looked up in the to be victims with an unimpressed look of superiority, a small grunt leaving the man as he prepared to give the order. However, Appen hearing the snap hiss of a lightsaber behind him, Duco raised an eyebrow and turned to face the assailant. Master Windu. How pleasant of you to join us Duco crossed his hands together in front of his brown robes as he stared at the master of the order whom had his purple saber ignited and held to Jango Fett's neck. This party's over was all Windu responded with, as lightsabers around the stands of the Colosseum were ignited, sending the Genosians in the stands panicking. A sea of blue and green erupted, a stark contrast against the dull orange stone as the Jedi and Jedi Council members stood ready. Brave but um, foolish my old Jedi friend. You're impossibly outnumbered Duca remarked, his face a stone cold slab as he remained unimpressed. I don't think so Winder retorted as he squinted at Duku. We'll see Duku answered as his eyes flickered over Winder's shoulder, alerting the Jedi Master to the march of four super battle droids. Turning to face the silver droids, Windu immediately deflected red bolts blasting at him from the battle droids' wrist-mounted blasters, and was forced to leap up and away from the bounty hunter that he had taken his eyes off of as a plume of fire erupted from the Mandalorian's gauntlet scorching Windu's robes as he dropped to the arena floor below, cursing his failure at apprehending Dooku as he tore off his burning robe and left it in the sand. With the apprehension of Dooku a failure, the arena dropped into chaos, the army of droids in and under the Colosseum spewing forward to meet the line of Jedi in open combat. Standing on one of the higher platforms of the stands, Kanya glared down at the battle opening up below, shrugging off her robe to expose her new armor, having left the exiled Padawan's armor behind because it would no doubt be known to the separatists at this point and did not want to be connected to it. This time she wore a set of resilient warden's armor, dyed pearl white much to her liking. Igniting her yellow bladed saber, Kanya's fiery orange eyes scanned the field below, searching for her brother. And she found him, still mounted to the reek as he and Obi-Wan were tossed sabers, freeing themselves and Padme of their cuffs. Don't worry Anakin. I'm coming crouching low, Kanya tensed her muscle before launching herself high into the air, out to the center of the Colosseum as she reached the apex of her leap. She stalled for a moment in the air, taking in the sight as she breathed in, and as the she pushed out the air from her lungs, she became a dropping comet of black and yellow light. Slamming into the ground at the center of a group of droids, time seemed to slow to the woman, her body acting accordingly. Her lightsaber flashed right, separating a droid's head from its body, and as its head still fell in slow motion, Kanya reversed her saber in her grip and slashed behind her, slicing another clear down the middle before she twirled and sliced the remain two around to her left in half all within a second. Everything returned to real time as Kanya looked around her the rest of the battle's occupants taking note of the new addition. Pathetic Kanya hissed with a hard glare blade intercepting a bolt without looking to be redirected back at its sender 40 dead Jedi already, did you just expect them to bend over for you without a fight? The droid, finally registering her as a threat, targeted the woman as she leapt into action, superhuman speed and reflexes carving a swath of death through the first rank of droids to open fire up in her. She's gotten stronger Valen remarked, watching Nox's apprentice seemingly flash around the battlefield explosions of metal following the girl's wake as she let loose. In a way, she simply learned the consequences of failure, and now she fears it Knox remarked as Kanya leapt high over a super battle droid and sliced it down the middle before landing on her feet and flashing towards a droidica. But even then Knox turned his attention to the overall battle. For every droid Kanya destroyed, two more took their places, an endless army of metal marching without care as they were made to trample the forces of the Jedi it's not enough. Are we to save them Valen asked as her fingers kept twitching towards her lightsaber, watching as Jango Fett leapt from his place at Count Dooku's side, activating his jet pack to join in the battle unfolding. No, we need not interfere, I can sense the Jedi Grand Master approaching from outside of orbit with what appears to be a great many life forms. The need to save them doesn't fall on our shoulders Knox explained as he crossed his arms and went back to observing the rest of the battle below. Stilling slightly, Knox turned to face deeper into the dark catacomb hallway, the
the light of the window behind him casting a long shadow that connected with the overarching dark beyond. It appears we have overstayed our welcome in his grip, the black blade of his saber screamed to life with a horrid scream, a shroud of purple curving around the blade as its purple light shone. Tearing from and cross the purple shroud, red arcs of lightning leaping from the blade to crash against the stone, illuminating it in violent flashes of red. Illuminated under the red light of the striking bolts, reflective eyes of hundreds of Genosians stared back, climbing on top each other, the ceiling, and the walls. May Ivalin asked, practically salivating at the chance to annihilate the bugs chittering before them. Of course Nox nodded, and with a scream, the blade of his weapon receded into the hilt, plunging the catacomb into darkness once more. Said darkness didn't last long however as a yellow light bathed the catacomb in its rays, Valen's blade in her grip as she wasted no time in sprinting at the congregated bugs. Glee shone on Valen's face as she collided with the first bug, blade tearing through its chest as she bounced to the left to clip the wings from one who tried to fly behind her. Grabbing a third by the neck, Valen dragged it into the path of a green ring shot from one of the blasters leaping out of the way as the pulse struck the bug, Valen blurred features becoming indiscernible as she plunged her free hand through the blaster-wielding bug, discarding its body to the side as her hot blade carved through its surrounding allies. Ducking under a reaching arm, Valen ducked up against the stone-cold wall that met her back, watching one of the bugs as it sailed past with a hiss. She swung her hand out to slap its head, its neck breaking and spinning into the other direction as it fell to the ground. Backed up against the wall, Valen was surrounded on all sides by Genosians, her eyes straining to the window to see Nox had remained lent against the window sill to allow her her fun. Rather than being worried, Valen smirked as she brought her lightsaber to her front, readying herself in her stance whilst the force coalesced around her palm. She spasmed slightly as she called for the dark side to come to her, the intensity of her eyes growing before her head snapped forward and let out a scream. The tunnel shook as the first line of Genosians scampered and scattered in sheer terror as the scream did as it was supposed to. Her lightsaber flashed in a blur, sweeping around in an arc to the left to carve through the left flank, her left hand now located under her right arm as her blade in her right hand completed its sweep, pointing at the right flank as a torrent of lightning leapt from her fingers, singing the Genosians under the barrage. With the first line of opponents now deceased, Valen looked deeper into the tunnel to see the rest of the Genosians exchanging chatter, seemingly scared and weary as they stood off with her as she retook her position at the center of the tunnel. Well it's no fun if you are too scared to attack she deactivated her weapon and clipped it to her belt as dark power began to build up in both hands once more. Seeing her deactivate her weapon, the Genosians took their chance to attack as they surged forward, but this proved to be their folly as Valen smiled wickedly, once more lightning snapped and forked from her fingers and into the bug, lightening up the hallway in blue and white light as the first four bugs completely exploded, the others melted or worked as conductors as lightning jumped from them and towards another nearby. But they all had the same thing in common as they became deceased almost immediately after being washed over by Valen's lightning. Sensing no further life up ahead, Valen halted the flow of dark energy through her fingers as the intense arcs died down, leaving husks where the bugs had once been, smoke and fire rising from their burnt flesh whilst bolts of electricity occasionally jumped from them to disperse into the air. Lowering her hands, Valen clicked her hands to her side and turned to walk back to Nox's side. Satisfied Nox asked, looking back down into the arena. Not in the slightest Valen answered, her brow knitting as she grumbled to herself what now? We leave, I've seen enough and soon the Jedi and their armies will be swarming, yes it's time we left extending his hand, Valen once more slid her fingers into his awaiting hand, squeezing it gently in her grasp as her eyes became lidded and she smiled slightly. With the two becoming enveloped in a purple haze, they evaporated from the catacomb, the only proof someone was there being the deceased corpses that would be pinned on a Jedi when discovered. The battle raged on around them as Padme and Anakin took cover behind an upturned skiff, Standing back to back, Mace and Obi-Wan deflected all blaster fire coming their way, the practitioner of Sorsua and the Vapad Master proved effective in defending each other. But it was proving to be futile, as no matter how many droids or Genosians were dropped, more took their place. 
Kanya's words proved true, as up until now, over 180 of the 250 Jedi had been slain in the arena. Kanya dropped low as a bolt sailed overhead, her right arm extended to her far right as the droid to shoot at her fell to the ground with its head cut off. Extending her left arm to the opposite side of its right, she made a gripping motion with her hands and dragged them towards her chest. Two droids were immediately dragged towards her, their confusion distracting them long enough for Kanya to leap up and behead them. Landing on the ground with a small huff, Kanya's braided hair hung over her eyes, the woman looking around the arena with a hard gaze. This isn't good Kanya saw the Jedi seem to be being herded together towards the center of the arena I need to get Anakin and Padme out of here. Picking up a dead Jedi's lightsaber, a pale-skinned human female with black hair, Kanya ignited the green blade in her left hand, pointing both blades at the ground as she leant forward and charged at the place she had spotted Anakin to be. Keeping low, her two blades left twin trails of smoldering sand as she chopped and carved her way through the droids in her path. A small hop to the right and a swing of her left hand separate the arms of a B2 battle droid. Dropping to the ground, Kanya slid under the legs of a Genosian whilst her yellow blade was pointed up and split the insect in half. Leaping up from her slide, Kanya's she's wandered for a second, allowing her to make a split-second decision for freak's sake. She sped towards a ring of droids surrounding a Padawan whom did his best to deflect every bolt being sent at him from every direction as he stood over his master's body. Breaking through the ring of distracted droids, Kanya hurled the green saber in her grasp as it circled through her targets like an omnidirectional buzzsaw. Landing in front of the human child the boy looked up at her with wide and hopeful eyes as the green saber she had collected landed snugly in her left hand. Take this Kanya handed the boy the green saber disengaging her yellow blade as she clung it to her right belt whilst she moved to grab the double-bladed saber connected to the back of her belt. Holding the hilt of her double-bladed weapon, Kanya hit the switch, the child watching with awe as a yellow blade with a deep orange glow sprung from the hilt with a deep buzz. Get ready kid, I have things to do, I won't come back for you if you fall behind. Kanya held her hilt to the right as she once more lowered herself and prepared to spring forward. Rather than formulating a reply, the boy ignited both lightsabers once more and promised himself to stick to Kanya's side like glue. Sprinting forward in the direction of her brother, Kanya's skill with the blade proved very effective with the use of the double-bladed weapon as she used the length of both blades to extend the range of her abilities. Hitting the wall of droids, Kanya's blade pieces the chest of a B1 whilst its opposite behind her separate the B2 in half. Clutching the hilt in both hands, Kanya began to spin her blade as she became the focus of local droid fire, the twin blades in her arms became a blur as she became a turbine of orange light. Spinning her blade, bolts of plasma reflected from her blade and struck three separate droids. Shifting her stance, Kanya changed the orientation of her spinning blade as she stopped the spinning turbine, choosing to go for more precise movements to block oncoming fire. Feeling the child she had saved be within arm's reach. Kanya noted the child to be doing his best at covering her back, the blade of her weapon moving upwards to the left, and in the same instance, its other end dipped slightly as she blocked two separate bolts. You see the line of Jedi over there in the middle of the arena Kanya asked, allowing the boy to see the ring made of most of the surviving Jedi. Ahoy, yes I see the boy chance to look as he blocked a shot from the droids. That's our target and it's where you'll be safe," Kanya told the boy, taking a moment of reprieve as the droids seemed occupied with the rest of the Jedi. Okay the boy nodded as Kanya sprinted at the droids in their way. Spinning and springing forward, Kanya doing her blade overhead before, as she was facing away from the droids, brought her weapon flat against her stomach and completed the final spin, separating an unshielded droidica in half. Committing a twirl in the opposite direction, she slashed through 2B1S before finishing the three-point mano uver before sending her weapon forward like an angry bicycle wheel that cut through the droids in her path until she shut it down remotely when it broke the line and clattered to the dirt near the center of the Jedi barricade. Seeing the path open, the boy joined her side just as she took him by surprise, slinging her arm around his waist before the world became a blur of lights to him. 
he gagged and coughed as the blur stopped dropping to the ground and heaving as Kenya placed him down and picked up her weapon and reclipped it back to the back of her belt. Finally taking notice of his location, he was once more awed at the woman whom saved him, the duo now resting firmly near the center of the Ring of Jedi. Kenya said woman looked over her shoulder to look at the approaching Obi-Wan Kenobi. Master Kenobi, good to see you've survived this long Kenya brushed the sand from her armor, grimacing slightly as she felt it in places she rather it not be. What are you doing here Kenobi asked as Mace Windu joined his fellow Jedi Master. I would very much like to know the same Windu asked as he squinted at Kenya, the young woman scoffing at the brown-skinned man's not-so-hidden suspicion. As you can see much the same as you were. Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Padme were in trouble, I was in a position to help them Kenya retorted as she made double sure she wasn't staring at the master of the order with Sith-like eyes, rather her own blue eyes that resembled the blue skies of Nabu. A lone Windu stared at her with beady brown eyes as Kenya scoffed. I would have been enough to get them away without anybody noticing. Unfortunately you were already present. Kenya sniffed at Windu as Kenobi shuffled on his feet. Your presence was not needed here, interloper Windu bit back as Kenya looked at him as if he were stupid. Evidently, now enough chatting, we have a battle to win, Master Jedi Kenya nodded and turned on her heel in a rushed effort to accompany her brother whom was standing beside Padme a few paces away, and much to her amusement, the child, more like teen was still following her nervously. She noticed the droids were now surrounding them but had ceased firing, some Jedi scattered around the arena either being knocked down and killed or captured and dragged towards their position. Master Windu Kenya knew the voice of the man as she looked up at Dooku as she came to a stop next to Anakin, gently placing her hand on his shoulder which caused him to jump. However when he saw it was her, she could feel the gratitude and joy rising from him, followed by a great deal of worry. You have fought gallantly the boy she saved joined at her side, looking with knitted brows at the Jedi bodies who lay between them and the droids worthy of recognition in the archives of the Jedi Order. Ugh, ever one for speeches Kenya gagged as she listened to the Count prattle on. Now, it is finished Duca continued as Ki Adi Mondi, PLO Kun and Aila Sakura were brought to them by droids and Genosians. Surrender and your lives, will be spared Duca attempted to reason and Kenya, seeing the amount of droids surrounding them, couldn't help but think it was a worthy offer, live to fight another day rather than die in a hopeless battle. We will not be hostages to be bartered, Duke of Mace retorted as Kenya bit her lip, a sour expression on her face. A freaking course Kenya gnashed her teeth together in fury. Then, I'm sorry old friend Duco looked genuinely saddened by the prospect of having to order their deaths. Seeing their refusal, the droids rearmed their weapons, taking firing stances whilst the Jedi made for one last stand. The boy at her side sobbing slightly as he gripped his saber with white knuckles. Hey Kenya looked down at the young teen as he looked up at her it's going to be alright. Calling the force to her aid, Kenya prepared to unleash the full brunt of her power in order to fulfill her promise to the boy and save Anakin and Padme. Her brother looking at her with white eyes as the hairs on his arms stood on end as it did on the boy who looked at her as if she was an angel sent from the heavens. Unfortunately, drawing in such power did not go unnoticed, not by Kenobi or Windu, and even more unfortunately by Duko himself as he looked at her, face flashing with recognition as the air around them became charged with energy. However, fortunately, the chance to unleash her attack was robbed as Padme called for them to look upwards causing Kenya to cancel the swell of energy rippling across her arms. And very much like the angel the boy at her side would describe her as, Master Yoda descended from the sky in a gunship alongside several others. Beams of green shot from the wings of the gunships as they dropped and flew close to the arena floor, cutting through scores of droids whilst Kenya ignited her yellow blade to redirect a bolt of plasma that had neared Padme. Chaos erupted as more and more gunships circled the arena. Around the survivors, a perimeter create Yoda instructed as the other gunships slammed into the ground, allowing their clone passengers to jump to the ground and begin firing up in the droids. Running towards the gunships, Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Padme leapt into one of the ships whilst the Jedi Council hoped onto Yoda's ship, 
the survivors leaping into the third and final. Kenya and the teen jumped up onto Anakin and Obi-Wan's ship as they rose into the air and headed to the south where clusters of core ships were located. Venator starships lowered through the atmosphere onto the dusty orange plains across from the core ships and fuel silos. Over a hundred thousand clones were being deployed from the large ships as missiles soured through the air from anti-air batteries and droids. Leaning out of the ship whilst holding a handrail, Kenya observed the positioning of the clone deployment, strategic calculations running through her head as she saw armies of droids being deployed. Searching for her next objective, Kenya has the glee she felt when she found her target near one of the battle fronts. Turning to Anakin, Obi-Wan and Padme, Kenya looked over them individually with an appraising eye. Will you be okay if I go down and offer my assistance? Anakin looked to Obi-Wan at her question, the two nodding to each other. We'll be fine Obi-Wan answered as Kenya nodded and turned to address the pilot. Making her way to the clone pilot, she came up beside the man and pointed to a specific area near one of the canyons. I need you to take me there, can you do that? The LAAT immediately changed direction. Of course General, the clone pilot answered as the ship rapidly descended with the other gunships. Thank you soldier, Kenya turned away from the pilot and made her way back to the hold, the hilt of her main lightsaber in hand as they came closer to the ground. Turning to her charge Kenya knew the boy would most likely continue to follow her even after they landed, are you ready? Dipping closer to the ground, the ship began to shake from oncoming fire the onboard passengers stumbling as Obi-Wan instructed them to take hold of anything them could. Seeing the damage the other ships were taking, Anakin had an idea. Aim right above the fuel cells Anakin called out as the gunners did as instructed. Their rockets firing and true to their mark as they hit one of the silos, forcing the silo to explode and collapse onto the droid forces behind it. Good call my young Padon Obi-Wan complimented as the lake began its final approach to Kanya's requested landing pad. The other gunships began to peel off in different directions to deposit their crew one staying on the same course as they flew to the furthermost Venator. Ready now, we must make this quick Kanya told the boy at her side as he crouched ready to drop down. Kanya Anakin called out in worry as his sister turned to face him with a small smile. Be safe Anakin. I'll see you soon Kenya gave a mock salute as the ship landed on the ground, Kenya leaping to the ground with the boy in tow. Yeah, see you soon Anakin couldn't help the profound sense of dread and worry that washed over him at the thought of his sister in the opening battle without him, the fear of losing another deer to him after the loss of his mother causing him to shake slightly as the late lifted off the ground. Anakin, she'll be alright, she's strong. Just like you Obi-Wan comforted Anakin in a rare display of affection Jedi shouldn't have. Stealing himself, Anakin slumped and took a deep breath, nodding to his master as she LAAT moved on to its next target. Landing in the dirt, Kenya observed the skirmish ahead. Feeling the passing of a Jedi as he was released into the force nearby. Soldier, what's going on here? Kenya hissed as a clone with yellow stripes approached. Count Dooku has fled using the canyon as cover, we attempted to stop him at the orders of your fellow Jedi but we were thwarted by a battalion of droids and their leader. The Jedi have left in pursuit of Count Dooku but have left one of their own. However his companion had been struck down and has been unresponsive since the commander informed Kenya as she stared at the battle from the checkpoint as she saw droids fighting with clones up ahead. I need to know our exact numbers and armament, current status, and locations. Now Kenya lent her palms against the console as she stared at an open map. We have 8,000 untold deployed, 7,900 are regular clone units, 50 are special forces, 25 are gunships and the last 25 are ATTE. All of which have been deployed into open combat against our enemy forces Kenya blinked at the explanation, her face contorting into a hiss. Pull back. Immediately. Use the ATTE cannons and target the walls, bring them down, impede the droids' progress and bottleneck them, get every soldier back here now Kenya ordered as the clone stared at her. Yes general, the clone seemed all too happy to pull his men back away from the wall of droids. What the freak were they thinking, just sending our men straight against our enemy, with these numbers? Commander. How many droids are we opposing Kenya asked as the commander finished issuing his orders to the men below him. 
General, we are fighting against 15,000 units, with the escape of Dooku, more have joined the original assault forces and are pushing us back as we speak." The clone spoke as he came to stand at her side whilst the teen stood on her opposite. Okay so, we're outnumbered, outgunned, and stuck in a canyon. Freak Kenya squinted as she stared at the map display, eyebrow twitching as the voice of an annoying little green alien was heard. What are you doing like a phantom, the assigned Jedi general appeared, a sad look in his eyes at the death of his Padawan. Leading, and since you obviously aren't in the mindset to make hasty and life-changing decisions, compromised you could say, I am asking you to work under my charge, not as their leader but as a fellow soldier of theirs the human looked conflicted, obviously wanting to argue the point with her, but after a thorough self-observation, he shut his mouth and nodded slightly. What do I need to do Shen asked, looking to Kenya for an answer as she returned to looking at the map. Commander, this is where the ATTE should halt their progress of retreat, and here, is where we will collapse the wall Kenya pointed to the sides of the canyon, the commander seeing what she was pointing awaited for further orders. Then, I want the ATTEs to be separate and placed in an eclipse formation and rain fire down upon anything that comes through. Behind them and in front of them, I want cover made, I don't care how, demolition experts blowing up rocks, crashed LAAT pieces of destroyed ATTEs, I want a barricade for our men to have cover made Kenya ordered, the commander smiling to himself as he rushed to do as ordered. You and me Jedi, are going down there ourselves, we're moving this command point and taking charge directly Kenya ordered as the commander paused and stared. I think I love you general the commander snarked as he grabbed his blaster rifle and ordered the clones around them to prepare to deploy. Let's go Kenya ignited her lightsaber and made for the line she had ordered the clones to hold. Suppressing fire CC3367 yelled out as he turned his rotary cannon on the horde of droids. The clone commando standing tall as his arms shook, his brothers running past him as they fell back. Laughing manically, the commando ignored the bolts that sailed past him as he grinned whilst cutting down all droids in sight. CC3367 you're clear to pull back the commando ignored his fellow commando, his commanding officer CC4153 pull back. He cut down droid after droid even as his shoulder pauldron was struck by a lucky droid. Go Danjit you idiot CC3367 was tackled from his perch by his commanding officer into the ground below as the rock he was standing on exploded from a rocket. Sorry. Forks. I don't know what came over me the clone CC3367 apologized before he was brought to his feet by the clone named Forks, stumbling back to the new line of defense as the ATTEs opened fire, two of the cannons targeting the cliff faces on either side of the cannon. Oh geez, this is going to be close Forks muttered as the cliff face shook, rumbling as a second volley from the two ATTEs struck the same spot. The two looked up towards the cliff face as rocks slammed down beside them, stopping as the rock face exposed further. I'm sorry Forks CC3367 muttered as they stopped and accepted their fate. Psycho, it's not your fault Forks answered as they held each other's shoulders. Closing their eyes, they waited to be crushed by the rockfall, for the void to take them and the cold to take over their bodies. What are you two doing? The two were dragged from their thoughts as they looked towards the strictly feminine voice. Beautiful Forks froze as he saw the beauty, rich rosewood colored lips, black hair braided and tied behind her head whilst her sky blue eyes stared at them and a skin pale enough to be considered exotic but simply added to her overall beauty, in her hand was a double bladed lightsaber of orange and yellow light. Come on, are you gonna get out of the way of do you want to be shelled to oblivion? The beauty spoke knocking Forks out of his confusion as he and Psycho looked at their predicament. On both sides of them, towering walls of stone stood three times taller than they were tall, massive boulders piled on top of each other, and the only way through, which they were currently standing in, was only wide enough for them to stand from shoulder to shoulder. Did you, save us? Forks asked as the woman looked at him. Can't have you dying now can I, now come on we gotta get back behind the defensive line she turned and hurried away, motioning with her hand for them to follow to which they easily agreed. It's holding general the commander announced, 
standing underneath one of the ATTE as it occasionally fired its cannon at the thin crevasse which droids were trying to bypass. Of the original 25 ATTE, only 14 remained, standing in two rows far enough apart for the second row to take aim and fire through comfortably. Eight maintained a constant aim at the crevasse whilst the other six slung repeated artillery fire over the collapsed rocks onto the army of droids on the other side. And the original roughly 8,000 clones had been reduced to four, and only 40 of the 50 commandos lived. A thousand clones knelt behind a hastily made second barricade of rocks and metal between the ATTE and the dropped cliffside, picking off any droid smart enough to try and climb over the impasse. Only three gunships had been lost and were positioned at the back of the army for conserving fuel. And of course the star-eyed Padawan and Shen were amongst the survivors at her side. Yes it's holding, their crap at navigation and moving over terrain, but they'll be able to do it before too long. Not to mention we're freak ed if anything with a bomb flies over Kenya stared at the artificial rock slide, glaring at it hatefully. Scanning over the environment surrounding them, Kenya observed the ATTE as they unloaded up in their targets. She saw how some of the droids tried climbing over the wall rather than be stoned through the gap, only to be picked off by clones. She noted how the ground shook from artillery fire. But she caught the most important fact of all as she spied the walls of the canyon, deep shadows etched into the towering rock faces. Commander, do you know what Genosians do to natural formations when they find a suitable location? Kenya asked as she grinned slightly. No, what do they do General? The commander asked as she pointed to a particularly large shadow. They dig, and they tunnel, often right under the surface and through mountains. And that right there, is one of hundreds of thousands of entrances to a underground tunnel system, one, of which I'd bet, runs right under both ours and our enemy's feet Kenya smirked as. The commander caught on to what she was getting at. What ideas are you cooking up? Shen asked as the commander unit called for all commando units to report in. Well, for starters, we're way too open, they know where we are and we have enemy forces on all sides. So instead, we're going into the tunnels, but first we need to make sure the enemy isn't already hiding in there Kenya answered as the remaining commandos quickly arrived to stand around their position. General the men are ready to listen the commander announced as he gave the floor to Kenya. Stepping forward as she drew the attention of the commando units, Kenya brought up a hollow disc as it displayed the canyon they were in. Time is short, and our enemies are working to clear the blockage as we speak, so let's get this over. First of all, those of you that excel best in recon will be heading into the tunnels followed by a support unit should you be met with any surprises. You are to map out the tunnel system, mark all entrances and come up with vital choke points. I want a passage to the surface uncovered and I want a way under our enemies Kenya began as she pinpointed several lapses in the hologram. Your entrance points are here, here and here. You are to work quickly, but be careful there is a chance that our enemy has thought of the same thing and is too going through these systems to get to us. Any questions Kenya asked as one of the commandos stood forward. If I may, why must we find a way under our enemies the commando asked as his brothers nodded. Whilst you find a way under, our demolition experts will prepare explosive charges to be placed throughout the system. We're going to blow them up from under their feet Kenya answered the commando's question whilst another one of his brothers spoke up. Wouldn't that endanger the others here the commando spoke up. Yes, that is why I want a way to the surface above the canyon found first, we're going to get our men to the surface whilst the bombs are planted and detonated, then, I want our men to light up anything that gets up amongst the rubble Kenya explained as the hollow displayed the upper level of the canyon. Meanwhile, while you work in mapping the tunnels, we will be stripping parts from wrecked and useless vessels and fashioning them into shield for the men to carry, if blaster bolts hit your armor, you're freak ed if you couldn't already tell, but if you've got a shield, you stand a far greater chance and have a mobile defense far greater than whatever crap your armor is made out of Kenya explained, motioning for one of the downed LAAT which was already being stripped by a horde. Of clones currently cutting pieces from the hull of the ship, any more questions Kenya asked as the commando units each looked to each other, shrugging amongst themselves, 
but in the end none came forward. All right, get into your squads, and move out. Kenya ordered as the commando units dispersed to begin their work immediately. Turning back to the map display, Kenya saw the blips which displayed the current clone locations as she fingered at her chin with her thumb and pointer finger. Hmm, all right, I want our heaviest munitions that can't be carried loaded onto the LAAT ready for transport to the top of the canyons immediately. Then, I want everyone from the ATTE not manning a cannon jerry-rigging their systems to continuously fire on their own Kenya ordered as the commander looked at her confused. If I may ask, why would you need them to rig the ATTE systems? The commander asked as he stared at her through the T-visor of his helmet. Well, I don't plan on leaving them behind when we move into the tunnels, we'll have one or two ATTE ready to be transports via LAAT. But I'm not valuing the machines over the lives of our men, these ATTE were already lost as soon as the idiot ordered them to be dropped off in the canyon. Kenya sent a half-hearted glare at Shen who looked sheepish at her words. I see, good call, the commander replied as Kenya watched the commando units walked into the tunnel entrances littering the canyon walls. What will we be doing? Shen asked as he came to stand at Kanya's side, the thousands of clones below already issued their orders by their commanding units as they packed everything up ready to deploy with haste. Me and you, well we'll be staying back until all the clones are in the tunnels, then we're collapsing the entryway behind us. You'll join the commander at the surface whilst I head down to the demolition experts and commandos as they place the explosive charges, then, after we kill the horde of droids. We move on to our main objective Kenya answered as Shen stared at her with a conflicted gaze. What's our main objective? Shen asked. Well, from what our intelligence reports say, the heads of the Confederacy are held up on the other side of this canyon, they're planning to escape, but if we're quick enough, we should be able to cut the head from the Confederacy before the war even begins. Kenya answered as the commander listened in. The catacombs were dark and musky, stalactites hung from the ceiling as small droplets of water fell from these hanging formations. Winding and twisting, echoes resonated through these tunnels as the clone commando squads split up and scoured through these catacombs, flashlights alight as they made sure to be careful for all surprises they may run into. You okay Forks Laps asked of his squad commander, Psycho at their back whilst he stood directly beside their fourth member known as Rupture. Just thinking Laps, just thinking Forks replied as they came up to a junction that went left and right. Looking down the right tunnel he saw flashlights from other commando squads, so he decided to take the left unlit tunnel that dipped slightly. Wouldn't happen to be about our pretty little general would it? Psycho whispered back as the other two of their squad looked at Forks whom slumped slightly at the admission from his squad mate. Oh my, did someone catch your fancy cap and laps teased as the clone commando that lead their unit side, climbing over a rock in his way before dropping down with a huff. It's not like that Forks tried to reason to his squad mates. Oh uh how, I saw the way you stared at her when she saved us. All love struck and like Psycho teased as Forks coughed slightly, tripping before catching himself and sending a glare at Psycho. Let's just, let's just focus on the mission for now alright Forks diverted, and Psycho, being reasonable for once, allowed him to do just that as he flashed his own light back the way they came, dropping a glowing signal beacon to mark the way they've already come. We're definitely continuing this when we get back Laps teased as they came into another junction, another going to the left and right, the right however ascended a steep incline whilst the left only continued to the left for about 10 meters before making a sharp right that opened up into a large cave. What's our exact location? Forks asked Laps as Laps brought out a display of their environment. According to this, we're directly underneath the droids Laps announced, Forks taking out a flare and aiming it straight at the darkness in front of them. Shooting the flare, Forks and the squad watched the flare fly unimpeded for several hundred meters before impacting a stone pillar. Radio in the general, we found what we're looking for. Forks smirked as Laps brought up comms. General, it's just as you thought, there is a large pocket running underneath the canyon, it appears to be some sort of water reserve for the Genosians and has an irrigation system that flows towards important points such as the arena and southwards towards the battlefield. The commander informed Kenya as the woman stared at the new map readings provided by Forks squad. Prepare the demolition squads, 
we're heading down there, we've located several paths to the surface above the canyons, order everyone to move out, get them to the surface, Shen, when everyone is in the caves, destroy the entrances and link up at the surface Kenya turned away from Commander and Jedi Master Shen, walking towards the demolition units with purpose, she stopped however as she felt the teen following after her and immediately turned to face him I need you to go with. Master Shen for now, this is going to be a great deal more dangerous than before, chances are high something might go wrong, I need you with Shen to protect the clones should something happen alright. The teen looked like he wished to argue, fists curling as worry was present on his face. Calming himself down, the teen sighed and nodded. Alright the teen answered, clearly downcast as Kenya put a hand on his shoulder. It'll be okay, it won't be too long now before this battle is over, then you will be safe back on Coruscant. Kenya reassured the boy before sending him back towards the waiting Master Shen. Watching the boy make his way back, Kenya turned away and made her way to the demolition units, each of the clones were standing around, resting or simply working on the charges they were going to use. General the demolition squad leader saluted and stood tall as the other clones jumped up and did the same. At ease, Commander, how goes progress Kenya asked as the rest of the units went back to work. General, we have completed the vast majority of our preparations and are ready to place and activate the charges the Commander explained as he motioned to a few backpacks full of explosive charges. I see, I want you to pack up your men and prepare to move out we've found our point of placement, myself alongside the squads will be going to place them, the rest of the units will be evacuating to the surface. Now, pick up your things and be ready to depart, I'll meet you at the entrance Kenya asked as she left the demolition unit commander to his job while walking towards the tunnel entrance they would be using. Underground cavern, half an hour later. Looking through the cave system, Kenya looked over the edge towards the large body of water that dove deep into the surface of the planet. Rising pillars of stone rose from the depths and connected to the ceiling of the cavern, where motes of dust and stone fell as the droids clambered around on the surface above. Platforms with rocky surfaces, obviously used by Genosians to observe the reserve the water rose from the water and stood about 10 meters above the surface. Are you guys ready? Kenya asked as the commando units and demolition squads all nodded, packs of explosives on their shoulders, whilst they held their DC-15A blasters, preparing to make use of the integrated ascension cables. Holding a blaster of her own, Kenya aimed towards one of the nearest pillars, pulling the trigger as everyone watched the line of cable shoot from the blaster and collide with the pillar, sticking to its surface as it collided. Giving it a good tug. Kenya was satisfied as she turned to the rest of the units, motioning to be handed one of the packs which was soon tossed into her waiting arms. All right, let's get this over with. Taking a running leap, the clones watched Kenya swing her way around, the cable on the blaster receding at a blistering rate, and before long, impacted the pillar on all fours. You know forks, gotta say you're gonna have a bit of competition for her a lapse whispered before aiming his own blaster and letting the cable fly, their brothers doing the same, making their way to the pillars as the prepped the charges. Clinging to the pillar, Kenya reached into the pack on her back, pulling one of the charges from the pack and stuck it to the cold pillar, making sure it was firmly in place before activating the explosive charge and priming it. Leaning back, cable in hand, Kenya began to scale around to the other side of the pillar, fingers gripping the solid stone underhand with a vice grip, she nearly dropped as one of the rocks came loose, she quickly caught her grip on another stone however just as the previous gave way and fell into the waters below, a soft sigh escaping the woman as she made her way to the opposite side of the pillar from the primed explosive, placing another and priming it before looking to the next pillar to latch onto. Reaffirming her grip, Kenya let one hand go of the pillar, using the DC-15A blaster to take aim towards another pillar without a clone currently clinging to its sides, aiming up at the ceiling. There, we go firing the blaster, she watched with satisfaction as it clung to the roof exactly halfway to the pillar from where she was. Swinging across the expanse yet again, Kenya came low, a few meters from the waters before the cable caught and swung her back upwards towards her target. Dislodging the end of the cable as she reached the apex of her swing, 
Kenya flew a few meters before impacting the pillar, the cable retracting into the end of the blaster with a snap. The last one for me to do she spoke, now being alone on the farthest point in the water reservoir from the entryway to the cavern. Attaching another primed charge, Kenya wasn't expecting one of the clone commandos to land on the same pillar, and from what she could feel and see, he was one of the ones she had saved. Squinting slightly, she watched the commando through the dark as he seemed to be psyching himself up. General the commando spoke, as he scaled the pillar with her. Soldier, what can I do for you? Kenya spoke as she made her way to the opposite side of the pillar again to place the final charge. I uh -huh. General, I and my squad would like to thank you in your efforts in helping us, we, are aware you weren't part of the original group, but you stuck your neck out for us, and we're grateful for your assistance Forks spoke as Kenya looked at him with a raised eyebrow and uh -huh. Freak it. And Kenya highly amused by the clones bumbling, primed the final charge with a small smile playing in the side of her lips. The boys will most likely be celebrating after this, I. We were wondering if you'd be joining us Forks asked, obviously shy and dancing around the subject he wanted to broach with her. It would be fun wouldn't it? But unfortunately, I won't be on that ship out, or any of the Republic ships for that matter Kenya explained as she unclipped the braces of her backpack, bringing it to her chest to be snug against the pillar and herself so it wouldn't fall. General the commando asked immensely worried about her line of speaking as she fished around in the pack to produce a day top hat. This here, is a day top hat containing plans for what you and the rest of your brothers will do once you return to the surface. It also contains as many backup plans as I could come up with should anything from an ambush occur or you be stuck underground she then passed the day top hat and shoved it into the commando's pack. What are? Forks mumbled as Kenya dropped the now useless pack into the water below the woman's eyes staring away from the rest of the reserve towards another entryway, dim in its light and heading further underground. This is where our paths split for now. Forks. I have a special mission to undertake of the utmost importance she turned and propped herself up against the pillar, preparing to jump the gap towards the tunnel follow the plans, keep your brothers safe and be careful from straying from what I've written. Do all that, and we may cross paths once again. Stealing himself, Forks sighed and nodded. As you command General, it has been a pleasure, I will uphold your orders and follow them through to the letter Forks answered as Kenya gave him a bright smile, the enraptured clone's face heating under his mask as Kenya gave him a two-finger salute before propelling herself away from the pillar, across the water to land softly on the dark tunnel away from prying eyes. Until next time Forks Kenya spoke before all but disappearing into the darkness of the tunnel without any light to help her. Be safe Forks sighed, slowly making his way back around the pillar before making his way across the waters the same way they had used to cross back to the pillars, but this time using them to get back to the original entryway. Landing on the rocks of the overlooking platform, Forks sat himself down with a sigh as his squad joined him alongside the demolitions unit which had just finished planting their charges. Where's the general, did it go how you wanted Psycho asked, his helmet removed as he wriggled his eyebrows. Not at all, she's uh, undertaking another mission and went on her own way through another passage Forks informed the units surrounding him much to their shock. Oh. I see sorry man Psycho sat down, dejected and sighing. It's not the end of the world after all she gave me this Forks pulled out the day top had this, is what we're going to follow from here on out, we're gonna hand it to the Jedi and the Commander, I've just finished going over it all, and I gotta say, she is thorough, we're gonna win this boys. Standing back up, he made his way through the gaggle of units towards their exit let's go win a battle. Coming out of one of the tunnels far away from the canyon and the rest of the battlefield, Kenya hissed no longer sensing Severance Tan on world, no doubt having used the distraction to flee to Dooku. You can't escape me forever Tan Kenya hissed her face contorting in utter rage as the Fury Interceptor appeared over a nearby mountain, its ramp lowering as it flew at her. Leaping upwards as high as she could, Kenya reached out and caught grip on the ship's lowered ramp, gauntlet locking its grip to make sure she didn't lose grip. The woman swung herself up just as explosions rocked in the distance, 
a small smile forming on her lips before she disappeared into the bowels of the ship as it ascended back into the atmosphere. It worked Shen chuckled as he watched the ground of the canyon explode upwards, sending droids hurling into the sky before crumbling down into the waters of the reserve below. Stood around the Jedi were the commando units and the clone commander himself, their ATTE facing the facility they were about to storm now that the defense of droids had been destroyed. Fumbling the day top hat in hand gifted to him from Forks, Shen saw no reason to not follow its guidelines, motioning with his fingers for the thousands of clones to move, of which they immediately did so. Do you think she'll be okay? The teen at his side asked, drawing his attention, it was a no-brainer whom they were talking about. I have no doubt about it, she'll be fine Shen replied as he placed a comforting hand on the boy's back. I hope so the teen mumbled as they moved away from the tunnels in a solid march, their LAAT flying over them to scout ahead with snipers. Ultimately their force would be one of the most successful units of the opening battle of Geonosis, sustaining the least casualties compared to the other deployed units under the Jedi command thanks to Kanya's in-depth orders and guidelines provided through the day top hat. B.O.S.S office, Coruscant, with Knox. Are you in? Skyva Knox's voice stayed within his helmet, muted as he walked towards the office he would be partaking in an appointment with. Yes my lord, I am currently siphoning through all registered data, one moment. Skyva replied as Knox entered the designated room, the room itself had a single exotic green plant in its corner with a desk of blue glass in its center, three chairs, two on the opposite side whilst the chair for himself was the only one on this side. Walking to his seat, Knox sat down and placed his hands together on the desk, staring forward as he waited for the personal that would be seeing him. My lord, I have located the data pertaining to the hyperplane routes to Zakul, Iokath and Nathama, they've been buried deep and appear to be all but forgotten, what do you wish me to do Skyva asked as Knox sighed in relief. Delete them, rewrite data to make it appear that there is a strong gravitational pull that impedes any further progress in that direction like a star or ten. Then you are to subtly transmit this data to all ships connected to the system, I want there to be no feasible way for a ship to be able to stumble up in our worlds Knox ordered, smirking to himself as he knew Skyva would do exactly as asked immediately. Waiting a few moments, Knox twiddled his thumbs both waiting for Skyva and the boss personnel, fortunately he wouldn't have to wait long for the first. Done my lord, is that all? Skyva asked. No, create a back door and write a script, my X-70B, and any fleet vessel alongside Kanya's own interceptor are to automatically be erased from any system should they be detected and recorded including all current recordings. Make sure this script will never be located Knox answered to Skyva's query, soon going silent as he felt two life signs coming towards his location shut down the cameras in this room, make it quiet. With the door opening with a small hiss, Knox's eyes flicked towards the cameras as he watched the lenses become unfocused and felt the power running through them stop altogether. I apologize for taking so long sir, it took longer than I would have liked to collect the documents necessary a blonde woman with a tied back ponytail and blue eyes smiled kindly at Knox whilst her companion. A brown haired middle aged man remained silent. Greetings Knox's synthesized voice spoke before he blasted them with the force obliterating their mental defenses as he made them puppets for his control take a seat. Heavily pregnant, Lana's hair lay matted, uneven and unkempt as she sweat heavily sticking to her forehead as she clung to her lover's arm as they slowly walked through the spire of Zakul towards the throne room. Following behind them, four exarchs chosen to guard their empress, followed silently behind, their eyes constantly scanning their environment for threats even though they were on home soil. The massive doors to the throne room slid open with a hiss, revealing the room on the other side of which scores of guardian knights and exarchs stood tall. She looked up to her lover with a twinkling gaze, lips pursing slightly, feeling the energies he was feeding her to soothe the pain that constantly racked her body due to the pregnancy. They slowly made their way along the walkway, knights standing slightly taller as they passed before relaxing ever slowly slightly as the exarchs passed by in following. Coming up to the steps of the throne, the ring of exarchs in front of the throne parted to allow them passage, Knox taking extra care to help the gorgeous blonde up the steps until they stood before the throne. 
gently grabbing the woman's wrist, Knox lowered his lover onto the cushioned seat that was the throne, allowing the woman to rest as she sat whilst he stood. Whilst sitting, one of Lana's hands gently caressed her bulging stomach whilst her other was relaxed onto the armrest of the throne. Below, the exarchs returned to surrounding the steps to the throne, those chosen for guard of the empress merging with their brothers to stand guard of their rulers. With his arms crossed behind his back, Knox stood tall, his imposing presence radiating from him as his power settled on the shoulders of everyone within the room. His eyes scanned his subjects, probing everyone around both the spire and on Zakul through the force. He could feel their content, the ships arriving from the larger galaxy to visit the new center of the galaxy's power. Nobody on the world longer for anything, their lives complete and full. Taxes non-existent, free wealth care, an overabundance of food and harvests. Artificial foods and resources created on Iocath which were metered out to the rest of the galaxy to raise the overall standard of living. Peace. Knox's eyes dropped as he smiled slightly, the Republic was silent, copious amounts of worlds rallying their support to the new galaxy's ruler, effectively limiting what the Republic could do in the open, he wasn't naive to think they were on his side, so he was constantly monitoring them, making plans after plans that would come into effect even if he was removed or killed. The Sith Empire was a similar story, Asina was hesitant to move against him, the defilement of her body having a clear affect on her mental state as the new lords of the Dark Council tried to contain the dissidents within their own borders. It feels, nice Lana spoke as she drew his attention, the loving look in her eyes clear as day as he felt the life form within her stomach shift, its power unquestionable even before birth as it radiated from her stomach in waves. Yes, it does but in the back of his head, he couldn't help but feel something was wrong a pit forming within his stomach over the last few weeks. He was taking measures to ensure whatever he was feeling, whatever warning he was perceiving, wasn't something that would blindside him. Hearing the throne room door open once more, Knox observed Letha, the woman garbed in ornate white robes gifted to her by Knox along with a white cloth that covered her eyes with jewels sewn into its surface. She looked much like her previous self her hair having grown back and braided to hang over her shoulders. Your Majesty Letha greeted, coming to kneel in front of the ring of exarchs, affording Knox a small smile as he slowly descended the throne, exarchs once more parting to allow him to stand in front of the kneeling peacekeeper. I have a proposition for you my friend Knox looked down at the Jedi as she looked up at him despite being blind. What do you wish of me my lord Letha asked as she remained kneeling in his presence. As you know, the galaxy is in a time of peace, the Republic and the Sith Empire are staying within their borders, the galaxy is thriving, everything is right. But... Letha listened intently to his words the Jedi have pulled back and closed their order off from the larger galaxy, the Sith still plot and plan. We are a new government, standing on shaking supports within the galaxy, if both the Republic and the Sith united and rallied their worlds, it would be a bloodbath systems would be destroyed, innocent worlds would burn, destruction would be paramount. That is something none of us want. What must I do to avoid this outcome my lord Lethe asked, desperation clear through the force as fear of his words registered within her mind. I rule this empire, but there are a great many happenings that I couldn't possibly oversee all hours of the day. It is inefficient, and costly. Scorpio has agreed with my decision, I am appointing a council, similar to the Dark Council of the Sith Empire, but more stable, less power plays and backstabbing. I would appoint you to be CO head of the council alongside Scorpio. You would be tasked with maintaining the council, overseeing bills to be passed, you would take an active part in keeping our empire and the galaxy at its best Knox explained to the woman who looked shocked at the proposition taking several seconds of silence to think over his words but there is something you must do beforehand. What do you request of me Lethe asked, already having accepted the proposal, now she just had to hear his request. As I have said, the Jedi have pulled out support from the galaxy and become recluse. The war we faced in the past was created by the Jedi the Sith, they brought worlds between them, into the crossfire. The have cast off their mantle of peace above all, of understanding and compassion, and became warhounds, 
dogs to the Senate's whims. I would ask you renounce your allegiance to this corrupt order. Officially join in our empire, become the symbol of peace the galaxy needs in this time of uncertainty. Raise a generation of Force users dedicated to the well-being of those within the galaxy, like the Jedi promised but have failed to do time and time again. You were never meant for this war, you bear scars you shouldn't bear. But you did so for those who couldn't stand up for themselves. Now I ask you to take your place, your rightful place, as the guardian, the peacekeeper, the life giver, to those that continue to be oppressed by the majority. Help me. Keep this galaxy safe Knox finished, slowly lowering his right hand, open and waiting as he felt the inner turmoil of the woman before him, and he waited, hand ready to take her own if she were to agree. She was silent as she descended into her inner turmoil, mind alight with worry and contradictions. The Jedi, peacekeepers of the galaxy, tasked since times of old to uphold their morals and help all that were in need. Yet they were responsible for the creation of their greatest enemies, when times were tough, more often than not, the Jedi forsook their vows and waged war, committing atrocities for what they called the greater good. And now, when things weren't going their way, they pulled their support, closed their doors and left the galaxy to its fate now they had an opponent they couldn't compete against. I. Letha grit her teeth and curled her knuckles as a track of tears ran down. Slowly and with a pregnant pause, she slowly raised her head to peer at him with her unseeing eyes, teeth grit, and with a solemn gulp, raised her hand to clasp his own. The present. Knox stared down at the colossal ships of the first fleet dipped into the atmosphere of Hoth heading towards the ship graveyard, fleet vessels flew in formation as they carried titanic construction equipment and several repulsor and gravity engines the eclipsing subjugation remained in the lower atmosphere whilst Valen stood at Nox's side as they watched from the onboard throne room. Snowstorms swept across the icy plains of Hoth, blistering winds scored the lands, threatening to throw the fleet vessels of course whilst they dropped closer to the surface of Hoth. Already on the surface, thousands of workers, miners and engineers were overseen by scores of Zaquilan knights. Where once was the starship graveyard was now a glacial plain of ice, buried under thousands of years of snowstorms, shifting shelves and crushing pressures. The only proof to the current populace that the starship graveyard existed, was for one to perform a scan on the area, which would return a startling amount of unknown signatures. And so, the thousands of workers, clad in thick jackets and masks to protect themselves from the weather, drilled tunnels into the surface of the shelf entire shafts having been constructed as teams slowly chipped away at the ice. Let's head to the surface Knox announced as he swiftly turned from the viewport and began to make his way to the entryway to the room with Valen in tow. As the fleet warships lowered over the ice shelves, shuttles departed from the large warships whilst the cargo they carried were transported view cables by four shuttles connected to these large crates. From the subjugation, the absolutely titanic flagship hanging low in the skies of the white expanse of Hoth. Knox's personal shuttle dove from his personal hangar towards the location that the starship graveyard once was. As Knox's shuttle settled down onto the cold surface of ice, the side doors opening up as the two occupants jumped down to the ground. Now, with the both of them wearing thick black cloaks, Knox and Valen watched as the large containers, double if not three times the size of the same four shuttles used to transport the containers, were lowered to the surface of the icy plateau under the watchful gazes of the Exarchs. As the crates touched down, crews of construction workers hurriedly ran with their hands covering their faces under the blasting winds, running to the crates as they uncoupled the cables, allowing the shuttles to disperse and fly back to the warships up above to deliver another payload. Large bulky walkers stomped across the slick grounds, their arms reaching forward to pry the crates apart. Four more walkers making use of magnetics, unloaded the cargo of the crates, revealing the cargo to be massive pistons with sharp points at one end with a piston at the opposite end. With the pistons already ready to be used, the walkers moved to the first of roughly 50 holes drilled deep into the ice below. Using their magnetism, the walkers used the first of the eight pistons they each had, lowering the tip into the cracked opening before slowly lowering the towering stakes into the deep chasms. 
watching as the various walkers lowered the pistons one by one along the entirety of the ice shelf, Knox squinted as the final crate was unloaded and the walkers went to work. We should probably move back Knox reasoned as he ushered Valen back into the shuttle, the crews hopping onto different shuttles as they all began to head towards the nearby mountain that remained, sticking high above the icy plateau that grew around it. Sirens blared in the distance as the shuttles lowered onto the safe ground of the mountain. As the last of the pistons were lowered into the ground, the walkers were picked up one by one by transport shuttles, ushered back up to the warships above. At the same time, as sirens blared and red lights shone across the ice plain, gravity engines were deployed from the warships, hovering above the ground as the slowly powered up. Awaiting your command my lord an exarch announced from behind Knox's and Valen's position. Begin the extraction Knox hissed, and almost immediately, everyone around them was forced to brace as the very earth they told shuddered. Knox watched with a plain look as the pistons, all forty, slammed down in perfect synchronization with each other, and as the pistons slammed down, the ice around them all but shattered and broke apart, sending massive boulders of ice flying into the air before they once more repeated the same process. Everyone watched, making sure to cover themselves as the ice plateau broke apart, each thump of the many pistons breaking the ice further. What are we doing this for dear Valen asked in genuine and open curiosity as the rattling and shaking grew stronger and stronger as the pistons began to lower deeper into the holes that had been drilled. Asset recovery, during the war, it was clear to the Republic that they weren't in a favorable position to win the war, so their best minds came together to create something that would tip the scales in their favor, badly. The ship they came up with was so big, and so powerful it had to be given an all-new designation of class, a super dreadnought. The Republic was so sure of this thing's superiority that they equipped it with prototype tech that nobody knew existed they made to to keep it on the hush-hush. But rumors always circulate, always Knox began to explain as the shaking intensified further as the pistons were now halfway through the ice shelving. If it was so powerful, what happened to it? Valen asked, eyebrow raised under her hood as Knox chuckled. Well, they weren't wrong in saying it would have a made them have almost guaranteed victory. And when the Empire finally found out about it, they knew it too. And so, when the ship was operational, the Republic, in their infinite intelligence, decided that if they took Dramund Koss, the Empire would fall, which of course, they were only half right. The Empire found out about this plan, and called everything they had they threw everything they had at it to stop it in its tracks. Apparently, even with their amassed power, they couldn't do jack crap to the ship and it carried on without care after obliterating them. Knox spoke wistfully whilst looking to the sky but it was for naught. Something unexpected happened, they forced it to collide with the nearest planet, Hoth, and as the ship fell to the surface of Hoth. I suspect it may have been sabotage from within, or a crew making their way on board to scuttle it. But even still, it was so tough, it remained entirely intact even as it collided with the surface, nothing broke the ship, but it refused to be powered on again, and became refuge for pirates. Many would try to reclaim even parts of it, all unsuccessful mainly due to the enemy finding out and stopping all progress at any cost, and so, it remained buried in snow, to be lost and forgotten to time. The ship's name was the Star of Coruscant. The Pistons, Appen striking something other than ice under the ice sheet, shut down all at once as the ice of the entire plateau was all but chunks, unstable in its entirety as its surface shifted endlessly. That's... Valen began as Knox nodded, a wave of his hand the working signal making the gravity engines in the atmosphere activate at full power and masse. The massive boulders of ice shifted and churned, dragged into the skies by the massive reverse in the gravitational pull above them. Knox ignored them however and stared down through the levitating ice chunks towards what was forcefully being dragged up from below. Gleaming silver, shining under the white sun, reflected into the eyes of observers as the ice broke apart against the absolutely monstrous hull, ice chunks falling from the ship to crash to the now unoccupied space below. With the gravity engines working at full power, 20 fleet warships made use of tractor beam technology to connect and hold the vessel many times larger than themselves, 
coming up to formation around the hull of the vessel whilst the gravity engines slowly lowered their power. As the gravity engines shut off, the full weight of the Star of Coruscant rested on the twenty ships surrounding it, causing the ships to shake and shudder under the weight. Seeing the struggle of the fleet warships, more began to divert from the formation of the first fleet surrounding the subjugation, more and more joining to assist in the transportation of the titanic hull. Inform Scorpio that I want her to begin opening a gate for immediate transport, I want this ship restored to its full capabilities under our watchful eyes on Io Kath Knox instructed the Exarch behind whilst the crew celebrated at the successful extraction as the hull of the ship rose into the atmosphere. Let's get going Knox turned to away from the still falling rains of ice as he made his way back to the shuttle that was waiting for immediate departure. And as the shuttle rose into the atmosphere to rejoin with the first fleet that was ascending the skies, Knox began to make plans for the vessel, as the gate opened up before the first fleet with the subjugation moving through with the rest of the fleet moving through along with their cargo being escorted through. I saw him smile today, the truest smile I've ever seen on his beautiful face. As he was carried by the man who saved us from Gargila, the girl that accompanied him at his side looked at them both with something I can't quite place my finger on. He answered any and all questions Anakin fired at him, even going as far as to play little games with my sweet boy as we made our way to the market. He procured them a couple of fruits each and allowed them to run off together to play, I was worried, as the girl gently took Anakin's fingers in her own and ran off into the bustling streets, each adorned with their own smiles. I learned his name then, and the purpose of which he had bought us from Gargila when the Troidarian had tried to gamble for us. He knew, right off the bat what Anakin was and why he was special. He had come with the sole purpose of protecting us from the eyes of the bad people that would try and separate us should they find us. My eyes were opened to dangers I didn't know existed, he told me that some members of the supposed protectors of the Republic, the Jedi would simply take Anakin from me when I wasn't aware and that their opposing counterpart was more likely to silence me and take Anakin than keep us together. He said he would pose as Anakin's father, and the girl at his side would be his sister. Not even Anakin would know the truth, claiming a hyperdrive malfunction had stranded them until they could fix it, and they had come right to us when they done just that, nobody would suspect the truth of his birth this way. That we would be safe in accommodation that he would provide and watch over us. We will be a real family, the family Anakin craves and deserves. He asked me for permission to do so, knowing the dangers if I was to oppose, I agreed. That was when they returned, soaking wet, glistening in the sun and the most joy-filled laugh I've ever heard from my boy. They raced each other to our side, and when Anakin tripped, I saw the precious thing pick my baby up in her arms like I myself would, tending to him as she brought him over. He had forgotten the fall entirely by the time she brought him over, laughing and joking together as she made faces at him. She handed him to me, I knew she was aware of their purpose as she accidentally called me mum, I saw how her face flushed and saddened. I knew right then and there what she really wanted, it was as clear as day. And so, I pulled her into a hug and whispered to her. My baby girl, and the father of my children, that is what they are what they were beforehand. I don't care. My two babies and me, protected. I don't think I've experienced such happiness in such a long time. Kenya closed the diary with a small smile on her face, very well remembering the day they had collected Anakin and Shmai, but, it was different knowing just how accepting and loving Shmai was right off the bat. And as tears streamed down her face she couldn't help lament her own failures she could have made it to her mother she was sure of it, if only she hadn't been so careless and gotten caught, then mum would still be alive. She curled her fists as fury racked her very being, gritting her teeth as she clenched her teeth hard enough for them to grate against each other. She would find severance and she would make the expletive pay. But first, she had to be there for Anakin and her to be sister-in-law. She turned to looked out the viewport as soon as the ship dropped out of hyperspace, the planet Naboo clear as day. Nabu. Standing with a near crap eating grin on her face, Kenya stood beside both R2 D2 and C3 Po as they watched Anakin and Padme kiss. Padme, wearing an obviously very expensive white wedding gown, and Anakin wearing his Jedi robes. 
The rose-covered arbor behind the couple accentuated the glistening crystal lake behind, the green mountains on the other side stood tall whilst the sun set behind their twin peaks casting a golden hue on the setting as the atmosphere was vibrant with excitement, fear and hope and undoubtedly love. Anakin's new robotic hand curled in and outwards reflexively, staring deep into Padme's eyes with a determination that the woman could very clearly see. But hidden beneath that, sadness hung like a curtain over the Jedi's inner conscience. The holy man presiding over the wedding gave the P.R.O.C. lamatting words of their union, Anakin raised his robotic arm, cupping Padme's cheek. The woman lent her head into her lover's touch instinctively, closing her eyes as Anakin leant down, the two sharing the first kiss of their union together. Watching this happen, the golden-colored C-3PO and R2-D2 whistled and clapped, whilst Kenya, staring at her brother and in-law couldn't help the small smile that overcame her features, raising her hand slowly to join in the celebration. Don't you worry Shmai, Mum. I'll protect them. I'll protect them both Kenya vowed as her eyes changed targets and instead peered out at the glistening crystal lake behind the lucky couple. As their lips broke apart, Kenya knew the two would most likely wish to spend the rest of their time on Nabal with each other, without outside worries. Stepping back, the woman decided the herself would oversee and provide for them whilst they spent the precious little time they had together in happiness. Karuskant. Bail Organa, Masameda, and Chief Palpatine stood side by side on a balcony that looked over a vast military depot. Numerous venators were landed with their hangar bays open and ready for their occupants to enter. Hundreds of thousands of clones stood side by side in their formations. Their brothers marching in unison into the waiting ships. Bail looked on in profound sadness as the clone army was deployed, marching into the venators whilst other ships were already lifting off into the atmosphere. Yet as he looked to the Chancellor, Bail's brows knitted together as he saw the Chancellor's look, a look of pure grim determination. So this is it, war is upon us Bail closed his eyes and let out a deep breath, eyes flickering from the marching armies below to peer up towards the sky and the stars beyond I can only hope it doesn't cost us too much. Jedi Temple Standing within the Jedi Council Chambers, large windows wrapping around the tower's top room to display the orange light from the sunset on the horizon, clouds hung high over the skies as the city world began to descend into its night. Obi-Wan stood beside Mace Windu whom was leant against one of the support pillars of the room, the ginger-haired man having his arms encircled by the sleeves of his thick brown robes. Do you believe what Dooku said about Sidious controlling the Senate? Obi-Wan asked, looking to Windu for guidance for if they should follow up the lead he was given it doesn't feel right. Join the dark side, Dooku has. Hmm. Yoda was revealed to be sitting in his usual chair, ears low and brow twitching as he was in heavy thought lies, deceit. Creating mistrust are his ways now. Nevertheless, I feel we should keep a close eye on the Senate Windu's usual distrust shining through, having no trust for those that weren't a part of the order and didn't follow the code he had based his life off. I agree Yoda nodded at the wisdom displayed by the follow master of the order. Where is your apprentice Windu asked, looking to Obi-Wan with an intense gaze. On his way to Naboo. Escorting Senator Amidala Obi-Wan answered, not wishing to linger on the subject any longer, he continued I have to admit, without the assistance of the clones the battle wouldn't have been a victory. Victory, victory you say? Master Obi-Wan, not victory Yoda looked grim as the shadows of the room seemed to stretch the shroud of the dark side has fallen. Begun, the clone war has. AEOS Prime. Master, are you okay, why did you call me up here Vass asked as he approached the summit of the mountain that they lived on. At first, Sifo didn't answer, instead, the man basked in the sheer radiance of light that tore off from Vass, the very life force the man projected seeped into the surroundings to rejuvenate all around him. Even at a time like this, on the cusp, the light from the boy brought him comfort. As Sifo turned to face the boy whom stood at the top of the ascending stairs, he couldn't help the smile that came to his face. Even as his head was bare of hair and his skin looked ill, veins colored black under the surface of his skin as his health failed him. Now, on the cusp of adulthood, the boy was already starting to turn into the man he had glimpsed in his visions. Yes, 
I was wondering if you'd like to join me for a meal while we watch the sunset. Sifo motioned to a large stone next to the one he sat on, flat enough for them to sit on while he had already painstakingly made a meal that was ready to be eaten. A smile came to Vasa's face as he stepped forward and made his way to the stone that was located next to Sifo, happily sitting down whilst Sifo reached into a heated container situated right next to his right leg. Fishing two containers of food from the heated box Sifo handing one to his apprentice with a small content smile along with cutlery for the boy to use. The skies were orange as the sun began to approach the horizon, reflecting off of the waters whilst the villagers below moved through the waters with their tamed aquatic creatures. The only clouds in the skies appeared to be gathered in front of the slowly descending sun as a few avian creatures flew inside. The warm rays of the evening sun beat down on them gently as they began to eat an expensive steak from what Vas could gather to be as nerf steak along with some vegetables from the village. Two cups sat next to Sifo as he pulled out an expensive win he had been saving, pouring it into the two glasses before handing one off to his apprentice. Geez, you really cooked the steak to perfection Vas chuckled as he enjoyed the meal, slicing portions off from the steak whilst his mind was a blur, rapidly thinking as he felt the atmosphere around him with the force. Naturally Sifo boasted good-naturedly as he took a sip of his wine, choosing to squint as the edges of the sun began to touch the horizon. Eating in the comfortable silence together, Vas couldn't help but feel the ripples of the force, whether something was happening or was about to happen, and he didn't like the feelings as he couldn't pinpoint the location. Sifo, on the other hand ate slowly and with purpose, sitting in comfort and enjoying the feelings of having his apprentice at his side. Even through the years of his sickness, simply being around the boy he trained, having his purpose, gave him comfort, allowing him to persevere through the pain that ruptured his body until recently. Watching the boy grow from just that, to a man, and a being that personified what being a Jedi should be, he knew it wasn't the Jedi way, but he felt as if the boy was closer to his son, that his apprentice, and he accepted that, for he felt there was nothing wrong with thinking like that. Stabbing into the stake with his fork, Sifo's eyes slowly tracked from the ocean before them to stare at the man he loved as his child. How's your little tag along Sifo asked, watching Vas pause for a moment before he felt a second source of warmth from his other side. Turning to his right, he caught the shimmering hue of a humanoid, cast eye the shape of a small girl that was smiling at him. She sat comfortably with her legs crossed on the grassy summit to the side, turning to look back at the sunset with a forlorn look on her face. When Sifo had become aware of the girl's presence, he had been deeply saddened, feeling a great injustice had been dealt to her. He smiled sadly at her as her hair swayed in the slight breeze around them, her ethereal figure cutting a fantastical image to the man. Her very presence and connection to his apprentice all but confirmed and validated the reason for training his apprentice taking solace in the feeling that he had done everything he could to prepare the young man for the future. Turning from her, Sifo turned to watching the sunset that was now a quarter of the way to setting. I guess it's time Sifo thought as he slowly set his plate down to the side even though it was only half finished, Dara slowly turned to face the Jedi Master as Vasa's brows knitted. Nervously, Sifo reached up to his neck and gently unwound the necklace that was wrapped around his neck, slowly and with purpose as he steeled himself. Clasping the ornate necklace in his hands, the Jedi Master turned and stood before his apprentice. Staring up at him, Vas slowly placed his food to the side, slowly catching Sifo's gaze as the Jedi Master, bald and sickly, stood with his own strength with his came to the side. Master. Vas began as Sifo connected eyes with him. This may not be formal, but it's going to be as official as I can make it," Sifo spoke, fingers curling around his necklace as he took a deep breath. Vas, my son Sifo began as Vas Lucas chalked at the sudden declaration I have watched you grow from a solemn young man, to a man of purpose, of duty, and compassion. Sifo stumbled slightly and winced under the buckling of his knees, he glanced at Dara as she looked at him worriedly, but he wasn't worried. After all he had asked if she was there so someone could be present for such an event. You are a shining beacon of radiance, you are what a Jedi should aspire to be, and had we grown up together, I would have aspired to be just like you. I am proud, to have had a hand in your training, 
and to guide you through the times where you needed someone Sifo spoke, tears brimming on the edges of his eyes slightly as he unwound the necklace and began to wind it around Vasa's neck slowly. I have made, in my long life, a great deal of mistakes, actions I have taken may have made things worse than they were supposed to be. But I know, for wrong I may have inadvertently done, with you, I write them. You are my pride, and joy, and I take great pleasure in being able to do this one thing, at this time. Finishing winding the necklace around his apprentice's neck, Sifo reached into his robes and fished out the hilt of his lightsaber. We are Jedi. The Force speaks through us. Throughout actions, the Force proclaims itself and what is real. Today we are here to acknowledge what the Force has proclaimed Sifo shakily, his frail hands clasping his lightsaber as he flicked the switch to his weapon, the blue blade of his weapon springing forward with a snap hiss. Vas, my child Sifo brought his weapon to bear above Vas's shoulder. By right of the Council, by the will of the Force, I dub thee Jedi, Knight of the Republic Sifo sliced Vas's Padawan braid from his head, tears now streaming down the Jedi Master's face as his weapon deactivated. He stumbled slightly as he put pressure on his back leg to balance, his breath catching as he tried to breathe. Master Vass rose to his legs and caught his master as the man fell back, the sickly man choking as black fluid ran freely down his mouth, yet the man's smile didn't falter even as he lost the strength to hold his lightsaber that rolled to the ground at their side. Don't look so sad Vass Sifo reached up to pet Vass on the cheek slightly, Smiling widely we both knew this day was coming sooner rather than later, we were just fortunate enough to have so much time. I... I don't know. I... Tears ran openly down the young man's cheeks as he held the man whom trained him. It seems, our time together is up. Sifo closed his eyes and took in a deep, meaningful breath, feeling the force beginning to overwhelm every cell within his body. A sense of content coming over him as all his worries evaporated I know, that training you was the right decision to make, even though I may never have seen your face, I know, the good in you, the righteous heart you have, that though the weight of the galaxy is on your shoulders, you will make the right decision. Vas paused before choking slightly, knowing very well that Sifo wasn't talking about just himself, but rather his whole being. Master. You knew Vas spoke slowly and with purpose as his brow twisted slightly as the full weight of Sifo's love bore down on him. Of course my boy Sifo spoke as, never flinching as another presence appeared at the summit of the mountain, Dara froze entirely as she recognized the feeling, the presence of the being that appeared standing over Vas and Sifo. Vas went silent as Nox stared down at Sifo, unmasked as the Jedi Master smiled up at him. There you are. My boy Sifo felt content as he looked into the purple glowing irises of the man above him, twin eclipses set into eyeballs as black and endless as the void, star flecked with glowing magenta irises. Nox knelt down and planted his knees onto the grass below, his stone-like demeanor breaking under the sheer amount of adoration that rose from Sifo. You knew, Master. Nox spoke in his deep voice humoring the man as a tear slowly trailing down his right cheek as he gently rested a finger on Sifo Dias's face. Of course I do, I always did, and I have to say, I'm proud of the man you are and the man you'll become Sifo answered as both Vas's and Nox's face contorted to display great sorrow. Had I grown up under you? I have a feeling, no I know, that somehow, I would have been a better man Nox stressed out as Sifo gently held his forearm. Don't underestimate yourself, my child. I know your burdens weigh down upon you, that your sadness weigh heavily upon your soul, that people may not see you as what you are. But don't for a second believe you're a monster. You're a good man, with a strong heart. And the abilities and drive to do the right thing, and while things may not always go to plan, may not always work out, you're better than what others think you are. Than you think you are, Sifo spoke slowly, his words beginning to dim and slowly slightly at the end of his speech. I'm proud, to have raised you, seen you grow and prosper. And I know, that with you, all will be, right. Knox simply held the man as he began to glow intensely, white light overtaking his features as Knox watched in slow motion, pupils dilated as he vanished, leaving nothing but empty robes as he joined wholly with the cosmic force. 
Knox knelt silently for several seconds before rising to full height and staring out at the sun for several seconds, face shifting through several emotions before settling on a blank mask of stone. Turning from the sun, Knox called out to the creatures housed in the mountain through the force, eyes turning to face Dara whom was looking at him in open wonder, knowing well that she could perceive the rippling force coming from him. A low hiss and snap sounded from the rising stairs of the summit, rising over the rocky formations was the many-eyed bull Summa Verni Moth, hovering closer as Knox called for it. Open curiosity rose from the creature as it used its psionic abilities to study the new man before it. It was apparently far more intelligent than Knox first thought it to be as he felt the creature had recognized him after studying him. Interesting Knox walked up to the summa that was now larger than a full-grown adult, raising his hand to the creature as one of its many many tentacles came forward to wrap around his offered arm. You're coming with me Knox spoke, feeling the creature's understanding of his words and its acceptance. Rising from his kneeling position on the ground, Vass deposited himself down onto the stone he sat early and slumped, staring forward out towards the ocean once more whilst Knox and the bull Summa disappeared in the wind, leaving Dara and Vass to their own. Things are going to be different now, aren't they? Dara spoke as she took a seat next to Vass. Vass remained silent as his hair was blown by the wind. Yet. A fear more tears ran down his face as darkness descent as the sun finally set. I o Kath days later. Thousands of construction drones swarmed the skies of Iocath's shipyard, the titanic shell of the Star of Coruscant hovered through the skies away from prying eyes as it was suspended by gravity engines until its power could be restored at a future date. Valen watched the drones enter the ship though various holes in its hull, flying inside of the beastly ship. How long do you think it'll be before it's operational? Valen asked Scorpio as the droid came to stand at her side. Unknown, it could be days, months, years. We have encountered several dozen creatures occupying the vessel for a nesting ground. It is in a severe state of disrepair, and almost all of its experimental technology has been destroyed, it is going to take some time before all the technology is figured out, and reverse engineered and replicated and the repairs are able to be made. However the generators have been figured out and will be the first things to be restored along with the thrusters and gyroscopes. So at the very least, it will be able to operate under its own power by the end of the week Scorpio explained as Valen crossed her hand and hummed in thought. What if the vessel is needed to aid the fleet in the meantime Valen asked as she turned to face the droid. I may be able to install some temporary installments in place of the current outfit, they should prove versatile enough for any prolonged battle as long as the fleet is to aid it Scorpio explained as she sent a directive to the drones to install the temporary weapons she spoke of. I guess it'll have to do, very well Valen permitted in reluctant acceptance. Just as she went to say something else, a small hum descended over the shipyard, sirens raining soon after as the star of Coruscant was lit alight with blaring red lights. What's going on Valen asked. Scorpio immediately returning to managing the Iocath mainframe to find out what was occurring. Reconstruction units appear to have repaired one of the many generators and have returned basic power needs to the ship, hence, emergency functions have reactivated Scorpio relayed as she brought up a blueprint of the Titanic vessel. Crossing her arms, Valen returned her attention back to the ship as Scorpio went over studying the blueprints. Searching. Valen stopped paying attention to the ship as her eyes danced across the mid-distance, squinting as a frown began to overcome her features. Snapping around, Valen made her way from the control room of the shipyard, stopping at the doorway to regard Scorpio for one more moment. Keep His Majesty posted of progress, and keep it under wraps Valen immediately after turned away from the droid and departed. Naturally Scorpio answered although she was now alone returning to overseeing the restoration of the Star of Coruscant. AEOS Prime, Village. You're leaving AESL Kadir, the leading hunter of which they had met during their first hunt with the Alpha Saber Jowl from years ago, approached the shoreline where a ship was hovering over the beach, the very same ship Vass had used to arrive on the planet, the D5 Mantis. Already on board the ship were the two adolescent remaining Summa Moth hovering around the ship as they inspected it in curiosity. 
villagers moved food stores into cabinets and munitions purchased from passing junkers and smugglers were loaded into crates placed into the cargo hold. I have to, I've done everything I can here, the rest of the galaxy needs me Vast turned to face the amphibian man. I see EES frowned slightly as he stared at the large ship. Vast turned to face the villagers that were gathering on the outskirts of the fishing village however they didn't wish to come too close due to their reverence of the boy due to his standing with the sum of Ernie Moth there's nothing we could do to convince you otherwise is there. Shaking his head, Vass placed a hand on Eeza's shoulder, a small smile on his face before he began to walk up to the extended ramp of the ship just as the last of the helping villagers dropped off the last crate and left the vessel. Well, I'm sure when I speak for everyone here, if you need a home, you always have a place with us EES yelled out as Vass stepped onto the ramp. Stopping at the ramp, Vass paused slightly before turning around and facing the village with a small smile. He raised his hand into a wave as the villagers whom were nervous before rushed forward and waved in turn. In the cockpit, the vessel's controls began to activate on their own under his influence, allowing the ship to begin slowly hovering higher into the air. Sighing, Vass watched felt the sorrow the villagers felt of his departure, his hand beginning to lower as the village became smaller and smaller to his eyes. Turning back around, Vass walked into the bowels of the ship whilst the ramp closed itself behind him. Walking through to the cockpit of the ship, Vass sat himself down into the pilot's chair, taking the control stick of the ship. On the sides of the ship, the thrusters rotated to face the back of the ship and activated to full power sending the ship hurtling into the skies as a streak of dark green and yellow. In the cockpit, Vass stared evenly as the clouds cleared the vessel's viewport and soon bled into a multitude of twinkling stars. Feeling a tentacle touch at his right arm, Vass looked to the youngest of the summa as it settled itself at his side. It'll be okay Vass pet the summa gently on the head as it let loose a small rumble we're heading towards the mid-rim, I don't want to be in Republic space just yet nor do I want to be within separatist space, so we'll go to the mid-rim and help as many worlds as we can. Vass could feel the approval of the Summa, its remaining sibling come to his other side and sat itself down onto one of the chairs in the bridge. Coordinates placed Vass spoke to his companions as the ship around them began to hum as power built from deeper within. Hit the switch Vass smirked as the Summa resting in the chair raised one of its tentacles in the direction he was looking, its appendage wrapping around the switch and slowly pulling it down at a girl. The ship's hum intensified tenfold as the hyperdrive activated, the stars lighting up before streaking across the viewport as the ship entered hyperspace. With Nox, Nox is Nathama Palace. You seem tense Valen purred as she needed the tense muscles in her lover's back. The two sat in the nude comfortably in a heated bathroom within the upper levels of the towering structure Nox called his palace. She danced her fingers across the muscled ridges of his back, eyes a haze as she felt several anomalies that didn't belong on the normal human's back. Just. I've been dealing with a great deal of squabbling amongst the structure of our empire. Skyva and Scorpio are vying for my favor, not out of spite but to see whom is better. Integrating the newfound slaves from Zygeria has been a chore, but they're doing well, sort of knocks began as he slumped into Valen's open arms head slowly tossing from side to side as she rubbed his shoulders. But there's more isn't there Valen pursed her lips before resting her chin on his right shoulder. Plagueis isn't reporting all of his findings to me, and is, meeting at a regular basis with several individuals from the old government that are smuggled through the gate on Iocath and Zakul Knox informed the woman at his back whilst his face scrunched up Laceel suspects he may be drawing them to his side. Do you think he might try a coup for the throne Valen sneered as Knox nodded let me kill him, such a worm cannot be allowed to fester and grow. No. I will allow him to do as he wishes, gain the support he wants, I want him to draw our would-be traitors to his side Knox spoke, simmering down Valen's anger as she thought on his plan. Anyone who sides with him couldn't be trusted to begin with Valen announced. Knox nodding in turn as she placed her chin back on his shoulder and when they strike, we retaliate and remove all the vile corruption from our glorious empire. And nobody will oppose us on our own soil Knox finished, knowing Valen was fully committed to his plan. I see. But what if they all turn on us for him Valen asked, 
looking unsure as her brows contorted upwards. I can rule a galaxy of ash and corpses just as easily as one full of life," Knox answered after several seconds of silence. Slowly, Valen unwound from her lover's back and made her way to his front, setting herself down between his legs as she looked into his eyes. Slowly, purposely, she wrapped his hands into her own as she leant forward. I would burn all of the galaxy's worlds away, if you were only to ask the absolute certainty in her words, the sheer will and desperation for her words to be taken as truth, moved Knox. Slowly, he pulled the nude woman into his embrace as she leant her head against his chest. I know. I believe you, you don't have to try to convince me anymore Knox whispered into the woman's eat as she smiled softly to herself, taking in his heartbeat and warmth that washed over her. Knox sighed in annoyance as a set of footsteps alerted them to the presence of another. Stepping into the room, an exarch looked to the ground, refusing to cast a glance at his nude lord and his concubine. Your Majesty, I bring news the exarch began Lady Skyva has asked for your presence. I see, thank you for informing me Knox remained still with Valen still slung over him. Of course the exarch made a swift departure, allowing for Knox to slump as Valen unwound herself from him and stood. Moments later, Knox himself stood, pooping his joints as he basked for one last moment in the sauna. So what are we doing Valen asked as Knox called a black cloak to his hand, fastening it around him as he tied it at the waist. I believe it's time I went to oversee Skyva's progress. Iokath Flying low over Iokath's steel cities, artificial rain pelting slightly against the hull of the vessel, the X-70B remained in camouflage as it weaved between spires and large buildings, wishing not to be noticed by prying eyes as it approached a larger facility in the far distance. Appen nearing the facility, the ship began to slow, a signal resonating from the vessel that opened a portion of the facility. A large set of hangar doors opening with which a platform was extended from. Slowing to a halt, the ship's landing gear extended as it began to lower, the hum of the thrusters lowering further as it landed gently. Marching from within the facility, a legion of heavy skytrooper units made twin columns to welcome their emperor. Rising from his pilot's seat, Knox breathed in a deep breath of cold artificial air. Valen tinkered with the console in front of herself to finish the landing sequence. Walking with a sedate pace to his quarters, Knox quickly went over his appearance, once more garbed in his royal armor. Squinting slightly, an uneven strand of hair was put back in its place, restoring his immaculate appearance before he turned away towards a lightsaber mount. Pulling his blade from the mount, Knox caught the weapon snugly in his palm before departing his chambers. Your Majesty, do you fancy a beverage the remade 2VR8 which now served as a physical body for the ship's AI, eager as ever to please and serve her master and creator? Not right now. But, prepare something for myself and Valen for when we return, and good job Knox complimented the AI as it became giddy at his praises. Saddling up beside him. Knox looked to Valen whom was ready to accompany him in his observations, a single nod being sent from her lover before they departed the ship. On the outside of the vessel, the landing platform was retracted back into the facility, the hangar doors closing to hide Knox's presence alongside the X-70 as the platform brought them into an internal hangar. As the ramp lowered with a hiss, Knox walked across the platform's walkway through the internal hangar, heavy skytrooper units kneeling in reverence. My lord Ivla stood bowed, her right hand in front of her chest whilst her left was curled at the small of her back. Ivla, you're looking well Knox complimented the droid that smiled slightly at his response to her greeting. Your constant improvements to my mainframe and programming have allowed me to experience many things I hadn't thought possible at the time as well they have for my siblings, and for that we are grateful and happy Ivla replied, returning to standing at her towering height as she smiled down at her master. I am pleased to hear that, come, let us walk and chat Knox motioned to the doorway, Ivla nodding as she turning and moved to walk alongside the High Justice and Knox. Tell me, how goes your studies Knox asked in reference to studying the monoliths on another floor of the facility, far below where Esni was currently taking more samples of the World Breaker monolith. They go well, several breakthroughs have been made, 
we have been able to replicate the unique armoring of the creature's plating. Harvesting its cells, we have been able to both replicate the creature and create offspring. We have also been able to analyze its DNA structure and overall makeup, we have discovered what lead to its impressive lifespan and resilience to the elements, I am working on recording our discoveries and shall send you a full and detailed explanation of our findings through to your implants Ivla explained, informing Knox of the beginning of their discoveries and the subjugation of the monolith. That is good to hear, I am pleased of your progress Knox replied, excited to receive the studies from the droid at a later date now tell me, is there anything you wish for, an alteration to your mainframe perhaps, or an exotic pet, it is my wish to grant. My lord, I am simply happy to serve, however, if I were to be so bald, I would ask for more, precise instruments to work with Ivla motioned to her hands. I see, I will design and begin development on a set of more, malleable digits to be installed Knox replied much to the droid's satisfaction, the two now exiting the hangar and walking into a sterile corridor, various different droids working at their highest velocity within the white walls of the facility. It would be greatly appreciated your majesty Ivla spoke, guiding Knox towards an elevator to another floor below them where Skyva was working with her creations. The towering droid and its majesty spoke in great length for the remainder of their walk, sharing their wisdom with each other whilst Valen remained silent during their exchange. As the elevator came to a stop on sub-level 5, Ivla once more bowed to Knox. It is time I depart from you my lord. Mother awaits you behind these doors with her creations Ivla spoke as the elevator door opened up in front of them. Very well, continue with your great work, I look forward to seeing what you've been able to uncover Knox replied before walking with purpose out of the elevator. I look forward to receiving your praises my lord Ivla answered, receiving a nod from Knox as the elevator closed between them, allowing for Ivla to descend to a deeper floor within the facility. That was an enlightening conversation Valen snarked as Knox chuckled, the two standing before another door, secured with several locks on the inside that unlocked at their approach. She's just eager Knox replied as the door opened and allowed them passage. If only all were that eager Valen mused bitterly as she thought about some of their previous servants. Yes, that would have been nice Knox agreed as they entered Skyva's laboratory. Looking around. Knox could see the capsules which used to control the specimens for Skyva's experiments that were housed against the wall. The same operations table which Skyva used to operate on her specimens was situated in the center of the room, clear of any current specimens. And entering from another doorway on the far side of the room, was the towering form of Skyva herself entering with an excited stride, quickly closing the gap between Knox and herself. There you are Skyva Knox regarded the droid as it stopped before him. Master, I'm glad you've arrived Skyva greeted with a deep bow, Knox nodding his head in turn before she returned to her standing position. You have something for me Knox immediately went to business. My experiments have bore fruit, your most powerful and useful servants await you Skyva motioned to the doorway which she entered through. Truly. You've completed your experiments Knox looked up to the droid whom gave her confirmation and motioned for them to move to the next chamber. There is little more I can improve Appen with their current form, I am most proud of their turnout Skyva informed as they exited the main room of the lab and entered the adjacent corridor, headed towards the chamber which housed the finished specimens. That is. Very assuring to hear. I look forward to testing them, tell me. Are the testing rooms available Knox asked as they came to stand in front of another sealed door which unlocked at their arrival. They are always at the ready should you wish to test my experiments my lord. Now allow me to introduce you to your most useful pawns coming to stand directly at his side, the doorway opened to reveal the chamber within. In total 80 pods ran in 8 rows, 10 rows in line with each other with their inhabitants kept within. With their arrival, the stasis pods relinquished their inhabitants opening to allow the nude individuals within to depart. In unison, all 80 of the successful specimens stepped forward onto the cold ground. Humans and aliens of all species stood tall against the chilled temperature of the room regardless of their lack of clothing. The youngest of this group provided to me was of the biological age of seven, a human female child, proved more malleable to program and alter, 
I have been able to install several neural implants and have been able to alter her brain to a greater degree than some others, her age and general lack of knowledge allowed essentially a blank slate, I dare say she may be an intellectual match for C490L the first of them. The oldest approach is the ages of 126 years old, whilst his organic brain was past its prime, however installments have restored any lost cognitive function. All others vary in species and age in between Skyva explained as the congregation of specimens stood shoulder to shoulder in front of their stasis pods. Analyzing then through the force, Knox was impressed by what he felt, they held their presences, but other than that, they were blank, thinking and feeling nothing, not even pain. Focusing, Knox penetrated their minds, watching several flinch at the intrusion but made no move to stop his advances. He could feel them, their subdued feelings a soft flow, their muted thoughts his to know. Interesting, I see they have taken well to your augments, their bodies have accepted them he turned to face Skyva as he made his observations. It was a slight annoyance to subdue their body's immune system to allow for the integration of these augments, but with what you provided, it was, rudimentary to do Skyva informed as she motioned for the being once known as Carol. Coming forward, Carol knelt before Knox and Skyva, her blonde hair cascading down her back whilst her facial features remained blank. This is the first successful specimen, C490L. You were present via hollow when she awoke if my memory is to be believed," Skyva announced, the artificial and organic amalgamation knowing very well it was being studied now that the being she was to serve was now here. Is it combat ready? Knox asked as he walked around the kneeling woman, noting several small lines that ran across her body, such as along her spine where her body was stitched back together. These lines ran across her arms, two from the base of her neck to run across her chest, over her breasts and stomach to come to a stop together stood her reproductive organ. Affirmative, I take it you wish to test its effectiveness Skyva opened one of the three connected doors beside the entryway, leading to an adjacent chamber where he could test C490LS abilities. Come now, Servant One, I wish to test your abilities accepting her new designation as her name, Carol stood to her feet and followed after her new master into the chamber she was familiar with testing chamber. Coming to a stop in the white room, tiles lined all surfaces of the room, stark white and sterile as every other part of the facility. Come at me with everything you have servant one, and be rewarded for your attempts. Knox unclipped his lightsaber, the blade screaming to life, said scream would have driven any other organic to their knees under the sheer fear that was experienced in the presence of his blade. Carol however, showed no outside reaction as she got into a stance her center of gravity low to the ground, her hands spread in front of her with her palms facing the ground whilst her legs were spread apart, ready to spring her in either direction. Knox watched, as the skin in her right palm separated, a blade of black steel-like material sprung from her palm, ready to be used. Without warning, Carol sprung forward, features a blur as she closed the distance in a near instant. She made a stabbing motion with her right arm. Bucking his head to the right, the blade passed where his head had previously been, allowing for Knox to sidestep the woman at speeds that surpassed the woman by leagues. Coming to stand behind the woman, Knox made to stab her in the back with the tip of his black and purple lightsaber, however was pleasantly surprised as she twisted, affording a grade to the side of her stomach rather than full-on impalement. She didn't react as the skin of her stomach burnt, instead, swept her blade around to strike at Knox's head, whom blocked by pointing his blade upwards. He was further interested as the black rod didn't immediately split in half, rather it stopped his blade, sparks flew between the two. Impassive as ever, Carol weathered the red bolts of lightning jumping from the shroud of his blade and onto her skin, leaving black burn marks in their place. The woman proved deceptively strong as she, for that very moment, applied all the pressure she could muster into pushing his blade down. Pushing back, Knox broke the lock, satisfied with her current level of strength, he moved on to his next test. Coming forward, Knox swung his weapon left at Carol's head, the woman leant back as it sailed by, and when Knox redirected his blade with a simple maneuver of his wrist, the blade altered its path downwards and to the right and threatened to spill the bottom of the woman's guts out. Slamming her blade down, 
Carol narrowly managed to spare the damage to her stomach, leaping back into the air as the scars and burns on her body slowly healed. Not letting the woman receive a reprieve, Knox leapt into the air after the woman, slapping the blade to the side as he reared his blade and swiped at her now undefended abdomen. Knox watched, intrigued as the superheated black and purple blade sliced deep into her abdomen, but was stopped against its will as it struck her ribs, stopping as it hit the replacement of her skeleton structure within her. Pulling his blade out, Knox blasted the woman with a force push as he fell back to the ground, landing gracefully on his crouched legs. The force pushed carried the woman and carved a trench of energy across the room carrying Carol across the room until she was embedded into the far wall, which exploded into shards of tile and steel as the force push annihilated its surface and exposed what was underneath. Let's hope she can survive even a percentile of my power Knox thought as he studied the damage his force push did not even half a percent and this was the damage, I'm going to need to reaffirm my control, don't want to crush anything, or anyone with my presence alone, again. He was dragged from his thoughts as Carol twitched and popped, arms coming forward, bent the wrong direction as she pried herself from the feminine shaped hole in the wall. Landing on the ground, Carol was bent all in the wrong direction, arms bent over backwards, hands flat against the ground. Her spine was wound the wrong way until her legs were the wrong way around. Knox watched as the woman stood up, legs still facing the wrong direction as the gash in her stomach still burned. The woman seemed to flex, and with a sickening snap, her legs wound around to face the right direction, her arms unbent and clicked together her broken arms fusing back together until fully healed. Deactivating his lightsaber, Knox nodded with satisfaction as he clipped it back onto his sash and relaxed his stance. Skill, B Pending Improvement. Speed, S. Strength, A. Endurance, S. Luck, to be tested. Overall score. A. Knox recorded his recorded data into his neural implant to be used later a very satisfactory specimen. But I could improve it further Knox smirked as he made to depart the testing chamber and made his way back to the main chamber. Tell me, are all the others as capable as you Knox asked the creation at his side as she followed him with a blank stare. Combat wise, I am second compared to my siblings, intellectually. I am first due to unique testing and programming Carol explained, making Knox nod in thought whilst thinking on how to utilize them to the best of their abilities. Coming back into the main theater, Carol went back to standing back in line with Skyva's creations as he went back to standing with the droid. He was about to say something when he stopped and paused, Iris's narrowing as his head snapped to the side slightly, Valen seemed to notice too as a wave of malevolence washed over them, passing by as it dipped into a sense of cold target hatred that only he was meant to feel. My Lord Skyva pressed as she noticed the instant change in his behavior, his unflinching glare that penetrated the wall. Transport them to Nathema, I have some other tests I wish to do. Shaking his head, Knox sent a pointed look to Valen whom approached forgive me, Valen will accompany them as an escort. No I must depart, there is, something I must take care of. He was gone from the room immediately after, evaporating in a cloud of dark shifting purple that convulsed and contorted in on itself before fading away. Korriban Dreshti, one of the only settlements left on Korriban, was a wreck, plumes of smoke rose from several crumbling buildings. Appearing within the center of a street, Knox looked around slowly, eyes staring at everything around him with an analytical gaze. Corpses lined the streets sunken husks clutching or running from something, stuck in their final moments, their skin dark grey and stone-like. Tapping one with the edge of his steel boot, Knox confirmed his suspicion as it crumbled away into dust to be evaporated by the winds of the planet. That's the first thing you do when returning from the void, destroy the only settlement here Knox announced over his shoulder, slowly turning to face the only other individual in the street I see. You've come to reclaim what was once yours Knox remarked as he stared at the individual, no, the entity in front of him. Beady red eyes, sunken into the features of what looked to be a middle-aged man stared back at him. Up in a simple glance, he appeared to be harmless, taunt arms with barely any muscle to his frame, lean with his bones visible underneath, 
his hair was black with a sickly green substance running through it making it clunky. But as Nox's eyes began to shine a fluorescent magenta, he could see the rippling energy that practically bled from his frame, black waves that sunk into his surrounding environment, sapping the life out of the very atmosphere around him as it became dead, color seemed to drain slightly as the sun dimmed. Where are my manners, let me be the first to welcome you back to the land of the living Nox spread his arms with a wide smile before they dropped to his side and regarded the entity with a solid glare now prepare to be assimilated, Typho Gem. The world seemed to rumble around the disguised entity as it growled, the land shaking with its progenitor's anger as it curled its hands into fists. Try not to struggle too much Nox glared hard, his teeth clenching together as his veils blackened and skin became grey, eyes shifting to black as his iris glowed vibrant magenta, waves of energy suddenly erupting from his mortal coil that began to combat with the desperate Typho Gem's own energy. The disguised monster shifted in uncertainty, its desires clear, with the efforts to regain its previously lost power discarded thanks to Nox's own actions in its realm in the void. The only chance for its survival was to come and take back what was stolen, and in doing so, taking what Nox contained and therefore regaining its previous power. No, it had no choice, here and now, it would regain its place as the dominant force in the galaxy. On sheer instinct, Nox grabbed his lightsaber, igniting the blade as it black laser shot from the fount, screaming to life angrily as the purple shroud struck against the blade of the dark shear of his opponent, said dark shear being in the grip of Typho Gem whom had flashed to Nox in a near instant. Red bolts sprung from the blade of his lightsaber that leapt from his weapon at that same instant, striking at Typho Gem's disguised form. However the being remained unflinching as the red bolts struck its skin, leaving black marks and scuffs in its pale white skin. Typho Gem tried hard to push against Nox's blade and arm, gaunt arm flexing as he tried to push up against the steadfast Nox. Red eyes of hate and malice manifest met Nox's glowing magenta eyes as black began to spread from his irises slowly. .GIVETBCK Its disembodied, warped voice raked against his ears, grinding his teeth together Nox began his counterattack. Relaxing his arm, Nox pivoted his arm, wrist pointing downwards to the left, forcing the dark shear to slide down the blade of his saber and strike the ground beside him. Stepping to the side, blade still pointed to the ground, Nox struck Typho Gem over the jaw, forcing the beast to stumble to the side before Nox planted his boot into its sternum and kicked the beast back, sending it flying through a wrecked building's foundations which promptly collapsed immediately after. Careening through the air, the beast struck the ground with a roll and tumble, followed closely by a surge of lightning that raked from Nox's fingers and almost immediately afterwards struck the momentarily downed form of Typho Gem. With a grunt, Nox stepped forward in pursuit of Typho Gem whom still hadn't returned, ignoring the crushed corpses he was stepping over, freaking under a stray steel pipe sticking from the ground and stepping over the rubble that once was the building he tossed Typho Gem through. On the other side of the rubble, Nox saw what was once the marketplace, stands were non-existent, corpses of burnt and shriveled children with their parents lay together as husks under more collapsed rubble. Smoke billowed from a destroyed speeder and rose into the air to join the rest of the rising black clouds. But his focus was one the downed form of his foe, still face down with his cloak small trails of smoke rising from its form. Are you going to get up? Nox spoke across the gap between the two, fumbling with his left gauntlet as he waited for the being to respond. He stopped however a second later as he heard a low rumble from everywhere around him, the ground shaking underfoot his eyes tracking back to his enemy whilst the hairs on the ends of his neck stood on end. He went on edge as the skies darkened, a cyclone of desert sands rising from all direction to swirl directly into the marketplace. Holding his hand over his eyes, his hair billowed violently around his face glowing purple eyes peeking through his fingers as he watched the sands be sucked into the still prone Typho Gem. Bulging and growing exponentially in size, Typho Gems grew until he was as large as a three-story building, built of the sands around him as it compacted and compressed, red veins burning onto their surface as its eyes began to glow an eerie light. Nox's lips twitched as the humanoid, now back into its original shape, turned to face Nox, its sand-constructed muscle bulging as its tentacles moss swayed back and forward. 
he's retained his control over his larger body, this able to use the sands to his will. Troubling Knox observed the beast as it took half a step forward, lent its head back before it blaster forward and released a world-shaking howl. The rest of the buildings around the town promptly collapsed and fell to the grounds, dust rising around them as lightning coated Typhogem's limbs. Readying himself, Knox lent half an inch forward, lightsaber reignited in his right hand, small crackles of lightning dancing in his left palm with it pointed at the ground. With his senses at an all-time high, Knox was ready and prepared as he felt the winds displace behind him, alerting him as he bounced to the right, a tendril of sand slamming down into his position before it swept in his direction. Raising his hand, Knox blasted lightning at the tendril, knowing Typhogem was currently sprinting at his back. The lightning struck the tendril, turning it to glass within that moment before he used the force to grip the sizzling glass tendril, leaping into the air and sending it tumbling at Typhogem. Landing on the ground, Knox turned to face Typhogem once more as it simply backhanded the glass appendage to the side, its hands still coated in lightning as a lance blasted from its hand in an attempt to stab Knox. Ducking to the left under the lightning lance, Knox sprinted forward to meet the sprinting sand beast, lightsaber screaming as it tore through the ground below. The two met with a thunderclap, as Typhogem reared its first back and roared, bringing the force constructed appendage forward with gale force winds following. Knox brought his weapon to defend the fist, face growing stern as the two met, the ground shaking as white light escaped from between the two, the fist proved to be resilient as the blade couldn't immediately cut through the sand, instead, the force imbued sands slowly began to glow orange as they once more tried to overpower each other. The winds shuddered around them as the ground cratered below the two as Typhogem called more of the lands of Korriban back into himself. As this transpired, Knox was forced to raise his lightsaber higher as Typhogem grew inside once more. Knowing he'd soon be unable to compete with Typhogem with sheer strength, Knox dropped low, as the fist sailed over him he dragged the tip of his blade across its surface, smirking as it managed to slice into the surface. Just as it thought, better to focus on a specific point rather than spread damage out Knox mused as the ground shook once more as Typhogem's fist slammed into the ground. Now, under Typhogem's body, Knox pointed his lightsaber directly upwards and heaved, stabbing up through the beast's chest. With a warning through his precognition, Knox shrouded himself in a static barrier, just in time as a shockwave erupted from the still-skewered Typhogem, drilling Noxi to the ground below, momentarily stunning Nox as he managed to keep the barrier active. Rearing its foot back, Typhogem kicked at Nox, striking the static barrier and launching the man into the air before the lightning dancing around the beast's arms coalesced at the center of its two hands before a single bolt of supercharged lightning struck the static barrier, causing both to violently explode up an impact burning Nox's hair from his body as he grit his teeth, refusing to allow his foe to hear his yells of pain. Skin sizzling, Nox slammed into the ground several hundred meters from where the town was once located, sliding to a halt as the sand in underneath grated against his sensitive skin. Slowly dragging himself to his feet, Nox glared back at the settlement of which Typhogem was slowly walking towards him from. Gripping the charred skin over his face, Nox raked his fingers, gripping the dead skin like a layer of film before tearing it from his face. Discarding the dead and charred skin to the side, his muscle on his face, bare to the world, with gnashing lipless teeth, was healed almost immediately after the dead skin landed on the ground as skin rapidly grew back over his face, his hair quickly grew back until it was once more flowing around his face in the blistering winds, returning him to his undamaged state. Flexing his freshly healed right hand, he watched Typhogem was more grow in size, now standing at the same height as the control tower for the spaceport at nearly a hundred meters tall. He's calling Korriban back to himself ever so slowly, each time he grows, he gets stronger. He's rebuilding himself. Nox steadied himself right hand facing the ground as his lightsaber ignited in his left palm. Spawn making eye contact with each other, the beast froze and stopped making Nox grow on edge as it spread its hands to its side and released a eardrum-splitting yell to the heavens. Shaking his head slightly, Nox watched the cyclone of orange around them which dropped suddenly, 
sweeping over the orange-tinted lands like a tsunami that cascaded over everything on sight. Once more, Knox covered himself as the sands hit him like a starship, however he managed to remain steadfast as his sight was tinted orange, each grain struck against his skin viciously. Growing tired of being submerged in the churning dust storm, Knox held his palms to the side of his head, eyes closed and cast another static barrier which promptly formed with a static boom, blocking the sandstorm outside and affording him a moment of reprieve. Now, Knox clasped his hands together, fists curling in front of his chest as he slammed his feet into the ground, arched his back before pushing outwards, each arm on either side of his body. All around his static barrier, white vicious winds tore from the shield, expanding outwards with greater force than the dust storm contained. Expanding over the lands, the storm was completely destroyed, dispersing into small winds as the massive, omnidirectional force push dissipated on the horizon. What greeted him was a legion of loyal followers of Typho Gem. Of course Knox should have expected this, the very first foundations of the Sith, the earliest of the order, thought of Typho Gem as a deity, to serve him was to attain his power. Of course this worship slowly dissipated over time. But even in death, his followers remained loyal, and so, when called to his side, came running. And now, Knox stared into the glowing red or yellow molten eyes of a legion of the early Sith, the first Darksiders of Korriban, and they looked back. Please, allow me Knox heard in his head, allowing the shade to leap from his body separating from his body in a mist of black matter that coalesced together at Knox's side. Sending a glance to his side, Knox smirked slightly as Aloysius stood tall, the ancient entity glaring out at his old adversaries and comrades. Over a thousand generations of blood spilled lay buried on these lands, corpses long dispersed to the wind whilst their memories lay forgotten. The first of us may have served this beast, but others, later generations knew where their loyalties should lay, even now Aloysius spoke darkly, calling for the loyal servants of the Sith that guarded the planet, the Darksiders whom recognized their place and came to the call of Korriban's ruler. Ascending out from the grounds below, corpses broke the surface, bones pulling themselves from the very sands they were buried within. Others, shades of the dead having long since lost their bodies to time, formed from the air, grey, black and in some cases, flaming spirits came together behind and around Knox and legions. Forming a dark shear in his grip, Aloysius turned to the horde of the dead around them, staring over the masses with black and red shining eyes. Brothers, sisters, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters. Our times have come, and they have gone. We are but whispers of the past, memories refusing to be forgotten. Our empires have risen, and they have fallen failing against the tests of time. We accept this, instead choosing to guard our homes, the last vestiges of what gave us purpose in our lives. Yet there are some that refuse to allow us rest, they serve a dying beast grasping at straws before its death, this beast who would call us to serve, would burn the galaxy away before allowing itself to die a silent pathetic death. Are you going to allow this monster to tear the very foundations of our homes, our history, our resting places apart, so it may live another day. Or will you join me in killing what has already died once and for all Aloysius raised the pulsing dark shear to the skies as the eyes of the dead were pinned on him in silence. One by one, the shades turned away from Aloysius, a long rumble beginning to rise amongst the ranks and before long, the legion of dead was rumbling with ghastly howls, some outright taking off running for Typho Gem and his army of loyalists. Turning back to Knox, Aloysius sauntered up to his descendant before nodding leave his army to us. Raising his dark shear in the direction of the enemy, Aloysius released a bellow, signaling his men to urge forward before he began a dead sprint at them. As one, the dead moved in pursuit of their makeshift leader, a variable ocean of twisting shadows, crawling over each other, crashed together. On the other side, Typho Gem's loyalists moved too rushing forward in tandem. But Knox and Typho Gem remained still, eyes staring across the sand plains at each other, and as the two armies of the dead collided, they moved. The large beast crashed over its minions as its towering feet slammed into the ground, 
its giant arms swaying back and forward as it sprinted at its adversary. In turn, Nox closed his eyes and straightened his back opening himself up to the force that proceeded to flood him, exciting the cells of his body as his hair began to swirl on its own. As his eyes snapped open, everything around him seemed to slow down if not stop entirely as he engaged one of his most bullcrap abilities. As his perception of time sped up, his brain activity skyrocketed, and the muscle of his body became tense, Nox blasted forward, the winds around him howled as he tore through the very oxygen in the air, leaving a vacuum that had yet to refill, space bent around him as a distortion appeared around his body. Typhogem's eye seemed to widen in slow motion, attempting to track his position as Nox blitzed forward, crashing through the armies of Typhogem's shades. As he collided with the dead, he obliterated them with his body, moving so fast that he phased through them before they could register their own death. In that same instant, Nox crouched, flexing the muscle in his legs and leapt, clearing the distance between himself and the motionless Typhogem. Spinning 360 degrees, rearing his leg, Nox slammed his right leg into the side of Typhogem's torso with the force of a falling meteor. Sinking his foot half an inch into the surface of Typhogem's torso, slowly, painfully slow, cracks began to appear around the impact zone. Not satisfied with the one attack, Ox plunged his hand into his fingers into the beast's chest, giving himself leverage to slam his fist into another impact point, he could physically see the shockwaves expanding from the zone, expanding outwards in a ring. With his fingers still in the chest of the beast, Nox knew he wouldn't be able to ignite his weapon, knowing he was moving faster than the blade was able to eject, instead resorted to dragging his hand through the beast's chest. Planting his feet on the solid surface below, he anchored himself through the force and ran, keeping his fingers in the monster's chest, and in doing so, began opening a gash like one would open a zipper. Running from the lower left portion of the beast's chest, he sprinted to its left shoulder before leaping upwards into the skies, he raised his hands to the skies, staring down at the monster whom began to register the damage it had sustained, and in a white flash, cast a bolt of lightning into the skies. Letting out a slow breath, time returned to its previous state as everything began to speed up again. He watched in real time as Typhogem was tossed violently to the side, the entirety of its left chest cracking and shattering from his kick and punch to its side, and as it crashed to the ground, its chest opened up as black energy blasted from within its being, like a volcanic eruption of darkness that crap into the skies. It wasn't finished however as dark clouds gathered, Typhogem stared at the skies with beady narrowed eyes as red lightning danced between the rolling clouds. With his right hand raised upwards, shadows obscuring his hair, Nox grit his teeth and scowled. As power built up in the heavens, the lightning became more frequent, the air around them became charged with electricity as you could hear the cracking of lightning intensifying tenfold. Die as you lived, a failure Nox growled before he dropped his hand in the direction of Typhogem, dropping from above, a single bolt descended, striking Typhogem's compressed body construct, however it didn't strike once and vanish, instead, it struck over and over with ferocity. The beast wailed as its body was glassed, entire chunks blasted off its body into nothingness all the while, as the bolt struck over and over, the crackling boom that repeatedly sounded shook the ground underfoot. With one last strike, Nox closed his fist and slammed in into the ground, the circling clouds above contorting and shifting before dropping onto Typhogem's prone form. As the clouds slammed into its body, they dispersed up an impact, but nonetheless did considerable damage as it was akin to getting hit by a collapsing building. Breathing out slowly, Nox ignored the war raging around him, occasionally flicking his hand at an approaching shade as he sent it hurling skywards with a mere wave of his hand. Knowing that wouldn't be enough to put down the Sith deity, Nox cast another stasis barrier in case of an incoming counterattack. Pulling his lightsaber back into his grip, the blade screamed to life as he ducked a swing from a shade, reversing his grip on his blade before stabbing backwards into its chest. He could hear it impact and the shade scream as its power was sucked from itself and into his lightsaber, feeding the terrible weapon as the dead dispersed into ash. All around him, more shades converged on him as the beast they served was still recovering. 
Come on then Knox growled as he gripped his weapon with both hands, feeling its eagerness to continue to be fed with his enemy's lives. Each one around him brandished a form of weapon, whether it be conjured blade or cursed physical blade they had picked up from the ground. Let me welcome you Chaos Knox's sinister remark shook few, as the first one leapt forward with its weapon held in a form one grip. Bringing its weapon down in an attempt to slice his head, Knox brought his weapon up horizontally, slicing through the ancient steel blade with ease and in the same arc, severed the head of the shade as he continued with the swing, he kept his momentum, using it to turn and face behind him as he deflected a stab to his back to the left. With the second shade's weapon diverted away from himself, he dragged his blade through its forearms before slashing it in half at the torso. With two dead in less than a second, the dead around him shifted in a sense of unease at the lack of effort he needed to dispatch of them. You think you sorry lot will be the ones to do me in? I, a god in mortal flesh, who houses the combined knowledge and powers of the most powerful beings in existence. Who rules one of the most powerful empires to ever exist, immortal in both mind, soul, and flesh. To think you, pitiful shades with the skill and power of children, think you could put me down, don't make me laugh Knox bellowed as he reached for the nearest, dragging it forward with the force and stabbed it through the chest. Flashing eyes of madness, Knox didn't stop even as the first shade was still skewered, he flashed to the left, knee slamming into another face before it could raise its blade before front flipping over the shade and slicing its head off from behind it as he was inverted upside in mid-air, all before the one skewered to his blade could disperse into motes of ash. Landing on his feet, Knox rose and looked at the eight remaining shades around him, wasting no time, the fifth to face him charged, opening in a form two stance as it made to stab Knox in the chest. Ducking to the left, Knox slashed his blade right, blocking the weapon as they engaged in a battle of skill. A block to the right, a slash to the left that was diverted, Knox turned his torso as his enemy's blade slashed by him grabbing the offending arm before pulling his opponent over his back and slamming it into the ground, taking the chance to plunge his blade into its head. As he stabbed low, he saw a blade pass over where his head previously was, and as the blade sunk into the shade's head, knowing it was now dead, he swept his legs around, catching the legs of the one whom had tried to behead him, and as it fell, swiped his blade up to split it in half. However he was going to fight the other six was unknown as he leapt back into the skies with a blur, the fist of Typhogem slamming into the ground as it obliterated the ground below. The beast tracked him with its each, giving him a chance to observe the damage it had sustained. No longer was its chest or face made of compressed force infused sand, rather its chest and right side of its face was made entirely of black, swirling, shifting energy. Its right eyes was an intense red, glowing with rage and fury as spectre-like tentacles hung from its lower face. Now that's the friendly face of yours I'm familiar with, Knox smirked as it dragged its fist through the sand and sent a vicious uppercut towards him. Sending a force push downwards, the force push slammed into the fist, slowing it considerably as it slammed into him, sending him higher into the skies of which Typhogem followed suit after spreading its wings and taking flight. Tumbling head over heels through the skies as he ascended into the atmosphere, the clouds parted around him violently as he entered the stratosphere before Typhogem reached him with its hand outstretched. Catching him in its grasp, Typhogem tried to crush him, as the darkness enveloped Nox's vision, the massive fingers compressed around him. Casting a force barrier with his hands spread apart, violent purple energy quickly came together into a physical dome to surround him on all sides. As Typhogem felt the resistance of the one it craved death happen in equal parts it did of its family, it curled its other hand around the one used to crush Nox, and applied further pressure as its facial muscles twisted and it curled its body inwards as it tried its hardest to squash the little bug. Nox's face twisted in concentration as he heard a loud crack, eyes shooting to the right as his force shield began to crack. With intense concentration, Knox rolled his eyes into the back of his head as he cast his attention to every individual he had control over and connections with. Mid-rim. In his ship, Vass paused in his actions, eyes calculating before rising from his pilot's chair and quickly making his way into his bedroom. Swiftly, Vass knelt on the ground, 
eyes closed before crossing his legs and placed his hands on his kneecaps. Blue motes of radiant energy soon began to pool around the man, swirling around him as his eyes began to shine white. And with a shining radiance, cast his power across the stars. Iokath. Valen paused as she felt a tug, eyes dancing downwards as she looked in the direction of Corriban. She knew whom was attempting drawing power from her, seeing no need to deny it, she relinquished the energy she currently had as it fled from her body and sped across the galaxy to the one whom held her heart. Elsewhere on Iokath, Plague Ace Lab. Lucille stopped as he hunched over, the sensation of his master's thought being physically inserted into his head causing him to wince slightly. Straightening himself out, the blonde turned his head from left to right as he looked up and down the corridor for any cameras or individuals that may have been watching him. Clasping his hands together, he breathed in and closed his eyes and sent his power to the one calling for it. Feeling his power was considerably for the moment, Lucille became guarded, knowing Jed be vulnerable unless he were to equip he mask he grasped it in his robes in case he were randomly attacked. Power complex deep below the surface of Iokath. Athlagiroth knelt within the sun generator plant as he had done for the last few years, not needing any form of sustenance, under its leader's orders, had remained in solitude to draw power into itself from the endless supply offered to it. The unshaped monstrosity twisted its head upwards as it felt the connection bridged between itself and its leader. I need to borrow a small amount of power from you Athla heard in his head, recognizing the voice of his lord. My power is at your disposal Athla Giroth replied in a deep baritone telekinetic voice, and almost immediately after, felt power being dragged from its being that it willingly relinquished. Back on Corriban. Feeling the barrier in its grip shatter Typhogem took glee at the lack of resistance as he closed his hands fully raising his hands before flinging the crushed being in its grip back down to the lands far below. Flying through the skies, Typhogem watched the streak of a mangled body descend from the skies, a trail of blood following it as it passed through the clouds. Arms, legs and torso twisted, Nox's face twisted in agony, pain and anger, Nox took few seconds before he slammed into the ground, he knew as he felt, every bone in his body had been obliterated up an impact. He arm was bent over his back, spine reversed and legs were spread apart with one of his knees facing backwards entirely. Vomiting blood from his mouth, which also spurted from his nose, he could feel blood leaking from his ears as his vision began to go black. With a grunt, Nox's right arm snapped back into its regular position. Allowing him to plant his hand onto the ground to allow him to roll onto his back. His eyes widened as he did so, as the clouds parted above him. Typhogem descended from above with its right leg outstretched. All amusement he might have had as a shadow appeared over him, he closed his eyes as the world went black around him, the world shook as Typhogem slammed into him, sending chunks into the stone in all directions as all feeling left him. Realm of the Void Opening his eyes, Nox observed the stark white expanse around him, feeling no body for him to use, just being a disembodied consciousness floating in nothingness. So I'm not in chaos, and I'd wager my left nut this isn't what the cosmic force looks like to the dead, so that's not an option. So what do you want Nox's perception shifted as he turned around to face a being of humanoid shape, constructed of innumerable shifting colors, it seemed to slump over in depression as it hugged its legs to its chest. Slowly its head turned to face him, gifting him a sight of its eyes, and he was shocked to be greeted by glowing purple irises up in a black background stars twinkling in the black as he stood on its legs and made its way over to him. You deny me for so long, pretend I don't exist, and now when you die, you refuse to accept me. The being's voice reverberated all around him as countless innumerable arms exploded from its back, incomprehensibly long with taut limbs and several more joints than one should have, the hands on the end of its fingers held several fingers per hand with long serrated claws for tips. The pressure of the world seemed to magnify as Nox was forced to kneel despite not having a body, waves through the force shook the dimension they were in. It glared down upon him, the innumerable colors of its form shifting to a series of darker colors like black, purple and deep red. You're a personality construct of myself of which I have no control, my emotions, my rage, 
I, a man who prides himself on control, do you really think I'd allow something that saps my control to have any presence in my life?" Knox retorted despite being nearly kissing the non-existent ground below. Yes, he knew what this was before him, the physical representation of all his accumulated power, the power he had even stolen from Typhogem was stored within its being, locked away. Deep within and hidden in the very depths of his power. You'd rather be weak than have no control the being spoke back, its voice rumbling as the arms on its back twisting and shaking as it withheld its rage. We both know that's a lie, I'm not weak, but what's power if it rushes from you and destroys everything you love and hold dear, no. I'd rather learn to control and exercise caution, sooner or later I'd have the power, it just takes time to learn to control Knox spoke in an even tone in response. But it's not coming at the rate you need, and because of that, you've been crushed by some dead abomination, what's the point of having all this power, if you can't use it to defend yourself it retorted in a heated tone. Because we both know why it's happening to us, why everything has happened to us, you're a part of me, you know the knowledge I poses. I'm not going to allow something to control my fate. It is my own, I choose how I live and Dinox spoke in a low tone, watching as the construct paused and shifted, growing smaller before it planted itself on the ground beside him. I don't want to die it spoke solemnly as it seemed to become depressed once more. Neither do I Knox replied to his other self, both seemingly staring into the nothingness as he became lost to his thoughts. Then what do we do it asked in genuine worry as it turned to face Knox. With a sigh Knox remained silent as he thought intensely. You go to sleep, and I stop being scared. I'm never going to be able to do anything if I can't accept who, what I am, and what I am going to have to do. I take the power, and I freak those that would use sideways Knox answered as the one beside him seemed to stare at his position intensely before its shoulders sagged and it withdrew slightly, but was agreeable nonetheless. Is it going to hurt the entity asked with a solemn grimace, to which Knox shook his head. I imagine it will be like waking up from a dream, you wouldn't even know it happened, you'll just, continue on as me, after all, we are the same person Knox responded, which seemed to calm the being considerably. Does that mean we're finally going to stop holding back it asked as it slowly began to climb back to its feet. Yes, I suppose it does Knox spoke slowly as it looked down at him. Then let us get this done it spoke as it brought its not inconsequential power to bear, an aura exploded around it. Heat radiated in all directions as the world around them appeared to sustain several massive black cracks. Yes, lads, goodbye my friend Knox closed his eyes as he opened himself up, allowing the power he was apprehensive, perhaps even feared, to flood into him. He felt more alive than he felt in a long time, finding himself looking from the perspective of the entity he had been speaking to earlier, now that it was once more under his control. Yes. This is mine after all Knox mused as he brought the energy made hand to his face and clasped his fist together before he closed his eyes and left the inner realm. Corbin. Typhogem glared down at where the unresponsive body lay, the raging war around having stopped to stare in his direction. But he wasn't worried about the bugs, he was worried about the fact his power had not left the being below, in fact, it seemed to cling to the individual and leaked from every pore, refusing to return. No matter, I will regain it over time anyway Typhogem growled as it pointed its finger at the being whom had taken its power, lightning coiling around the tip of its finger as it prepared to execute one final attack. With a screech, the lightning blasted from its finger and struck the body, rendering it a husk, black and burnt as it remained still and unmoving. Turning away from the body, Typhogem stared at the remainder of his does, glaring down at the enemy shades whom looked up at him defiantly. Preparing to execute the shades, Typhogem was taken by complete surprise at the explosion that sent him hurling away despite his impressive size, and sent the armies away like dispersing leaves with a leaf blower. Bringing itself to its feet, Typhogem looked towards the source, eyes catching a twisting tornado of black shadow and lightning that rose up as the skies darkened to a black, clouds obscuring the horizon as lightning flashed in the skies. Up above, the sun was obscured by the moon as an eclipse was formed. 
Everything became apocalyptic as a shockwave erupted from the tornado, obliterating the lands around it, turning several tens of shades to ash as it knocked Typhogem back onto its arse. Rumbling, as a shockwave impacted its surface, a mountain was reduced to stone and rubble as Typhogem's face contorted into utter rage, as he felt the force from this new power. From within the tornado, a beast-like, guttural screech descended onto the lands, a thousand voice warbled together, female, male, young, old, human and not were one as it screamed. Typhogem leapt back as an impossibly long arm suddenly exploded from within the tornado, as large as a starship as it slammed into the ground, three more blasted from within the twister in pursuit of the monster whom grabbed one, halting it whilst it deflected the other two with its wings. Going slack in its arms, the arm Typhogem was holding pulled back into the tornado as his rejuvenated enemy stepped out. He could feel traces of his own power being incorporated into this new being, making it its own, alongside a great deal of others being used to grow this new entity's power. Standing a solid hundred meters tall, its skin marble white, it held six arms connected directly to its torso. It held humanoid legs but only had two hoof-like toes on its feet. It had gumless lips with jagged teeth and sharp canines. Its hair was black and much like it was on Nox's human face. And, once more, jutting from its back, innumerable arms swayed behind its back, cascading hence the skies and lands around it where some clasped at several different rocks, sheets of metal or outright dug their hands into the ground. The newly empowered Nox wasted no time, raised his left and right hand and pointing his palms facing Typhogem, a purple halo formed in front of the entity with a glowing ball at the center. Bringing his wings in front of himself, the thundering blast being created by Nox screamed at Typhogem, striking the godly deity as it exploded against his skin. He kept himself shielded as a second blast struck him, arcs of lightning dancing off the white Nox's body as he began to sprint at the defending Typhogem. The lightning encasing him jumped and struck wayward enemies, as his large fest crushed many underfoot. One of the six arms connected to his torso became encased in lightning as he was sprinting, pointing upwards as lightning launched into the sky only to immediately strike at Typhogem's undefended back. The lightning struck, immobilizing Typhogem momentarily, and as Nox arrived, delivered a vicious descending overhand punch directly through the gap in the deity's wings which a second hand repeated, landing directly on the beast's cranium sending the beast downwards which was followed by an uppercut directly into the descending beast's lower face, destroying its tentacles and sending it soaring. Typhogem, stunned, was kept from soaring however as two hands wrapped around his right leg, suddenly, Nox was dragging Typhogem overhead before slamming it face first into the ground with colossal force. Raising his legs high, Nox dropped his right leg onto Typhogem's back, cratering the ground around them before he leapt eye to the air, somersaulting as as he slammed each and every one of the arms on his back into Typhogem on the ground before coming down with another overhand punch directly into the back of Typhogem's head. All around, friend and foe stumbled as the newly minted titanic being rained down punishment on his domed enemy, over and over as chunks of compressed sand were torn from the downed humanoid. Punch after world shaking punch sent sand into the skies, 10. 20, 50, they lost count as each arm connected to Nox continued to wail up in Typhogem. Nox was distracted from attack Typhogem as small, tiny bolts of lightning struck his skin, causing him to look down at the shades below who were coming to the defense of their god. Pathetic four of his arms pointed upwards as the gathered clouds above screamed, red bolts discharging from his body into the skies, all around. A force storm came into existence as the lands all the way into the horizon became victim to the wrath of Nox. Die to cataclysm Nox yelled out as hundreds of bolts hit his enemies, shades exploded as several hundred vengeful angry strikes of lightning disintegrated his foes. He had to stop as Typhogem overcame his momentary immobilization, bucking Nox off of his back as the angry deity came to its feet. Landing on his feet, Nox slid to a halt where the settlement used to lay, any hope for survivors lost as it was completely crushed under him. Dancing around Typhogem, arcs of lightning tore from the deity's being, hatred manifest striking out at Nox. From his back, eight arms came together in front of him, 
at their center, a massive swirling vortex of Tudaminas came into being as the lightning struck. Nox smirked as he felt the energy being converted for him to use, the lightning dispersing harmlessly against the vortex. Coming to his feet weathering the assault, Nox slowly took his steps, contorting one of his arms, using his metamorphosis to change one of his arms to what he wished. Rearing his right arm back, Nox tore the altered arm from his back, looking at the arm, which was now turned into a long blade of white. It connected directly to his palm, the two joining together as the blade became encased in dancing lightning. As he did this Typho gem ramped up the lightning he was discharging, the skies churning violently as the giant tried to smite the other. Nox continued forward as his Tudaminus held up, using his right arm to sweep his new blade in an arc to the right. Sweeping from the weapon, a wave of electricity swept the horizon, burning through the skies as the enemies to his front were destroyed. As the wave neared, Typho Gem cast a lightning wall, managing to cancel out the wave as it passed him by. The deity watched as the wave tore the tops off several mountains it passed over only to dissipate over the far distance. Sending his attention back to Nox, he brought his arms in front of him in an X to defend against a left hook, slamming his hand right to grab the blade that would have pierced his chest. Even as it felt the compressed sand be destroyed by the lightning-coated weapon, it knew it was better than being stabbed by the weapon. You thought you could come, in your pathetic weakened state, and just take what you no longer have, your weak a thousand voices assaulted Typho Gem as one of the countless hands came through his guard, grabbed him by the face, digging into the surface as it used its deceptive strength to slam Typho Gem's face into the ground. A failure Nox began to sprint, dragging Typho Gem's head through several large hills and through the ground before tossing him at a nearby mountain as he sprinted after the deity whom slammed into its surface before he plunged his hand into its abdomen. You're not even the being you think you are Typho Gem gripped the hand plunged into his stomach, wailing in pain as it was slowly raised. You're a shade, a memory, a sliver of a being long lost, clasping at straws as you fight against oblivion. You, are nothing two arms around from Nox's back around to Typho Gem's back, gripping his wings as he proceeded to tear them from the entity's body. Nox groaned as he took the latent energy from the torn wings to which dispersed and were sucked into Nox whom grinned savagely as he grew stronger. Dragging itself from Nox's arm, Typho Gem fell back, unleashing a torrent of lightning directly into Nox's face. As the lightning slowly died down, Typho Gem was horrified to see Nox completely unharmed, his hair hadn't even moved as all that had happened was Typho Gem expending a portion of his remaining power. How does feel, to know that everything you do from this point on will for nothing? You will never get your revenge. Never live again, you are a failure. A powerful failure, but a failure nonetheless. If you manage to flee, I will find you. Resist, I will overpower you. At the end of the day, I am here. I am, your end Nox proceeded to grasp Typho Gem by the head and the torso with his left and right arms. As the deity gripped his arms and tried to pry him off, only for two more arms to grip the deities and unfasten his grip. No, nothing he felt the deity grow desperate as Nox began to consume, drawing everything the perceived god into himself. Slowly, its legs began to disperse into ash, its flailing and screams intensifying as Nox maintained eye contact, unblinking as he smirked down at its wide-eyed panicked stare. Die now, sleep unknowingly forever in the great darkness as its grip its death grip held tightly onto him as its chest began to turn to nothing, Nox raising the dying deity into the air for its followed to watch. One last scream escaped the entity as it finally turned to nothingness, the energy that made up its being being absorbed straight into Nox's form. The force convulsed around him before a pulse resonated, blasting in all directions through the force as it washed over Corriban and out towards the larger galaxy. He ignored this however as he lowered his hands, staring down towards the stopped armies who stepped back in open fear as he regarded them. Kneel with a wave of his hand, he forced every single shade in front of him to kneel, an impossible weight dropping onto their shoulders as they were forcefully prostrated. Feeling Aloysius join back with him, he felt the gathered deer of the ghosts below. Join with me, join with your new god he made a grasping gesture, 
and with a drag to his chest, forcefully bound every being knelt in front of him, dragging their souls within himself where they were subjugated. And added to the masses within. With the remainder of all that happened being a field of ash that dispersed to the wind. Knox stared upwards towards the skies as the eclipse slowly came to an end. Relishing in the triumph as he finally vanquished one of his targets. That much closer. He stared off into the horizon as he felt the gazes of multiple beings throughout the galaxy, no doubt from the pulse through the force that washed over the galaxy. Look up in me, because you're all next. After sending the minuscule amounts of power he had borrowed back to the owners, Nox appeared on Iocath back in his human form. Valen immediately noticed the change, as she froze under the waves that washed over her, staring intensely at his black and purple glowing eyes, the man staring right back before he grabbed her wrist and began to lead her out of Skyva's lab. Where are we going? Valen asked as she followed, being led by her wrist as she made no moves to disconnect herself. To celebrate he responded as he dragged her into his embrace and folded space around them. Nathama, Knox's palace, Lemon scene. Appearing in his bedroom, his large bed behind them, Valen was surprised at the predatory look in his eyes. The sheer hunger barely contained as he pressed his lips to hers in that instant. She felt his hands roam her body, running down her back and rounding to cup at her butt. She moaned as he shocked her with a small charge of electricity, and as he growled, simply tearing the back of her grey robes from her body before he lifted her, allowing her to wrap her legs around his waist as she reciprocated by pulling the pieces of his armor apart and tossing them to the side. Soon, after prying all of the armor from his body, Valen unzipped the back of his Cordosis wave body suit, prying it from his body as she watched it unwind from him. She ran her fingers down his exposed chest as she wriggled the suit past her legs, she was sent into another wave of pleasure as another wave of electricity was sent coursing through her, her toes curling as she tossed her head back. Biting into her neck, Knox gripped the front of her outfit and simply pulled it from her body, exposing her breasts to him which he promptly set Miss Mouth to suckling on her areola and nibbled gently on her nipple, running his tongue along its hardening surface as he did so. He felt her wrapping her hands around his head as he tore off her leggings letting the scraps fall to the ground in a heap as he walked over to the bed, gently laying the woman on her back as he ran his hand along her exposed thigh. Letting go of her nipple, Knox watched, transfixed as it bounced hypnotizingly up and down under its own gentle weight. Slowly, he kissed at the lower half of her breast, then again a few centimeters under that, and slowly but surely, he was leaving a trail of kisses as he slowly made his way down to her womanhood. She bit her lips as he spread her legs and lower his head until he was face to face with her perfectly shaped entrance, no hanging lip or enlarged clitoris, it was something modeled by the gods themselves. Slowly, he spread her lips as he watched juices cascade down like a gentle flowing river. He entered, gently pushing them into her entrance which parted seamlessly around his fingers. Once inside, his fingers were curled upwards on the inside as he gently pulled his hand back, sending waves of pleasure as small arcs of electricity transferred from his fingers and straight into her most sensitive spots. Straightening his fingers out, he pushed them back into her before curling them and pulling them gently back, starting a rhythmic process of constant waves of pleasure, his fingers working expertly as they worked the roof of her sacred tunnel. Hungrily, he used his other, he kneaded at her breasts whilst he began to tease her clitoris with his tongue, gently raking his tongue across the nerves of the time bulb that sent Valen into a screaming mess as she grasped at his hair, crossing her legs behind his head as he continued gently raking against the roof of her tunnel and his tongue dancing across her clitoris. Up, down, he watched for every minute action his woman took, left and right, shaking his head from left to right, burying his face in the vanilla-scented area the sheer bliss she was experiencing as he worked her like a puppet. Another shock ran through his woman as he felt her legs seize up, fluids ejecting from her precious area that coated his face. He lapped up everything that she squirted onto him, not stopping in the slightest with his ministrations of her womanhood. She was lost, stuttering as her back fell on the bed, everything around her became more vibrant, the smells around her a sweet aroma. The light became vivid as streaks ran in her vision, 
her hearing left her as all she felt were the waves that ran through her, her tingling skin and spine that sent her toes and hands curling as she spasmed yet again. She wasn't aware of how long she spent floating on a wave of pleasure, but as he pulled his fingers from and stopped toying with her most sensitive spot, she wasn't aware he had stopped as she rode the waves for minutes. But when she did notice after a full four minutes, she felt empty, crashing to the ground and craving him once more again more than ever. She gripped him by the hair and dragged his face to hers, entering a vicious lip lock as her other hand transferred to his own length. Her slender fingers wrapped around its girth, however she was barely able to connect her pointer and thumb around its thinnest point as she felt its pulse and began to stroke up and down gently, goading it to grow in her hands as she was assaulted by his kisses. She felt him harden in her grip as his weight forced it to drop on the outside of her entrance. Greedily, she shifted both him and herself until he was lined up with her entrance, her lips parted around his head, her guiding hand urging the tip inside her. When he didn't move, she looked at him with a wide-eyed deer in headlights look, watching him smirk before he pulled her legs up with her knees landing on his shoulders. She groaned as his very nearly foot-long member was pushed into her body, she felt her insides being spread apart, her walls torn and the pain she felt as it stopped at her cervix. She grunted at the pain that flared through her body, but as the kind of person she was, found it impossibly pleasurable, and as he pulled his cock halfway out, it pulled against her walls, its thick veins plucking at her sensitive spots, sending another wave of pleasure through her, which was intensified as he slammed his length back in, her face twitched as he had became a haze, her eyes unfocusing as both pleasure and pain, with the pin only focusing the pleasure, exploded. Inside her. He did it again, pulling a good 15 centimeters out before slamming them back in, only getting two-thirds of his member in before her cervix stopped his progress. It seemed to annoy Knox to no end that he wasn't able to push his member all the way in, and without care, in both knowing she'd love it and wanting to bury himself all the way in, he pulled halfway out before gripping her by the hips and with a single thrust, he buried himself all the way up to the base, a scream escaping his woman as her eyes rolled into the back of her head and she fell to the bed, he could easily see the lump pushing against her stomach, he ran a finger along her stomach as he smirked, pushing it gently as it moves under his touch. She remained unresponsive for the moment, her legs still around his shoulders as he pivoted his back, pulling her cervix along with it before he pushed himself all the way back in, his left hand playing at her breasts while his other kept a grip on her hips. She seemed to come back to reality after the fifth thrusts up to the hilt, coming back with a scream and arch to her back as she squirted her juices over the sheets below. Before she knew it she was put onto her stomach, the man hoisting her rear as he bent her back, she was about to press her hands on the bed but was prevented from pushing herself up as his left foot connected with the back of the head and pushed her head down into the sheets of the bed. She felt his cock breach her once more, striking the back her her cervix whilst his right thumb gently circled her other pristine hole whilst he slammed his hips into hers, waves descended through her as her chest mashed under her body, his member pushing against the outside of her stomach with every thrust. The two of them lost themselves after they connected to each other through the force. Everything became a haze as their energies merged and connected, they molded at a level few ever could, they didn't know who was who, where he ended and she began. All they knew was they were one, and they loved it. This was the most intimate she had ever been with another, this was the most sacred thing a force user could commit with another, to be unified in the force was something almost never achieved. She knew she would never feel like this again for another, she was his, mind body and soul. She never wanted to be without him, to be so would be agony, their hearts beat as one. It was magical, it was euphoric. If he were to behead her right now, she'd die happily, and as her toes curled once more, her back bent and her lips parted, she once more felt herself descend into bliss as she stained the sheets beneath them. Her arms flailed around gripping at the sheets as he slammed his hips down, watching as the luscious meat that made up her cheeks rippled gloriously, his dick wet with her as he churned her insides, threatening to simply tear her open as he pulled out and slammed down. Please. Please give it to me, Phil me Valen bellowed as she screamed from under his foot. 
Her words filled him with a great deal of satisfaction and pleasure, as he watched his woman be converted from her proud self, to a bench and heat craving his seed from under him. He reached down to her hair, raking his hands through the long locks before cupping the back of her head. I want you to watch it spill out Knox huskily whispered, as he shifted, working her around his cock as he turned her onto her back, curling her like a sea as her legs hung with her head and back resting on the sheets, her stomach was glistening with sweat as they made eye contact. He pulled himself up, realigning himself and he transferred to a crouching position before slamming back down into her. He watched as her eyes rolled back once more, spittle running down the sides of her lips as she gargled and whimpered. He did this several more times as he felt himself approach his climax, the feeling built up in his stomach, warmth traveling down as his legs shook, the hair on his body stood on end as his spine shivered. He groaned, as the warmth shot from his stomach and balls and flooded through his shaft. It was an interesting sound that escaped his mouth, a deep groan or bellow, neither knew as when his fluids escaped him, it sputtered out, easily heard as it twitched. Valen's eyes focused once more as she could visibly see her stomach twitch and expand ever so slightly, as he shot rope after rope within her pulling halfway out before slamming down once more to shoot several more ropes into her uterus. She was blasted with the warmth of his seed, feeling it radiate through her lower body and throughout her as the waves of pleasure continued to send her straight to the clutches of bliss. And as he pulled out, the length sliding from within her like a snake shedding its skin. Her face was splashed with burning hot semen as it popped, escaping from her entrance like a cascade of flowing cream, running down from her S-class expletive and straight onto her face as she was glazed in the mixed juices of their union. And as the flow stopped, now covering her torso in white she gave out as her hips flopped to the sheets, her breath ragged and slow as juices continued to flow from her and onto the sheets. Her eyelids lidded as she rode the final waves of the absolute carnal pleasure that was slowly beginning to calm down. She was pulled from her thoughts as she felt her lover's hand gently slide up the back of her head, hands gently grasping the roots of her hair as he cupped the back of her head, she felt the length of his member land on her face as he turned her face upwards, running his free hand down her cheek as she slowly made eye contact with him with a grin. Don't think this is over dear. I've still got a lot to go Knox spoke as he tipped her chin with his finger, not giving her a chance to respond as he parted her lips with the head of his member and forced it down her throat like a tube. He watched with sick satisfaction as the muscle, bone and veins in her neck were forcefully parted all the way down, halting her breathing as her eyes rolled back yet again, the woman coughing as semen escaped her nose. Using his grip on her head, her groaned pleasurably as he pulled his cock out, affording her a breath before he forced it back down, the oral commissure of her lips separating, tearing as the sighs parted her lips, mouth and throat like air into a balloon. Yes, it was going to be a long, glorious night for them both, they loved it, and as he continued using her mouth to stimulate his member, they descended fully into carnal pleasure, unifying and becoming one until they forgot who was who. It would be a full three days before they left that bed chamber, and the room would need to be gurneyed to be cleaned properly, full sterilization needed.